The Centurions. Jean Lartaguy, B. Jean Pierre Lucien Osti, was born in Maisons Alfred, a small town just southeast of Paris. In March 1942, he escaped occupied France for Spain, where he spent time in prison before joining the Free French Forces. He served seven years of military service in North Africa and Korea, during which he earned various military awards. After being wounded by a grenade, Lata Guy turned to writing, working as a journalist and war correspondent. He covered conflicts in Eastern Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and North Africa, primarily for the magazine Paris Match. In 1955, he earned the Albert Londra Prize for his reporting in Indochina. A prolific writer, Lata Guy's body of work includes more than 30 works of fiction and non-fiction, most of which focus on the consequences of war and decolonization in the 20th century. He is best remembered for his Algerian War Trilogy, consisting of The Mercenaries, 1954, The Centurions, 1960, and The Praetorians, 1961. The Centurions, an overnight sensation and bestseller in France, became a film titled Lost Command, starring Anthony Quinn, in 1966. Though he died in 2011, his significance as a chronicler of irregular warfare continues to rise with the proliferation of modern guerrilla warfare and counterinsurgency tactics. Robert D. Kaplan is the author of many acclaimed books on the military, foreign affairs, and travel, including Imperial Grunts, The American Military on the Ground, Hog Pilots, Blue Water Grunts, The American Military in the Air, at Sea, and on the Ground, The Coming Anarchy and the revenge of geography, what the map tells us about coming conflict and the battle against fate. He is currently a national correspondent for the Atlantic and chief geopolitical analyst for Stratfor. He served on the Defense Policy Board and was named by Foreign Policy magazine as one of the world's top 100 global thinkers in both 2011 and 2012. Alexander, Xan, Wallace Fielding was a British author and translator. He served as a special operations executive in the British Army in Crete, France, and the Far East. The author of several books of his own, he also translated works by Pierre Boulle, Jean Lartaguy, and others from French into English. He died in Paris in 1991. Penguin Books Published by the Penguin Group Penguin Group, USA, LLC 375 Hudson Street New York, New York 10014. USA, Canada, UK, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa, China. Penguin.com. A Penguin Random House Company. First published in Great Britain by Hutchinson and Company, Publishers, Limited 1961. First published in the United States of America by E. P. Dutton and Co., Incorporated 1962. This edition with a foreword by Robert D. Kaplan published in Penguin Books 2015. Copyright Copyright 1960 by Presses de la Site, an imprint of Place to Edits. Translation Copyright Copyright 1961 by Penguin Group, USA, LLC and the Random House Group. For Word Copyright Copyright 2007, 2015 by Robert D. Kaplan. Penguin supports copyright. Copyright fuels creativity, encourages diverse voices, promotes free speech, and creates a vibrant culture. Thank you for buying an authorized edition of this book and for complying with copyright laws by not reproducing, scanning, or distributing any part of it in any form without permission. You are supporting writers and allowing Penguin to continue to publish books for every reader. Originally published in French as Les Centurions by Presses de la Site. Robert D. Kaplan's foreword is a revised version of his article Rereading Vietnam which appeared online in the Atlantic in 2007. ISBN 978-0698-15192 Cover Illustration, Ed Fairburn version underscore one. To Jean Paul Ugate. Contents. About the author. Title page. Copyright. Dedication. Foreword. Epigraph. 
Author's Note The Centurions Part 1, Camp 1 1. Captain de Glatine's sense of military honor 2. Captain Esclavier's self-examination 3. Lieutenant Biniers's remorse 4. The porcelains of the Summer Palace 5. Lieutenant Mamoudi's theft 6. The Viet Minh 7. Lieutenant Marindel's ventral 8. Dyer the Magnificent 9. The Yellow Infection Part 2, The Colonel from Indochina 1. The Cats of Marseille 2. The Beautiful Buildings of Paris 3. The Mules of the Col d'Urquiga Part 3, The Rue de L.A. Bomb 1. The Mutineers of Versailles 2. The Black Panther 3. The Leap of Lucadia 4. The Passions of Algiers 5. Mr. Arsenade emerges from the shadows 6. Rudo L.A. Bomb Forward Jean Latagai, Decoding the Warrior Ethos For thousands of years men have fought one another in situations where the battle lines are not fixed and words like front and rear lines have little meaning, for the war is everywhere, with civilians caught up and brutalized in the conflict. Irregular warfare, guerrilla uprisings, and counterinsurgency are timeless, not merely fads of the moment. Malaya, Vietnam, Somalia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Chechnya, the Congo, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria are just some of the datelines in which the 20th and 21st centuries register conflicts whose fundamentals the ancients would have been familiar with. With the collapse of central authority in the Middle East, otherwise known as the Arab Spring, this situation applies to an even greater degree. For countries like Libya, Yemen, Syria, and Iraq are barely states at this juncture, with tribes, militias, and gangs, divided by territory, sect, and ethnicity, battling for primacy over a confused and violent landscape. Conventional modern war, which Napoleon did so much to define and institutionalize, with its formalized set-piece battles and vertical chains of command, has mainly been with us for little more than two centuries. Its future, moreover, is uncertain. So while counterinsurgency is presently disparaged, because their results in Iraq and Afghanistan have been so unsatisfying for Americans, the lessons of counterinsurgency, if forgotten, will only have to be relearned on some future morrow. For that is the verdict of history going back to antiquity. You cannot approach Vietnam and Iraq in particular, or the subject of counterinsurgency in general, without reference to Jean Latagai a French novelist and war correspondent who in his own person encapsulates the divide between a professional warrior class that lives by these enduring, historical truths and a civilian home front alienated from them. Lata Guy inhabits the very soul of the U.S. Special Operations community, alienating not only civilian readers but members of the conventional military in the process. Throughout my years observing the Special Operations community close up, I witnessed several editions of Lata Guy's The Centurions, 1960, passing through the hands of those about whom I reported. Greenberries recommended to me not only Lata Guy's The Centurions but also The Praetorians, 1961, books about French paratroopers in Vietnam and Algeria in the 1950s that resonated with their own experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it wasn't just Greenberries who found Lata Guy essential. Alistair Horn, the renowned historian of the Algerian War, uses Lata Guy for epigrams in A Savage War of Peace, 1977. Some years back, General David Petraeus, then the future commander of U.S. ground forces in Iraq, pulled the Centurions off a shelf at his quarters in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and gave me a disquisition about the small unit leadership principles exemplified by one of the book's characters. More than half a century ago, this Frenchman was obsessed about a home front that had no context for a hot, irregular war, about a professional warrior class alienated from its civilian compatriots as much as from its own conventional infantry battalions, about the need to engage in both combat and civil affairs in a new form of warfare to follow an age of victory parades and what he called cinema heroics, 
about an enemy with complete freedom of action, allowed to do what we didn't dare, and about the danger of creating a sect of singularly brave iron men, whose ideals were so exalted that beyond the battlefield they had a tendency to become woolly headed. Lata Guy dedicates his book to the memory of centurions who died so that Rome might survive, but he notes in his conclusion that it was these same centurions who destroyed Rome. Born in 1920, Jean Lata Guy, a pseudonym, his real name was Jean Pierre Lucien Osti, fought with the Free French and afterward became a journalist. Because of his military experience and resistance ties, he had nearly unrivaled access to French paratroopers who fought at Dien Bien Phu and in the Battle of Algiers. His empathy for these men, some of whom were torturers, made him especially loathed by the Parisian left, even though he broke with the paratroopers themselves, out of opposition to their political goals, which he labeled neo-fascism. Lata Guy eventually found his military ideal in Israel, where he became revered by paratroopers who translated the centurions into Hebrew to read at their training centers. He called these Jewish soldiers the most remarkable of all of war's servants, superior even to the Viet, who at the same time detests war the most. By the mid-1970s, though, he became disillusioned with the Israel Defense Forces. He said it had ceased to be a manageable grouping of commandos and was becoming a cumbersome machine too dependent on American style technology, as if foreseeing some of the problems with the 2006 Lebanon campaign. I remember walking into the office of a U.S. Army Special Forces colonel in South Korea and noticing a plaque with Lata Guy's famous two armies quote. The translation is by Xan Fielding, a British special operations officer who, in addition to rendering Lata Guy's classics into English, was also a close friend of the late British travel writer Patrick Lee Fermer, to whom Fermer addresses his introduction in his own 1977 classic, A Time of Gifts, in the Centurions, one of Lata Guy's paratroopers declares. I'd like. Two armies, one for display, with lovely guns, tanks, little soldiers, fanfares, staffs distinguished and doddering generals, and dear little regimental officers. An army that would be shown for a modest fee on every fair ground in the country. The other would be the real one, composed entirely of young enthusiasts in camouflage battle dress, who would not be put on display but from whom. All sorts of tricks would be taught. That's the army in which I should like to fight. But the reply from another character in the Centurions to this declaration is swift you're heading for a lot of trouble. The exchange telescopes the philosophical dilemma about the measures that need to be taken against enemies who would erect a far worse world than you, but which, nevertheless, are impossible to carry out because of the remorse that afflicts soldiers when they violate their own notion of purity of arms, even in situations where such tricks might somehow be rationalized. They may win the battle, but will surely lose their souls. Rather than a roughneck, this Army Special Forces Colonel epitomized the soft, indirect approach to unconventional war that is in contrast to direct action. The message that he and other professional warriors have always taken away from Lata Guy's famous two armies quote, rooted in Lata Guy's own Vietnam experience, is that the mission is everything, and conventional militaries, by virtue of being vast bureaucratic machines obsessed with rank and privilege, are insufficiently focused on the mission, regardless of whether it is direct action or humanitarian affairs. Of course, the conventional officer would reply that the special operator's field of sight is so narrow that he can't see anything beyond the mission. They're dangerous, one of Lata Guy's protagonists says of the paratroopers, because they go to any lengths. Beyond the conventional notion of good and evil. For if the warrior's actions contradict his faith, his doubts are easily overcome by belief in the larger cause. Lata Guy writes of one soldier, he had placed the whole of his life under the sign of Christ who had preached peace, charity, brotherhood. And at the same time he had arranged for the delayed action bombs at the Cat by airfield. What of it? There's a war on and we can't allow Hanoi to be captured. Vietnam, like Iraq, represented a war of frustrating half-measures fought against an enemy that respected no limits. More than any writer I know, Lata Guy communicates the intensity of such frustrations, which, in turn, 
create the psychological gulf that separates warriors from both a conscript army and a civilian home front. The best units, according to Lata Guy, while officially built on high ideals, are, in fact, products of such deep bonds of brotherhood and familiarity that the world outside requires a dose of cynicism merely to stomach. As one Green Beret once wrote me, there are no more cynical soldiers on the planet than the SF, special forces, guys I work with, they snort at the platitudes we are expected to parrot, but, he went on, you will not find anyone who gets the job done better in tough environments like Iraq. In fact, in extreme and difficult situations like Iraq, cynics may actually serve a purpose. For in the regular army there is a tendency to report up the command chain that the mission is succeeding, even if it isn't. Cynics won't buy that, and will say so bluntly. Lata Guy immortalizes such soldiers. Lata Guy writes that the warrior looks down on the rest of the military as the profession of the sluggard, men who get up early to do nothing. Yet as one paratrooper notes in the Praetorians. In Algeria the type of officer died out. When we came in from operations we had to deal with the police, build sports grounds, attend classes. Regulations? They hadn't provided for anything, even if one tried to make an exegesis of them with the subtlety of a rabbi. Dirty, badly conceived wars in Vietnam and Algeria had begotten a radicalized French warrior class of non-commissioned officers, able to kill in the morning and build schools in the afternoon which had a higher regard for its Muslim guerrilla adversaries than for regular officers in its own ranks. Such men would gladly advance toward a machine gun nest without looking back, and yet were booed by the crowds upon returning home, so that they saw the civilian society they were defending as vile, corrupt and degraded. The estrangement of soldiers from their own citizenry is somewhat particular to counterinsurgencies and small wars where there are no neat battle lines and thus no easy narrative for the people back home to follow. The frustrations in these wars are great precisely because they are not easily communicated. Lata Gar writes, imagine an environment where a whole garrison of 2000 troops is held in check by a small band of thugs and murderers. The enemy is able to know everything, every movement of our troops, the departure times of the convoys. Meanwhile we're rushing about the bare mountains, exhausting our men, we shall never be able to find anything. Because the enemy is not limited by western notions of war, the temptation arises among a stymied soldiery to bend its own rules. Following an atrocity carried out by French paratroopers that calms a rural area of Algeria, one soldier rationalizes to another, fear has changed sides, tongues have been loosened. We obtained more in a day than in six months fighting, and more with 27 dead than with several hundreds. The soldiers comfort themselves further with a quotation from a 14th century Catholic bishop, when her existence is threatened, the church is absolved of all moral commandments. It is the purest of them, Lata Guy goes on, who are most likely to commit torture. Here we enter territory that is unrelated to the individual Americans I covered as a correspondent. It is important to make such distinctions. When Lata Guy writes about bravery and alienation, he understands American warriors, when he writes about political insurrections and torture, some exceptions aside, he is talking about a particular caste of French paratroopers. Yet his discussion is relevant to America's past in Vietnam and Iraq. I don't mean my Lai and Abu Ghraib, both of which aided the enemy rather than ourselves but the moral grey area that we increasingly inhabit concerning collateral civilian deaths. In the Face of War, Reflections on Men and Combat, 1976, Lata Guy writes that contemporary wars are, in particular, made for the side that doesn't care about the preservation of a good conscience. So he asks, how do you explain that to save liberty, liberty must first be suppressed? His answer can only be thus, in that rests the weakness of democratic regimes, a weakness that is at the same time a credit to them, an honor. One thing is clear, we have rarely been good at predicting the next war. And given the history of war, not to mention the undeniable, ongoing transformation of the army toward a greater emphasis on special operations, the lessons of the centurions will persist.
so will the need to nurture a professional warrior class that is determined to preserve its honor, even if that inhibits the mission. Robert D. Kaplan. We had been told, on leaving our native soil, that we were going to defend the sacred rights conferred on us by so many of our citizens settled overseas, so many years of our presence, so many benefits brought by us to populations in need of our assistance and our civilization. We were able to verify that all this was true, and, because it was true, we did not hesitate to shed our quota of blood, to sacrifice our youth and our hopes. We regretted nothing, but whereas we over here are inspired by this frame of mind, I am told that in Rome factions and conspiracies are rife, that treachery flourishes, and that many people in their uncertainty and confusion lend a ready ear to the dire temptations of relinquishment and vilify our action. I cannot believe that all this is true and yet recent wars have shown how pernicious such a state of mind could be and to where it could lead. Make haste to reassure me, I beg you, and tell me that our fellow citizens understand us, support us and protect us as we ourselves are protecting the glory of the empire. If it should be otherwise, if we should have to leave our bleached bones on these desert sands in vain, then beware of the anger of the legions. Marcus Flavinus. Centurion in the 2 nd cohort of the August Legion. To his cousin Tertullus in Rome. Author's note. I knew them well, the centurions of the wars of Indochina and Algeria. At one time I was one of their number, then, as a journalist, I became their observer and, on occasion, their confidant. I shall always feel attached to those men even if I should ever disagree with the course they choose to follow, but I feel in no way bound to give a conventional or idealized picture of them. This book is first and foremost a novel and the characters in it are imaginary. They might at a pinch, through some feature or incident, recall one or another of my former comrades now famous or dead and forgotten. But there is not one of these characters to whom one could put a name without going astray. On the other hand, the facts. The situations, the scenes of action are almost all taken from real life and I have endeavored to adhere to the correct dates. I dedicate this book to the memory of all the centurions who perished so that Rome might survive. Jean Lartagai. Part 1. Camp 1. 1. Captain de Glatine's sense of military honor. Tied up to one another, the prisoners looked like a column of caterpillars on the march. They emerged into a little basin, flanked by their Viet Minh guards who kept yelling at them, Didi, -de, more Len. Keep going, get a move on. All of them remembered those bicycle rickshaws they used to take at Hanoi or Saigon only a few weeks or a few months before. They used to shout at the coolies in the same way, more Len, more Len. Get a move on, you bastard, there's a pretty little half caste waiting for me in the Rue Katinat. She's such a slut that if I'm even ten minutes late she'll have found someone else. More Len, more Len. Our leave's over. The battalion's been alerted, we probably jumped a night. More Len, hurry up and get past that bit of garden and that slender beckoning figure in white. The basin looked like any other in this part of the country. The trail emerged from the valley, hemmed in between the mountains and the forest and came out onto a system of rice fields fitted one into another like in lay checker work. The geometrical pattern of the little mud embankments seemed to separate the colors, the various shades of deep, deep green which are those of paddy grass. The village in the middle of the basin had been destroyed. All that remained was a few charred piles rising above the tall elephant grass. The inhabitants had fled into the forest but even so the political committee were using these piles as propaganda hoardings. There was a crudely drawn poster of a Thai couple in national dress, the woman with her flat hat, close-fitting bodice and flowing skirt, the man with his baggy black trousers and short jacket. They were represented giving an enthusiastic welcome to a Bodoi, a victorious soldier of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam with a palm fiber helmet on his head and a huge yellow star on a red ground pinned to his tunic. A bodoi similar to the one in the poster, but who was walking barefoot and carrying a submachine gun, gave a signal for the prisoners to halt. They sank down into the tall grass on the edge of the trail, they could not use their arms, 
which were tied behind them, and squirmed about like fragments of worms. A Thai peasant had come out of the bush and sidled up towards the prisoners. The Bodoi exhorted him with sharp little phrases which sounded like slogans. Soon there was a whole group of them, all dressed in black, looking at the captured Frenchmen. This spectacle seemed incredible to them and they could not decide what attitude to adopt. Not knowing what to do, they stood silent and motionless, ready to take flight. Perhaps they would suddenly see the long noses break their bonds and knock down their guards. One of the ties, by dint of every kind of precaution and expression of courtesy, questioned another Bodoi who had just appeared, armed with a heavy check rifle which he held in both hands. Very gently, in the protective tone of an elder brother speaking to a younger, the Bodoi replied but his false modesty made his triumph seem all the more unbearable to Lieutenant Piniers. He rolled over towards Lieutenant Merle. Don't you think that V. et Scott the nasty expression of a Jesuit on his way back from the Sunday auto DFA? They burned the witch at Dean Bianfu and he must be telling them all about it. The witch was us. Boyce Furas spoke up in his rasping voice, which to Piniers sounded as self-satisfied as the Bodois. He's telling them that the Vietnamese people have beaten the imperialists and that they're now free. The Thai had translated this to his companions. He, in his turn, gave himself airs, assumed a protective manner and lordly demeanor, as though the mere fact of speaking the language of these strange little soldiers, masters of the French, allowed him to participate in their victory. The Thais gave one or two delighted cries, but not too loud a few exclamations and smiles, but which they suppressed, and drew closer to the prisoners to have a better look. The Bodoi raised his hand and made a speech. Well, Captain Boyce Führers, Biniers inquired sourly, what are they saying now? The Viet's talking about President Ho's policy of leniency and telling them not to ill-treat the prisoners, which had never even crossed their minds. The Viet would willingly incite them to do so if only for the pleasure of holding them back. He's also telling them that at five o'clock this afternoon the garrison of Dean Bianfu surrendered. Long live President Ho! The Bodoi exclaimed at the end of his harangue. Long live President Ho! The group echoed in the toneless, solemn voice of school children. Night had fallen with no intervening twilight. Swarms of mosquitoes and other insect pests set upon the arms, legs and bare chests of the Frenchmen. The Viets could at least fan themselves with leafy branches. By rolling his body forward, which forced his neighbors likewise to shift theirs, Biniers had drawn a little closer to Glatini who was looking up at the sky and appeared to be lost in thought. He was the one they had to thank for being tied up together, for he had fallen foul of the political commissar but none of the twenty men shackled to him held it against him, except perhaps Boyce Führers, who had not, however, ventured an opinion on the subject. I say, sir, where does this fellow Boyce Führers come from, who speaks their lingo? Piniers addressed everyone by the familiar two, except Glatini, out of deference, and Boyce Führers, to show him his dislike. Glatini seemed to have some difficulty in shaking off his thoughts. He had to make a great effort to reply. I've only known him for forty-eight hours. He showed up at the strong point on the 4th of May, in the evening, and it's a miracle he got through with his convoy of pims laden with ammo and supplies. I'd never heard of him until then. Piniers mumbled something and rubbed his head against a tuft of grass to get rid of the mosquitoes. Glatini was anxious to forget the fall of Dean Bianfu but the events of the last six days, the attacks that had been launched against the strong point of Marianne II, which he commanded, all these had welded together in a sort of mold so as to form a solid block of weariness and horror. The height had been three quarters surrounded. The Viet Minh infantry attacked every night and their heavy mortars harassed the position all day. Out of the whole battalion only forty men were left unscathed or lightly wounded. The rest mingled with the mud in the shell holes. During the night Glatini had made a final wireless contact with Raspagai, who had just been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel, there was no one else replying to signals or issuing orders. He was the one to whom Glatini had sent his SOS. 
I've no more supplies, sir, no more ammo, and they're overrunning the position where we're fighting hand to hand. Raspagai's voice, slightly grating but still retaining some of the sing-song intonation of the Basque language, reassured him and infused him with warmth, like a glass of wine after a civis train. Stick it out, man. I'll try and get something through to you. This was the first time the great paratrooper had addressed him by two. Raspagai did not take kindly to staff officers or anyone else too closely in touch with the generals, and Glatini had once been aide de comp to the commander in chief. Dawn had broken once again and for a moment a silhouette had blocked the rectangle of light which marked the entrance to the shelter. The silhouette had bent down, then straightened up again. The man in the mud stained uniform had carefully laid his American carbine down on the table, then taken off the steel helmet which he was wearing on top of his bush hat. He was barefoot and his trousers were rolled up to his knees. When he turned towards Glatini, the dull light of that rainy morning had brought out the color of his eyes, which were a very pale watery green. He had introduced himself. Captain Boyce Furas. I've got forty pims and about thirty cases with me. The two previous convoys had been forced back after trying to cover the three hundred yards which still connected Marianne 2 to Marianne 3 by a shapeless communication trench filled with liquid mud which was under fire from the Viets. Boyce Furas had taken a piece of paper out of his pocket and checked his list. Two thousand seven hundred hand grenades, fifteen thousand rounds but there are no more mortar shells and I had to leave the ration boxes behind at Marianne 3. How did you manage to get through? asked Glatini who was not counting on any further assistance. I persuaded my pims that they had to keep going. Glatini looked at Boyce Führers more closely. He was rather short, five foot seven at the most, with slim hips and broad shoulders. He had about the same build as a native of the Oat region strong and at the same time slender. Without his prominent nose and full lips, he could have been taken for a half-caste, his rather grating voice emphasized this impression. What's the latest? Glatini asked. We're going to be attacked tomorrow, at nightfall, by 308 Division, the toughest of the lot, that's why I dumped the ration boxes so as to bring up a little more ammo. How do you know this? Before coming up with the convoy, I went for a little stroll among the Viets and took a prisoner. He was from the 308th and he told me. HQ never let me know. I forgot to bring the prisoner back, he was a bit of a nuisance, so they wouldn't believe me. While he spoke he had wiped his hands on his hat and taken a cigarette out of Glatini's packet, which was the last he had left. Got a light? Thanks. Can I move in here? You're not going back to HQ. What for? We're done for there, as we are here. The 308th have been reorganized completely, they're going to go all out and mop up everything that's still standing. Glatini began to feel irritated by the newcomer's complacency and also by that supercilious glint he could see in his eye. He tried to put him in his place. I suppose it was that prisoner of yours who told you all this as well. No, but a couple of weeks ago I went through the base area of the 308th and I saw the columns of reinforcements arriving. So you're in a position to stroll about among the Viets, are you? Dressed as a Nake, I'm more or less unrecognizable and I speak Vietnamese pretty well. But where have you come from? From the Chinese border. I was running some guerrilla bands up there. One day I got the order to drop everything and make for Dean Bianfu. It took me a month. A non-partisan dressed in the same uniform as the captain now came into the strong point. It's minutes, my Batman, said Boyce Furas. He was up there with me. He began speaking to him in his language. The nun shook his head. Then he lowered his eyes, put his carbine down next to his officers, took off his equipment and went out. What did you say to him? asked Glatini whose curiosity had got the better of his antipathy. I told him to clear out. He's going to try and get to Liuang Brabang through the Narma Valley. You could escape as well if you tried. Perhaps, but I'm not going to. 
I don't want to miss an experience which might be extremely interesting. Isn't it an officer's duty to try and escape? I haven't been captured yet, nor have you. But after tomorrow we'll both be prisoners. Or corpses, it's all in the game. You could join the gorillas who are around Dean Bianfu. There are no gorillas around Dean Bianfu, or if there are they hand in glove with the Viets. There again we failed, like everywhere else. Because we didn't wage the right sort of war. I was still with the C. in C. A month ago. He didn't keep anything hidden from me. I took part in the formation of all those bands, and I never heard about any on the Chinese border. They didn't always keep to the border, occasionally they even went across into China. I took my orders direct from Paris, from a service attached to the President's du Council. No one knew of my existence, like that I could always be disowned if anything happened. If we're taken prisoner you're liable to get it in the neck from the Viets. They don't know anything about me. I was operating against the Chinese, not against the Viets. My war, if you like, was less localized than yours. Whether in the West, the East or the Far East, communism forms a whole, and it's childish to think that by attacking one of the members of this community you can localize the conflict. A few men in Paris had realized this. You don't know me from Madam yet you seem to be trusting me already to the extent of telling me things that I might have preferred not to know. We're going to have to live together, Captain de Glatini, maybe for a long time. I liked your attitude when you learned that it was all up with Dean Bianfu and left the sea. In C, a man of your class and your tradition, to get yourself dropped here. I interpreted that attitude in a sense which perhaps you had never intended. In my eyes, you had abandoned the moribund establishment to rejoin the soldiers and the common herd, those who do the actual fighting, the foundation stone of any army. That was how Glatini made the acquaintance of Boyce Führers who now lay a few feet away from him, a prisoner like himself. During the night Boyce Führers shifted closer to Glatini. The age of heroics is over, he said, at least the age of cinema heroics. The new armies will have neither regimental standards nor military bands. They will have to be first and foremost efficient. That's what we're going to learn and that's the reason I didn't try and escape. He held his two hands out to Glatini, and the latter saw that he had slipped out of his fetters. But he had no reaction, he was even rather bored by Boyce Führers. Everything came to him from a great distance, like an echo. Glatini was lying like a gun dog his jutting shoulder bearing the weight of his body. The crests of the mountains surrounding the basin stood out clearly against the dark background of the night. Clouds drifted across the sky and from time to time the close or distant sound of an aircraft could be heard in the silence. He felt no particular urge other than a very remote and very vague desire for warmth. His physical exhaustion was such that he had the impression of being withdrawn from the world pushed beyond his limits and enabled to contemplate himself from outside. Perhaps this was what Lathuong meant by Nirvana. At Saigon the Buddhist monk Lathuong had tried to initiate him into the mysteries of fasting. The first few days, he had told him, you think of nothing but food. However fervent your prayers and your longing for union with God, all your spiritual exercises, all your meditations are tainted by material desires. The liberation of the mind occurs between the eighth and the tenth day. In a few hours it detaches itself from the body. Independent of it, it appears in a startling purity which is made up of lucidity, objectivity and penetrating understanding. Between the thirty-fifth and fortieth day, in the midst of this purity, the urge for food occurs again, this is the final alarm signal given by the organism on the point of exhaustion. Beyond this biological limit, Metaphysics ceased to exist. Since dawn on the 7th of May Glatini had been in this condition. He had the strange feeling of having two separate states of consciousness, one of which was weakening more and more at every moment but still impelled him to give certain orders, make certain gestures, such as tearing off his badges of rank when he had been captured, while the other took refuge in a sort of dull, morose form of contemplation. Until then he had always lived in a world which was concrete, active, friendly or hostile, 
but logical even in absurdity. On the 6th of May, at 11 o'clock at night, the Viets had blown up the summit of the peak with a mine and forthwith thrown in two battalions which had seized almost the whole of the strong point and, which was worse, the most commanding positions. The French counter-attack by the 40 survivors had thus started from the foot of the slope. Glatini recalled the remark Boyce Führers had made, this is all completely idiotic. And Biniers is sharp retort. If you're nervous about it, sir, there's no need for you to come with us. But Boyce Führers was without nerves, he had proved this. He simply seemed indifferent to what was happening, as though he was reserving himself entirely for the second part of the drama. The counterattack had been feeble and difficult to get underway. Nevertheless, the men had managed to regain the position, dugout after dugout, by means of hand grenades. At four in the morning the last V at pinned down on the edge of the crater of the mine had been wiped out, but half the men of the small garrison had lost their lives. A sudden silence ensued, isolating Marianne too like an island in the midst of a sea on fire. To the west of the Song Ma. The Viet Minh artillery was pounding away at General de Castries HQ and for a few seconds the glow of the firing alternately spread and faded in the darkness. To the north, Marianne 4, assailed on all sides, was still holding out. Sir Kona, the wireless operator, had been killed at Captain Glatine's side. But his set, a piece ERN, which he carried strapped to his back, was still working and crackled gently in the silence. Suddenly the crackling gave way to the voice of Port, who was in command of the last reserve company centered on Marianne 4. This unit had been made up of the survivors of the three parachute battalions to come to the assistance of Marianne 2. Double blue, I repeat. I am still at the foot of Marianne 2. Impossible to break out. The Viets hold the trenches above me and are chucking grenades right on top of us. I've only got nine men left over. Blue 3, I've told you to counter-attack. Get a move on, for Christ's sake, we're also getting grenades tossed at us. You should have reached the summit by now. Double Blue 3, message received. I'll try and advance. Out. Silence, followed by another voice insistently repeating. Double Blue 4, reply. Double Blue 4? But Blue could not reply any longer. Old ports had been shot to pieces attempting to gain the summit. His huge frame lay stretched out on a slope and a tiny V it was going through his pockets. Glatini had listened to this strange wireless conversation with the indifference of a sports professional who has gone into retirement and tunes into the broadcasts of the matches by sheer force of habit. But this meant that no one now could come to the aid of Marianne II since Marianne III was lost. Glatini could not even summon up enough strength to switch off the PCR-10 which went on crackling until its batteries ran out. Sir Gona lay with his head in the mud, and the set with its aerial looked like some monstrous beetle which was devouring his body. A recognition light floating slowly down on the end of its parachute cast a livid gleam over the peak. On the reverse slope, Glatini could make out the Viet Minh trenches which stood out as a series of unbroken black lines. They looked calm and utterly inoffensive. His platoon officers and company commanders began to trickle back one by one to make their report. Ten yards farther off, Boyce Führers sat with his knees drawn up to his chin, looking up into the sky as though seeking a sign from heaven. Merle was the first to arrive. He looked lankier than ever and kept picking his nose. I've only seven men left in the company, sir, and two magazines of ammo. Not a word from Lacard's platoon which has disappeared completely. The next to turn up was Sergeant Major Pontin. The stubble on his cheeks was white, he appeared to be on the point of collapse and on the verge of tears. So long as he breaks down alone in his dugout, Glatini said to himself. Five men left, four magazines, said the Sergeant Major. Then he went off to have his breakdown. Piniers was the last to arrive. He was a senior lieutenant and came and sat down next to Glatini. Only eight men left, and nothing to put in the rifles. 
the Viets were now broadcasting the partisan song on Marianne 2S frequency. Friend, do you hear the black flight of the ravens in the plains? Friend, do you hear the dull cry of your country in chains? That's funny, Biniers remarked bitterly, it really is funny, sir. They've even gone and stolen that from me. Piniers had undergone his baptism of fire in an FTP Mackey group and had been assimilated into the army. He was one of the rare successes to emerge from this operation. Merle reappeared. Better come, sir. They've found the kid and he's dying. The kid was Second Lieutenant Lacard, who had been posted to the Parachute Battalion three months before, straight from St. Cyr and after only a few weeks in a training school. Glatini got up and Boyce Führers followed him, barefoot and with his trousers rolled up to his knees. Lacard had received some fragments of grenade in the stomach. His fingers dug into the warm, muddy ground. In the half-light Glatini could hardly distinguish his face, but by the sound of his voice he realized he was done for. Lacard was twenty-one years old. To give himself an air of authority, he had grown a wisp of blonde moustache and made his voice sound gruff. It had now become adolescent once more, a hesitant voice in which the high tones alternated with the low. The kid was no longer putting on an act. I'm thirsty, he kept saying, I'm terribly thirsty, sir. The only answer Glatini could give was a lie. We'll have you taken down to Marianne 3, there's an emo there. It was silly to believe that anyone, hampered with a casualty, could get through the Viet position between the two strong points. Even the kid knew this, but now he was willing to believe in the impossible. He pinned his faith on his captain's promises. I'm thirsty, he repeated, but I can certainly hang on until it's light. You remember, sir, in Hanoi, at the Normandy, those bottles of beer so cold that they were all misted up? It was like touching a piece of ice. Glatini had taken his hand. He slid his fingers up his wrist to feel his pulse which was weakening. The kid would not be suffering much longer. Lacard cried out once or twice again for some beer and muttered a girl's name, Aileen, the name of his little fiancée who was waiting for him in her home in the country, the little fiancée of a Saint Sir Cadet, bright and gay and not at all well off, who had worn the same dress on Sundays for the last two years. His fingers dug still deeper into the mud. Boyce Führers sidled up to Glatini who was still crouching over the body. Seven drafts of St. Sir Cadets wiped out in Indochina. It's too much, Glatini, when the result is a defeat. It will be difficult to recover from this drain on our manpower. A boy of twenty, said Glatini, twenty years of hope and enthusiasm dead. That's a hell of a capital to throw away and can't be easily recovered. I wonder what they think about it in Paris. They're just coming out of the theatres about now. At first light the Viets attacked again. The remaining survivors of Marianne II saw them emerging one by one from the openings in their covered trenches. Then the silhouettes started appearing and disappearing, moving swiftly, bounding and rebounding like India rubber balls. Not a single shot was fired. Glatini had given orders to reserve what was left of the ammunition for the final assault. The captain had a Mills bomb in his hand. He plucked out the pin, keeping his palm pressed down on the spring. All I need do, he reflected, is drop it at my feet just as the Viets are on top of me and count up to five, then we'll all leave this world together, them at the same time as me. I shall have died in the true tradition, like Uncle Joseph in 1940 like my father in Morocco, and my grandfather at Kemende Dames. Claude will go and join the Black Battalion of Officers' Widows. She'll be welcome there, she'll be in good company. My sons will go to Laflec, my daughters to the Legion d'Honneur. The joints of his fingers clenching the grenade began to ache. Less than ten yards off, three Viets in single file had just slipped into a dugout. He could hear them urging each other on before taking the next bound that would bring them right up to him. One, two, three. He hurled the grenade into the dugout. But he had raised his head and shoulders above the skyline and drawn several bursts of machine gun fire. The grenade exploded and lumps of earth and shreds of clothing and flesh came flying through the air. 
he lay flat in the mud. Close by, to his right, he heard the suburban accent of Mansard, a sergeant. They've got us now, the bastards, there's nothing left to fire back at them. Glatini tore off his badges of rank, he could at least try to pass himself off as an OR it would be easy to escape. When the time came. Then he stretched out on his side in the hole, all he could do now was wait for the experience that Boyce Führers claimed to be so interesting. The explosion of a grenade in his dugout made him take leave of the Greco-Latin Christian civilized world. When he regained consciousness he was on the other side. Among the communists. A voice was shouting out in the darkness. You are completely surrounded. Do not fire. We shall do you no harm. Stand up and keep your hands in the air. This voice uttered each syllable separately, like the soundtrack of a badly dubbed cowboy film. The voice drew closer, it now addressed itself to Glatini. Are you alive? Wounded? We shall take care of you, we have medical supplies. Where are your weapons? I haven't any. I'm not wounded, only stunned. Glatini had to make a great effort to speak and was surprised to hear his own voice. He could hardly recognize it, like that time he had listened to the playback of a talk he had given on Radio Saigon. Don't move, the voice went on, the medical orderly will be coming up soon. Glatini came to his senses in a long narrow shelter shaped like a tunnel. He was sitting on the ground, his bare back resting against the earth wall. Facing him, an ake squatting on his haunches was smoking some foul tobacco rolled up in a piece of old newspaper. The tunnel was lit by two candles, but every nake who went past kept flashing his electric torch on and off. In the same position as himself, leaning against the earth wall, the captain recognized three Vietnamese paratroopers who were at Marianne too. They glanced across at him, then turned away. The nake was bareheaded his upper lip flanked by two symmetrical tufts of two or three long straggly whiskers. He was wearing a khaki uniform without any distinguishing marks and, unlike the other Viets, had no canvas shoes on his feet and his toes wriggled voluptuously in the warm mud of the shelter. As he puffed at his cigarette he uttered a few words, and a bodoy with the supple and sinuous backbone of a boy bent over Glatini. The battalion commander asks you where is French Major Commanding Strong Point. Glatini's reaction was that of a regular officer, he could not believe that this nake squatting on his haunches and smoking foul tobacco was, like him, a battalion commander with the same rank and the same responsibilities as his own. He pointed at him. Is that your CO? That's him, said the Viet, bowing respectfully in the direction of the Viet Minh officer. Glatini thought that his opposite number looked like a peasant from Otkaris, one of whose female ancestors had been raped by a henchman of Atlas. His face was neither cruel nor intelligent but rather sly, patient and attentive. He fancied he saw the nake smile and the two narrow slits of his eyes screw up with pleasure. So this was one of the officers of 308 Division, the best unit in the whole People's Army. It was this peasant from the paddy fields who had beaten him, Glatini, the descendant of one of the great military dynasties of the West, for whom war was a profession and the only purpose in life. The Nake emitted three words with a puff of stinking smoke and the interpreter went over to question the Vietnamese paratroopers. Only one of them answered, the sergeant, and with a jerk of his chin he indicated the captain. You are Captain Platini, commanding 3rd Parachute Company? but where is Major Commanding Strong Point? Glatini now felt it was stupid to have tried to pass himself off as an OR he replied. I was in command of the Strong Point. There was no Major and I was the senior captain. He looked at the Nake whose eyes kept blinking but whose expression remained inscrutable. They had fought against each other on equal terms, their heavy mortars were just as effective as the French artillery and the Air Force had never been able to operate over Marianne too. Of this fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, of this position which had changed hands twenty times over, of this struggle to the death, 
Of all these acts of heroism, of this last French attack in which forty men had swept the Viet Minh battalion off the summit and had driven them out of the trenches they had won, there remained no sign on this inscrutable face which betrayed neither respect nor interest nor even hatred. The days when the victorious side presented arms to the vanquished garrison that had fought bravely were over. There was no room left for military chivalry or what remained of it. In the deadly world of communism a vanquished was a culprit and was reduced to the position of a man condemned by common law. Up to April 1945 the principles of caste were still in force. Second Lieutenant Glatini was then in command of a platoon outside Karlsruhe. He had taken a German major prisoner and brought him back to his squadron commander, de V, who was also his cousin and belonged to the same military race of squires who were in turn highway robbers, crusaders, constables of the king, marshals of the empire, and generals of the republic. The squadron commander had established his HQ in a forester's cottage. He had come out to greet his prisoner. They had saluted and introduced themselves. The Major likewise bore a great name in the way Macton had fought gallantly. Glatini had been struck by the close resemblance between these two men, the same piercing eyes set deep in their sockets, the same elegant formality of manner, the same thin lips and prominent beaky nose. He did not realize that he himself also resembled them. It was very early in the morning. Major de V invited Glatini and his prisoner to have breakfast with him. The German and the Frenchman, completely at ease since they found themselves among people of their own caste, discussed the various places where they might have fought against each other since 1939. To them it was of little consequence that one was the victor and the other the vanquished provided they had observed the rules and had fought bravely. They had a feeling of respect for each other and, what is more, a feeling of friendship. De v, had the Major driven to the POW camp in his own jeep and, before taking leave of him, shook him by the hand. So did Glatini. The Nakay battalion commander, who had listened to the boy interpreter as he translated Glatini's reply, now gave an order. A Bodoy laid down his rifle, came up to the captain and took a long cord of white nylon out of his pocket, a parachute rigging line. He forced his arms behind his back and tied his elbows and wrists together with infinite care. Glatini looked closely at the nake and it seemed to him that his half-closed eyes were like the slits in a visor through which someone far less master of himself was peering out at him. His triumph made him feel almost drunk. He would not be able to control himself much longer. He would have to burst out laughing or else strike him. But the slits in the visor closed and the Nake spoke softly. The Bodoy, who had picked his rifle up again, motioned to the Frenchman to follow him. For several hours Glatini trudged along trenches that were thigh deep in mud, moving against the current of the columns of busy, specialist termites. There were soldier termites, each with his palm fiber helmet adorned with the yellow star on a red ground male or female coolie termites dressed in black who trotted along under their Vietnamese yokes or taipanias. At one stage he passed a column carrying hot rice in baskets. All these termites looked indistinguishable, and their faces betrayed no expression of any sort, not even one of those primitive feelings that sometimes disrupt the inscrutability of Asiatic features, fear, contentment, hate or anger. Nothing. The same sense of urgency impelled them towards a common but mysterious goal which lay beyond the present fighting. This hive of sexless insects seemed to operate by remote control, as though somewhere in the depths of this enclosed world there was a monstrous queen, a kind of central brain which acted as the collective consciousness of the termites. Glatini now felt like one of those explorers invented by science fiction writers, who suddenly find themselves plunged by some sort of time machine into a monstrous bygone age or a still more ghastly world to come. He could hardly keep his balance in the mud. The sentry escorting him kept repeating, more len, more len, didi, didi. He was brought to a halt at an intersection between two communication trenches. The Bodoi had a word with the post commander, a young Vietnamese who wore an American webbing belt and carried a colt. He looked at the Frenchman with a smile that was almost friendly and asked. Do you know Paris? 
Glatini began to see the end of his nightmare. Of course. And the quartier Latin? I was a law student. I used to feed at Pere Louise in the Rue Descartes and often went to the Capulade for a drink. Glatini heaved a sigh. The time machine had brought him back to the world of today, next to this young Vietnamese who, at a few years interval, had haunted the same streets and frequented the same cafes as himself. Did gypsies in the Rue Cujas exist in your day? The Vietnamese asked him. I had some wonderful times there. There was a girl who used to dance there. And I felt she was dancing for no one but me. The Bodoi, who did not understand a word of this conversation, was getting impatient. The student with the colt lowered his eyes, then in a different, curt and unpleasant tone said to the Frenchman. You've got to move on now. Where are they taking me? I don't know. Couldn't you tell the Bodoi to loosen my fetters, my fingers are all numb. No, that can't be done. Thereupon he turned his back on Glatini. He had changed back into a termite and went off slithering in the deep mud. He would never escape from this sandhill, never again see the Luxembourg gardens in springtime or the girls with their skirts swirling round their thighs and a handful of books clutched under their arm. The prisoner and his escort moved on behind Beatrice, the Legion strong point commanding the northeastern exit from the Dean Bianfu Basin. Beatrice had fallen during the night of 13 to 14 March and the jungle was already beginning to invade the barbed wire entanglements and shattered shelters. As they emerged from the trench, a shell burst behind them. A solitary gun was still in action at General de Castries HQ and it was now trained on them. Without a pause they entered the dense forest covering the mountains. The path climbed in a straight line up the narrow ravine over which the tops of the giant silk cotton trees formed a thick canopy. Shelters had been cut out of the slope on either side of the path. Glatini caught a glimpse of some 120 caliber mortars drawn up in a neat row. They glistened faintly in the shadows, they were well oiled and, as a technician, he could not help admiring their maintenance. There were some men lounging about in undress uniform at the entrance to the shelters. They looked far taller than the average Vietnamese and each of them wore a medallion of Mao Tse Tung on his breast. This was 350 Division, the heavy division which had been trained in China. The intelligence department at Saigon had reported its arrival. There were smiles from the men as the captain went past. Perhaps they were hardly aware of him since he did not belong to their world. With his hands tied behind his back, Glatini could not walk properly and waddled from side to side like a penguin. He felt utterly exhausted and sank to the ground. The boat oil leant over him. Did he, more len, keep going, Titty? His tone of voice was patient, almost encouraging, but he did not lift a finger to help him. The soldiers outside the shelters were now succeeded by Nax dressed in black. In a patch of sunlight just above the path sat an old man eating his morning rice. Glatini had no sense of hunger, thirst, shame or anger, he was not even conscious of his weariness, he felt at the same time extremely old and as though he had just been born. But the heady smell of the rice unleashed an animal reaction in him. He had not eaten for five days and suddenly felt ravenous and cast a greedy eye on the mess tin. Any to spare? He asked the old man. The Nake bared his black teeth in a sort of smile and gave a nod. Glatini turned round to show him his fetters, whereupon the man rolled some rice up into a ball between his earth-stained fingers, carefully detached a sliver of dried fish and popped the lot into his mouth. But the soldier gave the captain a push and he had to set off again up the increasingly steep path. The sun emerged out of the morning mist, the forest was silent, dense and dark, like one of those dead calm lakes in the crater of a volcano. Glatini now began to understand why Boyce Führers had not tried to escape, why he wanted the experience. In his present plight Boyce Führers was the one who kept crossing his mind and not his superiors or his comrades. Like him he wanted to be able to speak Vietnamese, to lean across towards these soldiers and these coolies and ask them various questions. Why do you belong to the Viet Minh? Are you married? Do you know who the Prophet Marx is? 
Are you happy? What do you hope to get out of it? He had recovered his curiosity, he was no longer a prisoner. Glatini had reached the top of the hill. Through the trees he could now see the Dean Bianfu Basin and, a little to one side, under the eye of a sentry, a small group of figures, the survivors of the strong point. Boyce Furos was asleep in the ferns, Merle and Piniers were arguing together somewhat heatedly. Piniers was always inclined to be quick-tempered. They called out to him. Boyce Furos woke up and squatted down on his haunches like an ake. But the Bodoi urged Glatini on with the butt of his rifle. A short youngish man in a clean uniform stood in front of one of the shelters. He motioned him to come inside. The shelter was comfortable for a change, there was no mud. In the cool shadows, at a child-sized table, the officer caught sight of another short young man exactly like the first. He was smoking a cigarette. The packet on the table was almost full. Glatini longed for a smoke. Sit down, said the young man, speaking in the accent of the French lycee at Hanoi. But there was no chair. With his foot Glatini turned over a heavy American steel helmet which happened to be lying there and sat down on it, making himself as comfortable as he could. Your name? Glatini. The young man entered this in a sort of account book. Christian name? Jacques. Rank? Captain. Unit? I don't know. The V at laid his ballpoint pen down on the table, and took a deep puff at his cigarette. He looked ever so slightly disconcerted. President Ho Kimin, he pronounced the CH soft, as the French do, has given orders that all combatants and the civilian population should be lenient, he laid great stress on this word, towards prisoners of war. Have you been badly treated? Glatini got up and showed him his fettered wrists. The young man raised his eyebrows in surprise and gave a discreet order. The first little man appeared from behind a bivouac of brightly colored parachute material. He knelt down behind the captain and his nimble fingers undid the complicated knots. All at once the blood rushed back into his paralyzed forearms. The pain was unbearable. Glatini felt like swearing out loud, but the people in front of him were so well behaved that he controlled himself. The interrogation went on. You were captured at Marianne too. You were in command of the strong point. How many men did you have with you? I don't know. Are you thirsty? No. Then you must be hungry. You'll be given something to eat presently. I don't feel hungry either. Is there anything you need? If he had been offered a cigarette, Glatini would not have been able to refuse, but the Viet Minh did not do so. I feel sleepy, the captain suddenly said. I can understand that. It was a tough fight. Our soldiers are smaller and less strong than yours, but they fought with more spirit than you did because they're willing to lay down their lives for their country. You're now a prisoner of war and it's your duty to answer my questions. What was the strength of Marianne too? I've already given you my name, my Christian name, my rank, everything that belongs to me. The rest isn't mine to give and I know of no international convention that obliges officer prisoners to provide the enemy with information while their comrades are still fighting. Another heavy sigh from the Viet Minh. Another deep puff at his cigarette. Why do you refuse to answer? Why? Glatini was beginning to wonder himself. There must be some ruling on this matter in military regulations. Every eventuality is provided for in regulations, even what never comes to pass. Military regulations forbid a prisoner to give you information. So you only fought because military regulations obliged you to do so? Not only for that reason. In refusing to talk, then, perhaps you're abiding by your sense of military honor? You can call it that if you like. You have an extremely bourgeois conception of military honor. This honor of yours allows you to fight for the interests of the bloated colonials and bankers of Saigon, to massacre people whose only desire is peace and independence. You are prepared to wage war in a country which doesn't belong to you, an unjust war, a war of imperialist conquest. Your honor as an officer adjusts itself to this but forbids you to contribute to the cause of peace and progress by giving the information I request. 
Glatine's immediate reaction was typical of his class, he assumed an air of haughtiness. He was remote and disinterested, as though he was not personally involved at all, and slightly disdainful. The Viet Minh noticed this, his eyes glinted, his nostrils dilated and his lips curled over his teeth. His French education, Glatine reflected, must have weakened his perfect control over his facial expression. The Viet Minh had half risen from his seat. Answer. Didn't your sense of honor oblige you to defend the position you held to the last man? Why didn't you die defending the peak of your father's? For the first time in the conversation the Viet Minh had used an expression translated directly from Vietnamese into French, the peak of your father's for your ancestral land. This minor linguistic problem took Glatine's mind off the question of military honor. But the little man in green persisted. Answer. Why didn't you die defending your position? Glatine also wondered why. He could have done, but he had thrown the grenade at the Viet's. I can tell you, the Viet Minh went on. You saw our soldiers who looked puny and undersized advancing to attack your trenches, in spite of your artillery, your mines, your barbed wire entanglements and all the arms the Americans had given you. Our men fought to the death because they were serving a just and popular cause, because they knew, as we all know, that we have the truth, the only truth, on our side. That is what made our soldiers invincible. And because you didn't have these reasons, here you are alive, standing in front of me, a prisoner and vanquished. You bourgeois officers belong to a society which is out of date and polluted by the selfish interests of class. You have helped to keep humanity in the dark. You're nothing but obscurantists, mercenaries incapable of explaining what they are fighting for. Go on, then, try and explain. You can't, eh? We're fighting, my dear sir, to protect the people of Vietnam from communist slavery. Later on, when discussing this reply with Esclavier, Boyce Führers, Merle and Piniers, Glatine was forced to admit that he was not quite sure how it had occurred to him. In actual fact Glatine was only fighting for France, because the legal government had ordered him to do so. He had never felt he was there to defend the Terres Rouge's plantations or the Bank of Indochina. He obeyed orders, and that was that. But he had suddenly realized that this reason alone could not possibly seem valid to a communist. A few fleeting thoughts had flashed through his mind, some notions as yet undefined, Europe, the West, Christian civilization. These had occurred to him all at once and then he had had this idea of a crusade. Glatine had scored a direct hit. The narrowed eyes, the dilated nostrils, every feature of the funny little man now expressed nothing but pure, relentless hatred, and he had difficulty in speaking. I'm not a communist, but I believe that communism promises freedom, progress and peace for the masses. When he had recovered his self-control, he lit another cigarette. It was Chinese tobacco and had a pleasant smell of new mown hay. The Viet went on in the declamatory tone to which he seemed to be partial. Officer in the pay of the colonialists, you are for that very reason a criminal. You deserve to be tried for your crime against humanity and to be given the usual sentence, death. It was fascinating. Boyce Führers was absolutely right. A new world was being revealed, one of the principles of which was. Whoever opposes communism is ipso facto a war criminal beyond the pale of humanity, he must be hanged like those who were tried at Nuremberg. Are you married? The Viet Minh asked. Are your parents alive? Any children? A mother? Think of their grief when they learn that you have been executed. Because they can't imagine, can they, that the martyred people of Vietnam will pardon their torturers? They will mourn their dead husband, their son their father. The act was becoming tiresome and in poor taste. The Viet Minh fell silent for a moment to fill his soul with compassion for this poor French family in mourning, then went on. But President Ho knows that you are sons of the French people who have been led astray by the American colonialists and imperialists. The French people is our friend and fights by our side in the camp of peace. 
President Ho who knows this has asked the civilian population and combatants of Vietnam to stifle their righteous anger towards the prisoners and to apply a policy of leniency. In the Middle Ages, Glatini reflected, they used this same word apply, but in a different context. We shall take good care of you, you'll get the same rations as our soldiers. You'll also be taught the truth. We shall re-educate you by means of manual labor, which will enable you to amend your bourgeois education and redeem your life of idleness. That is what the people of Vietnam will give you as a punishment for your crimes, the truth. But you must repay this generosity by complying with all our orders. Glatini liked the commissar better when he was carried away by his hatred, for by restoring his normal reactions this hatred at least made him human. When he became smarmy and sanctimonious like this, he frightened and at the same time fascinated him. This sad little man, who hovered about like a ghost in clothes several sizes too large for him and who spoke about truth with the vacant gaze of a prophet, plunged him back into the termite nightmare. He was one of the antennae of the monstrous brain which wanted to reduce the world to a civilization of insects rooted in their certainty and efficiency. The voice went on. Captain Glatini, how many men did you have with you in your position? I feel sleepy. We could easily find out simply by counting the dead and the prisoners, but I would rather you told me. I feel sleepy. Two soldiers came in and one again tied up the captain's arms, elbows, wrists and fingers. They did not forget the running noose round his neck. The political commissar looked at the bourgeois officer with disdain. Glatini, the name reminded him of something. He was suddenly brought back to the Hanoi LIC. He had read the name somewhere in the history of France. There was a famous war leader called Glatini, a man of murder, rape and passion, who had been made a constable by the king and who had died for his royal master. The sad young man was not only part of the Viet Minh, a cog in an immense machine. All his recollections as a little yellow boy bullied by his white schoolfellows flooded back into his mind and brought him out in a sweat. He could now humiliate France right back to her remote past and he was so afraid that this Glatini might not be a descendant of the constables, which would balk him of this strange triumph, that he refused to ask him. Captain, he declared, because of your attitude all your colleagues who were taken prisoner with you will likewise be tied up and they'll know that they owe this to you. The guards dragged Glatini off to a deep ravine in the heart of the jungle. There was a hole there, six feet long, two feet wide, three feet deep, a classical foxhole which could easily serve as a grave. One of the guards checked his fetters, then stood him over the hole. The other loaded his submachine gun. Did he? Did he, more Len. Glatini took a pace forward and lowered himself into the trench. He lay stretched out on his numb and fettered arms. Above him the sky looked particularly clear through the foliage of the tall trees. He closed his eyes, to die or else to sleep. Next morning they hauled him off and shackled him to his comrades. The man in front of him was Sergeant Mansard who kept repeating. We don't hold it against you, you know, sir and to reassure him, he began talking through clenched teeth about Boulogne Billancourt where he was born, about a dance hall on the banks of the Seine adjoining a gas station. He used to go there every Saturday with girls whom he knew well since he had been brought up with them. But their pretty dresses, their lipstick suddenly gave them fresh confidence, which made him feel shy. When Glatini took command of the battalion, Mansard had not thought much of him. In the eyes of the ex-machinist he was nothing but a high-class gent from GHQ Saigon. Now, with clumsy tact, the NCO tried to make him see that he regarded him as being on his side and that he was proud his captain had not bowed his head before the little apes. He rolled over towards Mansard and his shoulder brushed the sergeants. Thinking he was cold, Mansard pressed up against him. 2. Captain Esclavier's Self-Examination stretched out in the paddy field, where the mud mingled with the flattened stubble. The ten men huddled close together. Every so often they dozed off, woke up with a start in the damp night, then sank back again into their nightmares. Esclavia held on to Lieutenant Lescure by his webbing belt. Lescure was raving, he might have got up and started walking straight ahead, 
giving that yell of his, they're attacking, they're attacking. Send over some chickens. Some ducks. He would not have obeyed the Viet Minh sentry who told him to stop and would have got himself shot. Les Q was quite calm at the moment, every so often he give a little whimper, like a puppy. In the depths of the darkness a jeep could be heard slithering along the muddy track, its engine laboring, racing and fading in jerks. It sounded rather like a fly in a closed room knocking against the window panes. The engine stopped, but Esclavier who had woken up waited hopefully for the familiar noise to start up again. Diddy, diddy, more len. The sentry's words of command were accompanied by a few mild and lenient blows with the butt of his rifle, which set the shapeless mass of prisoners in motion. But a voice now addressed them in French. On your feet. Get up. You've got to come and push a jeep of the Vietnam People's Army. The tone was patient, certain of being obeyed. The words were distinct, the pronunciation surprisingly and at the same time disturbingly perfect. Lakem struggled to his feet with a sigh and the rest followed suit. Esclavia knew that Lakem would always be the first to display obedience and eagerness, that he would turn the other flabby, baby pink cheek to curry favor with the guards. He would be the model prisoner to the point of turning stool pigeon. He would flatter the Viets to earn a few privileges, but above all because they were now on top and because he always obeyed the stronger side. To excuse his attitude in the eyes of his comrades, he would try to make them believe that he was hoodwinking the jailers and exploiting them for the common good. Esclavia had known this type of man only too well in Math Horse and Camp. All the inmates there had had their individuality steeped in a bath of quicklime, and all that remained was the bare essentials. Those simplified creatures could then be put into one of three categories, the slaves, the wild ones and what Esclavier with a certain amount of scorn called the fine souls. Esclavier had been a wild one because he was anxious to survive. Lakem's true character was that of a slave, a boy who would not even steal from his master, who would never make a bid for freedom. But he wore the uniform of a French army captain and he had to be taught how to behave even if it killed him. A slim figure wearing a fiber helmet towered over Esclavier and the voice, which by dint of being so precise sounded disembodied, made itself heard again. Aren't you going to help your comrades push the jeep? No, Esclavier replied. What's your name? Captain Philippe Esclavier, of the French army. What's yours? I'm an officer of the People's Army. Why do you refuse to carry out my orders? It was not so much a reproach as the statement of an inexplicable fact. With the painstaking care of a conscientious but circumscribed schoolmaster the Viet Minh officer was trying to understand the attitude of the big child lying at his feet. Yet the method had been drummed into him in the training schools of communist China. First of all he had to analyze, then explain and finally convince. This method was infallible, it was part and parcel of the huge perfect whole which communism represents. It had succeeded with all the prisoners of Kaobang. The Viet bent over Esclavier and with a touch of condescension explained. President Ho Chi Minh has given orders for the People's Army of Vietnam to apply a policy of leniency towards all prisoners led astray by the imperialist capitalists. Les Cure made as if to wake up and Esclavier took a firmer grip on his belt. The lieutenant did not realize, and perhaps never would, that the French army had been defeated at Dien Bien Phu, if he woke up suddenly he would be capable of strangling the Viet Minh. The Canbo went on. You have been treated well, you will continue to be, but it's your duty to obey the orders of the Vietnamese people. In curt, ringing tones, imbued with violence, anger and irony, and seething with revolt, Esclavier replied for all to hear. We have been living in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam for only a few hours but we are already in a position to appreciate your policy of leniency. Instead of killing us off decently, you're letting us die from exhaustion and cold. And on top of this, you demand that we should be full of gratitude for good old President Ho and the People's Army of Vietnam. He'll get us all killed, the silly bastard, Lakem reflected. It was hard enough persuading him to surrender and now he's starting all over again. But all I ask is to understand this popular republic of theirs. That's the only line to take, 
now that it's all over and we can't do a thing about it. Esclavia did not stop there. This time, fortunately, he spoke for himself. I refuse to push the jeep. You can look upon that as my personal choice. I would rather be killed on the spot than die by slow degrees, demean myself and perhaps become corrupted in your narrow universe. So please be good enough to give the orders to finish me off straight away. That's done it, Lakem said to himself. A couple of sentries will force him to his feet with their rifle butts, drag him off to the nearest ravine and put a bullet through his head that will put an end to Captain Esclavier's insolence. But the Canbo did not lose his temper, he was beyond anger. I'm an officer in the People's Army of Vietnam. I have to see that President Ho's orders are properly carried out. We are poor, we haven't many medical facilities or clothing or rice. First of all we've got to provide our own combatants with supplies and ammunition. But you will be treated in the same way as the men of our people in spite of your crimes against humanity. President Ho has asked the people of Vietnam to forgive you because you have been led astray and I shall give orders to the soldiers guarding you. This speech was so impersonal, so mechanical, that it suggested the voice of an old priest saying mass. Less cure, who was once a choir boy and had just woken up, responded quite naturally, Amen. Then he burst out into a long strident laugh which ended up in a sort of breathless panting. My comrade has gone mad, said Esclavia. The Viet Minh had a primitive horror of madmen, of whom it is said that the Marquis have devoured their brain. The people's democracy and the declarations of President Ho were of no more avail to him. The darkness was suddenly thronged with all the absurd phantoms of his childhood, with that seething populace that inhabits the waters, the earth and the heavens and never leaves man alone and in peace for an instant. The Marquis slipped through the mouths of children, they tried to steal the souls of the dead. He was frightened but, so as not to show his fear. He said a few words to one of the sentries and went back to his jeep. He switched on the engine, the prisoners all round him started to push. The wheels lifted out of the ditch, the engine started purring, all the Marquis of Darkness were exorcised forthwith by the reassuring sound of the machine, that brutal music of Marxist society. Did he, said the sentries, as they led the prisoners back, now you can sleep. The Marquis had devoured Les Cure's brain. During the week before the surrender the lieutenant had not stopped taking Maxiton pills, which were included with the rations, and had eaten very little proper food. Les Cure had a thin, lanky body, blotchy skin and lacklustre hair. There was nothing to qualify him for an army career. But he was the son of a colonel who had been killed on the Loire in 1940. One of his brothers had been executed by the Germans and another was condemned to a wheelchair ever since receiving a shell burst in the spinal column at Casino. Unlike his father and two brothers, all robust military animals, Yves Lescure delighted in a mild form of anarchy. He was fond of music, the companionship of friends, old books with fine bindings. As a token of loyalty to the memory of his father, he had gone to Coetquid and school and of those two years spent in the damp marshes of Brittany, among somewhat limited but efficient and disciplined creatures, he retained a depressing memory of an endless succession of practical jokes and inordinate physical effort. This had left him with the impression that he would never be equal to a task for which he had such little inclination. But to please the casualty of Casino, to enable him to go on living in the war through the medium of himself, he had volunteered for Indochina and, without any preliminary training, had dropped into Dean Bianfu, a feat that his disabled brother would have longed to perform had he been able. Lieutenant Lescure had derived little pleasure from the experience. Esclavier had seen him come down on one of those wonderful evenings that occur just before the rainy season, looking like a bundle of bones in his uniform, having forgotten his personal weapon, and with an expression of utter bewilderment on his face. The heavy Viet Minh mortars were pounding away at Veronique too and the clouds drifting low in the overcast sky were fringed with gold-like gypsy shawls. He had reported to Esclavier, Lieutenant Lescure, sir. Dropping his haversack at his feet, a haversack containing books but no change of clothing, he had looked up at the sky. Beautiful, isn't it? 
Esclavia, who had no time for daydreamers, had curtly replied. Yes, very beautiful indeed. The parachute battalion holding this position, of which I am in command, was six hundred strong a fortnight ago, there are now ninety of us left. Out of twenty-four officers, only seven are still in a condition to fight. Lescure had apologized at once. I know I'm not a paratrooper, I haven't much talent for this sort of warfare, I'm clumsy and inefficient, but I'll try to do my best. Lescure who was scared stiff of not being able to do his best had taken to max it on a few days later. He had taken part in every attack and counter-attack, more oblivious than courageous, living in a sort of secondary state of consciousness. One night he had gone off into no man's land to rescue a sergeant major who had been wounded in the legs. Why did you do that? The captain had asked him. My brother would have done it, only he can't any longer. By myself. I couldn't even have attempted it. Your brother? And Lescure had explained quite simply that it was not himself who was at Dean Bianfu, but his brother Paul who was wheeled round Ren in an invalid chair. His courage was Paul's, but the clumsiness, the sunsets, the fear, those were all his own. Since then the captain had begun to keep an eye on him, as the NCOS and privates in his company had already done for some time. For Veronique, as for all the other positions that were still holding out, the ceasefire had come into effect at 1700 hours. It was then Lescure had collapsed, yelling. Quick, some ducks, some chickens. They're attacking. Esclavia had continued to keep an eye on him. In the middle of the night they were woken up and had to abandon the half-light of the paddy field for the pitch-black darkness of the forest. They followed a path through the jungle. Branches kept lashing their faces, the slimy earth slid from under their feet or else suddenly swelled into a hard mound against which they barked their shins. They had the impression they were going round and round in an endless circle. Did he, more then, the sentries kept shouting. The darkness began to fade. They emerged at first light into the Muongfan Basin. Esclavia recognized the figure of Boyce Führers outside the first hut. They had untied his hands, in a bamboo pipe he was smoking some Thuaclau, a very strong tobacco which was cured in molasses. A sentry had given it to him after he had exchanged a joke or two with him in his own dialect. Want some? Boyce Führers asked in his rasping voice. Esclavia took a few puffs which were so harsh that they made him cough. Lescure started yelling his war cry. Some chickens, some ducks and he made a rush at a sentry to grab his weapon. Esclavia held him back just in time. What's the matter with him? Boyce Führers asked. He's gone off his head. And you're acting as his nurse? Sort of. Where are you quartered? In the hut with some of the others. I'll join you. Lescure had calmed down and Esclavia held him by the hand like a child. I'll bring Lescure with me. I can't leave him on his own. During the last fortnight this choir boy, this wet rag, has surpassed even himself. He has performed more acts of courage than the rest of us put together, and do you know why? To please a cripple who lives ten thousand miles away and won't ever know a thing about it. Is that good enough for you? And it's to save his skin that you didn't try and escape? There's nothing to stop me now, the others will take care of less cure. We might have a go at it together. The jungle's your home ground. I remember the lectures you gave us when we were due to be dropped into Laos during the Japanese occupation. You used to say, the jungle is not for the strongest, but for the wiliest, the one with most stamina, the man who can keep his head. And we all knew you said this from personal experience. Have you got any plan in mind? I've all sorts of ideas, but I'm not going to try to escape at least not yet. If I didn't know you, I'd say you were afraid of it. But I've no doubt you're thinking up some wild cat scheme or other in your complicated Chinaman's brain. I didn't realize you were at Dean Bianfu. What were you up to there? I thought you would never have anything to do with that sort of pitched battle. I had started something up north, on the border of Yan'an. Something that was liable to annoy the Chinese. 
it misfired. I withdrew to Dean Bianfu on foot. The same sort of harebrained wheeze as your pirate junks in the Bay de Long, in which you planned to go marauding up the coast of Hainan? This time it was something to do with leper colonies. Esclavier burst out laughing. He was glad to have run into Boyce Furos again, barefoot in the mud and surrounded by the Bodois, but as completely at ease as he had been the year before on the rickety bridge of a heavy junk with purple sails, in charge of a band of pirates recruited from the remnants of the armies of Chiang Kai-shek. Another of his harebrained schemes had been to arm the Chin and Naga headhunters of Burma and launch them against the rear of the Japanese army. Boyce Furos who was then serving in the British Army had been one of the few survivors of this operation and had been awarded the DSO. Boyce Furos was the man he needed to accompany him on his escape. He was full of resource, a good walker, used to the climate, and acquainted with the languages and customs of a good number of the tribes in the Oat region. Come on, let's have a try at it together. No, Esclavia, I'm all for waiting. I'd advise you to as well. I can't. I once spent two years in a concentration camp and in order to survive I was reduced to do certain things which horrify me every time I think of them. I swore I would never allow myself to be in a position where I would have to do them again. Esclavia had squatted down at Boyce Furose's feet and with a sliver of bamboo involuntarily began tracing some figures which were the mountains, others which were the rivers, and a long sinuous line running between the rivers and the mountains, which was his proposed escape route. No, he could not start being a prisoner all over again. The first mission which Esclavia carried out as a cadet had occurred without a hitch. He retained a fond recollection of his parachute jump by night. It was in the month of June and he had had the impression of being buried alive among the tall grass and wild flowers of sinking deep into the rich scented soil of France. There were three men waiting for him, terrain peasants, who conducted him and his wireless operator to a big manor house. There they settled them into a lumber room above a barn. From this hideout they could keep the main road under observation and instantly report the movements of the German convoys. Runners came in from the neighborhood of Nantes with messages and information, which had to be encoded and transmitted. Neither Esclavia nor the wireless operator was allowed to leave the house but all the scents of spring were wafted into their attic. A merry servant girl, a little animal with lively gestures and rosy cheeks, brought them their meals, sometimes a bunch of flowers, and always some delicious fruit. One afternoon Philippe put his arms round her, she did not struggle but returned his kisses with clumsy ardor. He arranged to meet her in the barn below, they met. In the heady smell of the hay, with their ears pricked for the slightest noise, like animals lying in wait, they clumsily embraced and were suddenly carried off by the raging torrent of their desire. From time to time a bat on its starting flight would brush against their intertwined bodies. Philippe could feel the girl's loins tremble beneath his hands and a fresh surge of desire overwhelmed him. When he climbed back to the lumber room, limp with fatigue and with the smell of the crushed straw and their lovemaking fresh in his nostrils, the wireless operator handed him a signal, it was an order for him to liquidate a neighbor agent, a Belgian passing himself off as a refugee, who had been taken on as an agricultural laborer in a number of farms. The peasants were chatterboxes, they loved to talk about what they were doing and hinted that their barns were not only used for the purpose of storing hay. Three of them had just been arrested and shot. This they owed to the Belgian in the Abwehr. The wireless operator was also keen on the servant girl and jealous of Philippe's success. He sniggered. All on one day, bloodshed, ecstasy and death. The wireless operator was an educated man, a lecturer at Edinburgh University. The Belgian was working on a neighboring farm, after supper his employer asked him in for a drink to give the two other farmhands time to dig a grave behind the dung heap. Philippe waited by the door of the living room, hugging the wall. He had butterflies in the stomach and his dagger felt slippery in his sweaty palm. He would never be able to kill the Belgian. How had he managed to get mixed up in this damned business? He should have listened to his father and stayed behind with him, sheltered by his books instead of playing at hired assassins. 
The man came stumbling out, impelled by a shove from the owner of the farm. He had his back turned to Philippe, who sprang forward and buried the dagger between his shoulder blades, as he had been taught during his commando training. But the blow lacked sufficient strength. Philippe had to repeat it several times over while the peasant sat astride the man's waist to prevent him from fighting back. A filthy butchery. They emptied the Belgian's pockets. Orders had been given for his papers to be sent back to London. Then they tipped the body into the hole by the dung heap. Philippe went and vomited behind a low wall. Bloodshed, ecstasy and death. When he got back to the farm he caught the wireless operator in the act of fornicating with the servant girl. In the arms of this ginger-headed runt, she was heaving the same size of pleasure as she had with him an hour or two before. At first his feelings were hurt but he resolved to be cynical about it and came to an arrangement with the operator whereby they each made use of the girl in turn. Philippe Esclavia succeeded on his second mission, which he carried out on his own but was arrested before he could even embark on his third. He had been dropped in with Staff Sergeant Budin. The Germans, who had got wind of the operation, were waiting for them on the ground. Budin, who landed in a stream, managed to escape, but Philippe had a pair of handcuffs snapped round his wrists before he was even able to unfasten his parachute harness and draw his revolver. He was conducted forthwith to the prefecture at Rennes and brought before the Gestapo. After being tortured, he had been deported to Mathhorsen camp. In his barrack room there was a skinny little Jew without family or country who had sided with the communists for some sort of protection. That was what had saved him from the gas chamber. His name was Michel Weil. The communist organization within the camp had entrusted him with the task of obtaining information on the newcomer. He's a free French agent from London who was dropped in by parachute, Weil had reported one evening to the man responsible for that particular barrack room, a certain Fournier. Then he may as well be left on the list of the detachment that's leaving for the salt mines. Weil had warned the newcomer. Esclavia had then gone to Fournier and told him that he was the son of the Front Populaire professor. Fournier had been staggered. The name of Esclavia was still held in great repute among the left and extreme left wing. But so as not to show his surprise, he had replied. The socialists are a soft bourgeois lot. If you want us to help you, you'll have to join our ranks, the communists. Philippe Esclavia had agreed to this and his name had been taken off the list. But during the whole of his captivity he had continued to serve the communists who constituted the only efficient hierarchy in the camp. What they demanded of him sometimes defied all the rules of the accepted moral code. As a communist, he might have considered himself absolved by reason of the higher interests of the cause for which he was fighting. But he had never been a communist, he had only cheated in order to survive, all he had been was a dirty bastard. Boyce Furose's harsh grating voice brought him back to the Muong Fan Basin. Daydreaming, Esclavia? It's not good for a prisoner to take refuge in the past. He loses his grip, goes into a decline. Come on, I'll show you where we hang out. Esclavia and the new arrivals reached the huts and sank down onto the bamboo bunks. They heaved a sigh of well-being. It was dry, clean and warm. Glatini had propped himself up on his elbows as Esclavia came in. Hello, he said to himself. Here's that proud brute without his dagger or his long barreled colt. And without rasp a guy for once. Esclavia had recognized Glatini. He bowed slightly from the waist with the affected elegance of a man of the world. Hello, it's you, my dear fellow. How's the C. in C? And his daughter, that dear girl Martine? Glatini reflected that some day or another he would have to bash Esclavia's face in but that this was hardly the moment. He had almost done so one evening in Saigon, when he had prevented Martine, the general's daughter, from going out with the captain. Esclavia would have made her drink too much and maybe taken her to an opium den, then he would have slept with her, and next morning he would have laughed in her face like the big hoodlum he was. Glatini fell back on his bunk and Esclavia went and lay down close at hand. All the same. I was surprised. The paratrooper went on, 
not to say extremely surprised, that you should have come and joined us. Meaning what? Meaning that you're not just a GHQ puppet or the duenna of the dear Martin, but also. Yes? But also perhaps. An officer. Esclavia sprang to his feet and went to fetch Lescure who was standing stock still with a vacant expression in his eyes and his arms swinging loosely by his side. With infinite care, not to say gentleness, Esclavia made him lie down and placed a kit bag under his head. He's raving, he said. He's lucky, he doesn't realize that the French army has been beaten by a handful of little yellow dwarfs because of the stupidity and inertia of its leaders. And you yourself must have felt this so strongly, Glatini, that you abandoned them and came and joined us, ready to commit yourself in our company. Lescure sat up with a start and, stretching out his hand, began burbling. Here they come, here they come, all green like caterpillars. They're swarming all over the place, they're going to eat us up. Quick, for Christ's sake, some chickens, some ducks. And while you're about it, why not some partridges, also some thrushes, some pheasants and some hares. We've got to let fly with everything we've got, to crush the caterpillars which are going to devour the whole wide world. Immediately afterwards he fell asleep and his face was once more the face of the dreamy, immature adolescent who liked Mozart and the simplest poets. And from the depths of his madness there came to him the opening bars of Ein Clean Nacht music. Daylight had transformed the absurd, hostile world of the previous night and the smell of hot rice rose in the still morning air. The prisoners, who now numbered thirty or so, were gathered round a basket of woven bamboo full of snow white rice steaming gently in the sun. Some tea had been poured out for them in empty bully beef tins, but this was simply an infusion of guava leaves. A few mouthfuls of rice sufficed to appease their hunger now that their stomachs had shrunk so much. The Bodois ate the same rice and drank the same tea. They appeared to have forgotten their victory in order to commune together in this elementary rite. The sun rose higher and higher in the pewter-colored sky, the glare became painful, the heat suffocating. Somewhere in the distance an aircraft dropped a stick of bombs. The war's still on, Biniers remarked with satisfaction. With his large paw he kept squashing the mosquitoes on his red-tufted chest. He looked at a sentry as though he longed to strangle him, that skinny neck was a temptation. The war was still on. Unconsciously, the Bodois stiffened and resumed their surly attitude. The morning's truce had come to an end. Lakem had gone off with a big handful of rice wrapped up in a banana leaf, which he tried to hide. With a nudge of his elbow Esclavia made him drop the rice, which fell in the mud. It's my rice, after all. Lakem began to whine. Try and behave yourself in the future. A sentry had angrily advanced on the paratroop captain, lifting his rifle butt to strike him, then he had held back, the slogan of the policy of leniency had deterred him just in time. He now drew the other soldier's attention to the spilled rice and jabbered furiously. Esclavia gathered he was saying something about colonialism and the people's rice. Glatini could not help admiring his comrade for having tried to impose a certain standard of behavior on the group. Then he relapsed into his daydream and strove to remember, he had been a prisoner for two days, so it was now the 8th of May. What would Claude be doing back in Paris? She loved the smells of the markets and the color of the fruit. He pictured her stopping for a moment in front of a stall in the Rue de Passy. Marie was with her, because, in the eyes of the old cook, she had never grown up and was still incapable of managing her life by herself. Claude thrust her bottom lip out slightly and in her low distinguished voice politely asked the prices. And Marie buzzed about behind her. I've got some money, my lady, let me see to it. Claude turned round towards her. But, Marie, supposing I can't pay you back, there's still no news of the captain. I'll stay on. I'll take some job or other in a restaurant. For once they'll get some decent food. The children belong to me just as much as to you." The wart above Marie's lip quivered with indignation. A newspaper boy went past shouting out the latest bulletin, Dean Bianfu fallen, 
no news of the 7,000 prisoners or 3,000 casualties. The little countess with the doe-like eyes suddenly turned aside and started weeping silently. The passers-by stared at her in astonishment. Marie rounded on them with rage in her heart, she felt like burying her teeth in them and shouting in their faces that at this very moment her captain was dead. Or perhaps even worse off. In the afternoon they watched the arrival of the 300 officers who had been taken prisoner at Dean Bianfu. Those who were on the staff or who had been captured at General de Castries HQ had had time to make a few preparations. They all wore clean uniforms and their haversacks contained a change of clothing and provisions. They gave the impression that their presence there, amongst all the others, was only by mistake. Suddenly Raspegai's powerful voice rang out. He had just caught sight of one of his officers, in a dirty vest and with a filthy bandage round his leg, tied up to a tree because he had jostled a sentry of the people's army. You bastards! What about the rules of war? What do you think you're doing, tying my men up like prize pigs being taken to market? Raspegai was suddenly beginning to find some use for the rules of war which he himself had never observed. On occasion he had been known to conclude his orders with a brief injunction, don't be too inhuman. In actual fact he always wrote out his directives after the operations were over and exclusively for the benefit of his superiors. He was followed by General de Castries, downcast because he had not been able to die and pass into the realm of legend. His cheeks were sunken, his features drawn and the khaki bush shirt which hung on his shoulders looked several sizes too big for him. He wore the red forage cap of the Moroccan Spahis and a third regiment scarf. Behind him came Moustache, his Batman, a huge Berber whiskered like a janissary. The general had reached a little stream of clear water flowing between muddy banks at the foot of the camp. The Vietnamese believed this water could kill. It had needed communism and war to induce them to venture into these ghost mountains with clear flowing rivers. Moustache had seventeen years service behind him and knew his job. From his haversack he brought out a clean, well-pressed uniform, bush shirt and trousers, and a leather toilet case. Castries took off the shirt he was wearing. He heard a noise behind him and turned round. It was Glatini. They had known each other for a long time and their families had intermarried at various stages. The general lisped with great distinction and detachment. Athew thee, old boy, it's all over. Yesterday, at Theventeen Hundred Hours, I gave the order to thief fire. Marianne four fell at nine in the morning. The Vieth were strung out along the river to the E. Arthed. There was nothing left but the literal strong point with three thousand wounded piling up in the dugout, not to mention the corpses. I reported to Hanoi at sixteen thirty hours. Navarre had left for Teigen and I got on to Cogni who told me, whatever happens, no white flag, but you're at liberty to take any decision you can find or fit. Do you still think a breakout sympathable? It's crazy. They never realized what was going on. They must find a solution at Geneva. In three months who'll be relieved? It was curious how this word Geneva seemed suddenly fraught with hope. Glatini repeated it under his breath and found there was something magical about the very sound. The general finished shaving. He handed his shaving brush still covered in lather to Glatini, who suddenly realized how dirty and stubbly he was and to what extent he had forgotten how important personal appearance is to a cavalryman. In 1914 cavalry officers used to shave before going into action. In modern warfare all those rights were ludicrous, it was not enough to be well born, smart and clean, first of all you had to win. I'll soon be thinking exactly like Raspegai and Esclavia, the captain said to himself. But Castries was already passing him his razor and metal shaving mirror. Im. Im. The sentry behind them yelled. Silence forbidden you speak to general. Castries paid no attention to this interruption. You see, all the divisions we were containing at Dean Bianfu will now pour down into the delta which is rotten through and through. Hanoi is liable to be surrounded before the rains start. Im. Im. The sentry was getting impatient. We'll have to come to terms. 
the Americans could have intervened before, now it's too late. Glatini was enjoying the feel of the lather on his face, the gliding of the razor over his skin. He had the sensation of shedding a mask and being able to resume his own identity at last. A cambo, an officer or under officer with the offensive accent of a brothel attendant, brusquely interrupted them. No talking with General, you there, rejoin comrades at once, more len. Glatini had finished shaving. Castries handed him his toothbrush and his tube of toothpaste, but he did not have time to use them, urged on by his superior, the sentry gave him a shove. He rejoined his comrades, Boyce Führers, who was eavesdropping on the Bodoy's conversation, Esclavier and Raspegar looking strangely alike, each with the same lean, wiry body and unruffled expression, and the same slight tension in every muscle. Raspegar grinned pleasantly. So you managed to find one of your own sort again? The prisoners remained in the Muong Fan Basin for a couple of weeks. They were split up into separate teams and that was how Captains Glatini, Esclavia, Boyce Führers and Lakem, and Lieutenants Merle, Biniers and Lescure found themselves condemned to live together for several months. They were presently joined by another lieutenant, an Algerian called Mamoudi. Withdrawn and silent, he prayed twice a day facing in the direction of Mecca. Boyce Führers noticed that he made several mistakes and prostrated himself out of time. He therefore inquired. Have you always said your prayers? Mamoudi looked at him in astonishment. No, not since I was a child. I only began again after being taken prisoner. Boyce Führers peered at him with his almost colorless eyes. I should like to know the reasons for your renewed fervor, a purely personal interest, I assure you. If I told you, sir, that I did not know myself, or at least did not know exactly, and that you wouldn't enjoy hearing what I feel. I don't mind hearing anything. Well, it seems to me that this defeat at Dean Bianfu, where you he laid particular emphasis on the you, have been beaten by one of your former colonies, will have considerable repercussions in Algeria and will be the blow which will sever the last links between our two countries. Now, Algeria cannot exist apart from France, she has no past, no history, no great men, she has nothing except a different religion from yours. It's through our religion that we shall be able to start giving Algeria a history and a personality. And just so as to be able to say you Frenchmen, you prostrate yourself twice a day in prayer which is absolutely meaningless. More or less, I suppose. But I should have liked, even in this defeat, to be able to say we Frenchmen. You people never let me. And now? Now it's too late. Mamoudi appeared to think the matter over. He had a long narrow head with a determined jaw, a slightly hooked nose and tranquil eyes, and his fringe of black beard trimmed into a point made him look like the popular conception of a Barbary pirate. No, perhaps it isn't too late, but something will have to be done quickly, unless of course a miracle occurs. You don't believe in miracles? In your schools they made a point of destroying whatever sense of wonder or belief in the impossible I had. Mamoudi continued to pray to a god in whom he no longer believed. Glatini also fell into the habit of kneeling down and praying twice a day to his god, but he had faith and this was manifestly clear. Lieutenant Colonel Raspagai, who felt ill at ease with the senior officers, came and joined them whenever he could. He was only really in his element among the subalterns, captains and NCOS he always went barefoot, by way of training, he claimed with a view to further operations. But he never mentioned what sort of operations. He would sit on the edge of a bunk and trace mysterious figures on the earth floor with a sliver of bamboo. Occasionally he would burst out. Why the hell did they have to dump us in this damned basin? Christ Almighty, it's unthinkable. On one occasion Glatini tried to put forward the high command theory that Dean Bianfu was the key to the whole of Southeast Asia and had been from time immemorial. Listen, Raspagai said to him, you're quite right to stand up for your lord and master, but now you're with us, on our side, and you don't owe him anything more. Dean Bianfu was a foul up. The proof of it is, we lost. 
Sometimes the colonel would go up to Les Cure and then turn round to Esclavier and ask. How's your crackpot? Any better? He regarded his favorite captain with a certain amount of distrust and wondered if he was only looking after the madman the better to prepare his escape, his midnight flit, without even letting him know. At the time of the surrender Aspegai had wanted to attempt one last breakout, he had been refused permission. He had then assembled his red berries and told them. I'm granting every one of you your liberty. It's every man for himself from now on. I, Raspagai, am not prepared to be in command of prisoners. Esclavier was facing him at the time and the colonel had seen that peculiar glint in his eyes. So you're giving me my liberty, are you? Well, you'll see if I don't take advantage of it. And all by myself. If he had had a son, he would have wanted him to be like the captain, as tough as they come, prickly and unmanageable, with a strong sense of comradeship, and so crammed with medals and feats of arms that if he had not curbed him a little he would have had even more than himself. He went up to Esclavier and laid a hand on his shoulder. Philippe, don't be a damn fool. The war's not over yet, not by a long shot, and I'll be needing you. It's every man for himself, sir, you said so yourself. We'll have a go at it together later on, when we're ready, when everything's right for it. On the third morning, while the prisoners were still at Muong Fun, it began to rain. Water began to drip through the thatch onto their bunks. Lakem woke up and remarked that he was hungry. Then, turning round, he noticed that Esclavier's place was empty. He felt there was something wrong and opened the haversack in which he had hidden six tins of baked beans. There were three missing. He woke up the others. Someone's stolen my rations. I'd put them aside. For all of us. Just in case. Esclavia must have taken them, he's run out on us. Pipe down, Boyce Führers quietly said. He's decided to try his luck. We'll keep his absence concealed as long as we can. Glatini had come up to them. He didn't take all the tins? Almost all, said Lakem, whose flabby cheeks were quivering. He didn't want to load himself down. Yet I advised him to take the whole haversack. But. Didn't you say you put those tins aside for all of us? Well, one of us needed them particularly badly. Pinyers was furious. He turned to Merle. Esclavia might have let us know, we could have gone with him. But you know what he's like, absolutely uncooperative, always does things on his own and trusts no one but himself. Mamoudi, sitting cross-legged on his bunk, did not budge. He did not even try to get out of the way of the water dripping down onto his neck. Lescu was quietly singing a strange little ditty about a garden in the rain and a boy and a girl who loved each other but did not realize it. The storm had broken in the middle of the night and it had suddenly turned as black as pitch, while the thunder rolled round the valley like a salvo of artillery. Two or three flashes of lightning ripped across the sky. Esclavier had leapt to his feet and crept up to Boyce Führers's bunk. Boyce Führers. What? I'm off. You're mad. I can't stand it any longer. This storm, you see, there was a storm like this during my journey from Kempken to Mathhorsen. There was a moment when I could have jumped out of the train through a badly fastened window in the carriage, but I waited in the hope of a more favorable opportunity. You're a damned fool. Can I help you in any way? This is my plan, if I head due south I can reach the Mio village above Bamushio in a couple of nights. I once had a look round that part of the country, and the Mios were always friendly. They're related to Tubai, the headman of Xenguang. They'll give me a guide. By following the crests of the mountains I'll be able to reach the Nambak Valley in a fortnight or so and that's where the operational base of the Kriveko column should be. If it isn't there, I'll push on to Muongsei. The Mios between the Namu and Muongsei are all on our side. They're not, they're against us. You're wrong. Last February they evacuated all the survivors of the 6th Laotian Light Infantry, including the wounded, right through the 308 division lines. The Viets may hold the valleys, but the Mios hold the heights. That was in February. 
Since then the Viets have overrun the highlands and conscripted the Mios. Your plan's feasible, but there are the Viets to reckon with, the whole Viet Minh world, Viet Minh organization, the Viet Minh intelligence service. It can't be true. No Mio has ever served any master except his own fantasy and has never been known to betray a guest. Glutini, who had woken up and heard them whispering together, came over and joined them. I'm off, Esclavia told him. I'd be grateful if you would look after Les Cure for me. Can I come with you? Impossible. There's only the remotest chance of success, even for one man on his own. Boyce Furos doesn't think I'll get away with it, and he may be right. Have you got any provisions? No. Without a sound Glatini went and got Lakem's kit bag. This might come in useful. That fat swine won't ever need it in an attempt to escape. Too heavy, said Esclavia. He only took three tins. Boyce Furos handed him a silver piester which he carried strapped to his leg by a band of adhesive tape. This is the only currency the Mios recognize. You'll either get yourself killed or be recaptured. Good luck. Esclavia gave him a tap on the shoulder. You were chasing her yourself, you old bastard, while pretending to defend her virtue. Just like the Viets. That was the best policy perhaps. Take good care of Les Cure, Glutini. He did something I could never have done, fought and showed courage for someone other than himself. Esclavia plunged out into the dark and was instantly soaked by the rain. There was a light flickering in the guard post hut. The guard post lay to the north, he would therefore have to move in the opposite direction and take cover in the jungle at once. Halt! The voice came out of the rain and the darkness. Esclavia replied. To buy, prisoner, very bad stomach. This was the password which enabled them to make the most of Viet Minh modesty and leave their huts at night, for the hygiene rule, which was one of the four rules of a soldier in the People's Army, decreed that the natural functions had to be performed in private. The sentry let him pass and Esclavia clambered up a slope. He was swallowed up at once in the jungle, the creepers were like tentacles that tried to wrap themselves round him, the thorns were like teeth that tried to tear him to shreds. It was impossible for him to maintain a straight course, there was only one idea in his mind, to keep climbing so as to reach the ridge. Once there, he would be able to take his bearings. Every now and then he almost collapsed from exhaustion, his eyelids felt like lead, he was tempted to lie down for a bit and go to sleep and resume his march a little later. But he remembered the window in the Kempken train, squared his shoulders and pushed on. He was right not to have waited any longer before escaping. He knew how quickly a man can lose his strength in a camp where the work is hard and the food insufficient, and how quickly he can lose his courage in the demoralizing company of grousers who are more or less resigned to their condition as prisoners. By daybreak he had reached the ridge and was able to rest. The valley no longer existed, it was lost in the mist. He was in the country of the Mios who live above the level of the clouds. In the legendary days of the Jade Emperors, the masters of the Ten Thousand Mountains, a dragon had come to China and laid waste the country. It had devoured the armies that were sent out against it and also the warriors clothed in their magic armor. The emperor had then made a promise that anyone who rid him of the dragon would be given his daughter's hand in marriage and half the kingdom. The big dog Mio had slain the dragon and came to claim his reward. The emperor was unwilling to keep his promise but he also feared the dog's strength. One of his counselors had then suggested a subterfuge. Admittedly, he had promised half of his kingdom to whoever slew the dragon, but he had not specified which half. Why not the upper half? As for the daughter, there was no problem. The emperor had a large number of them and spent most of his time begetting even more. Thus it was that the dog Mio was given the hand of the emperor's daughter in marriage and, as a dowry, all the land in the empire that lay above the level of the clouds. His descendants, the Mios, wore a silver dog collar in memory of him. They loved animals, lived in the highlands and, because they were after all descendants of the Jade Emperor, looked down on all the other races, especially the Vietnamese of the deltas. 
Esclavia was extremely fond of the Mios even though they were so dirty that their squat little bodies, with cuffs as thick as a Tibetan Sherpa's, were always jet black. They never mixed with the lowlanders, the servile and ingratiating ties, they admitted no social or family organization, some of them even declined all form of communal life. They kept to their mountain ridges, the last anarchists of the world. The sun blazed down. Esclavia began to feel thirsty. He kept following the ridge of the mountain and in the afternoon a fleet air arm course or flew over him very low. He waved at it wildly, but the pilot did not see him. In any case what could he have done? He had to push on, alone and unaided, and the thought of himself, lost in the midst of the elephant grass, his throat parched with thirst, was strangely beguiling. He bypassed the first Mio village he saw tucked away behind a mountain peak. He felt it was still too close to the Viet Minh's and to Dien Bien Phu. After a further three hours march he came across a ray, a section of the forest that had been burned down. In the cinders the Mio's had planted some hard rice, vegetables and poppies. There were four women there, dressed in rags, with panniers on their backs, barefoot, their feet looked almost monstrous with their calves encased in leggings. They were collecting vegetable marrows. Esclavia knew that he ought to push on farther, but he was at his last gasp, he felt terribly thirsty and it would soon be dark. He went up to the women. They did not look at all scared but uttered little guttural exclamations and turned their broad flat faces towards him. They smelt so dreadful that he was almost sick. It must be a question of habit, Esclavia said to himself. At Voronik too, towards the end, I was hardly conscious of the stench of the corpses. A male Mio appeared, with his silver collar round his neck and a primitive hunting bow in his hand. He was barefoot, his hair falling over his eyes, and wore a short jacket and black trousers. Esclavia did not know how to communicate with him. He showed him the silver piaster and the sullen face came to life. The captain went through the motions of eating, bent down, plucked a marrow and bit into it. It was juicy and full of flavor. Tiller, he said, cousin to Bai, village Bamushio. The Mio made a sign that he had understood and walked ahead. They kept going until it was dark. Tireless, the Mio trotted along hair-raising paths which invariably followed the line of the steepest slope. He had to stop and wait for the Frenchman every two hundred yards. At last they reached the village, a few thatch huts on low piles. The shaggy little mountain ponies, as tireless as their owners, stood with their heads inside the houses where the feeding troughs were, the rest of their bodies in the open. Tillo was there, indistinguishable from many of the others, a little older perhaps, a little more shriveled, fossilized by age and opium. He recognized Esclavia at once and bowed low before him in token of his friendship. The captain was saved, he felt like laughing. The Mios and the Highlands still belonged to the French. Boyce Furos was wrong, which was only to be expected since he did not know this region very well. The Mios had killed a suckling pig, it was roasting over the embers, exuding a delicious smell of grilled meat. The stodgy hot rice was spicy and dished up in little baskets. Esclavia knew the customs of the country. He rolled it into a ball between his fingers and popped it into his mouth after first dipping it in a red sauce. The flames in the hearth cast flickering shadows on the inside walls of the hut and red glints were reflected in the eyes of the horses as they snorted and shook their chains. Esclavia picked up a sliver of bamboo and, in the cinders in front of the fireplace, traced out the route he wanted to take to reach the Nam Bak Valley. Tiller miraculously seemed to understand and showed his approval by nodding his head. He then brought out a bottle of chum. The two men gulped down the crude rice wine and belched like a couple of Chinese merchants. Tiller suggested a pipe of opium, Esclavia refused with thanks. He was not used to the stuff and he was afraid he might be too tired to walk next day. Everyone said that Mio opium was the best that could be found in Southeast Asia. But a paratrooper never indulged in it, that particular vice was the prerogative of naval or staff officers. The Mios all smoked it, for them it took the place of tobacco and appeared to have no harmful effects. And so, 
while Tiller puffed at his pipe in the flickering light of the oil lamp and contentedly exhaled the thick pungent smoke, Esclavia fell asleep stretched out in front of the hearth. A line of verse came back to him, a poem of Apollinaire's. Under Myra Bridge flows the Seine. He would one day watch the Seine flow under Myra Bridge, as a free man, having escaped from this hell of green caterpillars which continued to haunt less cure. He would smile at the first pretty girl he met and ask her out to dinner at a little restaurant on the Ile St. Louis. A kindly hand was gently shaking him. With an effort he opened his eyes. A bodoy was leaning over him, all he could see was his ready-made smile, his slit eyes and his helmet. The impersonal voice started off. President Ho wants the French prisoners to rest after their long exertions. A nightmare had insinuated itself into his dream. The young girl took him gently by the hand, she caressed him and he fancied he saw in her rather sad eyes that she was ready to surrender. But the bodoy continued to shake him gently. President Ho is also anxious that the prisoners should not catch cold. Accept this blanket offered you by a soldier of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam so that after a good sleep you may recover the strength which you have wasted in vain. Esclavia sat up with a start. Tiller had disappeared and he saw a sentry standing at the entrance to the hut, his bayonet glinting in the moonlight. Kind-hearted Tiller, the free Mio of the Highlands, had delivered him into the hands of the little green men of the valleys and the deltas. Esclavia felt too weary, all he wanted was to sleep and let the night find some solution or no solution at all. In the morning Esclavia followed the Viets outside spitting on the floor as he left the hut in which a man of the ancient law had failed to observe the sacred rules of hospitality. Tiller turned his face away and pretended he had not seen him. This evening he would smoke a few more pipes than usual and would go on doing so until the day came when for the public good some political commissar or other would forbid him any more opium. Then he would die, that was what Esclavier hoped. The four soldiers escorting the captain showed him every consideration and kindness. They were in high spirits, they sang French marching songs to Vietnamese melodies and helped him over the difficult places and slippery monkey bridges. Like the Cochin Chinese partisans he had commanded six months earlier in the marshy forest of the Lagna, they were lively and agile, their weapons were well cared for, they could march without making a sound and, when they took off their helmets, they displayed the shock-headed locks of mischievous schoolboys. At dusk they reached a main trail deeply pitted by the wheels of heavy trucks. Small detachments of soldiers or coolies kept passing them in both directions. They all trotted along with the same rapid jerky gait. By the side of the trail the Bodoys lit a fire and started cooking their evening meal, rice and lentil soup with one or two little chunks of pork floating in it. On a banana leaf they laid out a few pinches of coarse salt and a handful of wild peppers. They ate in silence, then one of them brought out a packet of Chinese cigarettes made specially for the Viet Minh. He offered one to Esclavia. The little group surrendered themselves to the peace of the night. Their leader was reluctant to drag himself away from the glow of the fire. With an effort he rose to his feet, adjusted his equipment put his helmet on and resumed the inscrutable mask of a soldier of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. He turned to the prisoner. I must now take you to an officer of the division who wishes to interrogate you. It was an underground shelter with a floor made of gravel, illuminated by an acetylene lamp. At a table sat a man who looked a great deal more distinguished than the majority of his compatriots. His features seemed to be finely chiseled in very old gold. His hands were long and slender and beautifully kept. Your name? Captain Philippe Esclavia. Esclavia had recognized the inimitable voice. The first time he had heard it was in the dark, when it had ordered him to help push the jeep. I wasn't expecting to see you again so soon, Captain. Have you been decently treated since our last conversation in the Muong Phan Basin? It seems, however, that you didn't follow my advice. I'm glad your other childish escapade has ended without your coming to any harm. You have now been able to see for yourself how deeply united our nation is, how close the bonds are between the mountain people and those of the lowlands and the deltas, 
and this despite all the efforts that the French colonialists have made to split us for the last fifty years. The voice fell silent, gazed at the captain with friendly curiosity and went on pensively. What are we going to do about you, Esclavia? I suppose you'll take some sort of disciplinary action against me. This time I agree with you entirely. I'm prepared to pay for my failure. I should like to inform you, however, that it's the duty of every prisoner to escape and that I hope my next attempt will be successful. This statement of principle sounded slightly absurd, it would not have seemed so, however, had he been dealing with a German, a Spaniard, an American, a member of his own brotherhood. This word had just occurred to him, he considered it more closely, it did not seem to carry much weight. You want to be a martyr, don't you, to be tied to a tree, beaten with rifle butts, condemned to death and shot? In your eyes that would be a means of endowing your act with an importance which to us it does not possess. We'd like to put that act in its true perspective, as we see it, you're nothing but a spoiled child who has been playing truant. This time Miss Clavier was able to classify the person. His studied expressions, I wasn't expecting to see you again so soon, and playing truant the man was a schoolmaster. He had the condescending mannerisms of a somebody. He belonged to the race of pedagogues, but to him both men and arms had been entrusted. What a temptation for an intellectual gasbag! I had already appreciated your frankness, the voice went on. That frankness of yours will be the first condition of your education. During your stay in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam you will have time to learn how to conduct a self-examination. You will then realize, I hope, the immensity of your errors, your ignorance, your lack of understanding. This time no disciplinary measures will be taken against you. You'll be taken back to your comrades. You will merely have to tell them about your attempt to escape. We rely on your frankness to give them an absolutely accurate account of what happened. Instruction period in the Muong Phan camp. The officer prisoners, seated on tree stumps, formed a semicircle round a sort of bamboo platform on which the pedagogue stood commenting on the latest news of the Geneva Conference. As he spoke in his somewhat over-elegant, over-elaborate French, his eyes kept darting over his audience. A marquee of the termite world, he was there to hollow out the brains of all these men, to empty them of their substance and then stuff them full of propaganda rubbish. There is immense help among the people of France. The Vietnamese Armistice Commission has been able to make contact with the democratic elements of your country and to notify your families at last of your fate. Then he read out an article in L'Observateur, fiercely attacking the intransigent policy of Georges Bidalt who was opposed to any concession. The Commissar seemed genuinely distressed by the desperate efforts of this warmonger who was trying by every means to obstruct the peace and brotherhood of the masses and, by the same token, the release of the prisoners. But he still had hope, a single individual could never impede the urge of the masses towards progress. He concluded his lecture and after folding up L'Observer to Er, with the pointed remark that this was a French paper and by no means a communist one, he indicated Esclavier who was sitting at the foot of the stand. Your comrade, Captain Esclavier, returned to our camp this morning. He will now tell you in his own words the circumstances of his escape and of his recapture. A low murmur rose from the prisoners when Esclavier, with an inscrutable expression on his face, took the commissar's place on the platform. He spoke in short, clipped phrases, without looking at any of them but only at the sky which was streaked with a few grey clouds. Christ, I hope he doesn't do anything silly, Raspagai muttered, leaning over to his neighbour, a fat colonel such as such as strangling that little bastard who's forcing him to behave like a clown he's one of my men you know a real tough nut who's easily roused esclavier described all the circumstances of his escape and his capture he omitted nothing neither the women's friendliness the juicy vegetable marrow the smell of the meat grilling over the fire nor the welcome warmth of the fireside in the mio hut as they listened to him they all felt a profound nostalgia for their lost freedom and dreamt of escaping, even the most timid among them. The only thing I regret, Esclavier concluded, is having chosen a bad route. 
I advise you against the mountain ridges which are held by the Meos and also against the valleys which are held by the Ties. Then he stepped down from the platform with the same inscrutable expression on his face. Glatini leaned over towards Boyce Führers. He got out of that one nicely. He's given us all a longing to be free. I'm pleasantly surprised. Did you think he was just a big hairy chested brute? Well, there is that side to him. Get to know him better, try and win his friendship, which isn't easy, and you'll find that he's intelligent, sensitive, extremely cultured. But he doesn't like to show it. Lieutenant Mamoudi had shut his eyes and was dreaming of his homeland, of the arid soil, the grey stones, the pungent smells of the Sahara, of the sheep cooked whole on a spit of the hand that is dipped into the animal's insides and withdrawn dripping with spicy grease. In the deep blue night a shepherd boy was playing a poignant and monotonous melody on a shrill reed pipe. Somewhere in the distance a jackal howled. It's very decent of the Viet Minh, don't you think? Captain Lakem asked him. They might have taken it out on us for Esclavier's escape and put him in solitary confinement. Captain Esclavier is the sort of man we admire in my country? even if we do have to fight him some day. And Mamoudi recalled a proverb of the Black Dent, the courage of your enemy does you honor. But Esclavier was not his enemy. Not yet. As he entered the hut, Esclavier declared that he felt hungry, that his escapade and his little session of self-examination had sharpened his appetite. Without another word he took a tin of baked beans out of Lakeham's haversack, opened it and fell to. He offered the tin to Glatini. Have some? Lakeham felt powerless, he was on the point of tears. It was his very life this savage was devouring in his great champing jaws. Everyone else laughed, even Mamoudi whose face glistened with cruel delight. Then Esclavier went and lay down on his bunk in front of the fire. 3. Lieutenant Biniers's Remorse In the afternoon of the 15th of May, during the course of an instruction period, the man whom Esclavier called the voice notified the prisoners that they would be leaving next morning for Camp 1. They were split up into four groups, the first being made up of the senior officers and the wounded. The stores and equipment, some huge rice urns attached to bamboo poles, a few picks and shovels, were distributed among the junior officers of the three remaining groups. They were also given a three day ration of rice. But since they had no sacks to carry it in, a number of them sacrificed their trousers which were transformed into sacks by tying the ends of the legs together. Lakeham wanted them to get rid of the madman and send him on with the first group. But he came up against violent opposition not only from Esclavier and Glatini but from all the rest. They clung to Les Cures to a sort of fetish, they looked after him, took good care of him and forced him to eat his rice, thus forgetting their own wretchedness. Les Cures' cry of chickens, ducks, had become a rallying signal, in their own minds it no longer applied to code names for mortar shells, but to actual chickens and ducks which they hoped to scrounge in the process of moving camp. For a prisoner, everything is justified, Esclavier had declared, stealing, lying. From the moment they deprive him of his freedom he is given every right. Boyce Führers had asked him. And what if a regime, a political ideology deprived the whole world of its freedom? Then there are no holds barred. Each team was to elect a leader. Glatini proposed the victualling officer Lakem. He had made himself his campaign manager. Lakem has all the necessary qualifications, he explained. He's sly. He knows how to fend for himself and provides for the future. Look at those six tins of beans. In years, the former Macquizard, had cottoned on at once. He's got the ugly face of a quizzling, too. He'll play the part of level with the Viets. And we'll be the resistance. Thus it was that Lakem was detailed as leader of the team. A search had taken place after the meeting, it had been extremely thorough. The Bodois had not confined themselves to going through the prisoners' pockets and the hems of their clothes but had insisted on them stripping stark naked. 
up till then Boyce Führers had managed to conceal his dagger, a thin stiletto which he carried strapped to the inside of his leg with adhesive tape like the silver piaster he had given Esclavia. Realizing he would be found out, while Merle, who was one in front of him, was in the process of being searched, he had extracted the dagger and brandished it in the face of the NCO in charge, a former Hanoi rickshaw coolie bursting with self-importance. Of course I'm keeping it, that's agreed with the boss. He said each team was entitled to a knife for cutting wild herbs. Recovering from his surprise, the Viet had thought it over for a moment, then given his assent, when he suddenly realized it was a lethal weapon the prisoner was putting back in his pocket. No, you know understand, give me knife. Glatini managed to conceal two silver piasters by slipping them into his mouth and Binyer's a little mirror with a dent in the middle which could reflect the sun's rays and thus be used as a ground-to-air signaling lamp. Then, at first light on the 18th of May, the team left for Camp 1, with its rice urn slung on a bamboo pole, its madman who quietly followed behind like a poodle, boys Führer's barefoot as usual, Glatini and Esclavia, Merle and Pinyers, Lakem and Mamaudi. The camp has been set up near Dean Bianfu. Lakem had told them, so as not to be too far away from a landing ground. Once the armistice is signed at Geneva, aircraft will be able to come and pick us up. I don't believe it, Esclavia had replied. They'll make us move down towards Hoban on the edge of the Delta and hand us over in Hanoi. Or maybe we'll have to march as far as Sun La, and be taken on from the Bikarak. It's much too far, said Ben Years. We're nearly a hundred miles from Sun La. Glatini felt it wiser to say nothing. At Christmas, as a propaganda move, the Viet Minh had released four officers who had been taken prisoner at Cao Bang in 1950. The C. In C. had made him responsible for their interrogation, and one of them had told him that Camp 1, where the officer prisoners were held, was situated in the limestone country of the northeast, in the region of Bac Can, that's to say some 500 miles from Dien Bien Phu. Most of the prisoners were in a poor state of health and unlikely to stay the course. During the first day's march the prisoners covered 20 miles or so in a northeasterly direction, towards China. The senior officers and the wounded had passed them in trucks. Raspakai was sitting in the back of the last truck, with his bare feet dangling over the edge. A Viet Minh sentry had been detailed to keep an eye on him. Had not Generalissimo Jayap declared that his capture was the most important of all? Raspagai and his battalion had repeatedly eluded the two most powerful Viet Minh divisions and on one occasion had even destroyed the command post of one of them. Raspagai waved to the team and shouted. Conserve your strength, you're in for a long march. He would have liked to be with them, to encourage them and make them stick it out, and he would have shown them that, Colonel though he was he could do better than the youngest among them. He cast a friendly glance at the sentry, he would probably be forced to kill him when he made his escape, because he was going to escape and he was going to succeed where Esclavier had failed. The prisoners were now moving with the mainstream of the Viet Minh battalions, trucks and coolies. They no longer existed as themselves, they formed part of a vast human tide. The heat, the exhaustion, the lack of water were beginning to tell. On the third day they reached Tuan Jiao, an intersection of the RP-41 leading from Hanoi to Lei Ai Chor. The neighboring forest swarmed with soldiers, coolies and trucks, it was full of supple stores and ammunition dumps. It was the big invisible base of the army which had attacked Dien Bien Phu. The prisoners were quartered in a little Thai hamlet half a mile off the road on a hillock surrounded by bamboos. There they were allowed twenty-four hours rest, they badly needed it. The team had not yet settled into a cohesive unit. Later on those who belonged to it came to be known as the W.S. or Wily Serpents, for they proved to be singularly impervious to every form of propaganda, with a pronounced taste for pilfering and polemics, and a sort of genius for exploiting every weakness of Viet Minh organization. At the time they embarked on their long march they had not yet reached this stage. Lakem was more and more obsequious towards the sentries and called them sir, a form of address which they demanded in vain from the other prisoners. 
Esclavia was quick to take offense. Boyce Furas seemed to live for himself alone. As he ambled effortlessly along the trail, his bare feet with their prehensile toes gripping into the mud, he never gave his comrades the slightest assistance and confined himself to carrying the rice urn when it came to his turn to do so. Glatini occasionally gave himself airs. Lieutenant Merle had once asked him to help with some chore or other. Will you give me a hand, Glatini? My dear sir, I'm accustomed to my subordinates addressing me by my rank and not by the familiar two, especially when my uniform consists of a pair of dirty shorts and my prerogatives are reduced to obeying, as you do, a funny little green man who six months ago was a rickshaw coolie. Mamari did not say much, but more than once his comrades noticed a look of resentment come into his eyes when the food was doled out, as though he thought they were laughing behind his back because he was an Algerian and a Muslim. To all the prisoners camp one appeared as a sort of promised land where, in the shade of giant mango trees, they would spend a few days waiting for their release, smoking treacly tobacco, eating rice and dried fish and dozing through some vague lectures given by the voice. The sky had filled with the heavy black clouds which herald the monsoon. They concealed the mountain peaks behind a dark green blanket which stretched right across the horizon. One day, towards the end of the afternoon, they heard the drone of aircraft, a large formation of bombers. They dropped their bombs over the mountains and the explosion echoed round the valleys like distant thunder. The voice drove up in his jeep and immediately assembled the prisoners to inform them of the treachery of the French high command. Before the fall of Dien Bien Phu the Vietnamese delegation to the Armistice Commission had suggested an aerial truce to the French command to facilitate the evacuation of the wounded and the transport of the prisoners. The French command had agreed to this. But yesterday, without any warning, it broke this truce. The French commander-in-chief, in his palace in Saigon, does not give a damn for the wounded or the prisoners among his troops. All he wants is to prolong the war in the interest of the bloated colonialists and the bankers. Yesterday a column of French prisoners consisting of your NCOS and other ranks was bombed by your aircraft. Several were killed. To avoid this danger we are going to march you across the Mayo Highlands by night. We shall be leaving at sunset. It's a bit thick, I must say, Lakeham declared. After all we've been through, to go and unload their bombs on us. What have you been through? Esclavier demanded. You spent the whole time back at headquarters, stuffing yourself with the rations you were supposed to send up to us. Glatini, rather white in the face, broke into the conversation. I know the general extremely well. If he saw fit to break this truce and resume aerial bombardments, it could only have been for a very good reason but he felt that no one agreed with him and he heard Lieutenant Merle sneer. The general's sitting pretty back in Saigon. This evening, more than likely, he'll be having a romp with his boy or his congai while we're struggling across the Mio Highlands. Merle was being deliberately offensive and his vulgarity did not ring true. Piniers then gave his opinion. If he'd had the slightest decency. The general would have come along with us or else put a bullet through his brains. Glatini felt like shouting out loud. But I'm here with you, aren't I? Can't you understand that I'm here because the general couldn't be, just like Lescure who came in the place of his brother? Boyce Führers merely observed. That's not the point, anyway it's utterly unimportant. From their quarters the prisoners had a view of the valley and the road which wound through the paddy fields and the tall grass circling the edge of the forest. An hour before sunset the dead valley began to come to life. The battalions poured out of the forest and, like tributary rivers, added their volume to the main green stream. Some trucks moved slowly down the middle of this flow, jolting over the potholes with engines racing. A column of black coolies the Pims of Dean Bianfu, were drawn up by the side of the road. They marched off and were presently swallowed up in the oncoming traffic. The voice issued his last orders to the assembled prisoners. Tonight's march will be fairly strenuous. You must keep going without complaint and promptly obey every word of command. You will be coming across Vietnamese soldiers, your victors at Dean Bianfu. 
you are not allowed to speak to them and must show them every sign of respect. We may possibly run into a column of those men whom you call pims, those civilian deportees whom you snatched away from their families and peaceful peasant labors to transform into coolies. They are now free men who are returning to their hearths and homes. The suffering you have inflicted on them is such that they are filled with resentment against you. I advise you to be particularly respectful towards them. We are here to protect you from their righteous indignation, but do not provoke them, for otherwise we cannot hold ourselves responsible. The sun was setting as the prisoners began to climb the first slope up the pass. The forest covered the flanks of the mountains like mildew and spread right along the ravines. But higher up, well above them, the peaks were bare except for a uniform blanket of Tran, a tall razor-edged grass as pale as the ears of corn and, like them, swept by the wind into gentle waves. They came to a halt in the ditch to make way for a double column of Bodois who set off up the slope with the rhythmic trotting gait of the riflemen, only their pace was even faster and more jerky. They were weighed down under their haversacks, their bundles of rice slung over one shoulder, and their weapons. Panting, sweating, suffocating, they somehow managed to emit what passed for a marching song. There was no joy in their drawn features. Many of them carried two weapons, Russian submachine guns or Skoda automatic rifles, which had belonged to their comrades killed in the Battle of the Oat region. These weapons would come in useful in the Delta to arm the waiting recruits. There's no point in killing them, Esclavia despondently observed. They're like worms, you cut them in two and think that's the end of them, but all you've done is double their number, each separate half assuming a life of its own. They are going to multiply in the Delta and finish off what's left of the corpse of our expeditionary corps. A long column of ties followed behind them. The ties wore their traditional dress. The women, slender as reeds in their long narrow skirts and short bodices, seemed to have lost their indolent charm and sensual gait. Split up into small groups behind the canbos, who looked like ghosts in their outsize greenish uniforms, they joined in the slogans, taking their cue from the canbos, each of them had the blank and riveted gaze of a fanatic. Glatini gave Boyce Führers a nudge. Look. The termites have swallowed up the carefree people of the valleys and riverland, they have reduced them to slavery, they've conscripted my ties, of all people. So what? I lived at Lei Chow for six months when I first came out here. I thought I had found paradise on earth among these friendly, idle, cheerful men and these lovely, gentle women, always ready for pleasure or for love. These women made me appreciate the joys of the body. I've made love to them on little strips of sand by the banks of the Black River, in their houses on stilts. And not once, me a Catholic and a bit of a Puritan, not once did I have the slightest feeling of sin, because, you see, the ties, unlike every other race on earth, have no conception of original sin. And now these chaps have infected them with all their filthy claptrap. Night fell all at once like a safety curtain. Some bamboo torches were lit which marked out the twists in the road on the black flank of the mountain. Thereupon Lescure burst into a loud guffaw and they all listened to him in holy terror. It was as though some devil, exploiting his madness, had taken possession of him and was speaking through his mouth. The disjointed flow of words gave birth to extravagant visions. It was the great procession of the damned who were making their way to the seat of the last judgment, angels had lit their torches so that no one should escape in the dark. Enthroned high above them sat the god with the huge belly and eyes as round as millstones. In his claw-like hands he grabbed the humans up by the fistful and tore them apart in his teeth, the just and the unjust, the pure and impure, the believers and unbelievers alike. All were acceptable to him, for he hungered after flesh and blood. Every now and then he gave a solemn belch and the angels applauded with a shout, Long live President Ho! But he was still ravenous and so he also devoured them, and even as he snapped their bones between his teeth, they kept on shouting, Long may he live! An explosion very close at hand, a sudden blaze of red and the noise of the repercussion, was amplified in echoes right across the mountain. Christ Almighty, said Glatini, 
the aircraft have dropped some delayed action bombs and we've got to go in that direction. Delayed action bombs was one of his ideas. In the course of several aerial reconnaissances he had noticed that as soon as the Viets heard the sound of an aircraft they immediately disappeared, abandoning their work on the trail they were building. They did not come back again until it was dark. He had mentioned this to the general, who had given him a free hand. And now 50% of the bombs were equipped with delay fuses of anything between 2 and 10 hours. The raid had taken place about 11 o'clock in the morning. Most of the bombs would therefore explode, between 10 and 12 that night. He looked for his watch on his wrist, forgetting it had been taken from him. All he had now was his wedding ring. The Viets had also confiscated all wedding rings, but the prisoners had told them these were religious objects and so they had handed them back. In his case this was true. He had placed the whole of his life under the sign of Christ who had preached peace, charity, brotherhood. And at the same time he had arranged for the delayed action bombs at the Cat by airfield at Haiphong. Something on your mind? Esclavier asked him kindly. Are you married? Yes, I've a wife and five children. A paragon of a wife and five children at a Jesuit college? No, only three are with the Jesuits, the others are girls. That's perfect, your wife will wait patiently for you to come back and make it around half dozen. Did you hear the bombs? What of it? There's a war on and we can't allow Hanoi to be captured. The column set off again. Through a gap in the clouds the moon shone down for several minutes on the long file of prisoners straining uphill, their bodies bent forward. Motionless and silent in the middle of the road stood the trucks towing the 105 caliber guns made in USA Glatine counted them as he went past. There were exactly 24 of them, once again the intelligence reports were correct. There they stood in their original covers, towed by short-framed GMCS or Molotivers which were better suited to the mud. The Americans had given these guns to Chiang Kai-shek, the communists had either bought them from his generals or else taken them during the big Kuomintang defeat, then sent them to the Viet Minh to carry on the same war. At the head of the convoy a detachment of soldiers illuminated by their smoky bamboo torches were apparently directing the traffic. Farther on the road had been cut. More Len, more Len. The cry passed from mouth to mouth, and all the way back again. The road, which was carved out of the side of the mountain, had caved in over a distance of fifty yards. Some thousand pound bombs had been responsible for this damage and the Viet Minh ant hill seethed as though it had been stirred up with a stick. The Thai men, women and children with their picks, their baskets and even their bare hands were busily transporting earth to fill in the craters and placing rocks along the outer edge to keep this earth in position. There were about a thousand of them who had come from villages several days march away. Some canbos were in charge of them, they kept singing patriotic songs and chanting slogans first in Thai and afterwards in Vietnamese. The leader would give them a cue, then they all joined in while carrying on with their work. Long live President Ho! Long live General Jayap who has led us to victory! Long live the glorious soldiers of the People's Army! Lower down, on the edge of a freshly disturbed crater, lay five mangled bodies, victims of a delayed action bomb. But Glatini was the only one who saw them, for the coolies, under the spell of the incantations, had forgotten all about them, and the other prisoners, insensible to anything but their own exhaustion, did not bother to look, it was no concern of theirs. Dear God! Glatini did not know what he wanted God to do. His prayer was vague and confused. He would have liked to be with the coolies, to share their danger. Another bomb exploded in the middle of a mass of women, men and children and the blast bowled the prisoners over. A tie with a shattered leg started shrieking in the darkness like a wild beast, several blood-stained bodies coated with earth were no longer moving. The chanting had stopped. But all at once it started up again, faintly at first, then louder and louder. Ho Kai Tik, Muon Nam. Jayap, Muon Nam. More Len, more Len. By the light of the torches the prisoners filed past the corpses and the wounded who were being tended by medical orderlies with a band of white gauze stretched over their nose and mouth. The chanting pursued them and drove them on. 
Glatani made the sign of the cross and felt the friendly pressure of Esclavia's hand on his shoulder. We all suffer from conscience and remorse, that's why we are losing. Lay in the course of the night there were three further explosions. Each time Glatini gave a start, each time he felt his friend's hand on his shoulder. The noise of motor traffic could be heard again below them. The trucks were now able to get through and their roar grew louder at each bend as the convoy gradually gained on the column of prisoners. The Frenchmen were ordered to the side of the road and the black vehicles, like huge clumsy beetles, rattled slowly past them. The slopes began to get steeper than ever, the men slithered and staggered up the trail, sweat dripping into their eyes. Some of them fell down altogether and their comrades had to help them to their feet again. Mamoudi, with an arm under Lescure's shoulder, was helping him along as though in a daze. Pin years, with an ugly expression on his face, took over a kit bag from Lakem, who was whimpering shamelessly. I was never cut out to be a soldier. I wasn't trained for this sort of thing. Then what the hell made you go and join the army? Piniers demanded, pushing him forward. I've got two children. Carrying the rice urn on its bamboo pole, Boyce Führers trudged along with an easy swing of his shoulders, moving like a Vietnamese so as to absorb the jolt at every step. Esclavia, who was on the other end, kept stumbling and cursing. The skin had been rubbed off his shoulder which was bruised and bleeding. Every ten paces or so he shifted the pole from one side to the other and his arms ached right down to his fingertips. Glatini took over from him. Boyce Führers indicated with a gesture that he could carry on. He knew the value of silence during any prolonged effort and sucked a blade of grass to ward off thirst. Before their departure the voice had advised the prisoners to fill whatever water containers they had but these had long ago been drained. Their tongues were parched, their breathing labored. Word had gone round that anyone falling out by the side of the road would be finished off as a reprisal against the air aids. Even the weakest strained to keep going. The rasping, urgent voice of Boyce Führers came to their ears. Pluck some grass and suck it, for Christ's sake, but only the short, thick blades containing moisture, the others will upset your stomach. At every halt the wind off the summit froze their sweating bodies, and when they started off again their muscles felt so stiff that they could hardly move. The crest of the mountain seemed a little closer at every turn. Eventually it was reached, but behind it rose a second peak more lofty and more distant than the sky, then some bare, contorted ridges extending without a break to the farthest horizon. Beyond lay Sunla, Nasan, Hoban and Hanoi with its cafes stocked with ice-cold drinks, the Ritz, the club, the Normandy, its fast-living, devil-may-care air pilots, its reserved and evasive staff officers making announcements to the hordes of journalists and being stood round after round of drinks. Back there the Chinese taxi dancers would be dancing together in the middle of the floor, waiting for their clients. It was said that most of them were lesbians and lived together as married couples. On the civilian airport at Gilam the D.4 for Paris would be warming up its engines. Merle, who was at his last gasp and felt he could not take another step, suddenly yelled. To hell with them all, the bastards. His resentment against those who were not suffering with him gave him strength to carry on a little longer. The prisoners were anxious to survive, and for that they had to have something to think about, something to believe in. But all they could find in their vacant minds was of no avail. These were peaceful visions, lying in the grass on the bank of a river, with dragonflies skimming over the water, reading a detective novel by the gentle light of a lamp, with one's wife in the bathroom next door getting ready for bed and the radio playing some insipid little tune dripping with nostalgia. But gradually each one of them was assailed by a more forceful recollection than any other, one which they tried desperately to suppress. This was their secret and grievous sin. It was to remain with them for the rest of their arduous march, and for the best of them it would give some meaning to their suffering and atonement. The others, those who had nothing, were destined to leave their bones on the roadside. Piniers was still just behind Lakem, whom he kept helping to his feet, and cursing. He could not forget what the Vituela had said, I've got two children. 
Pinyas' child was dead before it was born, its mother had also died, she had kept the appointment by the cascade at Dalat, she knew what was in store for her and they had strangled her. That was how the Viet Minh punished those who betrayed them. It was shortly after he first arrived in Indochina, some three years ago. Pinyas had joined up as a paratrooper and volunteered for Indochina in order to break away completely from a past that was political rather than military. That day he had opted for the army against politics. Since then he had had nothing more to do with his former Mackie comrades. He had been posted to the parachute battalion at Leith, a village between Saigon and Tudormo. They held the road outside Leith and were responsible for controlling the traffic. His second in command, an old sergeant major, was efficient and conscientious and he was thus enabled to go on leave once a week to Saigon. That he would meet some colleagues of his in a bar, they would all go out and dine together at some local eating house, then drive down by rickshaw to the Route A Marins at Colon. They spent the evening wandering from one brothel to another and occasionally broke a window or two. Pin years did not find this particularly amusing but he made a point of copying his colleagues' mannerisms and behavior. He came from the Maquis, had not been to military college, and was a teacher by profession, all this he was anxious to live down. His colleagues still displayed a certain reticence towards him, but their reserve was beginning to melt and soon he would really be one of their number. Then he would embark on the life that suited him, membership of that paratroop Freemasonry which was in the process of being born. One morning, as he was driving back from Saigon to Leith, in the civilian bus, an old rattle trap consisting of separate parts from a dozen different vehicles, tied together with string and fitted with threadbare tires, the lieutenant had noticed a young Vietnamese girl sitting quietly beside a crate of chickens. Dressed in black trousers, a loose tunic of white silk, with long hair gathered together at the nape of her neck by a clasp like any other female student or schoolgirl in Cochin China. She had the pensive and at the same time merry face of a Greco-Buddhist virgin. A mysterious charm compounded of purity and reflectiveness emanated from her finely drawn features, her waist was so slender that Pinyers could have encircled it in his powerful hands. Pinyers was fed up with the girls in the brothels and in order to endure them he had had a great deal to drink. With one blow of his huge paw he sent the crate of chickens flying, a peasant woman promptly started screaming. Then he sat down beside the young girl. All he wanted from her was a smile to blot out the memory of the whores he had just been paying. But the girl recoiled from him with a gesture of disgust and shrank back against the battered side of the bus. Pinyers was no beauty with his ruddy, freckled complexion, his overpronounced features and musky smell, but he gave an impression of elemental power and his eyes were the deep blue of those of a newborn child. His personal reports invariably described him as the sort of man who was equally capable of the utmost good and the utmost harm. He had rarely done harm, he had often done good. Don't be frightened, Pin years told her. But he had never been able to control his voice. Leave me alone, she cried, go away. Everyone in the bus had turned round to watch, including the driver who, in the process, very nearly drove into the ditch. I'll tell my father. Pin years, who was beginning to get annoyed and felt he was making a fool of himself, rudely retorted. To hell with your father. My father is Dr. Fu Tain, he's a friend of the High Commissioner, who often asks him in for consultations. He noticed she had a small diamond fixed into the lobe of each ear. The girl's voice had become breathless. She fumbled in her bag. I've got an up-to-date permit. Look, you can see for yourself, signed by the High Commissioner. And if it's of any interest to you, I'm actually a French citizen. I only wanted to speak to you. She looked him up and down. Your sort only know how to speak with their hands, go and find another seat. I'm sorry. He had complied with her wish, while everyone round him sniggered. At Leith the girl had got off the bus after him. An old Assam dressed in black was waiting there to carry her books for her. The lieutenant made inquiries, the girl, whom everyone called my oi, was the only daughter of Dr. Fu Tain, an officer of the Legion d'Honor who was said to be a decent chap, 
very influential and wholeheartedly in favor of the French. My oi had been brought up at Dalat by the nuns of the Couvent des Oi Isaacs and was now a first year student at the University of Saigon, as far as it was known, there was no man in her life. Piniers forgot all about the girl. Terrorist activity was reaching its peak and, while interrogating a prisoner, the sector commander had discovered that most of the arms and explosives found their way to lay ith by way of the forest, and from there were sent on to Saigon. Piniers had practiced terrorism in France. He only had to draw on his own memories, the methods which he himself used to employ for delivering arms, and on four separate occasions he intercepted supplies being carried by plantation truck drivers or by coolies trotting along on foot. Hand grenades were concealed among piles of rice or even in the insides of fish. It was then he saw my oi again. She went past the section post one morning dressed in white and followed by her black assam. He gave her a brisk salute, to which she replied with a mocking smile. That evening he went and had a word with her. Next day he waited for her at the bus stop. The assam had not turned up, he saw her home, carrying her books for her. She asked him about his life, he told her about his school days. They both discovered they preferred Lamartine to Victor Hugo, he ventured to ask her out to dinner with him in Saigon, he would drive her home afterwards in his jeep. She accepted without any fuss. Her father, it seemed, allowed her a great deal of freedom, which was most unusual. But perhaps his French nationality had inclined him towards liberalism. At the Vieux Moulin, near the Dachau Bridge, she was alternately mocking, affectionate, flirtatious, and, on the terrace of the Kimalong where they went to dance, her slender body clung to his. There were whispers at every table at the sight of the slim Vietnamese girl almost totally engulfed in the arms of the big red-headed barbarian. On the way back, in the jeep, she allowed him to kiss her. She pecked him on the lips like a bird eating grain. My oi raised no objection to going back with him to his room. Their first embrace was a disappointment. Passive and detached, she lay there without the slightest reaction giving only a little cry when he was rough with her. He himself felt clumsy and ill at ease, up till then he had associated exclusively with Congais and had only thought of his own pleasure. But under the mosquito net, after she had fallen elseep, he lay musing for a long time over her naked body, as naked as only an Asiatics can be, and to him this golden girl was like one of those gifts which the gold kings in olden times used to offer the barbarian invaders in homage of their power. My oi fell into the habit of meeting the lieutenant in his room every evening and staying there until the morning. A week later the rainy season began with a violent storm. He caressed her insensible body and his desire was mingled with rage at being so close to this smooth young flesh which never gave so much as a tremor. The cloudburst developed into an absolute downpour, a puff of wind lifted the mosquito net and all of a sudden he felt my oi come to life. Her sharp nails dug into his shoulder, the slender reed of her body tried to escape him, then clung to him all the more closely and she gave a gentle whimper. When it was all over, she still clung to him and for the first time it was she who provoked his desire. In a completely changed voice, in which surprise was mingled with tenderness and timidity, she asked. What's your Christian name? Serge. Up till then she had not bothered to find out. My oi gave up the university and came to live with him. The black garbed Assam moved into a house nearby and from then on Piniers ceased to have his meals in the mess with his comrades. During this period, while the number of terrorist outrages increased still further in Saigon, Piniers's section had a run of bad luck and failed to intercept a single convoy of arms. Yet all the intelligence reports agreed, the Viet Minh were still using the Laith Road. One evening, after dinner, my oi said to the lieutenant. Serge, I've been given orders to kill you tonight. Don't worry, you know I could never do it now. At one o'clock the post is going to be attacked to enable a truck to get through loaded with explosives, arms and leaflets. Before the attack is launched, I am supposed to eliminate you. For the last two years I've belonged to a Viet Minh organization, the Nambo. It's they who gave me the order to go to bed with you, you were too successful at unearthing our arms. 
I did so and to begin with I hated it. Then there was that night when the rains started. Go and warn your men. The attack took place at exactly one o'clock in the morning. The Viet Minh were repulsed with heavy losses and their truck was blown up. During the whole battle, my oi had sat quietly on the edge of the camp bed without moving, and when her lover came back, drenched with sweat and spattered with her countrymen's blood, the pleasure she indulged in with him was followed by a sense of appeasement more profound than death itself. Next day Piniers had brought her before the intelligence officer of the zone. She had followed him without a word. Now talk, he had told her. She had told them all she knew without batting an eyelid and had given away the whole terrorist network in Saigon, its leaders, its arms dumps and meeting places. When the captain misspelled a name, she had corrected it in her own hand. Good show, pin years, the intelligence officer had said. It's the best thing we've pulled off since we came here. I'm being posted back to France, wouldn't you like to take over from me? No, thanks. To safeguard my oi from the vengeance of the Viet Minh, Biniers and the captain had decided to send her to Dalat. They found a room for her in the Couvent des Oi Isaacs where she had been brought up. Once again she had raised no objection. Every month Biniers used to go up to Dalat with the convoy and my oi would come and join him for three days in a tumble-down Chinese hotel where our Jong players sat up all night over their little pieces of bamboo and ivory. One day he received a very brief letter from my oi. I didn't dare tell you before, but I'm expecting a baby by you. What do you intend to do about it? We Vietnamese do not attach as much importance as you do to a child that has not yet been born. Afterwards we deal with it better. Whatever you decide will be all right because I love you. Ever since my oi had betrayed the Viet Minh terrorist organization, Biniers had often remembered this incident. At the liberation of France he had ordered his men to shave the scalp of a beautiful, rather silly girl who had openly flaunted her liaison with a German officer. While the operation was being performed, she had looked him straight in the eye. I loved my German, I'd got him under my skin. I'm only a woman. I don't give a damn about war and politics. He might have been a Negro, an American or a Russian, it would have been all the same to me and to protect him I would have sold the lot of you, just as I would have fought at your side if I'd happened to fall for one of you. But with mugs like yours, there wasn't much danger of that. Piniers had slapped her across the face until she sank to her knees and his men had then made free of her. Later on he had looked for the woman to give her back the jewels they had confiscated from her, but she had already left for Germany. For a whole week he thought the matter over, then he made up his mind the child would be born. If it was a girl, he would send her to the convent, if a boy, to a forces school. He would let my oi know his decision himself. As for her, he would give her some money for her to go away. What had that German done with this shaven pated French girl? Had he married her? The day the convoy he was due to take left for Dalat, Biniers was out on operations. For four days and nights he had been tracking down a band of guerrillas and had set fire to the village which they used as a hideout. The stench of burning flesh was still in his nostrils. When he came back, not very proud of this enforced task, he made up his mind to marry my oi, the collaborator. It would be too horrible for her to have betrayed her own people only to lose him in the end. Besides, he loved her and also the child which was about to be born and which was not going to go either to the convent or to a forces school. He took the following convoy and, since he had not been able to notify my oi of his arrival in Dalat, he went straight to the Couvent des Oi Isaacs. Her room was empty. The girl had vanished. On the table he found a letter in Vietnamese, which he asked someone to translate for him. The administrative committee of the Nambo asked the little sister to report to the cascade at Dalat in order to furnish one of their representatives with a few particulars. She was to be there after dark and alone. Her body was found next morning, she had been strangled with a silk parachute cord. Lakem stumbled again and asked Piniers to help him up. You can get up by yourself. I've got two children. The bastard had discovered his weak point, he was going to exploit it, take advantage of it. 
like a whining beggar. Piniers bent over him, helped him to his feet, and when it came to the captain's turn to carry the rice urn, he took his place. 4. The Porcelains of the Summer Palace Dawn broke as the column was struggling across the pass. The RP-41 was deserted and the prisoners were once more on their own after the chaos and tumult of the night. The roar of the trucks had died away in the whistling of the wind off the summit, and daylight seemed to have sent the Viet Minh termites scuttling back into their holes. The voice kept walking up and down the column and his smooth cheeks bore hardly a sign of fatigue. Several times over he gave the Bodoyas orders to quicken the pace, but without success. At the end of the morning the prisoners, foots or, exhausted and dying of thirst, were halted in a narrow little valley which threaded its way through the middle of the mountains. In small groups they flopped down in the mud under cover of the brushwood. They spent the rest of the day there, prostrated in their solitude, without being able to go to sleep or enjoy a moment's oblivion and without finding relief for their cramped limbs. They had reached that stage of utter weariness beyond which there exists only total collapse and death. During all the remainder of the march they were to carry the weight of this immense lassitude. Night after night the cavalry of the lamentable herd, driven on by its grim bodoys, continued in the heavy rain of the monsoon. The prisoners would take a step forward, stumble, take another step without being certain they would have enough strength to take a third, having long since forgotten why they were on the move or where they were going in this stifling stormy darkness through which monstrous visions floated like giant jellyfish. It was during one of these nightmares that they came across the pims of Dean Bianfu. The column of prisoners had halted by the side of the road to let them come past. The pims moved up slowly, a pathetic miracle procession with its cripples whose questionable bandages showed faintly white in the darkness, and its lame dragging themselves along on crutches. Their wounds were rotten with gangrene, their rags were coated in pus and they gave off a sugary smell of carrion and sour ice. The Viets had treated them even worse than the French, even though they had the same political value as the soldiers of the People's Army. The voice had said so. The officers gazed in silence at this procession of ghosts. There were four or five hundred survivors out of the four thousand coolies who had been flown into Dean Bianfu six months earlier. The voice wasn't so far wrong, Piniers reflected. No doubt they would be only too pleased to rip our guts out if they had the chance. Many others had the same thought in mind. Suddenly one of the Pims recognized Boyce Führers and rushed up to him. Captain, Captain. Me Pim of Fourth Company. He seized the captain by the hand, taking this opportunity to slip him a packet of tobacco. He rubbed up against him like a domestic pet. As they went by. Other Pims recognized their officers in spite of the darkness. They broke ranks, darted across the road behind a Bodoy's back, and without a word shook hands with the Frenchman, slipping them a shapeless little packet of tobacco or some food from their own meager rations or from what they had managed to scrounge. Glatini was given a little molasses wrapped up in a piece of newspaper, and Piniers a bit of stale or vitamin chocolate from a box of combat rations. What a damned waste! Piniers exclaimed. All those men might have been with us. Even without weapons we could have pushed all these Viet Minh bastards over the border into China, just with a few good kicks in the ass. Boys Führers questioned his Pim and Vietnamese and learned that they were being taken off to a hard labor re-education camp. They were going to have it forcibly driven into their heads that friendship was forbidden between men of a different race that a prisoner could not love his master unless that master was a communist, otherwise it was treason. Three of these Pims had been awarded the military medal for their heroic conduct at Dean Bianfu, but they had disappeared. The voice gave the Bodoy's orders to keep the Pims and the prisoners apart. For the first time the Viets began striking the officers with their rifle butts. The column of Pims faded out of the nightmare, the voice floated in. He addressed the Frenchman. I told you to show respect towards your victims, not to provoke them. You refused to listen and we were obliged to save you from their righteous anger. The damned bastard, Piniers murmured, clenching his fist. Not at all, Boyce Führers replied. He's being logical. 
According to Marxist theory, the colonized cannot fraternize with the colonizer. It's dogmatically impossible. But since this fraternization has just taken place, he simply denies the fact. The tepid downpour continued without a break. One night the prisoners passed a convoy of trucks bogged down in the mud. The coolies swarming round them, while their engines raced and roared, could not manage to shift them from the potholes. The RP-41 was out of service at last, the monsoon had proved more effective than the French pilots. But too late. As though in the throes of fever, Glatini kept wrestling with his phantoms which took the form of staff plans marked in red and blue, report, confidential signals, urgent, secret, top secret. He had a vision of the large-scale map at Air Force headquarters, Hanoi, with its red crosses indicating where the road had been cut. Effective for 36 hours, effective for 48 hours, of no effect at all. This was two months earlier. The road had never been cut, the termites worked faster than the bombs and Dean Bianfu had fallen. The big black artery swollen with coolies brought the lifeblood to Jayap's divisions every night. The road had to be put out of service and, if bombs proved ineffective, rain had to be made to fall instead. But the carbonic ice they had scattered by the plane load on the heavy ink black clouds had done nothing. The meteorologist who had been sent out from Paris had gone back after making this Sibylline report, the monsoon cycle is so disturbed in the northeast of Indochina that any forecast of rain must be regarded as contingent. The meteorologist was now safely ensconced in his cozy little flat in Paris, well protected from hunger and fatigue and from the despair and malediction of defeat. Meanwhile the rain poured down every day on the vanquished struggling along in the mud. Christ Almighty, Merle swore, stumbling against Glatini, if the general had the runs as I have. I've got to go again, though I'm absolutely drained. Here, take my bag. Between one spasm and the next his thoughts flew to the lovely Micheline, with her beauty spot and 18th century hairstyle. If you could only see your paratrooper now, my beauty. Then, all the same. I'm not going to die by the side of road like a destitute beggar simply because I wanted to prolong my holiday. It can't happen. Olivier Merle had been brought up in tours among a lot of old people. Everyone in his background was old, his father, his mother, his aunts, his cousins and even his skinny young sister. Olivier had gone off to do his military service. In the army he had discovered youth and gaiety but he had failed to distinguish between the regular army and the one in which the young civilians served. The last long holiday before life begins in earnest. In order to prolong his own holiday, Little Merle, after finishing his time, had signed on for two years in Indochina. In tours this had been considered rather frivolous of him. Olivier often recalled the secret joy he had felt that time he went home on leave after passing out of saint Maxent. Without his parents' knowledge he had been through a parachute course at the school and had then been posted to a southwestern battalion. For the first time his red beret made a bright splash of color in the old house on the bank of the Loire. What does it mean? His father had asked him. It means I've jumped from an aircraft seven times with a parachute strapped to my back and that each time it opened. Eccentrics are frowned upon in our profession. A parachuting notary. What will they think in tours? It won't do us any good. If your practice consisted exclusively of laborers, father, that might well be so, but most of your clients are from the upper middle and merchant classes. Exactly, the working class doesn't mind that sort of nonsense, but the middle does. But surely the army, and the paratroops in particular, are the great defenders of the privileges of the middle class? They distrust defenders of that sort even more than their enemies, they could well do without them. You could be a radical or a communist and all they would say is, he'll get over it, it's just a youthful phase. But a paratrooper. Let's hope we can keep it dark. But his sister had fondled his beret with its winged dagger badge. Never before had Olivier seen such a gleam in her eyes. I'm glad you joined, she had told him. You're the first to escape from this rat hole of ours. One day you must come back and fetch me away. Olivier Merle had remained in uniform, 
partly in defiance of his father, partly to please his sister, but most of all to scandalize the bourgeoisie of Tours, and in the evening he had gone out with a party of friends to a night club. Is his lordship trying to compete with me? Young Bizag of the magazine's reunies had asked him with a sneer. Bizag felt slightly put out. He was regarded as the Bolshe of the group. One day he had borrowed a motorcar for several hours and his lack of moral sense was a byword. But in one fell swoop Olivier had surpassed him and gone infinitely farther. Olivier was vaguely in love with all the girls he knew, but up till then they had merely used him to make their boyfriends jealous and only went out with him when they had no one else on hand. During his fortnight sleeve Olivier was in great demand. Everyone referred to him as the Red Devil and the girls regarded him with secret yearning and fascinated awe, as though he had already assassinated two or three wealthy widows. He spent a few nights with Micheline, the prettiest of them all, the one who lent a certain tone to the group, for she spoke of life, love and death with the utmost cynicism. She was nineteen and had had a miscarriage in Switzerland, which added somewhat to her aura. One day Micheline asked him, as though it was the most commonplace thing in the world. Have you ever killed anyone? She was obviously disappointed by his answer. Before he left for Indochina, Micheline had come and spent a week with him at Van. She had dyed her hair dead white and wore a beauty spot on the corner of her chin, which made her look like an 18th century Marx. Micheline had notified him, as though it was a matter of no consequence, of her marriage to Bizag, and Olivier had realized he was no longer in the running as a prospective husband. It was flattering and at the same time disheartening. Micheline had made a habit of writing to him regularly in Indochina, she told him about her love affairs, her little infidelities here and there, her trips to Paris. One day he replied, I've killed someone and from now on things are different. Then he had stopped writing to her for good. To his own amazement, second lieutenant, later lieutenant, Merle, who had no particular bent for a military career did extremely well and was highly esteemed for his courage and endurance. Among the decorations that had been handed out wholesale to the defenders of Dean Bianfu when it was known that the garrison was done for, he was awarded the Legion d'honneur and everyone felt it was well deserved. Piniers had told him. Now you can stay on in the army and become a regular. But young Merle had not the slightest wish to become a regular and at the moment he was passing blood. At one of the halts he dragged himself along to the M.O. I'm completely drained, he said, I'm dying of thirst. I can't go on. I've also got dysentery, the M.O. told him, and I've nothing to take for it. Imetine's what we need but the Viets haven't even got any for themselves, so they say. Well, what's the answer? There's no answer. Just carry on. It might cure itself, you can never tell. Try and drink some of the water in which the rice is cooked, that's an old wives remedy. It hasn't done me any good. Possibly because, as a medical man, I don't believe in remedies of that sort. Merle was getting weaker and weaker and his comrades had to help him along. He kept saying over and over again, it's no joke, it's no joke. Lakem swam in his own fat which was becoming as fluid as oil. He kept dreaming of vast platefuls of boiled beef, stewed mutton and roast veal, and his hunger was sometimes so obsessive that he fancied he was inhaling the savory smells of rich cooking. Less cure, isolated in his madness, ambled along between Glatini and Esclavia, a disjointed sightless puppet attached to life by a few slender threads. But when they came to Sunla, where they had to ford a small stream, he refused to step into the water and began struggling. I know this place. It's sown with mines and the Viets are in position on the far bank. We'll have to go round by the mountains. He grabbed at a terrified Bodoy. Go and tell the Major, more Len. I've some information for him. The Viets. You're mistaken, Esclavia gently corrected him. It's our partisans who are holding the far bank. Instantly pacified, Lescure followed his captain into the water. During the night of 27 to 28 May they passed through the old entrenched camp of Nassan. The voice ordered a halt, 
which lasted several hours. It had stopped raining, the sky had cleared, it was now luminous and the color of milk. They were at the foot of a tooth-shaped peak which was still crowned with a few strands of rusty barbed wire and stacks of punctured sandbags. I held this strong point for three months, Esclavia told Glatini. It was full of the et corpses, they reached right up to my dugout. I thought Nasan was impregnable. I also thought Dean Bianfu was impregnable. Everyone thought Dean Bianfu was impregnable, Glatini replied in a flat voice, the captains, the colonels, the generals, the ministers, the Americans, the pilots and even the sailors who knew nothing about it. Everyone, do you realize? No one doubted it for a moment. I was in a particularly good position to know. The calm of the night, the milky night, the memory of the battles at Nasan, which for him had been victories, made Esclav ear tolerant for a certain length of time and he forgot his harsh conception of war and his favorite axiom, the man who loses is guilty and must be executed. Why did we foul it up so badly? He asked dispassionately. At this point Glatini felt that by explaining Dean Bianfu he could exorcise his remorse. Boys Furos came up and without a word sat down beside them. We had to protect Laos, Glatini explained, to which France had just committed herself by signing a treaty of defense. Laos was the first country to join the French Union. We had to stem the main Viet Minh advance on the Tonkinese Delta, on Hanoi and Haiphong. So as to gain time we chose Dean Bianfu in order to engage them. 500 miles from our bases? Esclavier interjected. The Viets were also 500 miles from theirs and they had no air force. Their only supply line was this secondary road, RP-41, this umbilical cord which our pilots claimed they could put out of service at a moment's notice. That's what they never stopped saying, anyway. Only it wasn't true and Dean Bianfu was a basin. Certainly, but the largest one in Southeast Asia, 10 miles by 5. We could lay down several landing strips for our modern aircraft. The ridges commanding it were farther away than the range of the Viet Minh guns. To shell the entrenched camp, the Viets therefore had to sight their artillery either on the forward slope or else in the plain. There, we could fight back, destroy it with our superior guns our planes and our armor. But the Viets dug their guns in. They came down to engage us in the plain and in the plain we held the heights. So the Viets then stormed the heights and overran us. Boys Führers broke in. We were wrong from start to finish because we tried to see the war from the point of view of Saigon, or, at the most, of Paris, by forcing ourselves to believe that it was possible to isolate the Vietnamese peninsula from the rest of the Asiatic and communist world and that we could calmly embark on our little operation of colonial reconquest. Sheer stupidity. We should have regarded this war through the eyes of Moscow or Peking. Now, Moscow and Peking did not give a damn about Vietnam, this cul-de-sac which led nowhere, but they did care about Dean Bianfu, and very much so. I know Southeast Asia pretty well. It's more or less my country, I've been around here for years, I've fought here against the Japs and the Chinese. I've also read quite a lot of communist literature. What does Lenin say? The future of world revolution lies with the great masses of Asia. China is communist, but there still remains India which is closed to China by the Himalayas, to Russia by the Pamirs and the ranges of Afghanistan. The only point of entry is through Bengal and Southeast Asia. Among the seething races of the Far East which can hardly be numbered, there's only one ethnic group of any historical or political interest, the Thais. They've got a history, they've built an empire. They're called Chans and Garans in Burma, they're also to be found in Thailand and Laos. In the Oat region they represent three-fifths of the population and they're also established in Yunnan. The capital of this Thai empire is Dean Bianfu. The communists decided to work on the Thais so as to force an entry into India. They set up the Thai majority in Yunnan as an autonomous people's republic and, I can tell you now, it was on that business that I was engaged. The Chinese want to group all the other Thais round their people's republic. Once that is done, 
All that's needed is a slight nudge for the whole of Southeast Asia to collapse. Then every gateway into India will be open to them. They therefore could not allow the historical and geographical capital of the ties to be held by Western anti-communists. Mao Zedong ordered the capture of Dean Bianfu while Jayap was dreaming about the Delta. Dean Bianfu was the only basin where the big modern bombers could take off, Glatini observed, and the Americans had thought of it with a view to. With a view to what? Boyce Führers inquired. With a view to attacking China, perhaps. No one ever mentioned that possibility, said Esclavia. Glatini was afraid he had spoken too freely, he tried to correct himself. There was a rumor to that effect, I wasn't in the know about anything connected with secret international negotiations. But all of a sudden his regard for security seemed absurd. Nevertheless, he went on, the Americans were most insistent that we should choose Dean Bianfu. And Jaya put 30,000 of his Bodois slaughtered to please the Chinese. But in return he received from them 24 105 mm guns, 1875 mm, 112.7 AA guns, 80 37 mm, and all the ammunition he could possibly want. And also the promise of volunteers, if necessary, Boyce Führers chipped in. The communists are perfectly logical. Dean Bianfu was something on which their very life depended. That's what the Americans failed to see. It's true that American opinion, which is anti-colonialist by tradition, would have found it difficult to support a conflict, which the whole of their press condemned as colonial, to the extent of going to war. And yet Dean Bianfu was one of those battles which set the two blocks by the ears. Only the French found themselves facing the whole communist machine on their own. Glatini lay back in the damp grass and gazed up at the sky, in the moonlight the clouds sparkled like strings of artificial jewels. He had flown over this valley in the comfort of the general's aircraft and attended the briefings at which clever staff officers had dissected the war in detail but without grasping it as a whole. In the same aircraft he had accompanied those wretched little ministers who came out from time to time on a tour of inspection. They were 10,000 miles away from hearth and home and could only regard this conflict from the narrow viewpoint of little town councillors. How could they imagine another world in which vast swarms of men were famished, longing for the smallest morsel of food, and crazed with hope? After this halt and this respite, the voice subjected the prisoners to a forced march as though he wanted to make them atone for their victory at Nassan, and many of them, dazed with fatigue, lay down and died by the side of the road. Merle was getting worse and worse. As a result of some subtle and secret bargaining, Boyce Führers managed to obtain a few tablets of Stuversal from one of the Bodois. He made the lieutenant take them and Merle began to feel better almost immediately. Later on he asked Boyce Führers. It couldn't have been an easy job getting those tablets. No. You wouldn't be able to get any more, I suppose. They're finished. And what if you or Glatini or someone else suddenly needs some? We'll have to do without. The prisoners were now all living in a secondary state of consciousness, they hovered on the brink between nightmare and reality their will and courage fell apart while their personal characteristics and everything that contributed to their individualities melted away into the uniform grey mass slogging along through the mud. The voice behaved like a scientific chemist, he regulated their hunger, their fatigue and their despair so as to reduce them to the exact point at which, broken and deranged, he could at last work on them and drill them against their past by concentrating on what still remained, the elementary reflexes of fear fatigue and hunger. He kept assembling them incessantly for instruction periods. One day he started in vain against the French command which had just refused to take over the wounded of Dean Bianfu. As though to confirm his words, the French air force came and bombed the road. After a night march which was even more exhausting than usual, he kept telling them in that smooth, impersonal, relentless voice of his. We are obliged to make you march by night to protect you from being bombed by your own aircraft. That is what capitalism, with its internal contradictions, leads to. This was more than Pinyers could stomach. 
he turned to Boyce Führers and asked. What the hell does he mean by the internal contradictions of capitalism? Not daring to wage the sort of war that's necessary to defend oneself. Not reorganizing and remodeling oneself so as to carry the war into the enemy camp, shutting oneself up in ivory towers, not fighting by night, employing mercenaries, like us, for instance, instead of hurling into the fray everyone who is anxious for the capitalist system to survive, using money and technology as a substitute for faith, forgetting that the masses are the mainspring of all endeavor, corrupting them with modern amenities instead of keeping them wiry and alert with the offer of some valid purpose in life. Pale and emaciated, Merle angrily retorted. The masses enjoy modern amenities as much as we do. In Europe they discover the refrigerator and television. The Arabs also take to modern amenities, so do the Hindus the Chinese and the Patagonians. When I get back to France I shall lie back and wallow in all those amenities. I shan't drink anything unless it's iced and I'll only go to bed with nice clean little girls who wash between the legs with disinfectants. The civilization of the frigid air and the bidet, Esclavia sneered. On the 7th of June Esclavia stole a fork from one of the Bodois and on the 8th they forded a river in spate. There were several hundred coolies at work in the dark, repairing a bridge by the light of bamboo torches, and each gang, by means of slogans and songs, maintained an illusion of feverish activity. The sound of an aircraft overhead brought them to a standstill, all the torches were instantly extinguished. Complete silence ensued among coolies and prisoners alike. All of a sudden Les Cure burst out into his mad guffaw. Two officers from the adjacent group tried to make a break for it, but they were brought back a few hours later, knocked senseless with rifle butts and dragged before their comrades. The days of leniency appeared to be over and Lakeham, who had stepped aside into the undergrowth in order to relieve himself, was trussed up as though he too had been trying to escape. He protested his innocence in a sorrowful voice and was beaten up for his pains. Boys Führers who suddenly felt anxious, eavesdropped on the sentry's conversation, the Geneva conference had fallen through. The number of prisoners who were tied up increased every day. The Oat region had now given place to the Moan. The mosquitoes were voracious and countless, leeches had appeared on the scene, it began to be extremely hot. The days and nights never varied in their routine. Daylight meant the rice chore and a period of rest in the midst of a cloud of mosquitoes. As soon as night fell the Bodois lit their torches and resumed their march through the forest and paddy fields. Lakeham, who had his hands tied behind him, kept stumbling, a grotesque Christ with pendulous cheeks like an old hag's bottom. He did not even beg Piniers to help him along any more. The injustice of which he was the victim struck him as being so enormous that he could not bring himself to protest. Something must have gone seriously wrong with the workings of the Almighty if they believed him to be capable of such incorrect behavior as escaping. Yet he was prepared to like the Viet Minh and believe in all their nonsense. In the first place he had always been in favor of universal peace. The commissariat had nothing to do with war, a supplies officer was simply a grocer at the disposal of the army, and he fully intended, when he retired to start a shop at Bergerac where his wife's family lived. He felt a hand behind him unfastening his bonds. It was Mamoudi taking pity on him. They'll see, protested Lakeham, who insisted on enduring his punishment even though it was unjust, to show he was well disposed. Leave him alone, said Ben Years. Can't you see he's enjoying it? He's loving every moment. A Bodoi walked down the column and Lakeham wriggled away from Mamadi's hands, heaving deep sighs so that the sentry should hear him and see for himself how much he was suffering. He kept going, titupping along the track. Many of them were worn out by dysentery and were passing blood. The voice gave orders for them to be left behind in the villages through which they passed. Our medical service will take care of them, he promised. Not one of those prisoners was ever seen again. They died secretly in the corner of some thatch hut, wasted away by dysentery, festering from their wounds. The march now appeared to be endless, it went on and on, in the rain and in the mud, 
Among the mosquitoes and the leeches, it looked as if it might continue all the way to China, until all the prisoners died of dysentery by the side of the road. One night, which was less dark than usual, long after the crossing of the Black River by ferryboat from Takho, they noticed that the wild vegetation all round them was being succeeded by a semblance of cultivation. The trail, which was broad and straight but hemmed in by tall grass, led towards a little hummock. On the summit stood the blackened ruins of a large colonial house with its veranda. There were broad open spaces between the rubber trees and between each coffee bush, and the undergrowth had not yet encroached on these. The pitiful stamp of the white man, Boyce Führers said to himself. Some peasant had come all the way out here from the mountains of Auvergne or the banks of the Garonne, some stubborn peasant with fists like hams. He had cleared the soil and built himself a house, recruited coolies, sometimes with a kick in the ass, but he had stuck to this valley, the only one of his species, like a medieval robber baron. He had struggled against the climate, against fever against the jungle which he forced back step by step, also against the men whom he induced to work according to his methods and to live according to his pace. The French colonial had come out to Indochina at a time when white men still deserved to be masters of the world by virtue of their courage, their stamina, their energy, their pride in their own race, their sense of their own strength, their superiority, their lack of scruples. Boyce Führers did not belong to this category, he was a marauder. His type had infested China. He looked back on his youth as a series of flickering images, like an old newsreel accompanied by the burning, thudding rhythm of fever. Shanghai, the gunboats on the Wampu, the evenings at the sporting club, the lovely Russian refugees from Harbin, and the bandy-legged little Japs worming their way into the concessions and disembarking their troops. His father collected old jade and little Chinese prostitutes, and officially acted as political advisor to the Chamber of Commerce, he delighted in playing the part of a man of mystery. Perhaps it was from him that he inherited his taste for clandestine activity, which alone could account for his presence in the army of this secondary country, among these wretched prisoners. Chiang Kai-shek's forces were hammering at the gates of the city on the mud bank. Julian Boyce Führers was ten years old. His father and a few other rolled sharks of his sort met the Chinese generalissimo in secret. They convinced him that the communists had decided to kill him to get complete control of the Kuomintang. Chiang believed them or pretended to. He came to an arrangement, he stuffed his pockets with dollars and his troops wiped out the communists and dipped the skinny little students of Canton into boiling cauldrons. Julian Boyce Führers was eighteen. He had gone to bed with girls and found it boring, played poker and felt that it was not worth gambling unless one staked one's whole life and soul. He made friends with some young communists and with a certain Liuang who was operating with his group in the territory of the international concession. He provided them with information and money, both of which he got hold of at home. His old man worked undercover and was pleased to instruct his son in the manifold aspects of underground political activity in China. One night Julian asked him. Was it true about that plot against Chiang Kai-shek? Armand Boyce Führers simply replied. Where there are communists, there's always a plot. Chiang realized that. That's not the kind of information we want, Li Wang told him. That's all over and done with and we don't give a damn. Has your father met the Japanese Consul General, what did Chiang say to him the day before yesterday? That's the sort of thing we're after. On another occasion his father explained. The balance of the world depends on the disunity of China. A united China in the hands of a single group, of a single party, is liable to set the world ablaze. Communism is the great danger because only the communists are capable of uniting China. They have all the necessary qualifications, in humanity, in tolerance, single-mindedness, and they're mad. The prattlings of your father? Liuang would say. Not the slightest interest to us. But we shall be needing arms. And through him you could get some for us. Julian was nineteen. His father had summoned him to his office in the Chamber of Commerce, he had heard about his connection with the Communist Party. The old man did not moralize, that wasn't his way, 
he cut him off without a penny and turned him out of the house. You can come back when you've got over this nonsense. But Li Wang dropped Julian. He was no longer living with his father, he was therefore of no further interest. He did not believe in the conversion of the sons of Taipans. Their fathers had plundered China, their sons thought they could make amends with a show of remorse and a few contributions. That didn't work. Young whites who were well disposed were to be handled only as long as they were useful, then they were chucked away like a paper napkin. After all, they had much the same color, consistency and fragility as one. Julian was twenty. He was reconciled to his father and the old man had sent him to a business college in America. Came the 1940 armistice in France. Julian felt it was unpleasant but was not deeply affected by it. He did not regard himself as a citizen of a small western country but as a white man of the Far East, and to him the internal quarrels of Europe seemed ludicrous. Came the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which forced him to come to some decision. He had a French passport, he was living in America. His father was in China. He therefore joined up in the British Army. At the age of 22 he had the DSO, amoebic dysentery, an abscess of the liver and malaria. Within six months he was patched up in a hospital in New Delhi. His father was then in Dongqing, acting as official advisor to Chiang Kai-shek. He went and joined him. The old man was still surrounded by his retinue of policemen, intelligence agents, prostitutes, smugglers, bankers and generals. He was like certain mushrooms, he needed all this tongue in order to live. The old man was still pursuing his pet ideas, enjoying his pipe of opium and going to bed with younger and younger girls. He considered that the real enemies of China were the communists, not the Japanese whom the Americans would soon bring to heel. He urged Chiang to use the arms and equipment provided by the USA against the troops of Mao Zedong and Chu the while these were still badly organized. But at this American sentiment rebelled. Washington could only deal with one war at a time and the crafty type and Boyce Führers was sent into exile. Julian joined the French army and was posted to Mission 5 at Kung Ming. He set off for Yunnan, reached the Oat region of Tonkin and made contact for the first time with the Viet Minh guerrillas. In fulfillment of his mission, he convinced the communist leaders that he had come as a defender of democracy and not as the vanguard of a colonial reconquest. He already considered the Viet Minh efficient and dangerous. He was frequently sent into China. Each time he came back to Indochina he noticed the Viet Minh were organizing and developing according to the self-same methods as the Chinese Communist Party. When he went down to Saigon, he stayed with the director of the Bank of Indochina and established close connections with the big Chinese bankers of Kowloon. The American and Chinese services in Formosa repeatedly invited him to work for them, but he was not interested in money. The French intelligence service was better suited to his temperament and to the aim he had in mind. Its disorganization and complexity allowed him a completely free hand. He had an old score to settle with Li Wang, for that purpose it was more convenient to be in uniform. His father stayed on in Shanghai when the communists entered in order to negotiate some commercial agreements with the new regime. He had plenty of guts, the old bastard. His negotiations met with failure, there was no one left to corrupt except the whole regime, and even that could not be done at once. For four years Taipan Armand Boyce Führers, deprived of his opium and little girls, had remained as a hostage in the hands of the communists, then he had gone back to France. The communists had denied him the dung on which he lived, it was a wonder he did not die. In China the only form of self-indulgence left was the synthetic breeding of sexless ants in chemically pure surroundings. In the morning one of the Bodois came to fetch Boyce Führers. The voice watched the captain approaching. There was a strange smile on his face as he offered him a cigarette. You don't seem to have suffered much from this arduous march, Captain. Then all of a sudden he broke into Vietnamese. I'm told you speak our language extremely well. As only those who have got our blood in their veins can do. You're a half-caste, aren't you, at two or three generations removed perhaps? 
I was brought up by a Vietnamese nurse and I learned your language before my own. What were you doing at Dien Bien Phu? I was in charge of the PIMS because of my knowledge of Vietnamese. I've already told you that. At a sign from the voice two Bodois seized the captain. They tied his hands behind his back with the length of wire, pulling his elbows up with a jerk. That was a lie, Captain Boyce Furas. You belonged to the GCMA organization and you only got to Dean Bien Phu during the last few days. Before that you were north of Phong Tho where you commanded a group of partisans. You were one of those wretches who were trying to raise the mountain minorities against the Vietnamese people. Boyce Furas had only passed through Phong Thomas he had gone farther north to deal with the ties of Yan'an. The voice was confusing him with a quadroon officer who belonged to that organization and had tried to form a guerrilla group from the mountain people and some Chinese bandits. The officer had been killed in an ambush laid by his own men, there had been some fuss over a girl or over money or opium. The Viet Minh had had nothing to do with the business. He saw that it was very much in his interests to be confused with this half-caste. I admit I lied. I appreciate your frankness, late though it is. It's my duty to punish you. You will be tied up for the rest of the march. You are absolutely forbidden to say a word to the sentries. But if you are so keen on practicing Vietnamese, you can always come and see me. We could then discuss what you were doing north of Phong Tho. My mission there was a failure. It was bound to be. We shall hold a court of inquiry to see if you committed any war crimes. Until then you will be under special surveillance. Boyce Führers completed the march isolated from his comrades and under the close watch of three sentries who jabbed the barrels of their submachine guns into his ribs as soon as he opened his mouth. His guards were changed every day. Tied up between two bodoys, Boyce Führers marched at the end of the column. The wire had bitten into his wrists, his swollen, purple hands were paralyzed. He had lost his former agility and stubbed his feet on every obstacle in his path. Sometimes his ears, buzzing with fever, echoed with the din of heavy hobnailed boots tramping over delicate porcelain, with the shrill cries of women being raped and with the noise of tearing canvas. Then in his mind's eye he saw that lovely painting on silk that used to be in his father's house in Shanghai and which came from the plunder of the summer palace. It represented three reeds and a corner of a lake by moonlight. They smashed everything, his father told him, with the toes of their boots or the butts of their rifles, the loveliest and oldest vases in the world. There was a marine lieutenant with them who suddenly found he had a taste for Chinese objects. He only broke what he could not steal, that was your grandfather, my boy. As Boyce Furose's exhaustion increased, the sound of breaking porcelain became louder and more ear-shattering until he had to clench his teeth. He had a vague notion that he was being made to suffer to atone for his grandfather's looting. When he realized this, he felt furious at the thought of being so deeply affected by the Christian or communist sense of sin, an original sin with the Christians, a class sin with the communists. He then applied himself to freeing his hands. After a long and patient endeavor which took him three days, he managed to slip the wire off his wrists. During the few hours they halted he was able to move his cramped fingers and revive the circulation. When the sentry came to check his bonds in the evening, he had refastened them and they appeared to be as tight as ever. From then on he no longer heard the sound of smashing porcelain in the summer palace. 5. Lieutenant Mamoudi's Theft after crossing the Red River at Yan Bay, the prisoners headed in a northerly direction across the Mon region. One night, during a longer lap than usual, they emerged onto the RC2. In the moonlight they could see a signpost, Hanoi 161 km, then another, Hanoi 160 km. These signposts with their French measures of distance, the good old kilometers of the Ile de France, of Normandy, Gascony and Provence, were like life boys to which they could cling for a few precious seconds before being swept back into their nightmare. Hanoi 157 km. They left the Hanoi road and turned down a side trail leading towards the bright river. 
The surface was corrugated with six-year-old furrows over which ran a winding path for pedestrians and cyclists. The following night they crossed the bright river in canoes. The village of Bakenhang on the far bank was intact. The voice gave orders for the sick to be evacuated to the hospital and Lescu was taken from his comrades, then, as a measure of leniency he had the bonds removed from all the officers who had been tied up, with the exception of Boy's Führers. At daybreak the column did not make its customary halt. By tortuous paths it kept going until it reached a vast open space flanked by a pebbly stream. Several columns of prisoners were drawn up at the edge of the forest, divided according to race, French, North Africans, Blacks. A little to one side stood the group of senior officers from Dean Bianfu who had left Mi Wong Fun by truck a month earlier. A small detachment of Bodois had been detailed to keep watch over General de Castries. The heat was suffocating. There was a watchtower near the river. A camera and tripod had been set up on its platform which was shaded by a strip of matting. Beside it stood a white man in a fiber helmet, surrounded by a group of canbos. He was tall and fair, dressed in a bush shirt, khaki slacks and light jungle boots. They're going to film us for the newsreels, said Ben Years. They just want to kill us off, said Merle, who was dying of fatigue, heat and thirst. None of them had anything to drink and they were not allowed to draw any water from the river. Im. Im. The Bodoyers were getting touchier and nastier. They had smartened themselves up and cleaned their weapons. The voice was strutting about among the group of combos surrounding the film director, while the prisoners stood pressed together, marking time in the full blaze of the sun. Eventually the combos returned to their respective groups. They paraded the prisoners on the open ground formed by the deposit of the river and drew them up in one solid column twelve deep, the officers at the head, with General de Castries alone in front. To give the impression of an endless mass, to create the illusion that the number of prisoners was infinitely greater, the last ranks were tucked away behind a bend in the river, and it looked as though these thousands of men were merely the advance guard of the huge captive armies of the West. The white man directed the scene, giving his orders in a French which was barely distorted by his Russian accent, and his voice was solemn and melodious. Forward. Slowly. The massive column staggered forward as he focused his camera. Back a few paces. It was essential not to show the rear ranks. Move the head of the column a few paces to the left. Forward. As you were. We'll start again. This sinister ballet of the vanquished lasted until midday. Esclavia and Glatini were marching side by side in the center of one rank, their heads hung in shame, both of them overwhelmed by the same feeling of humiliation. The camera to which the vanquished are subjected, said Glatini. The modern yoke, but more degrading. We'll be seen under this yoke thousands and thousands of times in every cinema in the world. Damned bastards, Esclavia muttered, wild with rage. The Soviet film director Carmen, a familiar figure at the Cannes Festival and in the bars of Paris, relaxed, professional and smiling, was trifling with the ultimate physical resources of his racial brothers for the sake of political propaganda. A dirty traitor, Esclavia hissed. If I could only get my hands round his neck and slowly choke the life out of him. He was identifying the Soviet film director with his brother-in-law, little while Esclavia with his damp hands, who had robbed him of everything, even his name, it was while he was dreaming of strangling. As you were. We'll begin again. Forward. That evening three officers died of exhaustion. One day the limestone formations came into sight and Glatini knew that he had not been mistaken. They were being taken to join the prisoners of Kaobang in the Nahang Nakok quadrilateral in which the French Air Force had been ordered not to operate. So as not to land fully laden, a pilot returning from a mission had once jettisoned his bombs onto some huts where he saw some men moving, and without knowing it had killed some of his own comrades. The commanders in chief were now on their guard against the trigger happiness of the Air Force pilots. The night marches came to an end. On the 21st of June the prisoners were given their ice ration at dawn. The column then set off along a broad, easy trail, 
which climbed a gentle slope in a dead straight line. The rumor spread throughout the column that they were about to arrive and the men derived fresh strength to push on, though they had been ready to drop a few moments before. The trail now ran past neat little villages with squat Vietnamese hutments. Red flags and banners everywhere lent a gay carnival note to the scene. A few Chinese merchants, whose wares overflowed into the road, had adorned their shop fronts with the Chinese communist flag and a photograph of Mao Zedong looking fat and self-satisfied. Civilians at last, Merle observed gleefully. We're back in civilization. Where there's a Chinaman, there's hope. Still tied up, Boyce Führers in his turn filed past the shops. The smell of Cantonese spices, the sight of pig's bladders, the sound of a language which was even more familiar to him than Vietnamese, put new life into him. Boyce Führers loved China and was rather scornful of Vietnam. Greater China was in a period of flux and her flag already floated over Tonkin, the Otanmon regions. She would overrun Malaya, Burma, India and the East Indies and one day the tide would turn, perhaps under atomic bombardment. But the flow would gather fresh impetus. China was an ocean bound by cosmic influences and, in spite of their pertinacity, their diligence and cruelty, the contemptible and pretentious masters who thought they could direct her would suffer the same fate as the other invaders before them, the Huns, the Mongols, the Manchus because their junks had for a moment or two sailed over this ocean which was the Chinese people, they fondly believed themselves to be the masters of it. And as he stumbled along between his three centuries, Boyce Führers used the pure Mandarin language of Mao Zedong to recite this poem by the new master of China. Standing on the highest summit of the six mountains. Beneath the red flag waving in the westerly breeze. With a long rope in my hand, I dream of the day. When we shall be able to bind the monster fast. Mao was mistaken. China was not the monster, the dragon with a hundred thousand mouths and a hundred thousand talons, but this ocean which could not be bound fast with a rope or dominated by force of arms. The column came to a halt by a thicket where there were some banana trees. Esclavier had got rid of his depression after the crossing of the bright river at Bakenhang and was now seething with energy and revolt. We're not dead yet, he said. I think we've got away with it this time. Now we'll show these dirty little bastards what we are made of. There are some bananas on those trees. Let's have them. Come on, pin years, Merle, Glatini. The officers went and asked a sentry for permission to relieve themselves. The Bodoy accompanied them as far as the banana trees but, since he belonged to the Puritan Republic of Vietnam, he turned away as the four men squatted down on their haunches. Go! Esclavier shouted, as though on a parachute jump, and they snaffled the bananas and crammed them into their pockets. But the sentry had turned round and caught Pinyers who was slower than the others. Beside himself with rage, the little green dwarf started hammering his fists into the ginger-haired giant, the odious imperialist who had stolen the property of the people. For Christ's sake don't hit back, Esclavier shouted out to warn him. He's only doing his job. Piniers was quivering with anger, to master his feelings, he stood stiffly to attention while the Bodoy went on hammering him with his puny little fists. You've still got the bananas? Esclavier asked him. Yes. That's the main thing. Merle gave a couple of small bananas to Lieutenant Mamoudi who was down in the dumps and racked with fever. But Mamoudi took umbrage. Why are you giving me these bananas? Merle shrugged his shoulders. You're not in very good shape, you know. Lack of vitamins, that's the reason for your fever. You're afraid to eat wild herbs as we do, so keep up your strength on bananas. It looks as though we're over the worst and we don't want to see you die. Why? Now listen. You're an Algerian and a Muslim, I'm on the reserve and, if anything, anti-militarist. Army people bore me to tears. They're not adult, not properly mature. But that's a minor detail for you and me, as it is for Glatini and Boyce Führers, for Piniers and Esclavier, and even for Lakeham. We're prisoners. So we're all in the same boat, we've got to survive, our bodies have got to hold out, but
but our characters have got to survive as well. We must safeguard whatever it is that makes us different individuals, each with his own particular quirk, his spirit of rebellion, his indolence, his taste for alcohol or girls. We've got to protect all this against these insects who are trying to grind it out of us. Esclavier's right, we've got to show them what we are made of. When that's done we can settle our own accounts, between us, as people of the same universe. There are only two universes, Mamoudi replied darkly, that of the oppressors and that of the oppressed, of the colonizers and of the colonized, in Algeria, that of the Arabs and that of the French. You're wrong said little Merle, lifting his finger in a falsely sententious manner. There are those who believe in mankind and can tear out their own guts without any danger, and those who defy the human species in order to deny the individual. The latter give you leprosy as soon as you touch them. They went through another village where they had to pass in front of a Chinese shop outside which there was a sort of large jar filled with molasses. Mamoudi, how would you go about it to steal some molasses? me steal molasses? He seemed surprised. This chap Merle was really rather disconcerting with the way he had of jumping abruptly from one subject to the next, of showing after a whole month of cohabitation that he was capable of personal ideas and reflection in spite of his spoiled child manners. Stealing molasses. Stealing. The word stirred his memory. It was at Lagwat, a market day in spring when the grey and blue-throated doves COO in the palm trees and the streams run clear and swift like young colts. They were coming down from the mountains, a band of barefoot urchins, and in the hoods of their threadbare jellabas they were carrying a few handfuls of dates for the road. On the square, where the camels of the black tent nomads had their pitch, they gathered round the donut merchant. Two of them made a pretense of fighting and the others knocked over the stall and made off their hands sticky with the sugared cakes. Merle, said Mamoudi, I think I know a way. Let's organize a fight in front of the Chinaman's stall, between you and me, for instance. You call me a thief, I'll go for you, and meanwhile the other chaps can pinch the molasses. Why should I call you a thief? Mamoudi gave a smile which lent his drawn features a certain mystery and beauty. It will remind me. Of a donut merchant. They enacted the scene to perfection. Dirty thief! Merle yelled. Mamoudi sprang at the lieutenant and both of them tussled together on the ground in front of the shop. The prisoners had gathered round the two men whom the sentries were trying to separate. The Chinese was jumping up and down, his arms outstretched, as a fat and furious as a turkey. Didi, more len. Go! Esclavier shouted. Empty tins were whipped out of pockets and each member of the team plunged his into the pot of molasses. At the next halt Lakem was elected to distribute the stuff between the members of the group. He was well qualified for the task. Notified of the incident, the voice sent for Mamoudi. I hear, he said, that one of your comrades insulted you outrageously and that all the other prisoners, out of racial spite, took his side. If you will tell me who this comrade was, he will be severely punished. Mamari gently shook his head. It was a purely personal misunderstanding and racialism did not come into it. The voice abruptly dropped his impersonal tone. He became passionate. You're a simpleton. With them racialism always exists. They make a show of being your brothers, those friends of yours, of considering you their equals, but if you really want to mix your blood with theirs, marry one of their women. For instance, then they send you packing as though you had committed some sacrilege. Which comrade was it? No. You needn't feel any solidarity with them, they're the colonialists who are holding your people in subjection, they're the ones who were beaten at Din Bianfu. Din Bianfu is the victory of all the Arab nations which are still under the heel of France. It's your duty to tell me which of them insulted you. Mamoudi's lips were dry. He felt a fit of trembling coming on. Your duty is an Algerian oppressed by French imperialism. The voice's finely drawn and handsome features had recovered their hieratic quality and beauty, also their spell, for he was the conqueror of an army which Mamoudi had always admired. 
the eyes in the golden mask opened and closed and the lieutenant felt he was being observed by a creature of infinite patience. To release himself from their spell, he confessed the truth. I organized that scuffle, sir, to enable my comrades he had stressed this word with a sort of fury which did not escape the voice, to steal some molasses from a Chinese merchant. You ought to be punished. But I shall let you off. Go away. The voice watched him as he went. He had avoided making the bad mistake of sending him back with his hands tied behind him. Because of this punishment the Arab would have felt an even stronger solidarity with the other prisoners, and party instructions on this score were explicit, use every means to separate the blacks and North Africans from the French. Lieutenant Mamoudi did not have the calm strength of Dyer, the black medical officer, with the powerful laugh which rose from his belly. He was more apprehensive, more uncertain. But this imbecile had reopened a secret wound in the voice's heart. It was in the days of Admiral de Coup. Pham was then a student at Hanoi and belonged to a youth movement founded by Commander Ducaroy. It was the first time in Indochina that white youths and young Vietnamese were to be found together in the same camps and under the same organization. Stripped to the waist, in khaki shorts, mingling together like brothers, they saluted the striking of the French flag at sunset, while the whole of the white man's Asia was crumbling under the blows of the Japanese who already held the aerodromes in Tonkin. It was their fam who had met Jacques Sillier, one of the group leaders, a lad of nineteen with sturdy cuffs and close cropped hair, who wore a scout's badge. Sillier made a cult of leadership, tradition, the church, personal hygiene, physical fitness and frankness which he called loyalty. A violent admiration had drawn him towards this prince whom the camp had somehow acquired. There was nothing unusual about this devotion, which they all showed towards him, yellow and white alike. Jacques Sillier, more by instinct than reasoning, knew how to make his friendship valued. At his table, a few planks on two trestles set under a big Chinese pine, the food consisted of rice and bully beef and was served in metal mess tins. But the boy he had selected to sit on his right because he had shown most stamina on a test march, or because he had constructed a raft of creepers and bamboo with his own hands or had killed a snake without even appealing to his comrades for help, that boy, the prince's guest, felt his endeavor and courage well rewarded by this distinction. Fam often sat on Jacques' right. Although he hated physical training, he had become supple and strong. Although he enjoyed sophisticated conversation and improving on reality by means of poetic fancy, he had become down to earth and even slightly brusque. When they left Camp Jack Sillier, the son of a colonial administrator, had invited him home. His life as an impoverished student had been transformed. The Silliers were extremely affable, they considered that their religion gave them certain duties towards others and, like Anglo-Saxon parsons, they were inclined to play a role that was something between a dictator of conscience and a sports trainer. They had seven children, Jacques' younger sister was called Beatrice. She was not very pretty, but had an indefinable adolescent charm. Every morning Fam and his friend went for a run round the Great Lake they would come home panting and exhausted. Beatrice used to say. You're like a couple of puppies scampering after the wind and coming back with nothing. Tomorrow I want some flowers. Fama had brought her some flowers. She had smiled and kissed him on the cheek. The young Vietnamese had fallen in love with Beatrice and did not hide it from her. One day Jacques had said. Let's not go running today. Come for a stroll round the garden. Fam still remembered the blaze of the flamboyants, the pale grey colour of the sky and the acid pear drop flavour of the morning air. With his hands thrust into the pockets of his shorts, Jacques hung his head and kicked up the sand in the path with the toes of his sandals. Fam, my parents have asked me to talk to you about Beatrice. You know, she's only seventeen and nothing but a tomboy. And any idea of your marrying her is out of the question. Why? We're Catholics and for us everyone, whatever his race, is equal and alike. In principle. But. Fam had felt the sort of ice-cold blast that heralds about of fever. Jacques had gone on. It will be difficult for me to see you again for some time. Oh, 
Come along now, don't take on so. If you could only see your face. It'll work out all right in the end. You'll forget Beatrice, you'll marry a girl from your own country. Fam had left without a word. His friendship for Jacques and what he believed to be his love for Beatrice had turned into a deep-rooted secret hatred for all whites, especially those who tried to bridge the gap between the two races and then fought shy. At this juncture he was approached by some of his university friends at Hanoi who belonged to the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. After its suppression in 1940, the Central Committee had been obliged to withdraw to China and the students were getting slightly out of hand. They harbored a sense of injustice and dreamed in a vague way of the independence of their country and of splendid destinies for themselves. Pham had followed them. He had the same feeling of resentment, the same ambition and not a vestige of political education. But one morning a man had turned up from Shenzhen. He had assembled the students and had given them the latest international directives of the Comintern. From now on the Communist Party must take the lead in every national liberation movement and unite the maximum number of nationalist and socialist organizations in the struggle against fascist imperialism. And Pham was the one whom the Central Committee's envoy had made responsible for initiating his comrades into the Viet Minh program as it had been worked out in the depths of China by a certain Guanai Kwok who was now known by the name of Ho Chi Minh. He could recite the three points of this program by heart. We must get rid of the French and Japanese fascists and aim at the independence of Vietnam. We must establish a democratic republic of Vietnam. We must form an alliance with the democracies which are opposed to fascism and aggression. To Pham fascism had assumed the brawny muscular form of Jacques Sellier. But Jacques Sellier did not die as a fascist. At the time of the Japanese advance he and two other scouts had joined a guerrilla band organized by a half-caste lieutenant. He had been wounded and the bandy-legged little soldiers of the Mikado had finished him off. Pham had never forgiven him, either, for meeting such a noble end. He had already become a true communist and he felt that outside the party there could be neither hope nor heroism. The halt lasted until early in the afternoon. Captain de Glatini, banana thief and former staff officer, lay stretched out in the grass. He was dreaming vaguely of a number of things, of his comrades and of Les Cure who had left them. On the eve of his departure for hospital Glatini had sat beside the madman who was teasing a cricket with a blade of grass. The captain had suddenly had the impression that Les Cure was re-establishing contact with the real world. He called out to him in a parade ground voice. Les Cure. Lieutenant Lescure. Lescure went on playing with the cricket and, without raising his head, gently answered. To hell with you, Captain. I don't want to know anything, I don't want to be told anything and I'm perfectly alright, thank you. To be like Lescure. To reject all the anxieties, all the problems to which modern life was bound to subject every officer, to adopt the favorite bureaucratic formula. I don't want to know how restful that would be. The prisoners had to leave the trail to negotiate some slippery little mud embankments which ran between the bright green rectangles of the paddy fields, past screens of bamboo and clumps of mango, banana and guava trees. Darkness was beginning to fall and lent a limpid crystalline transparency to the atmosphere. It was then the two men appeared, emerging from behind a screen of trees. They were naked to the waist, clothed only in a cheap cocoon of uncertain color and, to prevent themselves from slipping, they walked with their toes spread out like ducks. They were carrying a huge black pig suspended from a bamboo pole and moved extremely fast, trotting along with the loose-limbed gait like all Vietnamese peasants. But they were far taller, and their skin was not the color of virgin oil but looked grayish and dull. One of them wore a sort of blackish beret on his head, and the other a grotesque hat made of rice straw. They caught up with the column by a short cut, lowered the pig and the pole to the ground, rounded on a bodoi who tried to make them move on, and watched the pitiful procession of prisoners with profound interest and unmixed pleasure. Here, I say, Esclavia, said the one with the beret. What are you doing here, sausage face? Esclavia recognized that slightly rasping voice and also the expression sausage face, 
but not the man with the translucid complexion, whose skinny body could not have weighed more than 130 pounds. Yet it could be none other than Lieutenant Leroy of the 6th BCP who had been reported missing at Kaobang, the athlete who had run away with the Army Athletics Championship in spite of his 200 pounds weight. Esclavier ran his tongue over his dry lips. Don't tell me it's you, Leroy. It's me all right, and the chap at the other end of the pig is Orsini of the 3rd Bep. We've been expecting you for several days. Are we still far from the camp? A mile or two. So long, sausage face, we'll come and see you this evening what the hell does this damned little bodoi think he's doing, pushing me around? And the peace of the people, what about that, you little monkey? It's your duty to re-educate us, all right, but that doesn't mean you can push us around. Im. Im. Disconcerted by the assurance of the two old hands and the flood of words they let fly at him, the Bodoi calmly allowed them to pick up their pig and bamboo pole and move on. With their fast trotting gait they soon left the column behind them and disappeared behind a screen of trees. A third village appeared with its houses raised on stilts among the trees. Halt! The column came to a standstill. Each group leader was ordered to count his men and then went and reported to the voice. He was accompanied by another Viet, as squat and bandy legged as a Japanese. A sort of map case hung on his skinny buttocks. His name was Drin, he was the general supervisor, the head warder of Camp 1. He was ruthless, brutal and efficient, and the voice knew he could trust him implicitly. The voice was sensitive and certain things repelled him. Trin made himself responsible for these. The voice was the pure conscience of the Viet Minh world, Trin was the material element. The voice embarked on a speech. You have reached your internment camp. It is useless to try and escape. A certain number of your comrades captured at Kaobung have tried more than once. Not one of them succeeded and we had to take severe disciplinary measures. Now they have come to their senses and have mended their ways. You are here in order to be re-educated. You must take advantage of this stay in the Democratic Republic of Vietnam to instruct yourselves, discover the evil of your errors, repent and become fighters for peace. From now on you will have some of your former comrades as group leaders. We have selected them from the ablest among them. Dirty rats, Esclavia muttered through clenched teeth. You must obey them, follow their instructions. I also have a splendid piece of news to announce. The new French Prime Minister, Mr. Mendez France, appears to be inspired with the best intentions with a view to signing the armistice. Who's this fellow Mendez? Piniers asked Glatini. An awkward character, who has always been in favor of the evacuation of Indochina. I personally regard him as a sort of Kierensky, only less beguiling. I know him, said Esclavia, on the strength of having met him once or twice in England, when he was with de Gaulle. He's ugly, brittle and conceited but at least he fought, which is pretty rare for a politician, he's intelligent, which is rarer still, and he's got character, which is exceptional. But a man like that won't ever sign the armistice, said Lakeham dejectedly. He's a Jew said Mamari contemptuously, and a Jew might do anything. There are no Jews here with us. You're wrong, said Esclavia, as a matter of fact there are two, a captain who fought extremely well and who's no different from any of us, and a crackpot lieutenant who dreams of stuffing himself with cakes and being made a librarian at the National so as to be able to spend the rest of his life reading. Each team was quartered in a hut on stilts. On the far side of a tributary of the Bright River which the last storm had swollen and filled with mud, the prisoners could see the neat lines of huts of Camp 1. The officers taken prisoner at Kaobang had been living there for the last four years, ninety of them had survived. Lakeham lowered himself onto his bunk with a deep sigh. Well, we've got here at last, we may as well make the best of it. I really thought I was done for and I'm sure if it hadn't been for Piniers and you others. Balls to that, the lieutenant muttered. Whatever you say, you're part of the army and a comrade and that's why we helped you. What's happened to Boyce Führers, I wonder? Glatini asked. Boyce Führers has got out of tighter spots than this, 
Esclavia replied. He was once in the hands of the Japs for three weeks. And he came through all right. I once had a brush with the Gestapo, we compared our experience. His was. Slightly more refined, shall we say? Lieutenants Leroy and Orsini turned up shortly afterwards, still as unconcerned as ever. Out of their pockets tumbled some bananas and tobacco and an old copy of Lhumanite. Lhumanite's not for reading, said Orsini, who was short, thick-set and swarthy, it's for rolling cigarettes. How did you come by all this stuff? Merle asked. How do you think? We pinched it, of course. In the interest of reciprocal rights, Orsini explained. Now here's the dope, said Leroy. Your team seems to have a pretty bad reputation, since the group leader they've chosen for you is little Marindal, who couldn't be better at the job. Marindal. Orsini said delightedly. That's someone to conjure with. A bastard, is he? said Glutini. That name seems to ring a bell. A stool pigeon? Piniers asked. Our best friend, said Leroy. Officially the number one collaborator of the camp, but actually he could be called the head of the resistance. He's got the right idea, Orsini scratched round his armpit and brought out a louse which he crushed between his thumbnails, to get the best of the Viets you've got to humor them and give them confidence in you. He's a double, a triple, a quadruple agent. He has got the best of everyone, the Viets, the camp commander, the meteor, us and perhaps himself as well. You'd better spread it around. Leroy went on. Potin, another group leader, is a communist. He turned communist here. He believes in it quite sincerely, but he makes a point of behaving decently and setting a good example. Menard, on the other hand, is an absolute bastard, an out and out swine. This is the difference we draw between them, said Orsini. Potin will bump off but we'll shake his hand first, and afterwards we'll see to his wife and kids. Menard will do to death by slow degrees and then dump him in a shit house. Fabbat's a chap who doesn't give a damn so long as he's left in peace and there's no trouble. Trizek's a Bible thumper and a dreary bore, always preaching, but for his own church, not the Viets. Genius is the only pederast in the camp and it's not his fault. So he's a progressive. Most people can't stand him, but I've seen him fight and I know that he's then a lion. Ah. Here comes that dear little bastard, Marindal. They made a face at the new arrival, got up and disappeared. 6. The Viet Minh. My name's Marindal, he said, Eve Marindal, a lieutenant in the 3rd Foreign Parachute Battalion. He was naked to the waist and every rib showed in his skinny chest. He had a tuft of fair hair on the top of his head, which made him look like one of those comic music hall characters. Tufted Rakey or Cadet Rousel. His beady little eyes sparkled with intelligence. He squatted down on his haunches in front of the team. I've been detailed as your group leader and as such I'm responsible for initiating you into camp regulations and supervising your re-education. To hell with you, said Esclavier in measured tones. In spite of all he had heard about him, he did not take to the lieutenant at all. You must never say that to the Viet Minh. What you must say is, I don't understand and I'd like you to explain. They love explaining. Your team has made a bit of a name for itself. The Meteor. We call him the Voice, said Ben Years. Well then, the Voice accuses your little group of three attempts to escape, constantly failing to comply with orders, theft and even racial squabble. That was in order to pinch some molasses, said Mamaudi. I told him that. What's more, you've got a war criminal and a madman with you. The war criminal will be back with you tomorrow after he has made his public self-examination and cleansed himself of his sins by Marxist confession. But where's the madman? In hospital already. Marindal scratched his throat. He'll be better off there, Dio will look after him. He's a very good doctor and has worked miracles. I've been through his hands myself and his herb soups put me back on my feet. Tomorrow there's an instruction period for the whole camp. You'll meet your old friends from Kaobang and be initiated into camp routine. I was given to understand that Captain the Glatini was with you. 
Yes, I'm Captain de Glatine. Marindel's voice underwent a sudden change, it became apprehensive. He was no longer Cadet Rousel, but a crumpled adolescent. May I have a word with you in private, sir? It's something personal. Glatine got up. Piniers noticed that in spite of his rags and exhaustion he still looked as elegant as ever. He wished he could have looked like that himself. The two officers climbed down the ladder from the hut and went and sat down in the shade of the big banana trees. We're vaguely related, said Marindel. Through your wife. I married Jeanine de Hellion, whose father. Now I remember. I thought your name sounded familiar. I've been without news of my wife for four years. I left for Indochina three months after we married and then came Kaobang. I imagine she's waiting for you just as all our wives are waiting for us, bringing up their children, helping one another and visiting the wounded in hospital. No. Jeanine isn't waiting for me and I haven't any children. It's just come back to me. I believe I met her in Paris about a year ago, at my place. Is she as lovely as ever? I remember a slender girl with long hair which she twisted into a plait and wore on one side of her head. You see, she's gone back to the way she wore her hair before she was married, and yet she knows that I'm alive and a prisoner. She never writes to me. My dear chap, you've got no proof and it's simply for the pleasure of torturing yourself that you're letting your imagination run away with you. When you get back to her, all your doubts will seem ridiculous. How can you be sure? My wife wouldn't have anything to do with a fellow officer's wife who didn't behave correctly. Thank you. He had recovered his spirits. By the way, you'll have a good laugh tomorrow. We're putting on a really splendid knockabout Marxist turn. A first class show. When Jeanine and Marindel entered the drawing room of the Glat Agnes House in the Avenue de Saxe, that little museum dedicated to a whole race of soldiers with its standards, its flags and its arms, Claude had clutched her husband's arm. How dare she come here? Glatine could not bear rivalry between women and thought it was an absurd and childish game in which a man was well advised not to meddle. He merely said. Oh, well. He started towards Jeanine, for she had that provocative child-wife beauty that had always attracted him. But Claude held him back. Her husband. Perhaps you knew him, Lieutenant Marindel. He's a prisoner of the Viet Minh. She hasn't been faithful to him. How long has he been a prisoner? Three years. And she's twenty-one at the most. I know, Jacques. I wouldn't do it myself, but I'm not so stupid. Or unfeeling. That I don't understand certain. Shortcomings. But she's living openly with another man, in his house, and he's a contemptible creature. A journalist called Pasfuro. That's her business. I don't agree. We women derive our strength, our fidelity, largely from our cohesion. We're a clan on our own with its own unwritten but nevertheless strict laws. We try and help one another. We criticize one another too, and Jeanine Marindel is my cousin. Glatine looked at his wife with her pale shapely face, her large doe eyes which now revealed no tenderness, her set jaw, her nostrils quivering with anger. He gently freed his arm and went across and kissed Jeanine Marindel's hand. She said to him. Claude isn't very fond of me, Captain. I don't know what she's got against you. Yes, you do, you know perfectly well. She had the astonished voice of a hurt child. She played this up perhaps. Claude thinks it's a scandal that I'm not making a mystery of it but living quite openly with Pierre Pasfuro. If we met now and then in some sordid hotel bedroom or between five and seven in his chambers, no one would say a word and I would then be in a position to criticize the other officers' wives. You don't love your husband anymore? How extraordinary you are, you men. Of course I love him. We were brought up together. We played games together and as children we even shared the same bed. He was the first boy I ever kissed. We married like a brother and sister, so as to go on playing our games. We lived in our own little world with its legends and its taboos. Only a few people were admitted, Judith the old maid, Uncle Joseph who is deaf, 
and my cousin Pierre Pasfuro who used to bring us gramophone records. When I knew there was very little chance of my ever seeing Eve again, I left his family, whom I didn't like and who were prepared to have me locked up, to kill me like a widow in India. I went and stayed with Pierre. In him I found the man, the stranger in my life. I could hurt him, I'm jealous, which would never even occur to me with Eve. Do you see what I mean, Captain? I think so. Then why are they all against me? I used to be very fond of Claude. She can't understand me, she didn't marry her own brother and then afterwards meet the only man in her life. What did she say in her defense? Claude subsequently asked her husband. But she has no defense at all. You don't know how defenseless she is, she's just a poor young girl into whom you're trying to get your cattish old claws. I'd be grateful if you asked her here as often as possible. A few days later Glatini had flown out to Saigon. The instruction and self-examination period took place next day after the afternoon rest. All the officer prisoners were assembled near the river in a large open space that had been cleared on the edge of the forest and was shaded by the big mango trees. In front of them stood a bamboo platform surmounted by the photograph of Hokaiman with his straggly beard and the red flag adorned with a yellow star. Some rudimentary benches had been made by the prisoners out of bamboo poles and creepers. The veterans of Kaobang met their comrades from Dean Pianfu again for the first time and some of them recognized one another. They thumped one another on the shoulder, uttered loud exclamations of surprise and delight, but in the end had nothing to say. They belonged to two separate worlds which so far had nothing in common. They stuck to their own respective groups. Marindal, Orsini and Leroy were about the only ones who sat with the newcomers. The old hands appeared to look forward to the spectacle with a certain interest and even pleasure. The star performer that day was Lieutenant Millet and they admired his qualities as an actor, his subtle and at the same direct manner, the brutal frankness which enabled him to put over his whopping great lies. The program also included the first performance of a newcomer, a certain boy's furors whom none of the veterans knew, who was kept isolated in a canna guarded by three sentries just outside the village. So he could not yet have learnt the rules of the game, an amateur, in other words, but whose story might be interesting all the same. The appearance of the voice caused a stir among the prisoners. The show was about to begin. The curtain went up on the big lie of democracy based on the peace of the masses and reciprocal understanding. The voice started off, as usual, by giving a summary of the news, which everyone looked forward to. They knew it was out of date, partly falsified, distorted for the sake of propaganda, and incomplete, but it was the only source of news they had. One day perhaps he would at last announce that the armistice had been signed at Geneva. But in sorrowful tones the voice informed them that the Geneva negotiations were dragging on interminably in spite of the goodwill and efforts of the Vietnamese delegation. After raising everyone's hopes, Mendez France was revealing his true face, the face of a colonialist more crafty than the others. If he was intent on bringing the war in Indochina to an end, it was only to repatriate the expeditionary force and send it out again to defend the vast estates that his wife owned in Tunisia. I'm beginning to like this Mendez, said Piniers, only I hope he won't leave us in the lurch. His wife's estates are in Egypt, said Esclavia. The voice went on. Your role later on, as fighters for peace, will be to keep a close watch on those false liberals in the service of the banks, who, while appearing to defend peace, will in fact ally themselves to the warmongers, since they are only prompted by their selfish class interests. Your comrade Millet has prepared a little lecture on the colonial movement in what you used to call Indochina. It's your duty to listen to him with the utmost attention, for it's a thoroughly objective study. Lieutenant Millet appeared on the platform. He was all skin and bone, with long cowboy legs. A bullet in the knee made him limp. In his hand he held a piece of paper, bamboo paper of such poor quality that one could only write on it in pencil. His expression was solemn and self-important. He began by stating some grotesque perversions of the truth, which made no impression on the old hands but dumbfounded the new arrivals. 
Statistics show that the government of Indochina made a point of lowering the birth rate. Certain districts of North Vietnam were systematically starved so that the population might be transported as laborers to swell the slave camps of the big plantations in Cochin China. Wives were separated from their husbands to increase their output. In order to restrict the transport of rice to the north, thousands of women, children and old people were exterminated. The coolies were never known to come back from the plantations. The clan of old hands was well organized, in the first row, the two officers who were communists or who thought they were, then the progressive group leaders, listening attentively, nodding assent, taking notes, behind them, the mob chatting together under their breath, applauding every so often and endlessly discussing what they were going to do with their four years back pay which was automatically piling up in their bank accounts. For all these tattered officers were millionaires and kept dreaming, though without much hope, of the cars they would buy and the gargantuan meals they would eat in the big three-star restaurants. Captain Verdi leaned over towards his neighbor. A newcomer told me that labor hours is not what it was, that the tour d'argent now leads the field. I was planning to take my wife there. Most annoying. And what about the vedette, the new vedette? His comrade replied pretty cheesy, it seems, and eats up gas. I'll treat myself to wine, said Pestagas in his Bordeaux accent, nothing but wine seeing as how I haven't had any for four years. I'll have a barrel hung over my bed with a pipe attached to it, and when I can't take any more through my mouth, I'll stuff it up my nostrils and after that damned if I don't take it like an enema. There was complete silence as Lieutenant Millet embarked on the interesting part his own self-examination. Comrades, he declared, the best illustration of the horrors of colonialism in Indochina is myself. During my first tour of duty, from 1947 to 1949, I held the Manthan post in the Mekong Delta. With my platoon of mercenaries, who hated the workers and the people, for they all came from the wealthy districts of Boulogne Billancourt and La Villette, we led a life of idleness and, since idleness breeds vice, we were all vicious. But Boulogne isn't a wealthy district. Piniers protested. Pipe down, Marindel replied, giving him a nudge. The voice is now convinced that nearly in the seas are the slums where the workers wallow in misery and that Lavillette is next door to the champs elise Yes, comrades, we oppressed the Vietnamese people and forced them to satisfy our gluttony with ducks chickens and the young buffaloes they badly needed to cultivate their paddy fields. We went even further in our misdeeds. To offend the susceptibilities of the Vietnamese people, we bathed stark naked in the middle of the village, while our concubines, whom we scornfully referred to as congais, virtuous young women snatched by force from their families, were made to pour the water over us. He's doing well, Orsini exclaimed in admiration. TCH. TCH. Leroy shook his head. Fevria was much better. One night, Millet went on, a unit of the People's Army of Vietnam, anxious to avenge the oppressed population of Mintan H, attacked our post which would have fallen but for the air support provided by the American imperialists. It was horrible. The bombs wiped out those valiant patriots and fire swept through the hutments. I was so misguided that I wanted to avenge the assistance which the patriotic population had given to the People's Army. A parachute battalion came to clear up the district and I myself told them which men to execute. They behaved with their customary brutality and I would rather not tell you all the atrocities they committed. It has taken four years of re-education, four years of this policy of leniency which is the Republic of Vietnam's reply to our imperialist barbarism to open my eyes and fill my soul with remorse. I ask the Vietnamese people and the soldiers of the People's Army for forgiveness, and I declare that the rest of my life will be devoted to fighting for peace and the brotherhood of the masses. There was a round of applause. The newcomers were completely at sea. The damned swine, Biniers muttered, I'll break his jaw for him. Go on, clap, Marindel told him, clap hard. At that date Millet was in Germany, and anyway he has never set foot in southern Vietnam. The bastard, Biniers raged. 
Lieutenant Millet left the platform, wearing an expression of triumph and remorse. He had high hopes of winning the chicken his comrades had promised for the best self-examination of the month. After congratulating the lieutenant on his frankness, the voice remarked that a full assessment of his crimes was an indispensable condition for a prisoner's moral recovery. He then announced Boyce Führers, one of the most dangerous war criminals captured at Dean Bianfu, who had himself requested this opportunity to explain himself to his comrades. The sun was shining straight into Boyce Führers's face and he shut his eyes like a nocturnal bird which had suddenly been taken from its lair. He was filthy dirty and caked in dry mud. His voice was more grating than ever. Gentlemen, he said, my misdeeds are infinitely greater than those of my comrade Millet, for they are political. I was born in this part of the world, for over a century my family has exploited the impoverished masses. I learnt the language and customs of Vietnam so as to be able to exploit the people all the more. I was one of those who benefited from the war. North of Fontho, among the mountain people, I tried to create a movement of separatism from the people of Vietnam. I took advantage of those peasants' credulity, I corrupted them with money, I furnished them with arms. I made them fight against their brothers. But those primitive men, enlightened by an envoy of the Democratic Republic, recovered their patriotism and class consciousness. They kicked me out. I refused to see the truth, and my mercenaries' pride impelled me to make for Dean Bianfu in order to continue the fight against the people and defend the selfish interests of my family. Today I am beginning to see the light. I repent, and all I ask is to atone for my faults by exemplary conduct in future. I do not deserve the leniency he laid his swollen, paralyzed hands on the little bamboo lectern in front of him, which the soldiers of the People's Army have shown towards me. He climbed down from the platform and the voice declared that Boyce Führers could go and join his comrades now that he had recognized the error of his ways. A serious rival to Millet, Orsini said in admiration. As a reward for this particularly successful session, the camp commandant, the bandy-legged man who looked like a Japanese and who bore the title of general supervisor as in a college, increased the rations. In addition to their usual ball of rice, the prisoners were given two spoonfuls of molasses, which contributed to the atmosphere of euphoria. Many of them saw in this issue of molasses the hope of a speedy release. Darkness fell in a few minutes. A fire, which was never allowed to go out, glowed on a patch of bare earth in the center of the hut. Every so often a hand would rekindle it with a few slivers of dry bamboo. Then it would burst into flame and in the shadows could be seen the faces of Esclavia and Glatini. Merle was reminded of a scout camp he had once attended in the mountains of Auvergne, been years of the long nights he had spent in a farm in Carise during the resistance. Mamoudi pondered on the affable girls from the Old Nail Mountains with their heavy silver jewelry. Lakem lay fast asleep on the bare floor under his mosquito net. Mosquito nets had been issued with great ceremony, one for every two prisoners. Since then he never stopped sleeping and from time to time he whimpered in his sleep. Boys Führers was sitting next to the fire engaged in an endless conversation with the owner of the house, an old Tho with a wrinkled weather-beaten face. The Tho was optimistic about the future, for his son was head of the village militia which consisted of three men armed with a single shotgun. He drew the Tobai's attention to his feet, pitted and deformed by Hong Kong foot or buffalo's disease, of which he seemed almost proud. The river babbled gently outside, mingling its noise with the distant echoes of a storm. The air, saturated with heat and humidity, felt as heavy as wool, it seemed to contain no oxygen at all and everyone was suffocating. Above the grunting of the black pigs that lived under the piles, they heard the sound of voices, then the noise of water dripping onto a flat stone. Below the hut, at the foot of the ladder, stood a jar of water with a ladle, a wooden kbat, this water was used to wash the mud off one's feet before coming into the house. Orsini and Leroy appeared on the threshold. They had come from the veterans camp and had brought with them a roll of tobacco, tied up like a sausage, a product of their plantation or the result of some mysterious bartering with the mans of the neighboring foothills. They squatted down among the other prisoners, 
took some homemade pipes out of their pockets and some letters from home which they used as cigarette paper. Marindal came and sat down next to Boyce Führers and put a hand on his shoulder. They've come to congratulate you. You've got away with it this time. We were rather worried about you. We learned from one of the Bodoys that some chaps who were doing the same job as you, two warrant officers of the Calibri Guerrilla Gang, a lieutenant of the Tabak Gang and Captain Hillerin, had been tried by a People's Tribunal and executed a few days after their capture. They chopped off Hillerin's head with a hatchet, said Orsini. He was my instructor at St. Cyril. If they had found out who I was and what I was doing, Boyce Führers calmly replied, I wouldn't have had a chance of getting away with it. But they would have waited a long time before trying me and perhaps they would have handed me over to my old friends the Chinese. For I was never at Phong Tho, and I wasn't born in Vietnam but in China. You took the only course that could save you. As though you knew the Viets extremely well. I once lived among them, it was in 1945, but they're no longer the same as they were then. You who've been with them for the last four years, could you tell us what the Viet Minh is really like? Merle clapped his hands. Take your seats for another instruction period, only this time everyone will tell the truth. Imitating the voice, his impersonal and self-satisfied tone, he began. Our veteran comrades, re-educated by four years of a policy of leniency, having reverted, now that night has fallen, to what they have never ceased to be, that's to save our colonial mercenaries, will now give an objective account of what they think of the psychology and behavior of that strange, repellent beast, the Viet Minh. So as to be able, Esclavier interjected, to show him what we're made of, to pinch his crops and even rape his woman if possible. It's not possible, Orsini regretfully observed. To beat him in the end, Glatini concluded with a certain solemnity. You kick off, Marindal, said Leroy. Marindal promptly entered into the spirit of the game. Comrades, contrary to what you may believe, we are no longer absolutely vile colonial mercenaries, for these repellent people have forced us to learn certain things. The voice is perhaps not completely wrong when he tells us we must recognize our faults, or rather our errors. Our tactical errors? Glatini asked. No, our political errors. In the strategy of modern warfare military tactics are a matter of secondary importance, politics will always take precedence. Let's discuss the enemy, exclaimed Esclavia, who was irritated by this preamble. They're of adverse will, as Klaus Witz would say. The Viet Minh have been hardened, changed by seven years of fighting. You're right, boys Führers, they're no longer the same as they were in 1945. They have created a human type which is repeated indefinitely and cast in the same mold. For example, every year, in every Viet Minh division, at the end of the rainy season a recollection is held. What's that? Piniers asked. It's a favorite term of the Jesuits. Nothing resembles the Viet Minh world as closely as the Jesuits. I know, I was brought up by them. A recollection means a retreat, communal withdrawal the examination of one's conscience over the period of a year. Go on. With the Viets it lasts a fortnight and in some units up to 10% of the personnel are sometimes shot because they no longer conform to the model laid down. In this process the guilty are their own public prosecutors and demand their punishment themselves. Nevertheless, said Glatini, in spite of our strokes of audacity and strokes of luck, in spite of our fits of laziness and energy, there was always Viet Minh organization, Viet Minh pertinacity, an ant heap forever active and in the process of reconstruction. That's true, said Marindal. The Viet Minh coolie, soldier, officer and propagandist have always worked relentlessly and with a sense of purpose that is scarcely human. They have built dugouts, trenches, underground villages. This reminded them all of the operations in the Delta, of the whole of that landscape remodeled and camouflaged by the human termites. We should have dragged them out of their holes one by one, said Esclavia, like snails out of their shells. Marindal went on with undisguised admiration. During the day they cultivated their paddy fields and made war, 
By night they organized committees, subcommittees and associations of old odderers and lads of ten. They hardly ever slept, they were undernourished, they always seemed to be on their last legs, but they still had the strength to carry on. Weren't you struck, as I was, by their physical appearance, their ascetic faces, their feverish eyes, their silent, gliding gait? In their outsized Chinese-style clothes they looked like ghosts. I thrashed it all out, said Orsini, with a V at from the 304th who spoke French fairly well. He told me something about his life. We only moved at night. He told me, in single file and in complete silence. We each used to carry a firefly in a little cage of transparent paper attached to our haversacks. So as not to lose our way, we simply followed these little lights. Some of my comrades made the same firefly last three nights running. So as to avoid being encircled, we often used to march for twenty-five nights at a stretch and our only food was a bowl of rice, a few wild herbs and, occasionally, a little dried fish. In the end I felt my body was a machine which moved, stopped, started up again of its own accord and I myself was outside it, half dreaming, half asleep. We've all been able to see how the Viets work, Glatini went on. All the way along the roads and trails which their convoys used, they had rigged up military shelters under the thick foliage of the jungle. At the mere sound of an aircraft everything, trucks and men, disappeared in a matter of minutes, and there was nothing left but an empty trail. That was all our pilots could see on each of their sorties, empty trails. Just think of the work involved. And it was carried out over hundreds, over thousands of miles and only by coolies who had nothing but picks, shovels and hatchets and who could only work by night. Meanwhile we were idling away in the brothels and opium dens. It's through the coolies they got the better of us, said Boyce Führers, by means of that vast horde swarming through the elephant grass with their baskets balanced on their shoulders. They used to start off from the delta with a hundred pounds of rice slung on their poles. They would march 300 miles over the twisting trails of the Oat region in order to deliver 10 pounds of rice to the Bodois. They had to feed themselves on the way and still keep a pound or two back for the return journey. These thousands and thousands of coolies trotting along the trails were invisible to our aircraft. It wasn't only terror that kept them going. Propaganda as well? Even that's not enough. Propaganda doesn't work or give such good results unless it touches something deep, something real in a man. Such as breaking his solitude, Esclavia solemnly explained. It's been a long time since the Viets have known solitude, said Marindal. The Viets remind me of those grinds at school, those bookworms who by dint of sheer hard work and perseverance carry off all the prizes at the end of the term. And yet they're the least gifted. We soldiers of the Expeditionary Corps were fairly well off. We had our cars waiting outside as we set off on operations, we had our cases of beer and our rations. Sometimes we felt rather parched, so aircraft would come and drop us some ice. Now and then we carried out some brilliant raids before breakfast, but never bothered to follow them up. Meanwhile the earnest, hard-working grinds carried on with their laborious war. The Viet Minh were not better soldiers than we were, especially when you compare their untold strength to our 20,000-odd paratroopers and legionaries who were the only ones to face them in pitched battle. Even so they had to be five or ten against one to get the better of us. But then the Viets all made war, and without stopping, day and night, whether they were regulars, coolies, dukit guerrillas, women or babes in arms. They made any amount of mistakes, they had about as much gumption as an old boot but they never failed to learn from their mistakes. As a result of this sort of warfare, these termite methods, Marindal went on after a short silence, the Viets have become pernickety and bureaucratic minded. They take endless notes, make reports and keep files at every level of command, using tiny little bits of paper, because that's what they're short of, paper. For the last four years, said Leroy, we've been pushed around the whole time by the canbos or the officers. They keep whipping out notebook and pencil, demanding to know our names and why we came to Indochina, asking a mass of technical questions about weapons and equipment. 
they solemnly take down anything you can think of, then wander off completely happy. That mania of theirs was extremely useful to us, said Glatini. They never stopped working their WT sets to broadcast the minutest detail. Every evening, at every level, they gave us a full report of their activities. We were able to intercept it all and we knew to the nearest pound what they were getting from China. Then why the hell did we come to grief? Esclavia rudely inquired. We knew everything to the nearest pound. And the Viet artillery at Dien Bien Phu. We knew everything, and that's all, we did nothing about it. Without that information we might have been driven out of Indochina two years earlier. Well spoken, my little staff officer. Seeing that the discussion was taking a nasty turn, Orsini broke in. Here, in the camp, the Viets keep revising the nominal roll over and over again. They jib at an accent, at a comma. They're so bigoted, it makes you sick. You're not allowed to use the word Viet Minh, you must always talk about the democratic government of Vietnam, and say sir to the lowest Bodoi besotted by propaganda. But we haven't the right to wear our badges of rank. There's no way of knowing what they think or how they live. You come up against a blank wall and their reply is the same old phonograph record. To begin with, during the first year or two, we thought they were wary of us. Then we noticed it was more than that. They simply have nothing to say apart from ready-made phrases, there's nothing personal about them. The party and the army, that's their whole life. Outside them they have no existence whatever. That explains it, said Boyce Führers. Many of the officers and other ranks have been waging clandestine war for the last seven years. They've lived in bands quartered in out of the way little villages, either in the mountains of Thanho or the limestone country of the day. They had nothing in common with the mountain people who despised them as inhabitants of the Delta. So they were reduced to living among them in this military, intransigent, rigorous and highly organized community. That's absolutely true, said Marindal. Even the voice, who's a graduate of Hanoi and quite brilliant, I believe, has ceased to have an original thought or to struggle against his surroundings. All those chaps, just in order to survive, needed all the strength they had. They had to endure night marches, battles to the death, insufficient food. In their leisure hours they were transformed into propaganda machines. They were compelled to reiterate again and again the same slogans that had to be hammered into the thick skulls of the Nax. They organized all sorts of associations to embrace the civilian population and saw to it that these associations did not come adrift immediately. They had to instruct recruits, conscript coolies, collect money. These men didn't have a minute to themselves, their life wasn't their own, and when, utterly exhausted, they found time to sleep for a few hours, they preferred to accept the communist system wholesale rather than to ponder over it and discuss it. You seem to be very fond of them, Esclavia remarked rather nastily. I tried to understand them, certainly. If I had been a Vietnamese, I don't think I could have held out, I should have sided with them. Imagine the life of a young militant before he is poured into the Viet Minh mold which will eventually depersonalize him. He knows the romance of revolution. He slips into a village at night. In the depths of a hut lit by an oil lamp he organizes a meeting. Often it's only a hundred yards or so from a French post. He hears the sentries clearing their throats. All that is known all about him is his pseudonym, he leads a mysterious, fascinating life. You've been reading too much Malraux, Boyce Führers gently remarked. Communism isn't like that at all. That doesn't stop these peasants, who have never left their little bit of paddy field, from talking about China and the USSR he lets them think that he has just arrived from those distant countries and they gape at him in admiration. His voice becomes seductive and compelling. He uses words that have a magic ring to them, such as maturism, collectivism, which he is mad about himself. He leads a life of adventure and all the girls look at him with yearning as they peck away at their sunflower seeds. I'd also be on their side, thought Merle. And I, thought Mamaudi, may soon be obliged to lead that sort of life, but in my case the Kannas will be Mectas, China and the USSR, Egypt and Iraq, Communism, Islam. I've known that sort of thing, 
Piniers reflected. Marindel fell silent for a moment or two. The old though spat and cleared his throat. Marindel went on in a calmer tone of voice. And after a few years of communal life the result is a man without a soul who is totally inhuman and at the same time ambitious and incredibly naive, like all those who believe they have found the one and only truth. On top of that there's the influence of the Boy Scout movement, for Tarquin Boer who's in charge of the Viet Minh youth is a former scoutmaster and inspector general of the Admiral de Coup schools. The doctrines of national revolution took firm root there and many of the leading Viets have been through those schools. You mustn't overlook doctrinaire and transigence. They're still in the first stage of communism, that of revolution and single-mindedness. They have a faith untempered by any sense of reality. He's a fine speaker is our Marindal, said Orsini with satisfaction. I think I can round off your explanation, said Boyce Führers. There are times when the Viet Minh appear to be solely a section of the Communist Party. Their implementation of the agrarian reforms, their methods, their propaganda system, particularly as addressed towards the women, their soldiers' uniform, their manner of fighting, all these are Chinese. The Chinese communist armies of Mao Zedong and Chu Te have brought those tactics to a fine art. Yet though this hold that China has on them is strong, it is not as complete as it might appear. Although linked to Peking, the Vietnamese Communist Party has its own contacts with the central organization in Moscow. Most of the Viet Minh leaders were groomed in France by French communists directly responsible to the USSR. The Viet Minh is therefore more orthodox than the Chinese Communist Party. They have decided to apply wholesale communism without trying to adapt it to the local temperament or climate, as Mao Zedong and his lot have done on a very big scale. Perhaps that's why the Viet Minh fight shy of discussion and stick to their catechism. They seem to be afraid, they're not sure of themselves. They haven't the traditions or the intelligence of the Chinese. They've always been a slave nation. The Viet Minh have become solemn and melancholy and have lost all their spontaneity, Marindal went on. That has almost happened before my eyes. You hardly ever see them laugh and if they do it's usually the private soldiers, never the NCOs or officers. They have rapidly lost their youthful virtue, their revolutionary enthusiasm and ardor, and that's why they're so disturbing. They can't stand a joke, they can't even see one. What about the girls? asked Merle. The women are now considered equal to the men. They have the same rights, therefore the same duties. They have become officers propaganda agents, political figures, but they have lost all their personality. Vietnamese girls as sweet as mangoes, Biniers involuntarily muttered at the memory of my oi. Sentimental and even sexual relations are looked upon as useless, worthless and uninteresting. The Viet Minh has become a Puritan, partly by necessity. His exhausting life leaves him hardly any spare time or energy. He denies all religion but behaves like the strictest Quaker. Esclavius niggered. I wouldn't mind having a go at a young militant Viet girl to see if Marxism prevents her from enjoying it. That sort of thing, said Leroy, is strictly forbidden between a Tabai and a girl of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Anyway camp routine doesn't allow the slightest carnal desire to exist. It's the great sex truce. But if, in spite of everything, the impossible happened, it would mean the immediate liquidation of the Tabai and a concentration camp for the girl, in other words death for both. In actual fact, to what use have you put these theories of yours? Boyce Führers asked. You seem to have landed on your feet all right in the artificial world of the Viet Minh. In order to survive, Marindal explained, we have found the right balance. This balance we call the political fiction of the camp. It's at the same time a philosophy, an organization and a way of life. It's unexpressed and unacknowledged, but everyone here has assimilated it. It gives us the exact attitude to adopt in order to find the best solution to each problem of our daily life. It's time to go to bed. Orsini and Leroy have to get back to their barracks. There's mass tomorrow. Everyone goes, even those who aren't Catholics, even those who don't believe in anything. For us it's the equivalent of taking up a political and moral stand. That's why, Mamaudi, 
I'd be grateful if you would come. You see, it's our church against theirs and you belong to ours. I'll see. You must come. All right then, I'll come. Glatini lay awake for a long time. He never imagined this sort of conversation could have been possible among a group of young officers or that they could have been able to analyze the situation with such lucidity. And that child Lieutenant Marindal, completely at ease in the Marxist world, talking quite naturally about the political fiction of the camp, urging his comrades to go to mass because it was a question of taking a political stand. That child who was more mature than all of them with the possible exception of Boyce Führers and whose sister wife back in Paris was being unfaithful to him with a certain pass Führer who was a journalist. 7. Lieutenant Marindel's Ventral During the first year of their captivity the 120 officer prisoners of Camp 1 had refused to cooperate with the Viet Minh in any way. They attended the instruction periods but the Bodois had to drive them to the assembly place with their rifle butts. There, on a little bamboo platform, the voice or some other political commissar entrusted with their re-education would lecture them on a given theme, the misdeeds of colonialism. The exploitation of man by capitalism. But not one of the prisoners listened to their educators' ponderous phrases, and when the voice afterwards questioned them on the lesson they could never give the right answers. Faced with this display of ill will, this refusal to collaborate in their re education, the voice had taken certain measures and the prisoners had their daily rations reduced to a ball of rice with a few herbs, but without so much as an ounce of fat or fish juice. They had held out a whole year, but thirty of them had died from exhaustion, biriberi, and vitamin deficiency. It was then the oldest and highest ranking officer in the camp, Colonel Charton had given the order to play the game in order to survive. And so the day came when a lieutenant, young Marindal, spoke up and gave the correct answers. The voice was exultant and he felt that the secret wound deep inside him was beginning to close. The rations were improved, the prisoners were given molasses, dried fish and bananas, and they signed manifestos in favor of peace and against the atomic bomb. They accused themselves of all sorts of crimes almost always falsely, they shouted their guilt out loud, and in return were allowed a certain amount of medical treatment. But Putin who had been a communist, and who could not be trusted to stand by his comrades to resist the Viet Minh, was inveigled back into the bosom of the party whose expressions and vocabulary were already familiar to him. He was like those Christians who, after neglecting their duties for a long time, are restored to the church by some sudden chance in the course of a service. This swarthy little man who wore steel-rimmed spectacles was absolutely honest about it. One day he came up to his comrades and said. Look. I was once a communist. I didn't think I still was but I have become one again, completely and without reservations. So from now on I'm on the side of the Viet Minh. I want you to know this and to treat me accordingly. I shall try not to know what you are doing, what escapes you are planning, but please don't tell me about it. Stop trusting me in any way. From then on he had volunteered for the nastiest, most arduous fatigues, he had refused everything which could have improved his lot. Even Orsini and Leroy, who were irrepressible and animated by a tenacious and steadfast hatred for the Viet Minh, bore him no malice. But they spoke to him as though to a bodoi which hurt him deeply, for he admired both of the lieutenants for their courage, loyalty and sense of friendship. Marindil alone showed some understanding, but he was wary of him and his lively intelligence. He was the worm in the communist apple, the choir boy who served mass in order to drink the communion wine. Menard was also converted, but his reasons were more questionable and when he was thrown out of the army, although he claimed to have played the double game, he found no one to defend him. A few others took to progressivism, either through conviction, cowardice, or to be given extra privileges. Marindal was one of these, but for another reason. This incurable chatterbox, this cheerful Mary Andrew had an astonishing capacity for secrecy. This was only realized two years later when he escaped with the whole group of irrepressibles. There were a number of setbacks which should have enlightened the Viet Minh and made them realize that their propaganda had gained a hold upon no more than half a dozen individuals. For instance, 
The Incident of the Chickens The prisoners had been given permission to keep chickens for their own consumption. Orsini, with many an obscene allusion, applied to have ducks instead but his request was not taken into consideration, each prisoner, with the ardor of a retired suburban, kept two or three birds. There was clucking all over the camp. During one of his lectures the voice announced that in token of satisfaction for this praiseworthy endeavor, he would allow the prisoners to put all their chickens into a common pool, which would enable them to recognize the superiority of collectivization to private enterprise. So, as from the next day, a chicken colchos was to be established. The prisoners did put their chickens into a common pool, but in a somewhat unforeseen manner. They killed them all that night and clubbed together to eat them. At the end of the third year, however, they witnessed a strange conversion due entirely to the influence of Marindal. The group of irrepressibles, about twelve strong, suddenly gave evidence of unexpected zeal. They hastened to sign every petition condemning war, the use of the atomic bomb and napalm. Given half a chance, they would also have condemned the air gun and the band arrow. They indulged with frenzy in self-examinations, accused themselves violently of every crime they could think of, made a still noisier show of repenting of them, manifested their desire to be instructed in the Marxist religion and made really remarkable progress in dialectics. Marindal had to do his utmost to curb their zeal for fear it should appear suspicious. The Viets are rather like Christians, they welcomed these last-minute converts with open arms, and, having soon become model fighters for peace, the neophytes occupied every responsible post in the camp. Not content with their daytime activity, with inventing a progressivist hymn in which every word had a double meaning, they also met at night, but always among themselves, to perfect their education under the tutelage of Marindal. Marindal would take a seat in the center of the circle and fire questions at them. Leroy? Present. How much rice did you steal today? Three handfuls. That brings our store up to a hundred pounds. We'll need four times more than that. Millet. I'll get the hatchet tomorrow. The man wants a litre of chum and a couple of chickens for it. Orsini. I scrounged a pair of trousers, they could be made into a sack. They belonged to Minard and he made a fuss. So I pitched into him and accused him in the presence of a Bodoy of playing a double game and being nothing but an imperialist in disguise. Don't overdo it. I, said Mainsant, managed to relieve one of the Bodoys of his tinder lighter. Have you prepared your self-examination? I can't think of any more crimes to accuse myself of. Use your imagination, you've got to replace Potin as officer I, see stores before the rainy season begins. I've been working on the meteor for the last fortnight, but the supervisor general is on his guard. From now on we're going to work in four teams of three, each team will build its own raft. We'll have the hatchet in turns. I've got a map, said Juves, or rather, a tracing on a bit of bumwad. They let me have a look at a pamphlet on French atrocities and it contained a map of Tonkin. I made a copy of it. So what? Do you realize? smart guy, what we're letting ourselves in for. Over three hundred miles roped to bamboo rafts, first the river by the camp in full spate, then the Songam with its falls and rapids near the sun. Enough to drown us twenty times over. We meet the bright river at Pinkar, with Viets stationed on all the islets. It's a hundred to one, a thousand to one, against our pulling it off. Do you know a better way? Can you see us marching barefoot through the jungle? No. Well, then. Do you want to die here, still performing your Marxist monkey tricks? Especially as you're not particularly gifted. Orsini broke in heatedly. We've agreed once and for all. Marindal's the boss and we're sticking to his plan. This war is bound to end some day, Juves protested. Don't you believe it? Do you think France is going to climb down because of these little bastards? If we stay on here, all that's left for us is to become collaborators like Menard or, better still, commies like Potin. I'd rather do myself in. The following month Mainsant succeeded Potin as officer I, C. Stores. The communist, 
who had given ample proof of his integrity, did not protest even though Marindal had reported him to the camp commandant for stealing rice for himself and his friends. Leroy saw fit to apologize. You understand. I think I understand, he curtly replied. He went off, hunching his shoulders. He would have given anything to be one of them, to share in the fresh strength they had suddenly derived from preparing their escape and through which they had made themselves masters of the camp. That was how the political fiction of the camp came into being. The Viet Minh only knew prisoners who were zealous or reluctant, who advanced with faltering steps along the path of re-education or else, on the contrary, made rapid progress. But in the shadows there already existed a sort of clandestine collective government which ascribed the role that each man had to play in the vast charade that had been prepared for the benefit of the voice and the camp guards. To begin with, this state of mind was unconscious and unexpressed. It was Marindal and his group who, in preparing their escape, gave it a cohesive and specific form. After they were recaptured the political fiction became general. With the sly and patient perseverance of prisoners, the officers of Camp 1 managed to lend a double meaning to every gesture and every word, to ridicule their guards, their ideas and their convictions at every instant and to trick them all the time while maintaining an air of the utmost gravity. Discovering laughter again, the prisoners contrived to prise open the mysterious gates of this Kafkaesque hell into which they had been plunged. They remained captives, admittedly, but the part of them which the Viet Minh were so anxious to enslave, all that was not purely physical, had broken free, and this time laughter was more effective than bamboo rafts for the escape bid met with total failure. The rains had started. The level of the river no longer dropped in the interval between two storms and its muddy waters churned with driftwood. The four rafts were ready and, weighted with stones, lay on the river bed. They had been crudely constructed out of bamboo sticks held together with creepers which had already started to rot in the water. These rafts were in fact nothing more than thick logs some fifteen to twenty feet long which the officers planned to sit astride rather like horses. They were pierced by a plank at both ends to prevent them from turning turtle in the water. They had knocked together some clumsy paddles with which to steer them. The rafts, which they had tried out on several occasions, floated almost totally submerged, so that they had to carry their foodstuffs slung round their necks. Each team was equipped with 50 pounds of rice and a bully beef tin full of salt, which was nowhere near sufficient. Four copies had been made of Juve's map. Each prisoner had provided all the information he could on the country to be crossed and this information had been recorded on the maps. A suicide operation, Juve's maintained. It's tonight or never, Marindal announced one morning. Tomorrow they're organizing a general search, we'll have to be off before. That SOB of a supervisor general is beginning to suspect something. He's not straight, that rat. He's a dirty nake who's impervious to all dialectic. They attended the instruction period which took place at five every evening. The daily storm broke after supper, towards seven o'clock. The downpour drowned every other noise and isolated the huts. This was the moment they chose for their escape. Marindal had previously handed Treasel. The parson, our letter addressed to the voice with instructions to leave it outside the camp office but not until the following morning. What's it all about? asked the wary Breton who had never been able to understand Marindal's complex character. Don't ask too many questions. I'm making a break for it. But I'm taking certain precautions. In other words, I'm buckling on my ventral. The letter was written in pencil on bamboo paper and the Jesuits by whom Marindal had been brought up in the prison convent of St. Francois de Sales at Evrux would have been proud of their pupil. Democratic Republic of Vietnam Camp 1 Sir When you read these lines I shall have left Camp 1 in the hope of reaching Hanoi and France. I suppose you will be disappointed and will think that I have relapsed into my former errors. I wish to justify myself in your eyes for I need your moral support if I am to carry on the struggle for peace. During the thirty months I spent in your camp you made me see not only where my duty lay but also that the title of peace fighter had to be earned. I now feel fully qualified and certain of my aim. 
I am impatient to engage in this campaign which you are waging throughout the world to wipe out the last traces of a society that is rotten, selfish and damned to eternity. This campaign I must wage in my own country, among my own people and my own class. If you had released me, I should have appeared suspect to many of my comrades and to my own government. Having escaped, however, I shall be able to operate in complete freedom. Were it otherwise, would I be writing to you now? My two comrades, Orsini and Leroy, likewise share my views. I am convinced that one day we shall meet again and that side by side, fraternally united, in Paris, the center of our communal culture, we shall work together to bring about that world of hope and peace for which you have already sacrificed more than your life. Allow me, sir, to thank you for having made a new man of me. Thanks to your instruction and your example, I shall in my turn be able to conquer and to triumph. Eve Marindel. Fighter for Peace. In groups of three they made their way to the river through the undergrowth, took the rice out of its hiding place, and distributed the prepared packets. Some of them dived in and pulled up the rafts. The river was in full spate and flooding the jungle. See you in Paris, said Orsini. Or in hell said Juves. They climbed onto their rafts and with great difficulty reached midstream. The current swept them down one after another. All of a sudden it stopped training. The darkness cleared, like ink being diluted by water, and the evening star appeared in the sky. They were soaked to the skin and began to shudder with cold. Have you got a wife? Marindel asked Orsini. No, but I'm going to find one, and not only one a whole mass. What about you, Leroy? An old girl friend down at Busier's. My wife's name is Jeanine, Marindel solemnly announced. She's very young, very beautiful and it's been a long time for her to wait. The first night they covered forty miles, but one of the rafts, the one carrying Captain Juves, overturned. The three men managed to swim back to the bank, but at dawn they ran across a Viet Minh patrol. They made a dash for it and the Bodois opened fire. One prisoner was killed, another was wounded, and Juves gave himself up. The Viets finished off the wounded man and made Juves kneel down on the muddy bank. The corporal leading the patrol put a bullet through his head and with his foot toppled the body over into the stream which promptly carried it off. In the Songam Rapids the second raft came to grief against a rock. The creepers holding the bamboos together broke. Two prisoners were drowned and the third, Lieutenant Millet, was saved by some fishermen and handed over to the Viet Minh. To punish him while waiting for instructions, the local commander had him tied naked to an ant heap. All night long Millet begged them to put him out of his misery. The following morning he was taken back to camp where a people's tribunal condemned him to nine months solitary confinement for having betrayed the trust of the Vietnamese people. The third raft capsized several times. The rice fell into the water. Dying of hunger, the three prisoners gave themselves up to the communists. They were brought back to camp, tried and condemned to six months solitary confinement. The cells were rather like bamboo cages with a trapdoor opening. They were too small for the solitary prisoner to stretch his legs. Once a day a bodoi brought him a minimum amount of food and for the rest of the time he stewed and rotted in the damp heat and solitude, haunted by his memories. The three lieutenants on the fourth raft held out for a fortnight. They had forgotten the number of times their vessel had turned turtle. Eaten alive by the mosquitoes, obliged to feed on raw ice, shivering with cold and fever, their limbs cramped and aching. They were frequently pushed to the limits of human endurance. But each time, at the last moment, they clung to life, Orsini and Leroy through hatred, Marindel through love. Later on Orsini and Leroy were astonished to realize that in this pitiful and admirable endeavor they had still been able, after three years captivity, to summon sufficient strength and courage to perform one of those impossible deeds that gives man his grandeur and that at the same time they had been delivered of their hatred. Marindel's love for Jeanine had, on the contrary, gathered fresh strength, for he now identified his wife with everything that was best in him, his endurance, his courage, his refusal to give up and die. 
It was on the morning of the fifteenth day, as they were floating down the bright river, that they caught sight of the Juangtho post, its square crenellated tower and forecourt of earth and planks. We've made it, we're on French held territory, said Leroy, who had once been garrisoned there for six months. It's Juangtho, said Marindal. We've come down much lower than we thought. Three more days and we should have reached Hanoi. We should merely have had to jump off the raft to go straight to the Normandy for a drink. It's one of those strokes of luck you read about in the papers. They summoned up enough strength to land, but had to lie stretched out in the grass for over half an hour before being able to move their cramped limbs. Where's the French flag? Marindal asked with sudden anxiety. In the grey light, under the leaden sky, he could see nothing unfurled on the tower. They haven't raised the colours yet, said Orsini. The garrison troops are colonials and you know what they're like, not exactly gluttons for work. They're sitting pretty down here, so close to Hanoi, there are no Viets around. Let's go, said Leroy. There's a path leading up to the post round at the back. We'd better take it, they might have laid some mines. Duongtho had just been evacuated and the three prisoners were greeted at the entrance to the post by some Bodois. There were a dozen of them picking through the rubbish left behind by the French, turning over the empty tins and wooden and cardboard cases with their bayonets. The officers had not enough strength left to double back on their tracks. They sank down against the walls of the forecourt and fell fast asleep. They were much too tired to feel either anger or disappointment. Some time later, as the sun was beginning to sink behind the river, an officer came and woke them up. He made a note of their names and rank and had them tied up to one another without brutality. In the morning they were released from their fetters. Orders had arrived during the night to treat them well. They were given the same rations as the soldiers, were allowed to rest, and on the following day they set off under escort on their way back to Camp 1. They ambled along for three weeks. The Viets were soon on good terms with them and seemed to be in no hurry to get back to the camp. They turned a blind eye on the abyss pilfering and shared the fruits of their plunder with them. The prisoners reached camp one after dark and were promptly locked up in the cells. Next morning Marindal was sent for. The voice wanted to have a word with him before taking disciplinary action. In spite of his cynicism, Marindal came away from the interview somewhat chastened. The voice with his fine mask of gold had gently reprimanded him, as a scoutmaster might his favorite cub. He had spoken with disarming naivete. Why didn't you come and see me before trying to escape, Marindal? I shouldn't have dissuaded you. You haven't grasped the point of our tuition. Before attempting anything, you should first approach your superiors, for what may strike you as a happy decision may in fact have an adverse effect on the party of peace. Furthermore, you have set your comrades a bad example, even though you acted in good faith. I shall therefore ask you and your two comrades to make a thorough self-examination, and I think I shall then be able to adopt a lenient attitude. You've still got a lot to learn, Marindal, but the sincerity of your feelings has always given me grounds for hope. The three lieutenants had made their self-examination. Even so Orsini and Leroy were confined to the cells for a week before being pardoned, whereas Marindal, after a few days, was restored to his position of group leader. For a long time no one in the camp could talk of anything else but this extraordinary act of mercy, which could not be completely accounted for by Marindal's letter. There was even a suggestion that the voice harbored an unnatural passion for the lieutenant, and Menard insinuated that Marindal had denounced his comrades. This hypothesis was absurd and without foundation but nevertheless gained a certain credence. Boyce Furos asked Marindal what had prompted the voice to act as he had done. Marindal gave several reasons, first of all his Boy Scout naivete. Secondly, his incredible vanity as a communist intellectual convinced of being in possession of the one and only truth, finally, a certain nostalgic friendliness towards Westerners among whom he had been brought up and whose culture he had assimilated. Marindal knew nothing about Commander Ducaroy's youth camps or the boy with the sturdy cuffs and close cropped hair who had been the prince of one of those camps. For a week Lakeham was a lifeless mass who had to be fed by his comrades. 
he showed no more interest in life and refused to move from his bunk and go down to the river to Washington. He became mildly delirious. He imagined he was living in a huge grocery, filled with tins of every shape and size, barrels of oil, sacks of rice and flour, cases of biscuits, macaroni and sugar. He went over his stock again and again, for people kept stealing from it. Sometimes it was Glatini or Boisfuras, at other times Esclavia, Merlopin years. The voice gently pointed out that his accounts did not balance. He would then start all over again. Three thousand tins of peas, two thousand of string beans, two hundred boned hams, ten barrels of oil. There was a barrel of oil missing. Esclavia came and leant on the counter and sniggered stupidly. Then everything started to swim before his eyes. The doctor who was sent for shrugged his shoulders. There was nothing to be done. There was no physical ailment he could diagnose, but something had gone wrong. He advised the services of a priest. One morning Lakem stopped counting his tins. He was buried in a little clearing on the side of the mountain above Camp 1. For a few weeks his grave was marked with a bamboo cross, then it was swallowed up in the jungle. There were several other officers in the camp who gave up the ghost like this, mostly those who had shown the greatest endurance during the march and had afterwards heaved a profound sigh of relief as they dropped onto their bunks in Camp 1. Esclavia and Glatini had one mosquito net between them and shared the same blanket which they spread out at night on the bamboo slats of the floor. One night Esclavia, who normally slept like a top, twisted and turned in a fever. After the evening downpour the temperature had dropped abruptly, he started shivering. Glatini wrapped him up in the blanket with all the tenderness and affection he now felt for this hardened condotti ear. Reveille sounded shortly before dawn. A viet would hammer on a large bamboo hanging from a branch, slowly at first, then with progressively increasing speed as the sound gradually diminished. This was the great rhythm of Asia, the rhythm of feasts and pagodas, of funerals and births, of the chase and of war. From the distant monasteries of Tibet to Vermilion Hued Peking, from the narrow valleys of the Thai countryside to the Kampongs of Malaya, all life was geared to the clash of gong and wooden rattle. The prisoners assembled in teams outside their huts to draw their breakfast soup, a meager ration of rice recooked in slightly salted water. They gobbled it up standing in the fresh invigorating light of dawn before reporting on the parade ground for the daily fatigues. Shall I bring up your soup? asked Glatini who was worried by his comrade's immobility. Esclavia lay hunched up under the blanket, bathed in sweat. He muttered weakly. No, you can have my share. This looked serious. No one could afford to miss a meal. Refusing rice was the first symptom of the capitulation which in a few days had brought Lakem to the little clearing tucked away in the jungle. None of that now, you're going to eat up like the rest of us. Glatini unhooked the two wooden ladles hanging on the partition above their bed a space and held them for a few seconds over the flames in the hearth to sterilize them. In addition to the bugs and the mosquitoes, rats swarmed through the huts all night in search of the smallest grain of rice. Famished and mangy, they were carriers of a deadly germ, the spirochete. In humans, this germ caused a burning fever which reduced the body to a state of mummification. French hospitals had perfected a rigorous and costly treatment, and this alone was capable of saving the patients. They were kept alive by intravenous injections of a serum in all four limbs, which enabled them to survive during the ten days it took for the spirochete to develop and die. In Camp 1 this treatment was not available and disinfection by fire was the only form of prevention against this illness which was almost always lethal. Holding a ki bat heaped with rice in one hand, Glatini knelt down beside his companion and raised his head with the other. Come on, eat up. Esclavia opened his feverish, bloodshot eyes. I can't swallow. Eat up, I tell you. Give me something to drink. Get this down first, then I'll make you some tea. There's nothing left to drink at the moment. In the country of water that kills they first had to boil the liquid to which they added a few leaves of wild tea, guava or bitter orange. In spite of his reluctance, 
Glatini forced his comrade to swallow his breakfast soup. Esclavia sank back exhausted and brought it all up in a series of shuddering wretches. The others, having folded their blankets and mosquito nets and equipped themselves for the morning fatigues, climbed down the ladder and went off to the parade ground. Marindal, glatingly called out, Esclavia's ill. Tell the voice I'm staying behind to look after him. He cleaned the soiled blanket, washed the captain's face and chest in cold water, then boiled some tea. Esclavia seemed a little easier now, his face betrayed enormous strain and in one night had assumed the translucid grey-brown complexion of the veterans of Kaobang. The fever appeared to have abated. He had managed to keep down two large bowls of tea. I feel better now. There's no need for you to stay. Esclavia seemed ashamed of inflicting these nursing duties on his comrade. He knew how keen Glatini was on his morning fatigue, a ten-mile walk, there and back, to fetch the rice from the depot. He called this physical culture and claimed it kept him in shape. But Glatini refused to leave him. I'm not going out this morning, I'm on barrack fatigue. I'm going to clean up and bring in the water and wood. You had a nice bout of malaria last night. My attacks are violent but short, I'll be up and about tomorrow. In the course of the morning, Captain Everett, the medical officer on duty that day, came and saw Esclavia. He sounded his stomach, examined his throat, felt his pulse. I've got malaria, Esclavia insisted almost angrily. Glatini followed Everett outside and, when they were some distance away from the hut, questioned him. What's wrong with him? Fever, said Everett, I can't say more than that without being able to make an analysis. I'll put him down for the regime, but I don't know if Prosper will accept him. Your team has a rather bad name, you know. Prosper, an arrogant little Vietnamese who barely concealed his hatred for the whites, bore the pompous title of Camp Doctor. He had been an orderly of sorts at the Jayadin Hospital before joining the Viet Minh two years earlier. Every morning he presided under this title at a medical inspection in the infirmary where the sick had to come and report in person. From the sixteen medical officer prisoners he had selected two assistants to whom he had at least conceded the title of male nurse. His assistants examined the patients, which he was incapable of doing himself made their diagnosis and prescribed a treatment which they recorded in an exercise book. This was eventually submitted to Prosper who made the final decision, without even having seen the patients, according to standards that were utterly alien to medical practice. Beside Esclavier's name was the note, Malaria, two tablets of Navqueen, three days regime. Prosper screwed up his little monkey face. Esclavier and his team were classified as WSS Wiley serpents. He crossed out malaria and wrote in, fever, relieved of duty for 48 hours, which meant that his team would draw only half a ration of rice for him. Thank heavens the little rat doesn't normally air, Everett reflected, otherwise he would have the whole lot bled so as to kill them off the more quickly. For four days Esclavier's temperature kept rising. He lay without moving under the blankets which his comrades piled on top of him. Glatini, who never left his side, persuaded him to drink a little boiled water every two hours. More often than not he brought it up, and at night he was delirious. One evening the old though, before smoking his water pipe, came and squatted down by his head. He looked at the whites of his eyes, lifting the lid with a finger the color of paddy field mud, and drew back his lips to examine the gums. He cleared his throat and aimed a long jet of saliva with accuracy through a gap in the floorboards. Then he rejoined Boyce Führers by the fire. Tired, he said, taking out his pipe, to buy tired. Boyce Führers questioned him in though, but the old man merely shook his head and repeated, Tired. Tired meant death in Vietnamese. The old man made no further comment. He had no time to waste in gestures and words for a man whom he considered already tired. Everett called half a dozen times, bringing with him a different doctor each time. They discussed the case at the bedside of the patient whose skin, stretched over an emaciated frame, had gone reddish-yellow color. Glatini or Marindal walked back with them to hear their verdict. He ought to go to hospital, Everett declared one morning, 
he can't last another week. But Prosper won't hear of it. Yesterday his note in the book was, dysentery, diet. He might just as well have written down, smallpox, aspirin. If smallpox were a disease which is tolerated by the Puritan Democratic Republic, I'd like to strangle that filthy little politica who dares to assume the title of doctor but can't even give an injection. Marindal persuaded Botin and the doctor to come with him to see the voice about it. His dialectic, supported by Everett's technical arguments and Botin's political guarantee, eventually extracted an agreement from the political commissar to move Esclavia to hospital. The hospital was two days march away and the patient had to be carried there on a stretcher. The whole team was given permission to join a fatigued party which was going to bring back some salt. Leroy and Orsini volunteered to go with them. Mamari was worn out but decided to accompany them all the same. Boyce Führers believed in the old those diagnosis. Esclavier was tired, there was nothing more to be done for him. But he preferred not to say so. Esclavier would end up being carried by his comrades, like a barbarian warrior he would receive in homage their sweat and their endeavor. And that was something which could hardly fail to please the strange captain. 8. Dyer the Magnificent The Thursday that hospital was situated among wooded hills intersected by broad cultivated patches in the vicinity of the bright river whose reddish waters were a churning mass of tree trunks, driftwood, carrion and tufts of grass. It was the biggest and best one in the people's army and consisted of over thirty animite huts built at ground level and scattered through the forest. They were connected to one another by paths of beaten earth shaded by huge trees, redwood sows, limbs as hard as iron, silk cotton trees with thick white trunks, and giant banglangs which are used for making dugout canoes. A tangle of creepers draped the hospital in a natural camouflage net which was impenetrable to observation from the air. From the straight white secondary road between Baknahung and Jim Ho, which bordered it on the east, there was nothing to betray its presence except for a few sentries posted at the near end of the paths which were hidden by thick clumps of bamboo. The group of prisoners carrying Esclavier reached the hospital late in the evening. Esclavier was still alive but delirious. His comrades were exhausted from their efforts. They had hurried all the way and their legs trembled while Avia tordily, trying to impress them by wearing a gauze mask over his mouth, looked with disgust at the patient they had laid down at his feet. Tired, he said. You may as well take him away. He's no more tired than you are. Dio appeared, wearing nothing but a pair of shorts, with his muscular ebony torso, his slim waist his sprinter's legs and his powerful bass voice booming like a drum. What has he been treated for? He asked Marindal, as he bent over Esclavia. Malaria. He's got spirushtosis. My dear colleagues don't know how to use their eyes, they need laboratories and analyses, radio equipment and neatly labeled bottles of medicine. But since all these are lacking, they just throw up their hands in despair. They've stopped being proper doctors. Real doctors should be like wizards who possess the secrets of life and death, of plants, poisons and sex. I, Dyer, have a number of secrets. Even for curing spirushtosis. What do you use? Glatini asked. Bromide, Dyer calmly replied, shrugging his massive shoulders. It was a brainwave. There was nothing else available, so I thought of bromide. If I'd had any aspirin, I might have thought of aspirin. But above all I believe I inspire those who have thrown in the sponge with the will to live. My dear colleagues have a name for that, psychosomatosis. They give highfalutin names to whatever they don't understand. Bring the patient to that hut down there. Captain Dyer of the medical corps disappeared into a canna behind a screen. He's a bit of a crackpot, isn't he? Merle asked Marindal. Most of us owe our lives to his secrets. There are plants that he knows, but above all it's his love for mankind, for all men, and the life and strength he disseminates all round him. He's looking after less cure. He may be able to save Esclavia. He has even made an impression on the Viets, said Orsini. Haven't they tried to work on him politically? Boyce Führers asked. 
Dyer's not like us, said Marindal, fragile and inconstant, uncertain of everything. He's a magnificent and generous life force. I can't explain it more clearly. But he's neither white, nor negro, nor a civilian, nor a soldier, he's a sort of benign power. What do you think the sterile, sexless Viet Minh termites can do to him? Termites only attack dead trees. Dyer reappeared, he was sweating freely and scratching his crinkly hair. We might be able to save him, he said, if he wants to be saved, but it won't be easy. Is he a new arrival? What's his name, Marindal? Captain S. Clavier. Lescure has told me a lot about him, Captain S. Clavier, the man who led him by the hand like a small child throughout the march. Lescure talks to you. Glatini asked. Certainly. He's not mad, you know. Just a little strange. He's taken refuge in a sort of cocoon where he doesn't want to be disturbed by anyone. I'm very fond of him. He stays with me, where I can keep an eye on him. Can we see him? Not yet. He's cured all right but he doesn't know it. He's got to get used to the idea. Off you go now, chaps. I'll take good care of Esclavia. Because I appreciate what he did for less cure. Marindal, please tell Everard that he might have sent him along a little sooner. It's Prosper. Sometimes, said Dyer, I dream that I've got my hands round his throat and that I'm squeezing, squeezing hard. Then I let go and he drops down dead. Prosper. And all his dirty politics which poison man's happiness. He waved goodbye and went off to join Lescure in a small hut where he lived with him on the edge of the forest. Lescure was cutting down a tree with a hatchet, humming under his breath as usual. Dyer came and squatted down beside him. What's that June? he asked. A Mozart concerto. Go on, I like it. Yes, I like it very much, but I couldn't sing it like that, I'd have to alter the beat. Go on, my lad, sing. He picked up a wooden kalabash, turned it upside down and started tapping out a jazz rhythm with the palm of his hand. Lescure sang louder and the marvelous, elegant music seemed to lend itself cheerfully to the big negro's fanciful improvisation. There's something I'd like you to hear, said Dyer. Every now and then it comes back to me. It's music from the sacred forest, the music of my people, the Gzis, it's the Nyoma war fetish song. I couldn't have been more than twelve when I last heard it, but I haven't forgotten it. He started whistling through his teeth, beating time on the kalabash. The sound he produced was plaintive, like the whimpering of a sick animal or an unhappy child, but accompanied by the deep resounding rhythm of the jungle, the rhythm of nature. Overwhelming, savage and inexorable and at the same time serene and beguiling. It spread its arms wide to welcome men, beasts and plants alike in its warm embrace, to reduce them to their essential atoms and bring them back to life in the various forms adopted by the vital force, as the Gzis of the sacred forest called it. Your music's lovely, said Les Cure, but it lacks tenderness and sweetness, the sort of friendly gentleness of a human smile. What about Esclavia? You'll save him, won't you? You've got no idea how I hated him until I discovered what lay behind those grey eyes of his. Esclavia's rather like your music, your Nyoma song, the part you accompanied on the Kalabash. He's hard, relentless, tireless, completely unbowed, proud in his animal strength. But he's also an utterly pure, subtle and ancient melody. Friendship and human affection. The violins in the autumn part of Vivaldi's Four Seasons. You express yourself extremely well. All I can do is talk or make music, but I don't know how to fight like Esclavia, or how to cure like you. You don't enjoy fighting? No, neither the noise of the guns, nor the whistle of the bullets, nor the mangled corpses, nor the waving flags. And you don't want to remember. But I don't remember any more. Let's have something to eat, then I'll go and see Esclavia. If I can keep him alive for two more days, he's saved. Will you speak to him? No, he wouldn't hear me. But I'll be near him, within arm's reach. What he really needs is a woman at his bedside all the time. I'm going to ask for a nurse. 
It was comrade nurse Sun Kyuan of the 22nd First Aid Section at Thanho who was detailed by the director of the hospital, as much on account of her knowledge of French as by virtue of her sound political education. She was a pure product of the VIN training establishments. She wore uniform tunic and trousers, both several sizes too big, and a Bodois fiber helmet from which two long plots escaped. In spite of this garb and her abrupt and bossy manner she was beautiful, for her beauty lay in the purity and delicacy of her features and the harmony and elegance of her gestures. The first task Daya gave her was to cut the patient's hair, shave him, make him drink a mouthful of tea every half hour and a spoonful of bromide every two hours. But soon demanded that the Viet Minh doctor should confirm this treatment, for it was scarcely to be believed that a man who was not a communist should know anything about medicine or even have access to any form of knowledge whatsoever. The Viet Minh doctor was extremely flattered. He congratulated his little sister but nevertheless asked her to obey the medical officer who, in spite of his primitive methods, sometimes obtained excellent results. In any case she would quickly be relieved of her task, since the prisoner had no more than a few hours to live. Soon raised Esclavier's head, opened his chapped lips and poured a little tea between his clenched teeth. His face was covered in a heavy growth of beard. His hollow cheeks threw his jaw and cheekbones into sharp relief. He could scarcely open his burning, bloodshot eyes, racked with fever, he could no longer articulate, while his body, which day by day lost more and more of its substance, was reduced to a sort of skeleton under a tightly stretched, orange-colored skin. As she touched him, however, soon felt a faint indefinable tremor, which she attributed to her fatigue or the heat. This was the first time she had been put in charge of a white man, and she had been warned that this particular one had been an extremely dangerous type before his claws had been blunted by disease. Esclavier had a sort of spasm which contracted his limbs. With a jerk of his foot he threw back the bedclothes. He was stark naked except for a filthy, stained slip which concealed his private parts. Soon realized how strong and vigorous he must have been. His chest was hairless, his wrists and ankles slender. As she pulled back the bedclothes, she noticed several scars on his chest and thighs. She could not refrain from touching one of these with her finger. Her sister Ngoc at Hanoi had once had a lover who was a white man like this one. She lived with him in a villa with a garden and when he came back from the war they used to give little parties to which they invited Frenchmen and their wives or their Vietnamese girlfriends. Little Japanese lanterns were hung among the trees, there was music, there were sweet things to eat, preserved ginger and pawpaw salad. Ngoc and all her friends were nothing but strumpets. One day the soldiers of the People's Army had killed the Major who lived with her sister. Ngok had been so besotted with him that she had refused to marry the son of the governor of Tonkin and had gone off to live with another white man. She was nothing but a cat in heat, who had no other thought in her head, who mewed in the dark when making love. Perhaps this man who was lying here and whom she was tending had been to her sister's parties, perhaps he had even held her in his arms. One night in Hanoi the Major had introduced her to a swarthy, bandy-legged little lieutenant with an overpowering smell. When he had tried to lay hands on her, soon had sent him off with a flea in his ear. Then she had packed her few belongings and gone off to Hai Chuang to stay with a girlfriend who belonged to the Viet Minh organization. First of all she had done a spell with the Dukits and, since she spoke good French, she had been detailed to pick up drunken legionaries and try to buy their arms or induce them to desert. On two occasions she had narrowly missed being raped and one night it was only by a miracle that she escaped from a police patrol. Her partisan comrades also tried to sleep with her and on three or four occasions she had it to give in to them, because they accused her of being an aristocrat and a reactionary and of reserving herself for the caresses and slender hands of a mandarin's son. She had developed an absolute horror of everything to do with men and sex and it was with profound relief that she had joined the regular army where chastity was the rule. Soon tried to imagine how Esclavia must have looked before his illness and what she would have done if the major had introduced her to him instead of to the runtish little lieutenant. She dismissed this absurd thought from her mind. He was an enemy of the Vietnamese people, 
a colonial mercenary, and it was only because President Ho had advocated a policy of leniency that she was looking after him. On the evening of the ninth day of his illness Esclavier had an internal hemorrhage. Soon was wiping the bunk clean with cold water when Dyer, accompanied by the doctor in charge of the hospital, looked in. They were both laughing, because the negro even managed to make the little Asiatic unbend and made him forget his old resentment as a medical student in Saigon who used to fall asleep over his books from sheer fatigue and as an underpaid doctor on a plantation in Cambodia who was only allowed to look after the coolies. Besides, Dyer was a negro, a member of a race that was exploited by the whites, and the instructions about him were explicit in spite of the failure they had so far encountered, they were to persevere in their attempts to indoctrinate him in the hope of winning him over to the communist cause. Thanks to these many pretexts, Dr. Nguyen Van Tak was able to indulge in an occasional display of friendship before assuming the inflexible mask of a Viet Minh director. Dyer looked at the blood-stained rags and drew closer to the patient. How do you feel this evening? In the interval between two bouts of fever it sometimes happened that Esclavier recovered his full lucidity. He would then lie hunched up under the bedclothes, motionless and silent. With an effort the captain would muster all his strength and try to fight the illness. But like those fragile banks of sand that children build on the seashore and which the tide eventually comes and sweeps away, the powerful waves of the fever likewise destroyed his last defenses and dragged him back into the furnace in which his memories, his resentments, his hopes and his strength were all consumed in flickering red flames. Dyer put his hand on his forehead, and at once he felt a sense of relief, as though another child had come to help him build his dam. The negro repeated his question. How do you feel? What remained of Esclavia made an effort to speak and to smile. He started off by swallowing hard, then managed to utter the words. I'm thirsty, I'm always thirsty, but I keep bringing up whatever I drink. Dyer burst into a loud guffaw. You'll be better tomorrow. Soon left the room with the doctor in charge and Dyer. The negro was scratching his head and had become extremely solemn, which gave an innocent and at the same time sly expression to his face. He's been passing blood, hasn't he, Miss Soon? She felt she should defend her patient. This evening was the very first time. God Almighty, they brought him here too late. Intestinal hemorrhages are the final symptoms of spirochetosis. I've never seen anyone survive who's reached that stage. Dyer turned to the doctor in charge. Miss Soon will have to stay with the patient all night to give him something to drink at regular intervals. She's got a certain way with her. Comrade Soon, the Viet replied, will certainly volunteer for this additional task. She knows her duty as a militant and has pledged herself to our cause body and soul and once and for all. He delivered this little speech with unconcealed self-satisfaction. He looked to see if it had made any impression, but the big negro remained impervious, his thoughts elsewhere. He was running over in his mind everything he knew about this illness, every treatment that had been discovered. None of them was available here, and in any case it was now too late. He hung his head and felt the sharp pang that occurred every time death got the better of life and snatched one of his patients from him. He was a Christian at heart but he still vaguely believed in the old animist legends and felt that every creature that died diminished the sum total of the vital force of the entire universe. Some of his own strength would be taken from him when Esclavia strained for the last time to expel what life he had left. He would also lose a comrade, and he had an extremely profound sense of solidarity. Between themselves Negroes called one another brother, but Dyer also called many white men brother. In the early hours of the morning Esclavier's temperature went up again and soon remembered what the black doctor had said. The Frenchman was going to die. Unless. But she hadn't the right to think of that. It was amoebic dysentery the patient had, since he was passing blood, she knew this, she didn't have to be a doctor for that. In the director's medicine chest there were some of those long brown files that cure dysentery, they contained emetine. But imatine was in short supply, it was reserved for the soldiers of the people's army. Esclavia started moaning again. 
she wiped the sweat off his forehead with a damp cloth. His features were drawn, he was battling with death all by himself, battling with the big black fisherman of legend who haunted the sunny beaches of Anam with the souls of men in his net. She was there to help him, and she was doing nothing. But she had not the right to do anything, not even to believe in the big fisherman. Once again she wiped his forehead and tried to force his teeth open to make him swallow a drop of tea. The emetine was reserved for the soldiers of the people's army, this was as it should be, for they had to fight without aircraft, without medical facilities against the wealthy soldiers defending imperialism. But President Ho had decreed a policy of leniency. Esclavier gave a sort of violent hiccup, soon thought he was going to die and she felt overwhelmed with sorrow as though someone very dear to her was about to be snatched away, her father, her mother. No, this was different, it was something even stronger. Then the patient recovered his breath. She tried desperately to find a solution. I'll go and see the director, I have done my duty by him, he has confidence in me, I shall ask him, as an exceptional favor for a file of emetine. He won't be able to deny me this. Yes, but he's not here, he's asleep, he's tired, I can't wake him up for something so unimportant. I shall report to him tomorrow. Anyway there will soon be peace, and medicines will start arriving from all four corners of the earth. Soon hurried across to the infirmary, she was blinded by the gusts of rain which twice tore the helmet off her head. She lit her way by switching her electric torch on and off, as she had been taught, so as not to waste the battery. When she got back, she had the precious file clutched in her damp hand. She took a syringe and a needle out of her first aid box and by the light of a candle end heated up some water on the open fire. The water took a long time to boil. She felt like screaming with impatience, the patient was liable to die at any moment. She blew frantically on the embers. Outside, the monsoon burst into a steady downpour. Eventually she managed to give the injection and Esclavier immediately seemed more comfortable and began to breathe more regularly again. The downpour had also abated slightly, it had lost its aspect of violence and fury and the myriad drops of rain tapping on the roof of the hut sounded almost friendly. The fire flickered and slowly died down still throwing off a gleam or two which flared over the thin partitions and over the patient's face, that emaciated mask in which the eyes formed two dark cavities. Soon felt happy, at the bedside of this man whose very name was unknown to her, this man of an alien race, she experienced a feeling of joy of which she had never before suspected the existence. With her little wicker fan she slowly swept the thick air above the prisoner's face and smiled. He was hers, for she had saved him, of that she was certain, little knowing that emetine had no effect at all on spirochtosis. One day peace would come and they would meet again. He would be strong and upstanding again, the finest, strongest white man in the world. Then she would tell him how for his sake she had stolen the precious file. Her misgivings returned, but gently, like the sound of the rain, and, like the rain, they seemed to share her secret soon had made the to buy a gift of her first fault against the party, almost as though it was her virginity. As a result of this she felt vaguely distressed and at the same time filled with wonder. When Dyer came back the following morning, Esclavier was asleep and still being attended by an exhausted and radiant little Miss Soon. He put a hand on the patient's forehead and felt his pulse. The fever had abated. With a final effort, by summoning up all his strength. Esclavier had managed to reach the threshold of the tenth day. Dyer felt like laughing out loud, singing and dancing. Death had been warded off, humanity was the richer by a man's strength. That night he had prayed to the Lord for Esclavier's soul and all the time the Lord, with a great chuckle, was busy curing the captain. He was immensely pleased. He's saved, Dyer told the nurse. I can't get over it. He saved himself all on his own, without my medicine. Don't you think? She stopped short. For the pleasure of scoring over the black man, she had almost revealed her theft of the emetine. When Dyer bent over Esclavier to examine him more closely, she started forward as though intent on defending her patient. 
Daya looked at the girl and was astonished to see that she was no longer an insect, that there was something warm, triumphant emanating from her, that her eyes sparkled and her nostrils quivered. Life was coursing once more through her veins. It can't be possible, Daya said to himself. She's showing every symptom of being in love. In the four years he had been at this hospital he had never seen such a thing, a Viet Minh woman falling for a prisoner. He felt like being very gentle with her, calling her little sister and telling her to be extremely careful because she risked death, and Esclavia as well, if anything occurred between them. For the moment Esclavia was quite incapable of doing the least thing, but she, soon, was aglow with love, it was as visible as a firefly in the dark. When he went back to Les Cure, Dyer was singing. He seized the slender lieutenant by the elbows and dandled him in the air like a child. Two miracles have happened, he chanted. Blessed be the Holy Virgin and all the angels and all the demons of hell. Esclavia should have died last night, this morning he's alive, alive and kicking, his fever's almost gone, and that little brute soon has fallen in love with him and is beaming like a candle. Love has come into the big Viet Minh hospital of Thursday that for the first time, like a ray of sunshine on the termites. Perhaps they'll all die of it. By the evening Esclavia was much better. He no longer brought everything up and cheerfully gulped down every cup of tea that soon made him. Dyer brought him a tin of condensed milk which he was keeping for a special occasion. It still bore the label, Gift of the American Red Cross. When soon came back next morning, she found that the captain, while attempting to sit up, had fallen off his bunk. Stark naked, with one elbow resting on an emaciated leg, he looked sheepish and at the same time furious. She could not help laughing. Well, 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 said Esclavia, that's the first time I've heard you laugh. I thought you all had something cut out of your throats. She helped him climb back onto his bunk and experienced a fresh tremor as she felt Esclavia's arm round her shoulder. She tried to reason with him. That's not very nice of you, Eclopia. The captain peevishly corrected the pronunciation of his name. Esclavia. Captain Philippe Esclavia of the 4th Colonial Parachute Battalion. There are no captains here, or paratroops. There are just to bis prisoners to whom we're applying President Ho's policy of leniency. Oh, balls. Exhausted, the captain fell asleep. Soon pulled the bedclothes over him and ran her fingers over his forehead. He was called Philippe. She repeated the name, Philippe. Philippe. He had big grey eyes, as luminous as the sea on certain mornings in the Bay de Long. For a moment she imagined herself sleeping in his arms, like her sister with the Major then instantly dismissed the idea. Philippe was just a Tobai, an enemy of her people. That evening soon attended the political education meeting which was held once a week for the personnel of the hospital under the presidency of the director, Dr. Nguyen Van Tack, a member of the Central Committee. As usual, the meeting began with a collective self-examination undertaken by Nguyen Van Tack. He reproached himself in the name of his comrades for the insufficient efficiency of the hospital and emphasized the fact that even if the armistice was signed at Geneva, the struggle would go on until every vestige of capitalism disappeared from the earth. Some of the participants then accused themselves of minor faults, promised to make amends and made solemn resolutions that were utterly out of proportion to their misdemeanors. The usual routine? Soon was sitting in the front row and for the first time the doctor noticed how beautiful she was, a butterfly that had just emerged from its chrysalis and was stretching its new wings in the sun. All the desires he had suppressed since he had joined the people's army, high-spirited young girls, iced beer, unreserved friendships with men like Dyer, the click of Maojong pieces in Chinese shops, came flooding back like a whiff of magnolia on a June evening in Phnom Penh. He would have liked to hold Sun tight in his arms and caress her long eyelashes with his lips. He mastered his emotion and cleared his throat. I must congratulate our comrade Sun, he said, for the great forbearance with which she has looked after a prisoner in spite of the disgust and contempt this mercenary inspired in her. No, said Sun. There was a heavy silence. One never protested when praise was meted out to one but, on the contrary, 
it was customary to lower one's eyes and assume a modest, startled air of embarrassment. No, Comrade Tack, I'm not worthy of your praise. It's my duty to inform you that in the course of this task I committed a serious fault. In your absence, when the Tobai was going to die, I took it on myself to take a file of Imetin and inject him with it. My pride tempted me to put my own interpretation on President Ho's directives on the policy of leniency. But today you have made me aware of my fault, for I should have known this medicine was reserved for our valiant combatants. I beg leave to be removed from my post. Soon had spoken on the spur of the moment, to be relieved of her sin, and she was already regretting it, for she was going to be separated from her to buy. Dr. Nguyen scrutinized his audience but no one showed either anger or compassion. They were all waiting for him to give a sign of the one or the other. Soon was really gorgeous, sitting bolt upright, her face raised towards him, offering herself for punishment. He had some difficulty in assuming the injured tone to suit the occasion. Comrade Soon, I must give you a severe reprimand. I see, however, that you recognize the gravity of your fault. Your past record and political background speak for the purity of your intention. I feel partly responsible myself for having allotted you these extra tasks which might have warped your judgment to such an extent that you allowed yourself to put your own interpretation on our beloved leader's decisions. You will remain in your post and deal with that abyss instead of tending our glorious combatants. That will be your punishment. Only then did everyone manifest his compassion. I shall be seeing Philippe again, soon said to herself, I shall be with him every day. A thrill of delight ran through her. Next day Dyer, for whom the walls of the hospital had ears, heard all about it. He discussed it with less cure. That silly little soon might have killed Esclavier with her imatine. Imatine jolts the heart, and now she believes she saved him. She's as blindly in love as a schoolgirl. It will turn out badly for her in the end, badly for both of them perhaps. Have you ever been in love, Les Cure? Les Cure bent his head over the piece of bamboo he was carving into a shepherd's flute. A cousin of mine. I told her and she started squirming about in her chair as though she was sitting on a packet of pins. And she laughed and laughed. After that, only tarts. I was quite popular at the Pania Fleury in Hanoi. I used to play the piano for them. Esclavier's a lucky dog. Di appealed a banana pensively. I'm very fond of you, he said all of a sudden. I'd like to keep you here with me. We're left in peace, we only talk when we feel like talking. You'll soon be able to play me that flute of yours. But the director of the hospital is beginning to think you're not so very mad. He's talking of sending you back to Camp One. But I am mad. Dyer. I can show him. I'll bring him in for a consultation. We'll arrange a little scene for him. Next day, when Dr. Nguyen Van Tack came into the hut, Les Cure pretended to be asleep. He woke up with a start. Boy, he shouted, more Len. Make tea at once, I shout for you the whole time, you good for nothing. Dyer crept up behind the director with a bowl of tea. He's very overexcited this evening. Here, hand him the tea, I've put some bromide in it. Come on, boy, more len. Nguyen Van Tack was furious. Dyer gently reasoned with him. Come, sir, he's mad, and you're a doctor. An excellent doctor, moreover. Hand him this bowl of tea. He doesn't know you have beaten the French army at Dien Bien Phu. I'd like you to cure him so that he learns. It's really too easy a position. Madness is often an easy solution for those who take refuge in it. And thus it was that Lescure stayed on at the hospital and was served tea by the director. Esclavier quickly recovered his strength. His skin lost its strange color. In addition to his improved regime rations, soon brought him fruit, guavas and slices of fresh pineapple and enriched his rice with chicken or sometimes little chunks of fat pork cooked in sugar. Relieved by her confession and by the absolution that had followed, she devoted herself wholeheartedly to her nursing duties, little realizing that her attitude towards the prisoner was that of a con guy in love. 
she forgot all her Marxist vocabulary and the peace of the people to ask him more personal questions. What is Paris like? Esclavia tried to think. It's very beautiful and very dirty, very rich and very poor, there's a wood on either side of it, Vincennes where the poor go, Boulogne which is for the rich. And where did you go? To the Luxembourg, where the students go, who are poor, but who all believe that one day they'll be rich and famous. Are French girls pretty? Today's the 18th July, isn't it? The beaches will be crowded with golden skinned girls, laughing, splashing about in the water, playing with rubber balls, who are in love, or believe they are, or pretend they are. When they come back from the beach, they put on bright colored dresses and reflectively sip long iced drinks while pretending to understand a boring boy who talks to them about Sartre but who has gentle eyes. And it's his eyes they look at. Our lovely young French girls don't know there's a war going on. He suddenly looked at the little Vietnamese girl with her plaits, her collar buttoned up to her chin, in her dull green uniform. But you're all so lovely, soon, you're all so golden skinned. And you're at war. I'm at war for my people. Our pretty girls dance, drink, eat, play in the sun and make love for the sole pleasure of their selfish bodies. He was lying on his bunk, propped up on his elbows with his head resting in his hands, and through his mind scampered the slender girls of his country, the merry, eager girls tasting of sugar and vinegar. Soon squatted by the head of the bed. Esclavia turned towards her and gently stroked her hair. He felt deep affection and friendship for his little Vietnamese sister in uniform who was suffocating with him in this hut among the blazing limestones, who, like him, had known war and all its horrors and who had been moved by human suffering. To make her ugly, she had been given a helmet and tunic several sizes too big for her, and her magnificent hair had been knotted into two long plaits which hung down to her shoulders. She had been forbidden to be a woman. Esclavia drew soon closer to him and her cheek brushed against his. She gave a little sob and shut her eyes. She was trembling from head to foot and she felt as if she was drowning in an emerald green sea which was warm and cool at one and the same time, then everything seemed as simple as love, as simple as death. She loved her to buy, her defenses were down. She would do whatever he wished. She would risk death in order to please him, she would steal to get him better food, she would escape with him if he asked her. She would be his little congai, like her sister with the major and if ever he left her she would kill herself. She ran her damp finger over the captain's brow and the last memory she had of him was his big grey eyes and the desire she fancied she read in them. In fact it was only astonishment. A Bodoy had come to tell soon that the director wanted her. He had thrust his head through the door of the hut and had seen her with her cheek against the two buys, he had witnessed her treachery against the people when she had caressed him. He had crept away without a sound to notify his superiors. Soon rose to her feet. I'm going to fetch your meal, she said, I'll be back at once. She's a nice little thing, Esclavia said to himself. When I'm released, I must try and send her a little present. But it was a Bodoy who brought him his meal. Dr. Nguyen Van Tack had called a meeting of the Camp Vigilance Committee to interrogate Soon. They were eight in number including three women, and the meeting was held in a hut with an armed guard outside the door. Soon faced them, standing bareheaded and stiffly to attention. The Bodoy who had caught her out delivered his evidence. Yes, he had seen Comrade Soon pressed amorously against the prisoner, yes, she had certainly stroked his face. Did he think sexual intercourse had previously taken place between them? No, he did not think so. Comrade soon had her uniform jacket buttoned up and the prisoner just had his arm round her shoulder. The head nurse rose to her feet. Can you state, Comrade soon, that you have never had the slightest sexual intercourse with the prisoner Esclavia? Yes, I can. Yet because of him you stole a file of emetine? Yes. Were you? She hesitated before uttering the horrible, obscene word. In love with him? Yes. Dr. Nguyen broke in. Once again he was anxious to save the little fool and tried to help her. This prisoner, who is classified as a dangerous type, 
tried to take advantage of you in a moment of weakness, was that it? No. He doesn't come into it, he doesn't even know I love him. I was the one who leaned over him, I was the one who caressed him, just as the Bodoi told you. The head nurse broke in again in her icy, insinuating, knowing voice. Comrade Sun, think carefully now before answering. Would your waywardness have led you to commit the sexual act with the prisoner? Soon dropped her deferential attitude towards this dried up, hypocritical, ignoble old woman who had always hated her. Yes, comrade, I would have done it. I would have lain down beside him and since I am young and pretty he would have made love to me. And for that infamous physical contact which is punishable by death. It's not an infamous contact, it's love. For this infamous contact you were prepared to betray the confidence of your people and of the party and the army. I wouldn't have betrayed anyone. I love this man, I'm only happy when I'm by his side. If you gave me my freedom I would go back to him. I don't know what's happened, but apart from him nothing else exists. Do you repent? The director asked. Repent? She looked absolutely amazed. But how can a woman repent of being in love? Nguyen could do nothing more for her. To have interceded again would have appeared suspicious. He made a proposal that soon should be expelled from the party forthwith and sent to a re-education camp for an indefinite period of time. This was tantamount to a death sentence. No one, man or woman, white or Vietnamese, had ever returned from those forced labor camps. Soon knew this. It was one of those things that were discussed in undertones in the divisions. The proposal was accepted by the majority. The members of the committee withdrew and for a moment Dr. Tak was left alone with Sun. I wanted to help you, he told her, and avoid such a severe measure being taken against you. But if you mend your ways, in a few months you may be reprieved. Dr. Tak, I'd like to see him just once more. He must be asleep now, he won't even notice. Just once more. No that's absolutely out of the question. It was nothing to do with him, he mustn't be punished. Promise me you won't take any action against him. We shall hold a court of inquiry. Promise me, Dr. Tack. I was very fond of you, you're the only one I was fond of in the whole of this camp. I promise. Soon seized his hand and kissed it before he had time to snatch it back. Two sentries came and marched her off. Nguyen Van Tak went on sitting with his head between his hands, trying to sort the matter out in his mind. Soon had made the ancient womanly gesture of submission, she no longer behaved like a Viet Minh girl, she had recovered her allure and her beauty. He himself had been aware of her attraction. All this, because she had fallen in love. It would be difficult to establish communism completely as long as men and women still existed, with their instincts and their passions their beauty and their youth. In the old days the Chinese used to bind their women's feet to make them smaller, that was the fashion, it must have had some religious or erotic significance. Now, in the name of communism, they bound the whole human frame, they frustrated and distorted it. That also might be nothing but a fashion. Soon had discovered love and kicked everything else overboard, recovering at the same time her freedom of action and speech. A fashion to kill thousands of creatures in the name of a fashion, to disrupt their lives and habits until one day someone would speak up and declare that communism was out of fashion. Nguyen had some difficulty in dismissing these unwelcome thoughts from his mind. He had his job to do as a doctor. He was a good doctor, Dyer had said so. He loved his country, even as a child he had dreamt of its independence. That was something positive. That wasn't just a fashion. On the following day Dyer, accompanied by Les Cure, came and fetched Esclavia. They helped him to walk to their hut and settled him in. Dyer did not come back until after dark and was a little tipsy when he arrived. He had got hold of a bottle of chum, a crude rice spirit produced by the mans who lived below the hospital, for which he had bartered a few tablets of quinine. We must drink, he said. All three of us because a little light has gone out in the camp. Drink up, Esclavia, it's because of you, though it's not your fault. Drink up, less cure, my lad, 
and play us that flute you made. Play what went on in your head when your little cousin laughed at you because you were in love with her. And I'll sing, I, Dyer, the Negro, with all my university degrees. I'll sing like a man of my people to exorcise the evil fetish, the curse that lies on us, because the little light has been snuffed out. Dyer, what are you talking about? Esclavier inquired. Little soon, they've sent her to a concentration camp because she was in love with the handsome to buy. For his sake she had stolen a file of imetine. A bodoi caught her kissing him and denounced her. But she was so proud of her love that she refused to repent and spat in their faces like an angry cat. Dyer, I didn't even notice it. Of course not. Drink up, Esclavia. Dr. Tack told me you won't get into trouble. That was her last request before being marched off by the Bodois, that you should be spared. Nguyen would also like to get drunk tonight. But he can't. He daren't admit it even to himself, but he was also in love with Soon. Love is catching, it might have spread through the hospital, then the camp, then the whole Viet Minh. So quick, out with that little light. When I was a little bush nigger, a bearded missionary came and took me by the hand. He was called Father Taysidra. I served mass for him, he taught me to read and write. Then, as he loved the jungle, our customs, our songs, our secrets, he used to come with me and visit the sorcerers and witch doctors, those who slay the prince of the dance with a golden arrow every seven years and those who fasten iron talons to their hands to play at panther men. Before knowing him, as a naked little nigger boy, I used to tremble with fear. But when he held my little black paw in his great hairy fist, I was no longer scared of the fetishes or poisons. Father Taysidra was love, the love of the Negroes, of the white men, of the whole world, he was stranger than all the fetishes and witch doctors and political commissars. One day he came into an inheritance, a farm in his native Oven. He sold it to pay for my education. In the name of love, in the name of Father Taysidra, to hell with the Viet Minh. He took a great gulp of the rice spirit. The Viet Minh and all those who deny love and mystery and gods, who block their ears so as not to hear the joyful and bewitching tom-toms of nature, sex and life, all those will be found dead one morning and no one will know why. When they've snuffed out all the lights, they'll fall flat on their backs and die. And Dyer the Magnificent, dead drunk, fell flat on his back himself, while the rose in the clammy, stifling darkness the sweet, clear melody of Lescure's shepherd's flute. 9. The Yellow Infection. After delivering Esclavia at the hospital, the team of stretcher bearers under the leadership of Marindel made their way back to camp one by easy stages. As soon as they were away from their chiefs, the three Bodois who made up the escort became carefree, cheerful and friendly with the prisoners, from whom they could only be distinguished by the weapons which encumbered them. They merely attended to the evening meal, which they made a point of preparing themselves, for the Tabis were no good at cooking the rice which had to come out of the pot after twenty minutes simmering, hot, dry and each grain separate. The newcomers would have willingly prolonged this holiday camp existence, but Marindel, Orsini and Leroy told them they had to be back in camp by the 14th of July. Anyway, said Leroy, we've only got enough rice to last up to the 12th. Parodying the voice, Marindel explained. The 14th of July is the feast of the liberation and brotherhood of the masses. The French people, our friends, who are fighting by our side in the camp of peace, were the first to shake off the yoke of tyranny and feudalism on the 14th of July 1789. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 completed this task of liberation. These are the great dates of humanity on the path of progress and in the historical sense. Marindel resumed his normal voice. Therefore, by way of celebration, on the 14th of July 1954 rations will be doubled all round provided we put on a big show with lectures, news bulletins, self-examinations at every level, both national and individual, manifestos and motions, choirs and orchestras theatrical productions and I don't know what else. A show that's not to be missed, calories to be built up, and perhaps the announcement of our release. They reached camp on the 13th of July, shortly before the midday meal. 
The parade ground was already decorated with banners in honor of every liberation movement, denouncing every form of constraint and imperialism, and cursing every Bastille and every prison. Merle, with his hands in the pockets of his shorts, his beret tipped forward over his nose, and his nose sniffing the wind, was on the prowl for news items. He wanted, he said, to write a full report on the preparations and the event itself for the camp newspaper. At the slaughterhouse he saw four skinny goats fastened to two stakes, some chickens and ducks for those on the regime, and two pigs whose exact weight he noted down for the sake of accuracy. They had to be weighed on old-fashioned bamboo scales. One came to just over seventy pounds, the other to almost eighty. He went and interviewed the camp commandant who told him that for the 14th of July the prisoners would be issued, in addition to their ice in lard and lentils, with a supplementary ration of goat in sauce, rice and molasses, and half an ounce of salt per man. He exaggerated these items of news as he saw fit, spoke of pigs weighing the best part of 300 pounds and whole flocks of goats and hinted that the Viets who had just discovered a store of wine concentrate were going to dole out a quart to every man in the camp. Merle's article was a great success. He decided that once he was free he would embark on a journalistic career. Marindal then assembled his team. We must all contribute, he told them, within the limit of our means and our imagination, to the celebrations organized for the 14th July. The afternoon meeting will be brought to a close by the adoption of a manifesto addressed to the French people which will be broadcast on the Viet Minh radio and reported in France in Le Humanite. This manifesto has been drafted by some of the old hands, I did a certain amount of work on it myself and you can count on us. There's nothing missing, we've even made sure of just the right amount of exaggeration to make anyone with any sense in his head howl with laughter. Needless to say, all the old hands will be only too eager to sign it, and also a large number of the newcomers. Marindal was pacing up and down in front of his comrades who sat squatting on their heels. Nevertheless, in order to prove the sincerity of our feelings, it wouldn't be a bad thing if some of you refused to sign this manifesto. I therefore propose to distribute the various roles we have to play. When the voice calls on you individually for your official signature, you will all read through the text with the utmost care and if necessary ask a few judicious questions before putting your name to the manifesto. Captain Glatini who is looked upon as a feudalist, that's written down in his file, I've seen it, obviously can't be expected to sign. So you'll declare, sir, if you don't mind, of course. I am an aristocrat and the son of an aristocrat, a pupil of the Jesuits and a French officer. During the last few weeks, thanks to the humiliation of defeat, I have become aware that my heredity, my background and my profession have corrupted the man in me. I now recognize the bestial selfishness of my class. But I have not yet been completely stripped of my inheritance of false ideas. If you order me to do it, I am quite prepared to sign this text with which I heartily agree in so far as it concerns the peace and brotherhood of the masses. But I am not convinced by the rest of it and I should feel I was deceiving you if I did not confess what doubts I have on this score. Assume the proper tone of voice and an air of modesty combined with a certain forthright endeavor that suggests your regret at not being able to fall in completely with the fighters for peace. After that, confide in the voice who, with tears of joy in his eyes, will take the pen out of your hand and urge you to persevere with your re-education which has started so well. Shall we rehearse it together? No, Marindal, said Glatini, I do not care to lie, not even to an enemy. Marindal's voice became as dry as Glatini's. I must remind you, sir, that you are still at war, what I'm asking you to do is an act of war. It's something more subtle but infinitely more realistic than a cavalry charge. Boyce Führers broke in. Marindal's right, Glatini. Perhaps this role doesn't appeal to you because in your case there's a certain amount of truth in it. Glatini made an effort to speak in a detached tone but he felt the anger welling up inside him. Would you kindly explain exactly what you mean by that, Boyce Führers? You have recognized the failure of your class, the feudalism of generals and staff officers to which you belong. 
which makes you so grumpy that you lose all sense of subtlety and self-control. Glatiny gradually calmed down. You must forgive me, Marindal. You're right, my education is still not complete. You ask me to perform an act of war and as such I shall do it. To the best of my ability. In my military career I've been required to do a number of unpleasant things, and this is one of them. I've been having to do unpleasant things for the last four years, Marindal gently replied. I shan't sign all that crap, Biniers declared. Orsini took him to task for this, and his voice suddenly betrayed the inflections of his native Corsica. Don't be a nitwit, it's the surest way of letting your family know you're still alive. I happen to have worked with the commies, when I was in the FTP they're not such bloody fools as that, they know what I'm like and they realize I'm hardly likely to take part in their little games again. All the more reason, said Marindal. Your name on the list will act as a further disclaimer. Do you really hate them as much as all that? Boyce Führers asked Marindal. I sometimes admire their courage and endurance, they're fortunate in having a faith, I've even got a certain weakness for the voice, I've hoodwinked him so often. I realize that many of their methods are valid and that we ought to adapt ourselves to their form of warfare in order to get the better of them. It's difficult to explain exactly, but it's rather like bridge as compared to Belot. When we make war, we play Belot with 32 cards in the pack but their game is bridge and they have 52 cards, 20 more than we do. Those 20 cards short will always prevent us from getting the better of them. They've got nothing to do with traditional warfare, they're marked with the sign of politics, propaganda, faith, agrarian reform. What spiting Glatiny? I think he's beginning to realize that we've got to play with 52 cards and he doesn't like it at all. Those twenty extra cards aren't at all to his liking. The 14th July festivities were a great success. For several hours the prisoners forgot their circumstances. There was a civilian in the camp. He had been there for two years. The Viet Minh had captured him in the Moan region while he was going round from post to post selling odds and ends. He was about thirty years old, with a little moustache and was forever taking his notebook out of his pocket and totting up rows of figures. He was working out all the money he would have earned if, instead of being a poor wretched civilian, he had been a soldier whose pay was accumulating in a post office savings account. Sometimes he shyly asked one of the officers. The Viet Minh have put me in the same camp as you, they therefore regard me as a military prisoner and an officer. On this score I may be entitled to an officer's pay. I've lost everything. I even owe some money to a Chinaman. No? You don't think I'll be considered as an officer? My truck which they burnt was worth 40,000 piastres, the contents 100,000 piastres, and they took all the ready cash I had on me, 60,000 piastres. The prisoners were hoping that at the evening meeting they would be informed that the war was over. But the voice made no announcement. The prisoners went back to their can as weighed down with disappointment. The fortnight that followed was one of the gloomiest periods of their whole captivity. The instruction sessions brought the same old news of the Geneva negotiations which were dragging on interminably. A rumor sometimes spread through the camp in a matter of minutes and brought all the prisoners out of their huts, American marines have just landed at Haiphong and two units of Chinese volunteers are concentrating on Munkei and Lang Sun. The old hands discussed the news with a sort of disillusioned philosophical attitude, while the newcomers at once drew dramatic conclusions from it, they were going to be sent to China, they would never be released. Some of them came and saw Glatini, hoping he would still know all about the intentions of GHQ. What do you think? They would ask the C. In C. S. former ADC. Glatini refused to cheat in order to reassure his comrades. The internationalization of the war is a solution which has never been completely excluded. The French in Indochina are fighting against the entire communist world. It would thus be logical if the nations of the free world stepped in, as they did in Korea. So you believe that the Marines have really landed? It would mean that the Geneva Conference has broken down. 
in that case we ought to try and escape at the first opportunity, said Bin Years. Who's with me? Don't let them lead you on, though, Marindal warned them. That rumor of marine landing is utter nonsense. I'm pretty certain it was put out by the voice, the source and medium of every news item. We shall have to undertake your education a little more thoroughly. Political re-education has a great deal in common with market gardening. When you arrived here you were fallow land covered in weeds, thickets and wild flowers. The problem was to make this land yield a good solid Marxist crop. So the soil was broken up for tilling, said Orsini, meaning that you were reduced to the appropriate mental and physical condition by an extremely judicious diet. 25 ounces of rice a day in fact, Leroy chipped in. The three old hands were performing a well-rehearsed turn. They never missed a cue, they each appeared in turn and made their little speech, then disappeared into the wings. Yes, 25 ounces of rice a day. The minimum vital ration. Within a few hours, as you saw for yourselves, you were dying of hunger, all you could think of was food. Your stomach clamored for attention and left you no time for any preoccupations of a philosophical, political or even religious nature. Then the instruction periods began. That was the seed being sown, the good old Marxist seed. It encountered no resistance in such well-tilled soil. The next thing was to create a sort of Pavlovian conditioned reflex in you, a politico-stomachic reflex. The prisoners have been enlightened and are making political progress. The minimum vital ration is increased proportionally and the stomach is prepared to think along the right lines. On the other hand, any backsliding is punished by a reduction in the diet and the stomach has to suffer the consequences of this mental rebellion. But there was still one weed which was particularly tenacious because its roots lay buried deep in the earth, hope, the hope of getting back to France, living as free men once again, seeing our families once more and making love to a girl without committing a political sin. It's worse than quack grass, this hope. No sooner is it pulled up than it grows again and in a trice strangles the tender little shoots of the Marxist crop. It's got to be pulled up all the time. The best method they've found is the false rumor. Here's what I mean, on the 14th July everyone in camp was filled with help of a speedy release. The quack grass was running wild. So the voice disseminates one of his false rumors by one of his usual means, a piece of paper dropped on the ground. A Bodoi who shoots his mouth off, the Vietnamese delegation has left Geneva for Prague. The Mendes France government has just been overthrown, the Marines are landing at Haiphong. Help is abruptly snuffed out. There's no other solution. The only way to survive and get away with a whole skin is to become good fighters for peace. And all the time there's the stomach clamoring for its ration, anxious not to have it decreased. The conditioned reflex. Good night gentlemen, sleep well. Take it from me, that rumor's all nonsense. But we shouldn't have been able to tell you so with such conviction if we had not ourselves been subjected to this treatment hundreds and hundreds of times. When the news of the Geneva Armistice eventually reached Camp 1, no one needed any confirmation to believe it. Truth always has a stronger, more convincing flavor than rumor. On the 21st of July, after the siesta in the damp heat of late afternoon, a great clamor rose from the old hands' quarters and spread across the river. Boyce Führers, Glatini, Merle, Marindal, Orsini, Mamoudi and Piniers got up without saying a word. Leroy appeared at the top of the ladder. This is it, it's all over, they've signed, he said. Marindal had gone quite pale beneath his dull yellow tan and Glatini had to support him. You know, Jacques, he said, I'd given up all hope. Now I'll be seeing Jeanine again. Glatini suddenly felt deep affection for the little lieutenant. He put his arm round his shoulder and made him turn round towards the corner of the hut so that no one should see the tears in the eyes of this aged child who was so weak and so strong, worldly and naive, cynical and tender. All the cannas were disgorging their to bis who raced in single file along the mud embankments towards the river to join the old hands. Prisoners and Bodois intermingled, fell into one another's arms and fraternized and, as God was witness, 
At that moment there was no one in the whole camp except men who saw their hard time coming to an end. That evening the voice, all sugar and spice, informed them that the armistice had been signed some days before and they would soon be leaving for the release camp. Preparations for the departure began in an atmosphere of enthusiasm and delight. The voice called for volunteers to act as stretcher bearers for the sick and seriously wounded. Every member of Marindel's team of wily serpents offered his services, even Esclavier who had just rejoined his comrades and could still hardly stand upright. We'll be free in three days' time, said the optimists. Trucks will come and fetch us away. Nothing's as simple as that in the communist world, said the old hands. On the day of the departure from Camp 1 a certain number of Viet Minh officers and NCOS approached their prisoners with paper and pencil. Hiding from one another, they asked the Frenchmen to give them a written testimonial stating that they had treated them decently and had behaved well towards them. They're afraid we might come back, Binyas sneered, so they're taking proper precautions. It's not that exactly, said Marindel. In a few weeks time they're all going to undergo a purge they'll be demoted and a few of them will be shot. They're already preparing their defense without even knowing if they're guilty. Anything may be useful, even a prisoner's testimonial. They're the poor wretches, not us, for they have to stay on in prison and haven't a hope of ever getting out. Are you getting soft-hearted? Esclavier asked him in a peculiar tone. I went and said goodbye to the voice. I was almost moved by the bastard. I thought he was going to ask me to kiss him, as a man condemned to death might ask his lawyer or the chaplain at the foot of the scaffold. And look what he gave me. He held out his hand to show them a little boy scout cross. There's every sort of type in the Viet Minh, Esclavier curtly replied, pearls and swine included, but it's always the swine who eat the pearls. You don't seem to have much to say about your spell in hospital. There was a rumor however. I almost died. Dyer, a little V at nurse and good luck saved me. The team was given only one sick man to escort. He was an elderly senior officer who had been captured at Kaobang. He was on his last legs, but he had sworn that he would not die in the hands of the Viets, so he was infinitely careful in the use he made of what life he had left. He never spoke, he never moved. Throughout the march the wily serpents helped themselves to fruit, molasses and poultry and halted when they felt like it in the huts along the road. They got hold of some chum by threatening the peasants that they would denounce them, for it was forbidden to possess any alcohol, and some wads of tobacco by exchanging them for objects which they subsequently took back. They trotted along like coolies, four of them at a time carrying the stretcher. They would cover three or four miles in an hour then suddenly declare that they had had enough and dossed down just outside a village where, as soon as darkness fell, they would go scrounging. All personal differences within the team soon disappeared, while solid bonds of friendship between them began to be forged, they formed a united and unbroken front. What belonged to one belonged to the others. No one gave orders, but they had fallen into the habit of putting their heads together to decide what they were going to do next. They parodied those meetings of the People's Army at which each Bodoi made his self-examination and gave his opinion on the best way to capture Dean Bianfu or look after a rifle. But, without realizing it, they were developing collective habits in their everyday life and way of thinking, they were no longer merely comrades thrown together by chance and circumstance but an organization with its own rights, based on stealing molasses, a cell whose function was to frustrate another organization. Three years later, when the military examining magistrate was interrogating Mamoudi in Chichimidi prison, he asked him this question. Why, after signing the letter to the President of the Republic, didn't you go the whole hog and join the FLN? Mamoudi looked at the captain from the Judge Advocate General's branch with his well-cut uniform and gold-rimmed spectacles. He had noticed the bureaucratic self-satisfaction with which he had spread out on the table the carefully documented papers he carried in his briefcase. Were you ever out in Indochina? he asked. No. Then it would be difficult for you to understand. What had held him back was Piniers and Glatini, 
the touchy Esclavia with whom a little Viet Minh girl had fallen in love, the madman Lescure whom he had protected, and little Merle who longed for civilian life, it was Marindil and his tuft of tow-colored hair on the top of his head, and Orsini who once told him, you silly fool, when you get caught stealing, you must always think up some excuse, otherwise what's the point of dialectics? It was Leroy and that old colonel they had carried on the stretcher who was hanging on to life in order to see France again. It was one of those things you can't discuss with an examining magistrate. On the 30th of August, after a fortnight's rest on the banks of the Bright River, the prisoners reached Vietri where the release camp had been installed. It consisted of some big, newly constructed bamboo huts over which fluttered Viet Minh flags, banners and Picasso doves of peace. The prisoners had been issued with cigarettes, new uniforms like those worn by the Bodois and fiber helmets which were not, however, covered in camouflage material, and, one hour before their release, some very poor quality canvas shoes. The transit camp was situated on a sort of hill which descended in a gentle slope towards the Red River where the LCTs of the French Navy were now moored. The evening before, a large detachment of PIMS had arrived who were to be released as a reciprocal measure, a group of journalists accompanied the party. The entire population of the neighboring villages was assembled on the beach, lined up along the barrier in their cone-shaped hats and black trousers under the command of Canbos in uniform. When the first boat lowered its ramp the Canbos gave a signal and the crowd gave a loud cheer and waved their hats. The PIMS replied by waving their hands but without much enthusiasm. At Haiphong they had almost had to be driven onto the vessels by force and some of them had taken flight, so reluctant were they to go back to the Viet Minh paradise. The journalists Pasfuro and Villel, who had flown out from France a week earlier, made an incongruous pair on the beach, standing slightly apart from the cohort of accredited pressmen, agency representatives, magazine photographers, newsreel and television cameramen, and foreign correspondents. In spite of the torrid heat and an uncomfortable night on the LCT, Villel still looked elegant in his sky blue tropical suit and tie worn with studied negligence. He had a patrician figure in spite of slightly lopsided shoulders. With his handsome face, intelligent features, and deep set A's, he took a well meaning interest in everything. He invited confidences and his perpetual expression of mild astonishment prompted the people he interviewed to tell him more than they had intended in order to convince him. They all thought him pleasant, understanding and well disposed until the moment they read what he had written about them. But by then it was too late and they couldn't even bash his face in, for he had skipped off. He was thirty-five years old. A few grey strands in his thick well-groomed hair added to his charm and distinction. No one had ever seen Pasfuro in anything but baggy trousers and a shirt opened at the neck to reveal a powerful torso. There was always a cigarette dangling from his lips and his uncouthness was proverbial. He had a sulky face and undistinguished features, he was extremely clumsy both with people and inanimate objects, he sweated copiously, had a strong smell and frequently forgot to Washington his heavy square hands were those of a stonemason or riveter who by some stroke of fate had taken to journalism. He scribbled notes down on odd bits of paper and more often than not mislaid them. When Pasfuro smiled a mischievous gleam came into his dark brown eyes, he then looked extremely young. Children, dogs and even his own colleagues were quite fond of him, whereas they could not abide Villel. Ten years earlier Villel was still called Zamit and his parents kept a shop at St. Eugene near Algiers. His father was Maltese, his mother a Greek from Alexandria, and the blood of every Mediterranean race flowed through his veins. Villel had spent his childhood in the little streets which smelt of rancid butter, grilled skewered meat and kesra. He knew every pimp, dart, kif addict and pickpocket in the casbah. He liked to make himself useful to the members of this underworld. But his brothers and comrades, quarrelsome, touchy and ticklish on a point of honor which in general they did not value particularly highly, accused him of lack of virility and referred to him with contempt as a clo. He won a scholarship, his father and uncles paid for his passage to France. He shed his accent, invented a suitable family for himself, 
passed out of college with flying colors and, on joining the weekly influence, became Luke Villel. It was only an unexpected sense of the ridiculous that prevented him from adding the particle de to his assumed name. Progressivism was all the rage, so he followed the fashion. Villel loved discreet luxury, deep armchairs, cakes and pastries and very sweet coffee with cream, and delighted in the heady scent of high game that emanated from western civilization in this decaying city of Paris. He had no political opinion but his instinct prompted him to rise up at once against anyone who preached courage, endurance, endeavor and heroism. He had a taste for defeat and anarchy. From time to time a fit of aggressive nationalism prompted him, under the influence of passion or in a spirit of rebellion, to write the opposite of what he generally preached. He was regarded then as suffering from a twinge of conscience which enabled him in consequence to pass himself off as a journalist torn between two stools, a man of absolute integrity and largely independent of the editorial policy of his paper. Whereupon he would resume his slow undermining activity with increased effectiveness. He had heard that Philippe Esclavia might be in the batch of prisoners who were shortly to be released, the poor misguided idiots. He thought of writing a long article on the return of the captain, heir to one of the greatest names of the French left wing, the son of the late Professor Esclavier, who had been taken prisoner in the colonialist war while fighting against the liberty of the people, whereas back in France his sister and brother-in-law, the wild Esclaviers, were directing the para-communist movement of the fighters for peace. With an article on these lines he could get everyone's back up and assume the pathetic tone which he exploited only too well to expound on those heroic degenerates who were the last remaining defenders of a condemned civilization. At the end of the war Pasfuro had been authorized by a court decision to assume the strange name he had thought out for himself, while serving with the Mackey in Savoy, to the exclusion of all his others, Herbert de Mortfort de Pisagnac de Cortilia. Marquis of this and Count of that, all perfectly authentic titles earned in a succession of royal beds. When the daughter of the family wouldn't do, the son was sent in her place. No inhibitions or complexes in that clan, if they failed by the front entrance, they succeeded by the rear. And their success had been brilliant, as all the history books showed. They had played the same game with the Empire and the Republic, with the Jewish bankers and American big business. During the occupation they had carried on in the same way with the Germans. But they did not sleep with any old German, never anyone below the rank of general, so no one had worried about it. Pasfuro sometimes wondered who on earth his father might be. Certainly not the old Marquis, whose tastes were exclusively unnatural. Perhaps the plumber who happened to call that day. Ever since the Crusades his family had been easygoing in that respect. But what the hell did he care? He was now plain Pasfuro, a reporter on the Quotidian, who earned 150,000 francs a month, plus the fiddles on his expense account. He loved his job, but he was less talented than Villel, he did not cheat so much. Pasfuro was against the war in Indochina but not against the men taking part in it. Perhaps he would shortly see Yves Marindel, Jeanine's husband, coming down the sandy path it might be slightly embarrassing. In this batch there was probably also a distant family relation, that fellow Glatini who wore an eyeglass and who was allowed to ride horses which were even better bred than he was. Pasfuro suddenly noticed a little Viet Minh in uniform who early or on had introduced himself to him as a journalist. He was now on board one of the else it is and had just handed a piece of paper to one of the Pims. The latter promptly turned round towards his comrades and gave certain instructions. Ho Chutik, Muon Nam. The Pim shouted. His comrades took up the cry, shouting louder and louder, and suddenly, at a sign from the journalist who had gone back ashore, they all threw their bush hats into the water. That wretched dented headgear which was worn by every soldier in the expeditionary corps had suddenly become the symbol of servitude. The crowd on the banks cheered and waved small flags but there was nothing spontaneous about this manifestation. Enjoying it? Pasfuro asked Villel. The whole thing's a put-up job. Men regaining their liberty, it's always rather moving. As a pim passed close by him waving wildly, 
for it was wiser to be in with the new masters, Villel recoiled in a squeamish sort of way. Pasfuro sneered. They're quite clean, you know, they were all given a bath before embarking. A medical orderly or doctor in a white smock, with a surgeon's mask stretched across his mouth, was preparing to deal with the sick and had lined his stretchers up in a row on the bank. Behind him stood his team of nurses, detached and aloof. But the Pims were all perfectly well, they were as plump as could be and bursting with health. The man in the white smock dithered, he had received his instructions and behind him two cameramen were watching him rather reproachfully. At long last he noticed a victim of seasickness who was still somewhat green in the face. He fastened on to him, he was saved, here at last was a victim of colonialist atrocity. The Pim, wondering what was happening to him, tried to get away but he found himself laid flat on his back, held down on the stretcher, photographed and filmed. Only his legs kept kicking out in a rather ridiculous manner. Brainwashing makes me sick, said Pasfuro, any form of brainwashing. Propaganda's a filthy business. Are you going to write about this show, Villel? Villel put his head on one side and in a slightly scornful tone replied. It's only a detail you've got to try and see things as a whole. Three violins playing out of tune, a drum which couldn't very well do anything else but play in tune, three little pigtailed Vietman girls going through the motions of a national dance, and behind them, looking very pale, the French prisoners. They marched under a triumphal arch of paper and bamboo which proclaimed the brotherhood of the masses, then another, smaller one, which wished them a safe and speedy return to hearth and home. Pasfuro could scarcely recognize the emaciated youngster in the front rank as Eve Marindel. He was no longer the mischievous noisy, truant schoolboy with his pockets stuffed with practical jokes and snares who had flown out to Indochina four years earlier after entrusting him with his child bride. This was a cross between an old man and an adolescent. Eve caught sight of him, rushed up and burst into tears. It's you, old man, you've come all the way here. How's Jean in? She's waiting for you in Paris. Why didn't she write? Through Prague? She tried to. Several times. Through the Red Cross. Glatini had now come up behind them. He too had changed, he no longer looked like one of his horses. Glatini, let me introduce a cousin of Jeanine's, who now goes by the name of Pasfuro. I know him, said Glatini. He's also a cousin of mine. He gave a slight bow and turned his back on him. What's wrong, Herbert? He doesn't seem exactly delighted to see you. Oh, of course, it's because you've changed your name. I'd almost forgotten, Pasfura was thinking, I've also got that silly Christian name, Herbert, maybe because my mother slept with the Lord. On with the butler. Pasfuro had promised Jeanine to put Eve in the picture to tell him it was all over between them, that she wouldn't ever sleep with him again, that she would no longer be his wife but always his sister if he wanted. He couldn't do it, it would have been worse than hitting a cripple. He would stand him a lot of drinks, give him the best meal that money could buy, get hold of a girl for him, the loveliest girl in Saigon. And afterwards perhaps he might bring himself to tell him. After having their names checked, the prisoners filed on to the LCT, still in complete silence. A few journalists followed them aboard. When the ramp was raised behind them a voice rang out, the voice of a former prisoner perched in the bows. Off with this filthy crap. He hurled his Viet Minh helmet into the water. All his comrades followed suit. Villel leaned towards Pasfuro and asked under his breath. Who's that savage who's trying to jeopardize our relations with the Viet Minh by that idiotic gesture? Captain Philippe Esclavia. The helmets now mingled in the Red River with the bush hats and bobbed about in the wake of the boat as it drew away from the shore. The senior officers were liberated after the subalterns, and General de Castries on the last day. When a journalist asked him what he was looking forward to most, he replied with an extremely distinguished lisp. Teak and French fried potatoeth. Pasfuro interviewed Raspagai, who was in great form, beaming with health and vigor. He had done two hours physical culture every day. 
Did you have a very hard time in captivity, Colonel? Not at all. In fact I might even say I found it extremely interesting. I think it taught me a lot, for instance, how to go about it so as not to let those fellows get the upper hand. Smart fellows, you know. Nowadays you've got to have the people on your side if you want to win a war. There's no longer any question of war, the armistice has been signed. The armistice. That's just another staff college idea. The armistice. There won't be any now. Or if there is it'll be a swindle or some sort of racket. You didn't by any chance see a man called Esclavier and his gang of ruffians go through? Yes, three days ago. They're all in the Lanimizan hospital. Have you ever done any fighting yourself? Yes, and I can't say I enjoyed it very much. Raspagar looked utterly bewildered, he could not understand how anyone could fail to enjoy fighting. Lescure and Dyer were evacuated together, but by helicopter with the seriously sick. When Colonel V, who commanded the French detachment saw the Negro doctor, he turned to his second in command and said. Better keep an eye on that bird. A doctor, therefore an educated black, must have been influenced by Viet Minh propaganda, a communist most likely, make a note of him. The colonel had a powerful voice, dire, a sensitive ear, he had heard everything. He turned towards less cure. I suppose we're going to run into bastards like that everywhere. Less cure played two or three notes on his flute and shrugged his shoulders. The former prisoners spent anything between one week and one month in various hospitals in Indochina. Then they began taking to drink, sleeping with women or smoking opium. But hardly any of them seemed to be in a hurry to get back to France. They were becoming reacquainted with the pleasures of Vietnamese life, instead of alienating them from yellow skins, their captivity had brought them closer. They could be seen arguing with rickshaw coolies and Chinese itinerant vendors. They proved to be amenable and not at all recalcitrant, they reported punctually whenever required and filled in any number of forms, but they appeared to be living outside the army, in a world of their own, they eschewed the company of white women and of their former comrades who had not been through the same ordeal. One morning they were quietly herded onto a ship, it was the Edouard Branley, a stout old charge's reunis tub with good food and comfortable cabins. They put into Singapore, where they bought mangoes and Chinese knickknacks, Colombo, where they made an excursion to Kandy, Djibouti and Port Said, and one day, towards 10.30 in the evening, they reached Algiers. It was the 11th of November 1954. They were told that the boat would be leaving again at 2 o'clock in the morning and that they could go ashore. Mamoudi left them there. He had been ill during the voyage and an ambulance was waiting to take him to the mail at hospital. He could hardly bring himself to part from them. In leaving them he seemed afraid he would once more be assailed by all his doubts, uncertainties and contradictions. The former prisoners of Camp 1 went ashore and were astonished to find the town as dead as though it was under siege. All the shops in the Rue d'Ile were closed. Patrols tramped the pavements in their hobnailed boots. The steps of the main post office were picketed by a platoon of CRS wearing steel helmets and armed with submachine guns. They made for the Casbah in the hope of finding a nightclub or brothel open but came up against barbed wire entanglements guarded by Zwaves. They did not come across any of their comrades of the parachute units, and at the empty bar of the Aleti Guillaume the barman told them they had all left the evening before for the oars. Not knowing where to go. Frightened of finding themselves plunged once again into an atmosphere of war, a fear to which they thought they had become impervious, they fled back to the boat. In the bar Merle had picked up a Paris newspaper, and since his comrades were jostling all round him, he read bits of it out loud. Seeing this little gathering, Raspagai promptly joined them, followed by a portly little major of the Algiers garrison wearing the red forage cap of the Zwaves. Oars. First major engagement. Entrenched in the caves, the Felagas are firing on our troops. Thirty rebels captured in Kabylie. Batna, 10th November. The first major engagement in the general mopping up operations in the Oars is now taking place in the Jbulich Mool two kilometers from Fum Tube, 
South of this locality a detachment consisting of two companies of paratroops have made contact with a band of outlaws who have taken refuge in some caves from which they are firing with automatic weapons. The battle was still going on at dawn this morning. Three paratroopers have been wounded, one seriously. They have been brought back to Batna by helicopter. The bodies of two rebels have been found and one prisoner has been taken, he was armed with a rifle and revolver. In Kabylie, near Drelmazen, two policemen have captured 30 rebels who had committed various offences in the area. While they were passing through the village, the population attacked them. In spite of the policemen's intervention, one was killed and another wounded. In Algiers the police have discovered a store of bombs in the residential quarter of the town. A similar discovery has been made in the department of Oran, at Urail. At Rio Salado in the same department, the police have identified eight men who were being sought for terrorist activities and arrested six of them. Twenty pounds of explosive and three rifles were found in their house. For the last 48 hours all civilian aircraft have been grounded. An aeroplane was reported last night flying with all lights extinguished above the Oars range, while a number of fires were observed in the mountains. The authorities believe that the rebels, whose supplies are running short since the roads have been cut, may be receiving arms and food by parachute. It's the same old war going on, said Boyce Führers. The Viets were right. The little major could not let this pass. All the men arriving from Indochina had their vision completely distorted by their captivity or engagements against the Viet Minh. They had caught some nasty yellow infection of which they would have to be cured, come what may. Captain, he said, buttonholing boys Führers but addressing all the other officers as well, Algeria is not Indochina. The Arab is a Muslim and not a communist. We are dealing with an essentially localized rebellion, a few bands of Kauia brigands. We have sent in the paratroops, which we should have done some time ago. It will all be over in a week. In Algeria there have always been flare-ups of this kind. Ever since bugged, and in the same area. Forget Indochina, you're now in Algeria, only a few hundred miles away from France. He turned to Raspegai who, as a senior officer, was surely bound to back him up. That's right, isn't it? Raspegai sucked his pipe and cast a glance of inquiry at Esclavia. No, he abruptly replied. I haven't got much book learning and I don't express myself very well, but I feel old Uncle Boyce Führers is right even though he has never set foot in Africa before. Your little flare up in the oars isn't going to be snuffed out just like that. I've been out here fifteen years, Colonel, I speak Arabic. Maybe you might have done better if you'd gone to Indochina. Out there they were already talking about the next war. Raspegar repeated this sentence for his own benefit. He found it striking, but it didn't seem to have much effect on that old sod Esclavier who was reading the paper over Merle's shoulder. He must be doing it on purpose. Merle did not give a damn about this business in Algeria. It was all over, he was a civilian and he was glancing through the paper to see if there was anything that might interest a genuine civilian like him. The socialists had replied to Mendes France. Harriet had been invited to Moscow. So he was still alive, that old Republican gasbag. Danny Robin liked Picasso. But who the hell was Danny Robin? Hold up in the Rue d'Averon, a million francs stolen from a cashier. A million wasn't much. Floods in Morocco, 23 dead. Hassan Fatimi, the former Minister for Foreign Affairs of Iran, had been shot. After the execution, by way of a funeral oration, General Tamer Bakia had stated that he had more blood than a bull. Another tender hearted chap. 180 18th century court costumes at the Musée Carnivala. In the entertainments column, Robert Hurry and the Brank Wagnalls claimed it was the audience that amused them and on the book page Glebertens was reviewing the memoirs of a writer who signed himself de Gaulle. De Gaulle, there was a chap who had soon been forgotten, even by those who wore his insignia, the free French cross, the Esclaviers and Boyce few races of the world. In camp no one had so much as mentioned his name. General de Gaulle's book is infinitely superior to the works that are usually written by war leaders and statesmen. 
men in power, once their strength begins to decline. The siren of the Edouard Branly announced their departure. The docks of Algiers were deserted. One by one the officers went below. It was cold out on deck. Two days later, at eight o'clock in the morning, a loudspeaker announced that the coast of France was in sight. Still half asleep, they went up on deck. Under the overcast sky the coast looked black. Gulls flew to and fro above the boat, giving their piercing cries. They were all there, pressed close together, leaning over the rail. The paradise they had dreamt about so often in the prison camps was slowly approaching and already it was losing its appeal. They were dreaming of another paradise, Indochina, that was what was uppermost in the thoughts of all of them. They were not sorrowful sons coming home to lick their wounds, they were strangers. Bitterness swelled up in them. In 1950, at Orange, a train full of Far East wounded had been stopped by the communists who had insulted and struck the men lying on the stretchers. A Paris hospital advertising for blood donors had specified that their contribution would not be used for the wounded from Indochina. At Marseille, which could now be seen looming over the horizon, they had refused to disembark the coffins of the dead. They had been abandoned, like those mercenaries for whom there was suddenly no further use and whom Carthage had therefore massacred so as to avoid having to pay them their due. Cut off from their own country, they had recreated an artificial motherland for themselves in the friendship of the Vietnamese and in the arms of their slant-eyed women. They were almost horrified to realize that they now had more in common with the Viet Minh whom they had hated, with the voice and his mysterious smile, with the oafish Bodois than with these people who were waiting for them on the quayside with a wretched little military band and a detachment of soldiers sloppily presenting arms. If the war had gone on, Esclavia pensively observed, if an honorable peace had been made, a real fusion might have come about between us and the Vietnamese and the world might have seen the birth of the first Eurasian race. Which of them would the child of Sun and Esclavia have taken after? But he went on furiously. No peace is ever honorable for the vanquished. They had all picked up an insidious infection, the yellow infection. They were bringing it back to France with them and it was a crowd of contaminated men that disembarked on the quayside at Marseille and kissed their wives, their mothers and their children whom they no longer recognized. Even the morning air smelled alien to them. Part 2. The Colonel from Indochina. 1. The Cats of Marseille. Boyce Führers had parted from his comrades in Marseille. On a grey November morning, with a catch in their throats, they had seen his slim figure disappear. With his old cardboard suitcase whose handle was reinforced with string, and his cape which was too long for him and hung down to his heels, he was the perfect picture of the poor soldier back from the wars who has no idea where to go and who will shortly be a human wreck destined for the workhouse. He had given Florence's address to the taxi which drove him off. The driver had a more pronounced accent than most Marseillais, which made him sound like a stage comedian deliberately overacting. So the war's over at last, Captain, eh? Yes, it's over. Personally, mind you, I respect everyone's opinion, but Indochina, we couldn't very well hang on to it since the people who lived out there wanted to see the last of us. The taxi stopped outside a large modern block of flats in pink stucco built at the foot of Notre Dame de la Garde. Boyce Führers felt the slight tremor that came over him each time he went to see Florence. There we are, sir, home again, with your little wife waiting for you inside. That's better than war now, isn't it? That'll be 380 francs. The tip's not included. No offense meant, but some people after being overseas so long, tend to forget the customs of our fair land of France. The driver laid particular stress on the last words. Feeling ill at ease, Bois Führers said to himself. Our fair land of France is enough to make one sick. He paid off the taxi, gave the driver a tip and asked the concierge. Miss Florence Mercadias, please. Third on the left. You can't go wrong. There's always music and a lot of noise. She spoke in a dry, disagreeable tone, Florence was obviously up to the same old tricks. He went upstairs, 
dragging the suitcase whose handle had broken yet again, rang the bell and Florence was in his arms, against a background of sugary, insipid music dripping from the radio, the chairs, the tables, the floor itself, were littered with empty bottles, saucers of cigarette ends and the remnants of a cold supper. The maid hasn't come, said the half-caste apologetically. She was barefoot and wearing an old dressing gown, but her smooth slender body exuded a faint perfume of vanilla. Contemptuous and disgusted by all this mess, a white tabby cat had taken refuge on a shelf. She yawned, opening her pink throat, and stretched one paw above her ear. Boyce Führers cleared an armchair for himself. Florence came and sat down on his lap, her thick black hair was pressed against his cheek. Haven't you paid the maid? She doesn't like me, no one likes me in France. Florence unbuttoned the captain's jacket, then his shirt, and with her long hand and hard nails began stroking his chest. The unmade bed, which still retained the smell of woman and lovemaking, soon beckoned them, and with his lovely whore Julian Boyce Führers once again experienced the intense sort of pleasure which she alone knew how to produce. Real pleasure is painful and degrading. His father, Type and Boyce Führers, used to say. Otherwise it's little more than an organic function. It must defy all constraint and taboo to be what the Christians call a sin. When you make war, you risk your skin, when you make love, you must risk your soul. With Florence, the little half-caste who, with parted lips, was now lovingly stroking her stomach and breasts. Julian played with his soul in the same way as a bullfighter manipulates his cape. Shall we go out and eat? No. I want to go to Alex's. We'll have Chinese soup, fried nems and abalones that come from Hong Kong already tinned, they're very expensive. Then you'll buy me some dresses and we'll go to the cinema and tonight I'll be. She ran the tip of her tongue over her full, fleshy lips. Dot. Very. Very sweet to you. He slapped her in the face, deliberately, without anger, and she clung to him, limp and chastened, sobs, which were succeeded by pleasure, made her firm stomach expand and contract. He thrust her aside and lit a cigarette. I'm behaving like a pimp in a film, he said to himself, but that's the only way to avoid being relegated by Florence to a mere accessory. She spent last night with another man, then, when he went off, Shortly before I arrived, she stroked her stomach and breasts in the same manner to thank them for the pleasure they had just given her. And she's already forgotten the accessory which served her purpose. A cruel, selfish, soulless little strumpet. But I'm only interested in her body and my degradation. Florence took his hand, rubbed it gently against her lips and kissed it. He reacted to this with complete indifference while the cat with her red brown eyes stared down at them from her shelf. Julian heaved the half-caste out of bed. Turn off that music and go out and buy something to eat. Florence looked at herself in the wardrobe glass and twisted round to catch the reflection of her lightly arched loins. She would have liked to be a man so as to adore her body and make love to herself. In a science fiction novel she had read about a creature which reproduced itself in order to go out and kill people, the fool, instead of giving itself pleasure. There was a faint mark near her eye where Julian had slapped her. You've given me a bruise. She said this simply as a statement of fact. When she saw Magi, she would tell him that her captain had come back from the war and that for the time being it would be better for her not to do the round of the bars too regularly. Florence was happy that Julian was back, for she was tired of her freedom. The half-caste was bored in Marseille and missed Saigon, the Dachau Quarter and its seething life, its little bars, its compartments thronged with amoral, sexual families. Old fathers that sold their daughters, assuming the haughty air of Hidalgos. Brothers got a rake off for introducing their sisters to friends. The whole quarter wallowed in a warm miasma of sex. New York ma'am, and dried shrimps. Then came the war, as fiery as red peppers, which lent an unexpected zest to each fresh embrace. Florence had experienced passion as furtive and brutal as that of wild beasts, pursuits, fights, and murders. One day she had fallen into the hands of the Bingzuans and Julian had saved her. 
the chief of the Arroyo pirates who ran all the gambling dens and colon could not afford to fall out with Captain Boyce Furos who knew the name of the coolie whom he had once killed in order to steal two piastres from him. That was ten years before he became a colonel and a friend of the emperor. Florence disappeared into the bathroom and came out again wearing close-fitting leopard skin trousers, a chunky black sweater and a canary yellow scarf. She looked common and provocative. Her dull skin and slanting eyes, the sinuous movement of her limbs, gave her the additional tang of some exotic fruit. Boyce Furos lit another cigarette. He surrendered to the clammy but beguiling self-disgust in which his energy and resolution melted away. He had to plumb the depths of this disgust so as to have the necessary purchase for his foot which, with a kick, would send him rising to the surface again. The captain spent a week with his lovely whore, took her out to the cinema once or twice, ran through several detective novels and smoked enough cigarettes to sear the roof of his mouth. At the most unusual hours Florence produced a number of meals in which Vietnamese dishes which she cooked herself were supplemented by poor quality cold cuts from the neighboring butcher's shop. To drink she bought nothing but sugary aperitifs tasting of chemicals which cloyed palate and stomach alike. When his disgust almost swept him off his feet like a wave, Julian went out onto the balcony and watched the cats. At the back of the building there was an empty plot of ground enclosed by a high wooden fence. Hundreds of cats, grey, white and black, romped about in this playground among the bits of corrugated iron, piles of rubble, broken bottles, clumps of nettles and carcasses of old drugs. The darkness sparkled with countless gold and emerald green eyes. They reminded Julian of his big game hunts by night in Burma of the eyes of the animals caught in the headlights, which the rifle shots extinguished like so many candles. Burton in his sentimental way used to say. One gets the feeling one's killing eyes. It's far nastier than shooting animals whose head, limbs and body are visible. Putting out their eyes in the dark is like killing life itself. Men's eyes do not shine in the dark. During a hunt in the Naga Hills they ran into some Japanese and Burton was shot dead. The cat, Julian noticed, had a recognized leader, a gaunt, lean-ribbed grey beast. Whenever any refuse wrapped up in a piece of newspaper was thrown down from one of the balconies of the building, they all pounced on it, fur bristling, claws bared, and formed a circle round the packet, not staring to advance for fear of being attacked by the others. At this point the grey cat intervened. He would pick the packet up in his jaws and make off with it. But the newspaper, dragging along the ground, would fall apart, spilling out the old bones, crusts of bread and kitchen refuse, which were snatched up by his pursuers, and the grey cat would find himself on the discarded dustbin which served as his throne with an empty piece of torn paper between his teeth. The cats disappeared in the afternoon, but in the evening, when the lights began to come on in all the villas scattered over the hill, they would suddenly reappear and embark on their saraband. They clawed and nibbled, squealed with passion, made love and killed one another. The white tabby cat would start trembling, brushing up against the captain's legs and mewing. One night he opened the door for her and she scuttled off to join the free world of cats covered with scabs and mange, ruled by a stupid and short-sighted tyrant. On the following day Julian Boyce Furos gave Florence her freedom. She too needed to scamper about the wastelands of Marseille and resume her adventurous love life, he left her enough money to live on for three months, she pretended to be grieved. When he left, she cursed him up hill and down dale, burst out laughing when the door closed behind him, shed a few tears shortly afterwards because she was already beginning to miss him and consoled herself by promptly spending some of the money he had left her on a television set. That evening she went out and met Maggie and her old bark cronies, while the white tabby in the empty plot of ground squalled with love as she let herself be mounted by the stupid king, the big gaunt grey. Julian Boyce Furos had cured himself of Florence as of a fever which is suddenly brought down. He had needed her out in Indochina in order not to think about the war. This war had begun to lose its appeal when the flavor of exotic and unusual adventure that it had at the beginning began to fade. By 1952 it was already nothing more than a useless dissipation of heroism, suffering, 
endeavor and human life, while corruption, the black market and chairborne warriors were all on the increase. Boyce Führers had been forced to make false promises to his partisans in the Bay Delong and on the Chinese border. When he came down to Saigon to ask for arms, rice and money, more often than not he met with a refusal. The money had been spent in the capital to swell the coffers of some political party or other, the arms had been issued to some parade ground Vietnamese units who neither knew nor wished to learn how to use them. Then, so as to have the courage to deceive his partisans with further lies, he used to go and see Florence in her compartment at Dachau and expend all his strength and fury on that smooth, eager, selfish body. There were times when Julian felt he would like to alter the course of history all by himself, to be as puerile as a Don Quixote, who, armed with a spear and encased in a suit of armor, attempts to halt a heavy tank attack. Heroic, stupid, play-acting. Because he thought the conflict was pointless, he had needed the heady drug which was secreted between his mistress's thighs. Eroticism was the answer to despair. When Julian thought about that war, all he remembered was a series of disconnected adventures, adventures of the kind that Esclavier called hair-brained schemes. A big junk prowled up the Chinese coast in the darkness, the wind rose and filled the sails which were reinforced with slivers of bamboo, the tiller creaked at every movement of the vessel. Julian was lying out on deck next to his Batman minutes. When Vong, the owner of the junk, drew on his water pipe and made the embers right next to them come to life, his face emerged out of the darkness like a ghost. It was a wrinkled old face with cruel little eyes. Vong may well have betrayed them, but not for political reasons or out of self-interest, he was above anything of that sort. The gamble was all that could make his deadened nerves tingle any longer. The sea was like a mill pond and the stifling salty air seemed to be glued to its surface. Minutes rolled over to shift his revolver from his hip to his waist like that he would be able to fire more quickly while lying flat on the deck. He believed in Vong's treachery but had never mentioned it to his captain who had known all about it for some time, for minutes trod warily, bristling like a cat on guard against dogs. Vong's head emerged out of the darkness again. He spoke softly. The junk's arriving. The sound of flapping sails and rippling water grew louder. A pinpoint of light flashed on and off in the distance. So Vong had not betrayed them. Why not? He hardly knew himself, maybe because this time the stakes were so much higher. He was gambling with the lives of the whole of his family left behind in China. Minutes went down into the hold to rouse the dozen men of the commando. They came up on deck barefoot and fully armed. Boyce Führers made them lie down along the scuppers. A machine gun had been set up in the bows, concealed behind some sacks of rice. Vong put down his water pipe and began signaling with an old hurricane lamp. The little Corsican sergeant in command of the non-partisan sidled up to Boyce Führers. What do you think it's going to be, sir, opium, girls? He might equally well have said gold, rum, spices or pearls. Andriani and Boyce Führers savored the deep, savage joy of piracy, this war had granted them an adventure of some bygone age, a boarding on the China seas. The junk from Hainan drew closer, there was a sound of voices. How many were there on board? Were they armed? Vong embarked on a palaver with the other owner. The wind had dropped completely and the two vessels now lay side by side. The machine gun loosed off three bursts and the dozen men of the commando sprang to their feet with a yell. The Chinese put up no defense, but the crew had to be pitched overboard just the same, for there was nothing else to be done with them. The junk was loaded with arms and medical supplies for the Viet Minh. No, for all his money, Tai Pan Boyce Führers could never have offered his son sensations of such power and intensity. Then one day Julian grew tired of these stereotyped romantics and tried to find some purpose in this fighting. Since there was none that he could discover, he took to Florence who proved to be a much more potent drug than anything else. At Dean Bianfu he met officers who claimed to be fighting simply because they had been ordered to do so. 
it had needed the defeat to make them subsequently seek a more or less valid reason for their having fought and to dismiss from their minds the myth of discipline which the defeat of 1940, the resistance and the liberation had deprived of all its content. From some incomprehensible sense of shame, however, those officers still would not admit, as he did, that their war had become a mere game for desperate dilettante. Boyce Führers had no feeling of nationalism, he was therefore unable to invoke the defense of his country, of Mother France. He needed a more universal cause, like many of his comrades, he believed he had found it in the struggle against communism. Communism as he had known it in Camp 1, deprived of all human substance by the Viet Minh, could only result in a universe of sexless insects without contradictions and therefore without genius without any extension in the infinite and therefore without hope. Man in his diversity and richness was suddenly menaced, but were not those who wished to take up his defense bound to find themselves harnessed to this mass of rubble which was all that was left of the West, its myths and its beliefs. Boyce Führers felt it was his duty to take part in this defense of the individual. But he refused to confuse this new form of crusade with the guard mounted by a motionless sentry over the walls of a deserted citadel, the porch of an empty church, or the bars of a museum or library in which no one set foot any longer. As he made his way towards the St. Charles station in his civilian suit which made him look like a workman in his Sunday best, Julian Boyce Führers recalled the hordes of cats in the empty plot of ground, their cruel habits and their king who was as stupid and brutal as an American gang leader. Still carrying his battered old suitcase, he got into the train for Cannes. Someone had left yesterday's paper behind in the compartment, he glanced through it. The insurrection was spreading through the whole of Algeria. Fresh troops were being sent out. GHQ announced that it would all be over in a matter of weeks. He thought of Mamoudi. What would he have done in his place? The finest role is always that of the rebel, books, films and men of goodwill are always on his side. But defending rubble is an ungrateful and demeaning pastime. What passed through the minds of the Roman centurions who were left behind in Africa and who, with a few veterans, a few barbarian auxiliaries ever ready to turn traitor, tried to maintain the outposts of the empire while the people back in Rome were sinking into Christianity, and the Caesars into debauchery. At Cannes Julian Boyce Führers took the bus which dropped him off at La Serbalia, his father's estate. It stretched all the way from grass up the hill towards Cabrin was hidden from the public eye by thick smooth walls like those of a prison. He rang the bell at the gate, an old Chinaman opened a peephole and curtly inquired through the grill. What you want? Then suddenly he recognized him and a broad smile came over his grumpy face. On Julian, me very happy. He threw the gate wide open to allow Julian's car to drive through but there was only the young master with his battered suitcase standing there. He snatched the suitcase out of his hand and scrutinized him closely. Om Julian was mad, perhaps it was the fault of that Vietnamese nurse who had brought him up and used to take him with her every day to burn incense in the pagodas of the Buddha. He had inhaled too much incense, which must have disturbed his mind. He, Lung, was a good Christian, a good Protestant, who preferred the smell of soap. On Julian had not changed. He was still dressed like a tramp. Neither large cars, nor fine clothes, nor opium, nor good food, nor, like the old master, pretty little girls, nothing interested him but war and politics. A man appeared outside on the veranda of the house. He had a long narrow head culminating in a mouth that was more like a sucker. His lips were so red that they looked made up his skin so pale as to be transparent, revealing a blue network of veins and arteries. His emaciated frame was swathed in a sort of monk's cowl. All round this creature who had just emerged from the dark and was blinking his eyes, splendid beds of flowers blazed in the late autumn light. The breeze brought with it all the scents which are those of Provence, sunshine and life, the scent of thyme, mother of thyme, fennel sweet marjoram and the pungent smell of pine trees. But the man looked like a corpse in this magnificent garden. Ah, the you are at last, Julian. Yes, father. 
I sent you out an air ticket to the bank at Saigon. I preferred to come back by boat with my friends. Still refusing to touch a penny of what you look upon as my ill-gotten gains? No, it's simpler than that, I'm ill at ease with money, I feel it keeps me apart from something that is basically essential to me. Anyway, I'm very happy to see you again. So am I, coming. Julian at once noticed the heady, penetrating smell of opium, mingled with a faint effluvium of pharmacy. They went through a big hall with Chinese hangings and lacquer furniture, then entered a dark little room. Two thin rush mats were spread out on the floor. Between them stood all the smokers' paraphernalia, the little oil lamp with its golden flame, the bamboo pipes. The smell of the drug, like leaf mold after rain, was unmistakable, drowning all the others. Above the lamp the roll of painted silk which had been looted from the summer palace hung like a Japanese cake mono. I often thought of that painting, said Julian, especially when I was marching in chains along the tracks of the Moon region. I imagined it much bigger and it's nothing but an old bit of faded silk. He settled down on the mat facing his father and watched him hold the little pellet of opium over the flame between two long silver pincers. The old man peered at him with his roomy eyes. Well, what's your opinion of this war we've? Yes, this war we've just lost. It was inevitable we should lose it. Not enough arms, enough money? We had too many arms, too much money. With the money we bought up a lot of puppets, while we let the Viet Minh take the arms. We had no valid reason for fighting, apart from preventing the communists from fanning out into Southeast Asia. To succeed in this aim, we needed the support of the Vietnamese people. But how could they give us their support since, at the very outset, we denied them their independence? But it was only much later, in the prison camps, that we realized this conflict had overreached itself. But you, what part did you have to play in this business? A quick change music hall performer, by turns a partisan leader, a political advisor to racial minorities, an intelligence agent, but more often than not I acted as an observer, a witness. Care for a pipe of opium? No, thanks. Yet opium is the vice of witnesses. Armand Boyce Führers drew on his pipe. The little pellet bubbled, expanded, and the Taipan exhaled the smoke. Do you want to go and lie down? Your room has been ready for you for over a week. No, thanks. Go on, then. Asia is lost. The communists have introduced extremely effective and worthwhile methods out there. They have transformed China and northern Vietnam into a vast, perfectly organized, perfectly inhuman ant heap. It will hold out for quite a time. Old boys Führers clapped his hands and Lung came in with some tea. It will hold out as long as their police system holds out. Supposing a sort of popular tidal wave suddenly wiped out the whole Chinese communist organization. What would be the result, father? Anarchy, monstrous, cosmic anarchy on a worldwide scale, a human ocean lashed to fury by the winds and smashing down every breakwater. Julian again remembered the hordes of cats in Marseille and their stupid king. Kuomintang China was rather like that, with its warlords and brigade generals. A nasty thought, isn't it, father? On this overpopulated earth of ours, where distance has been abolished, we can hardly afford an anarchy 600 million strong. Armand Boyce Führers emptied the bowl of his pipe, shook out the dross which he put aside in a little box, stretched out and laid his head on a small cushion. The communists have either absorbed or liquidated every branch of society that might at a pinch have controlled that anarchy. The world is becoming an extremely disagreeable place, my dear Julian, with more and more insoluble problems presenting themselves every day. I shall soon be of an age to take leave of it, so for me those problems don't exist. Meanwhile I've got this refuge, the smoker's den where the sound and fury of the present age only reach me in the form of a muffled echo, deprived of all hysteria and pathos. You'll be leaving the army, I suppose. I was planning to give you the directorship of our group of insurance companies. You'll have absolutely no work to do, it's the sort of sinecure that only a capitalist world can offer. 
It will enable you to live on a grand scale, to travel anywhere that takes your fancy, to have, shall we say, a social purpose. Stay here for a bit, have a good rest, go to bed with some girls. And in the evening, as you used to in Shanghai, come and lie down here with me on the mat. I'm rather bored, but I refuse to live in Paris. I have a horror of big towns in the West. I need warmth, silence and the beauty of flowers. A shark but at the same time an artist, my boy, and also resigned, resigned and weary to the point of not wanting to corrupt anyone anymore, not even you. Yes, I'm decidedly bored with this world. Take advantage of its decline and its perversions, Julian, whether as an artist or a moralist, it's much the same thing. You can have as much money as you like. I don't enjoy things anymore. What one can do with a woman or even a very young girl is pretty limited in the long run. You don't bother about it, Julian. That sort of thing leaves you cold. You're merely obsessed by your lust for power, the longing you have to fasten your name to some historical incident. Beware of the temptation of communism, you've already experienced it, it might easily come back. In another age you would have been a financial tycoon, but money has lost its power and perhaps that's why you despise it. The masses now represent the only power, and in order to win them over men indulge in the same savage, cynical tussle as the sharks of Wall Street or the city did in the old days. Only this new form of capital can't be locked away in the vaults of a bank. This capital lives, eats, suffers, dies and rebels. In spite of my ghastly reputation, I believe I'm more human than the whole lot of you. I've only tried to corrupt my fellow man, not to use him as a limited capital. You think I'm off my head, that I've smoked too much opium. No, I've merely realized the absurdity of our condition and the immensity of our vanity. Don't bother about the human race, Julian, just eat, drink, make love or listen to music, take drugs, you'll be all the better for it. Why not marry? You'll have children, you'll build yourself a home, you'll bring off a big deal, and one day you'll be old and there'll be nothing left for you but to wait sanctimoniously for the sky to drop on top of you. Come on, have a little pipe. Julian Boyce Führers got up and went to bed. He knew how deeply his father was suffering through having nothing more to do, through rotting away all alone in the sunshine of Provence without being able to contaminate any more continents with his personal gangrene. Next day Julian Boyce Führers went for a walk through the narrow lanes of grass. Washing hung out from every window, round an old fountain some peasant women were selling the flowers and wild herbs from the mountains, hordes of children scampered up and down the steps and threw stones at one another, a beautiful, dark-haired girl with dull skin and a profile of classical purity was enthroned behind a stall of figs and lettuces. Julian sat down on the damp rim of the fountain and appraised the girl dispassionately as a beautiful object. Hello, Captain. A heavy hand came to rest on his shoulder. He looked up and recognized the journalist who had attended the prisoner's release at Vietri and who knew Marindal. Hello. Pretty girl, isn't she? She might have been born in a Florentine palace in the Quattrocento. You can see her fingering her jewels. Her page comes in and kneels at her feet, bringing back the dagger with which he has killed her unfaithful lover. She kisses him, keeps him all night in her bed and gives orders for him to be hanged in the morning. She has taken so much out of him that the page doesn't even have the final orgasm which all men who are hanged are said to have. I've just been reading the Chronicle of the Cincy, I'm so bored here. Why don't you go away then? You may well ask, Captain. I've got a month's holiday, not a penny to spend, and an old aunt who's putting me up at grass. She is extremely well born and extremely deaf. Do you live in these parts? My father does. Don't you miss Indochina? I was born in China, so it's China I should miss if anywhere. I believe you know my cousin, Eve Marindal? Extremely well, we were prisoners together in Camp 1. For four years all he had to eat was rice. Now that he's back in France, he only takes his wife out to Vietnamese restaurants. He wants to teach her animite. Are you free for lunch, Captain? 
Julian had no wish to go back to his father wandering about in his old dressing gown among the flower beds, leaving a smell of corpses and pharmacy behind him. Why not? We could go up to Cabra. You're sure to have a car. Anna owned or a Vidette, or maybe a frigate. All the officers back from Indochina have cars. I don't. That's odd. Let's take mine, then, if she can manage the climb, she's an old rattletrap. Are you building yourself a house? The few officers who haven't bought cars are building themselves houses. I'm not. During the meal the journalist never stopped drinking and kept ordering bottle after bottle. At one point he even clutched his glass so tightly that it broke in his hand. Are you feeling restless? Boyce Furos asked him. Bored with your long holiday? You've got an ugly face like myself, Captain, a mug that's enough to turn the milk sour, as the peasants say, and your voice is as grating as a rusty hinge. As for me, I've got about as much grace as an elephant, and when I sweat I stink like an old billy goat. A girl must be either off her head or completely blind to fall for me. Have you ever been in love? It's never happened to me. I believe in carnal passion, not in love. And since I've got an ugly face, as you've just reminded me, I pay for my pleasure, which doesn't in any way detract from carnal passion, rather the reverse in fact. I was madly in love with a girl once. I don't know if she ever loved me in return, but at least she was used to me. I brought her husband back for her from Indochina after stuffing him with hormones and vitamins, beefsteaks and caviar, then I came down to grass to get over it. Marindal's wife, I suppose? Yes, Jeanine and Marindal. They hadn't got a flat, so they took mine. They insinuated themselves into my life like a couple of tapeworms. Yet you took advantage of the wife when her husband was a prisoner. I behaved badly. I realize that, and yet. Have a brandy with your coffee, won't you? Do you know Ussel? That's right, in Cariz. You ought to see that town in the rain, a long black road, flanked as far as the eye can see by horrible middle class houses with blank facades concealing mysteries which couldn't be anything but sordid. A creeping sense of despair grips your guts and you feel like slipping some arsenic into grandma's cup just for the sake of a laugh. Three months after their marriage, Eve Marindal flew out to Indochina and Jeanine went to stay with little Eve's parents at Ursel, in one of the dreariest houses on that road. The father made a packet in hardware, wholesale groceries or something of that sort, a radical socialist, a Freemason, though he sends his wife to mass, and a member of the Rotary Club. The Rotary Club of Ursel. The aunts, a couple of ugly old maids. All of them hated her. Jeanine was young and pretty and when she laughed a dimple appeared in her cheek. She came from a good family, but her parents had lost all their money. To her middle class in-laws she was the adventuress who had stolen the heart of poor little Eve. Come on, have some brandy, Captain Boyce Furors. You were born in China, you wouldn't understand how cruel and narrow-minded the French provincial middle class can be. Well. Jeanine made her escape for fear they might kill her by injecting all their poisons into her own life. I was her cousin, I used to buy her sweets when she was a little girl, gramophone records when she grew up. I was the only member of her family who went to the wedding. She was marrying her childhood friend, with whom she used to share the sweets I bought her and to whom she used to play my records. For the old house at Ursel, the reign of Ussel, the boredom of Ussel, had unaccountably produced the marvelous youth called Eve who resembled her so closely. Jeanine took refuge with me in Paris. She brought with her an entire childhood with all its strange and infinitely varied rites, and I, Captain, had never had a childhood of my own. She used to sing those silly little songs that school children sing at round games. She used to weep over a flower smear her face with chocolate and talk of dying as though it was like going for a stroll round the garden. Now this is what I feel, love can't exist unless it's linked to that mysterious power and ritual of childhood. I fell madly in love, I stopped drinking, I found a job on the quotidian. One day, while holding Jean in a little too closely in my arms, I made her my mistress. 
It wasn't particularly convenient, but it was inevitable. After that I experienced both paradise and hell. My pleasure was increased by a sense of sacrilege. There was I, the coarse old dullard, admitted into the fairy land of childhood, and at the same time being granted more pleasure than mortal man can have. The dragon taking advantage of the fairy princess he has captured. The prince came back, delivered his princess, and the dragon is now eating his heart out. Unfortunately it wasn't as simple as all that, it was the fairy princess who held the dragon captive. She had developed a taste for his embraces. But it was still the poor old dragon who went off and fetched back the prince. I'm drunk, I'm boring you to tears with this story. And yet I can't talk about anything else. From the moment Jean in saw Eve again I ceased to exist for her. Before seeing him, she wanted to leave him. Now, I could swear she doesn't even remember that she lived a whole year with me. Did Eve Marindo know? He amazed me, that boy. Four years is a long time, he said, and you're handing me back my wife just as she was when I left her, as though you had kept her under glass, protected from the heat and cold. She hasn't aged, she hasn't changed at all, and yet she has acquired any amount of new tastes, the music of Stravinsky and Eric Satie the poetry of Disnos, Blue Jeans and Pony Tales. Thank you, Herbert. For you didn't know, Captain, did you? Pasfuro brought his huge fist down on the table. My Christian name is Herbert and I'm more well born than the whole of the Polish aristocracy put together. Julian Boyce Führers took to meeting the journalist fairly frequently. Pasfuro proved to be a mass of contradictions, with a taste for the weird and the unusual, mad and generous, cynical and tender-hearted at one and the same time. He hated all forms of hierarchy and lumped together the communists, with whom he was once in conflict, the Jesuits, with whom he had been brought up, the police, with whom he had often had a brush, the middle class, towards whom he felt an aristocrat's contempt, the military, whom he considered stupid, and all dried up old maids members of the educational profession, clergy, technicians, inspectors of finances, pimps, Corsicans, people from Auvergne and infant prodigies. Pasfuro on his side respected the captain, his contempt for sartorial elegance, that manner he had of being at home anywhere, and his sound political and economic background. He seemed to belong to no particular country, had no national prejudice, attached no importance to money or decorations and was astonished and mystified to find himself in the army. A slightly grudging friendship sprang up between the two of them. When Pasfuro was posted as permanent correspondent in Algeria and had to go back to Paris, Boyce Führers decided to go with him. They took the holiday route along the Mediterranean coast as far as Montpellier and then crossed the Seven. This brought them one morning to the little Lozier village of Rosier on the edge of the gorges du Tan. The trees had shed their last leaves and winter was beginning to assert its authority under the clear sky, among the quivering skeletons of elms, poplars and beech trees. All the gorges were bathed in a blue mist which the December sun could scarcely penetrate. The cliff of Kapliuk stood like a barrier at the junction between the black waters of the Jout and the green waters of the Tan. Near a tumble-down old bridge a peasant pointed out a goat path leading up to the summit. He was a nice old man in a black drill jacket, corduroy trousers, hobnailed boots and cloth cap. He spoke slowly with a strong accent, taking his time, happy to be alive. Up there at Kapliuk, he said, at one time there were Templars, as in many other places in the courses. No one ever knew what they were up to in these parts. Pasfuro and Boyce Führers embarked on the ascent. At each step the loose pebbles slipped away from under their feet. Pasfuro admired the agility of the captain who effortlessly climbed the steepest slopes, swinging his shoulders slightly. The journalist was out of breath and, in spite of the cool breeze fanning his face, he sweated copiously. He thought to himself. What an unnatural life I led in Paris. The office, bars, cinemas and theatres to which Jeanine made me take her almost every night. She always seemed anxious to postpone the moment she would be alone with me. Each time we went to bed there was a minute or two of ghastly embarrassment. 
she would turn out the light and undress in the dark, but as soon as beauty's body and the body of the beast came into contact, she would be overcome with passion. Does she turn out the light with Eve Marindal, I wonder? Pasfuro sat down on a boulder opposite a wall. He did not notice the splendid view, the ochre-colored ledges of rock, the pine woods punctuating the lighter expanses of stone and, far down below, the clear green waters of the Dun. The captain's rasping voice broke into his unpleasant daydream, plunging him into this bath of light and color, and his love resumed its ludicrous dimensions. Come on, journalist, one last effort. There's a village behind this rock, and above that the Templar's commandery. Pasfura went on climbing and presently the ruins of a village appeared among the nettles, bushes and broom. Some of the houses were still intact with their dry stone roofs, walls as thick as fortifications and semicircular vaults. The Templar's commandery dominated the village, all that remained of it was a vast stretch of wall which threatened to collapse and bury the rest of the ruins. It's lovely, said Boyce Führers, this silence and solitude, these ruins and these gorges bathed in a blue mist, like some parts of the country in the north of China. It's the first time I've come across a place in France where I don't feel a stranger. What made the Templars, those strange warriors who owned most of the wealth of the Western world, come and take refuge in this wilderness? Not much is known of their history, Pasfuro told him. The East, it's certain, provided the Templars with a certain number of rites which they introduced into their Christianity, the initiation ceremonies among others. Perhaps they came up to these commanderies in the courses to prepare the fusion between the Islamic East and the Christian West, which was the dream of their Grand Master Simon de Montferrat and which would have been the first step towards the unification of the world. The Templars discovered the power of money at a time when money was despised, and in Syria the sect of the assassins had taught them the power of a dagger wielded by a fanatic, in other words terrorism. They were ready for the conquest of the world. The ancestors of the communists? Perhaps. But the Templars were burnt on the stakes of Philippe le Bel just as the communists were shot through the head by Stalin's henchmen. I'd rather like to rebuild this village and this commandery on this very spot, said Boyce Führers, bring a few men I know up here and recreate a new sect which might have its assassins but, above all its missionaries, who would attempt to bring about not the fusion of the religions of the East and the West, but of Marxism and what I can only call, for want of a better word, Occidentalism. Do you really mean that? Boyce Führers gave a cynical sneer. Of course not. I'm in my father's hands, I'll soon be the director of an insurance company. Where would I recruit my initiates? Among the agents, clerks and typists. Initiates of that sort are only to be found among the young paratroop officers, who have a sense of brotherhood. They are still sufficiently unspoilt and disinterested to do without comfort. They are ready for any adventure and capable of laying down their lives for any high-minded cause provided it does not conflict with certain prejudices to which they still cling. Can't you see them in this restored village of Kapaluk, quarrying stones and reading books which they can no longer possibly ignore, Karl Marx, Engels, Mao Zedong, Sorel, Proudhon? Go through the motions and you will believe, Pascal said. Go through the motions of the communists, read their books, and you will become a communist. No. All the officers in my monastery would already be inoculated against communism by the Viet Minh camps. Boyce Führers gave another cynical laugh. But these are just words which are lost in the winds of Lowe's ear, just a senseless dream which can never be realized, isn't it? I don't like dreams of that sort, they culminate in fascism, communism, Nazism and unleash those epidemics which people find hard to cure. The Germans aren't cured of Nazism, nor are the French cured of Britain and the occupation. There's not a single communist country which has managed to stamp out the blight of Marxism. Don't toy with ideas of that sort, Boyce Führers. Leave the tinder in the hands of the older generation, they're in too much fear of dying not to use it with infinite precaution. That's also what my father thinks. He would like me to grow old quickly so as to leave the world in peace. 
a thick, soot-laden fog hung over Paris when they got there. It was cold and the city rumbled with a joyful ferocity, crunching and devouring mankind. Boy's Führers and Passführer were swallowed up in the seething crowd, the former cherishing his big scheme, the other his love, that darling vulture that was eating out his heart. 2. The Beautiful Buildings of Paris I firmly believe, sir, and I'm not the only one, that this is the root of all our troubles. De Gaulle should have come to an agreement with Bedain. De Coup would have stayed on in Indochina and we should never have had this wretched war. The man was elegantly dressed and smelled of lavender water, graying hair added to his distinction. His double chin quivered above a polka dot bow tie, and the buttonhole of his blue suit was adorned with the narrow ribbon of the Legion d'honneur. Someone who's onto a good racket, Philippe Esclavier immediately concluded. Not the sort of man to have done any fighting but one who's got a certain pull with the government. The Mistral train was going all out up the Rhone Valley, belting through the stations, thundering over the points. It stopped for a moment at Avignon. Philippe got up and peered through the carriage window, as though his father might suddenly appear on the platform with his finely chiselled features, his flowing white hair and that air of calm assurance with which he moved. He was one of those men whom ticket collectors scarcely dared to approach. Uncle Paul, on the other hand, always gave the impression of not having paid his fare. The train jerked Philippe back from his memories. His travelling companion was holding forth again in the faintly protective and slightly disillusioned tone of voice affected by the fifty-year-old man who has succeeded in business. The war in Indochina, Captain is the outcome of a series of unforgivable mistakes. One of my cousins was under secretary to the Ministry of Associated States at the time of Dean Bianfu, he always said. I'm in France, Esclavier kept telling himself. I've just passed through Avignon station and I don't feel a thing, no sensation at all, not the slightest urge to cry. I simply sit back in my seat facing this old bore. Let me introduce myself. Georges Personnier Moreau, laboratory director of the Mercure Pharmaceutical Products. We did a lot of work for the army during the Indochina War, antibiotics for the most part. So you're a chemist, are you? Personnier Moreau gave a start, like a barman in a smart hotel on being addressed as waiter. He had not noticed the mischievous glint that had come into the captain's grey eyes and said to himself. What imbeciles these army people are outside their own profession they don't know a thing. Yet he could not bear the idea of being taken for a pharmacy assistant. A chemist, captain, does not have an annual turnover of several million francs. Let's say that the chemist is the retailer and I'm the manufacturer. I make, I invent the goods that he sells. You must forgive my ignorance. So you're by way of being both a research worker and manufacturer. That's more like it our research department. He preferred to evade the question. The activities of Mercure Laboratories were confined to packaging the products which other firms invented and manufactured. But I mustn't bore you with all that. You're a nice young man, I can see the tone was now distinctly protective, would you mind telling me your name? Captain Philippe Esclavier of the 4th Colonial Parachute Battalion. I say, that's interesting. You're not related by any chance to the Esclavia, the professor? I'm his son. I would never have imagined. Nor did he, and he died without understanding it. I also know Mr. Yes, a certain while who calls himself Esclavia. My brother-in-law. While is all for the communist revolution, purges and firing squads. He sends that little shiver down your spine which makes a pear taste better and your mistress's skin feel softer, he leaves you room to hope, if you do one or two little things that aren't too compromising, that he might, once he's in power, include you among the useful middle class. But, Captain. Utter nonsense, my dear sir. The communists, and I think I know them pretty well, will put the wiles of the world into the same concentration camp as there. But what did you say your name was? Pisania Moro. As the Pisania Moras. Why Moro, incidentally? 
that's my wife's name. As clear as daylight, Philippe thought to himself, his father-in-law is the real boss. Personally Moro is a parasite of the wireless clavier class. My father also ran a laboratory, but for distilling and conditioning ideas. He left it to the retailers, the journalists, schoolmasters and professors, to advertise and sell his wares. Weil appropriated the trademark and is now living on his reputation. It was Francois I's Persinia Moreau who had dragged her husband along to the Rudel Universite. He had been bored to death there, nothing to drink but a sort of tepid, watered down punch, and dainty little sandwiches. Weil's attitude to the Mercure Laboratories had been somewhat condescending, which had punctured its managing director's vanity. Francois I's, meanwhile, wallowed with delight in the swirling mists of abstract discussion and wrinkled her brow as she spoke of the working class. The captain closed his eyes and put his feet up on the seat. Scandalous behavior, Persinia said to himself. That's the sort of thing you might expect in the third class, but hardly in the first. Service personnel don't pay any fare, or else only quarter price, they travel in a manner beyond their means and therefore above their station. He unfolded his newspaper. Trouble in Algeria. What was the army doing about it? Nothing, and meanwhile the officers lolled about in luxury trains. Persinia turned over to the entertainments page. In the center there was a photograph of a new discovery, a slender and at the same time sensual figure with a childish yet somehow provocative mouth, Bridget Bardet. He thought she looked rather like Mina, a little starlet whom he was keeping. Mina did not cost him much. He managed to provide for her out of the firm's expense account. So long as the treasury did not get wise to it. But when she went out to dinner she invariably ordered roast duck. He dreamt of a girl who would take her time over the menu and give a sophisticated pout as she dipped her lips into the Lanson 1945. Drowsed by the swaying motion of the train, Philippe let himself be carried away by the memory of his father, Eshines Clavier. The man he had loved more, admired more and despised more than anyone else in the world, and this memory was at the same time tender and bitter, provoking anger as much as tears. A hand was gently shaking Philippe. Captain! Captain! We've arrived in Paris, the city of lights, the vast forcing house of exotic flowers. But beware, they're carnivorous. Are you being met? Have you got a car? I'd be delighted to drop you anywhere. Persinian Moro had an umbrella and a pigskin briefcase in his hands, and his jaunty little hat set carefully aslant his graying hair gave him the mocking, insolent appearance of a Parisian Pierrot. The grey Bentley glided noiselessly up the luminous stream of the Champs Elysees. Eh? Forgive me for coming this roundabout way, said Persinia, but I've got to drop in and say hello to a little friend who's waiting for me in a bar. Just long enough to down a whiskey. You're not in a hurry, I hope. No. No one's waiting for me. Personally Moro was far from displeased at being able to show the captain that a fifty-year-old chemist could treat himself to someone like little Mina. The Brent bar was down a side street a few yards off the Champs Elysees. Eh? Dark panelling, red plush seats and a long bar adorned with the flags of the nations gave the place the atmosphere of one of those comfortable London clubs where whiskey is at its best. The clients spoke in subdued voices. The men all looked like Persinia Moro, most of the women were young and pretty. Mina was enthroned on a stool near the cashier's desk, petulantly nibbling at a straw. I might have gone to the cinema, she was telling the cashier. Instead of waiting for him here like a little tart who needs a few thousand francs to see her through till the end of the month. Oh, come now, Miss Mina, we don't have any tarts in here. What do you call Solange, then? She's never with the same fellow longer than a week. Mina pouted with infinite charm, she had a hungry mouth, a sensual, womanly body, all curves, and the features of a child. Persinia rushed up to her with much ado, seized her hand and kissed, or rather, licked, it. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, darling. I'd like you to meet a friend of mine, Captain Philippe Esclavier, he's just back from Indochina. Philippe and Mina looked into each other's eyes. 
They barely shook hands and pretended to disregard each other, but both of them already felt that they were going to spend the night together. The voice of desire was insistent, making their ears tingle, they took great care not to let their hands so much as brush against each other, while Persinia Moro kept buzzing round them like a fat old bumblebee. He left them for a moment to go and telephone his house. Philippe laid his hand on Mina's, a hard, heavy hand which could hurt. Wait for me here, I'll be back. And then? Then we'll go and have a drink somewhere else. I've never felt this so strongly, Mina thought to herself. What's this man with the horned face and big grey eyes got? Something, in any case, which Persinia never had. How I can make old Persinia sweat with my roast duck. The captain has the famished look of the fairy tale wolf. Mina, my pet, you'd better watch your step. Actung, Mina, out of bounds, handle with care. He must have slim hips and a firm, flat stomach. Not like Albert's little pot belly, carefully squeezed into a flannel belt. Albert personally and Moro came traipsing back. We'd better be off, Captain. Darling, I'll ring you up tomorrow morning. Esclavier asked to be dropped near the Luxembourg, from where he took a taxi straight back to the Brent bar. Edouard, the barman, was aware of his little game. He was pleased with the trick that was being played on the chemist and inwardly rejoiced. This big fellow who wasted no time on details or subterfuge, who went straight after what he wanted, appealed to him, and so did Mina, who pretended to be stupid but who was as crafty as a monkey, full of appetite and sensuality. Esclavier wanted to settle up for the two whiskies Mina and he had just drunk in silence. Edouard refused the money. It's on the house. Why? Edouard leant over the edge of the bar and quietly replied. Because I like the look of you both. All of a sudden Philippe was overwhelmed by the memory of Soon, the Vietman girl. He could no longer recall every detail of her face but tried to reconstruct it mentally round the slanting eyes. Soon alone was love, all the rest were mere encounters, like Mina, this exciting little tart who was clinging on to his arm. Philippe Esclavier was woken by the telephone ringing. He rolled over on his side, rolled back again, and even stuffed the pillow over his head to escape the persistent noise pursuing him. Mina picked up the receiver in the dark. Hello. Oh, it's you, Albert. What do you mean by waking me up at this unearthly hour? It's ten o'clock already? But it's quite dark outside. There's a fog, is there? No. I don't feel like going out. No, you can't come here either. The place is in a dreadful mess and anyway I'm rather tired. What did I think of Captain Esclavia? Oh, nothing to write home about. She was quietly stroking Philippe's leg and the warm palm of her hand felt gently insistent. No, Albert, I don't like those cocksure young types who think every woman's going to fall into their arms. What I need is tenderness and affection, which can only be found in men who have had some experience of life, like you, my dear. The pressure of her hand increased. Philippe snuggled up to her, returning her caresses in his usual straightforward manner. Mina's voice changed, becoming deep and guttural, on the verge of a passionate groan, the sort of voice that Pisani and Moro had rarely had occasion to hear. Of course I love you, honey bunch. She hung up, uttering a long wail of pleasure. Mina eventually got up to make breakfast. She drew the curtains, a dim light filtered through the window and presently the smell of coffee and toast began to fill the room. The phonograph played a languid blues in the background. She came back carrying a large tray. Her auburn hair hung in heavy coils above her white silk dressing gown. She looked like a greedy, hypocritical virgin. How much sugar? Darling, I've already buttered the toast. A cigarette? Here? Do you want to see the Figaro? Albert gave me a subscription to it. It's comfortable here, said Philippe. Your coffee is excellent, you minister to a man's needs, you don't talk too much, and you know how to make love. The perfect concubine for a fat chemist who has made millions out of Indochina while others were dying of hunger or disease. Do you know how much your nun, Tiormio partisan got for carrying a rifle, 
fighting and in many cases dying? 25 piastres a month and a few handfuls of rice. You hate my chemist, don't you? He's not worth hating. But you do, my beauty, don't you? What about that little telephone conversation just now? Why did you have to lead him on like that? I don't want him to feel uneasy. I know what fat old Albert's like. If he felt uneasy about me, he would drop me without the slightest hesitation. Albert's an old softy who's wrapped up in cotton wool, but if you rub him up the wrong way he gets furious. Every now and then, without his knowing it, if it's not too risky, I treat myself to a handsome young lad who happens to take my fancy. And you call Pisania up on the telephone? No, that was the first time. Mina lay down beside the captain and nestled her head against his shoulder. I'd never thought of it before. Perhaps it was you who gave me the idea. I don't know you from Adam, you don't bother your head about niceties, you fling your shoes into one corner of the room, your coat into another. You have a bath and splash the water all over the place. And I get up and make you breakfast. All the others, I used to send packing at dawn. Once the show was over, off they went and no harm done. Just because a man knows what a girl's got under her skirt, that doesn't mean he's got any rights over her. But I want to hang on to you. Maybe because you're like me, because you don't find life so wonderful. What do you find wrong with it? Even a little pool is her dreams. Do you know which is the loveliest street in Paris? No. The Rue de Boussy. That's where I was born, among the carrots, cauliflowers and leeks in the market. My mother was a concierge, my father worked in a post office. She was a holy terror, my mother. She gave everyone hell, you should have heard her. I remember one row about a fish that wasn't quite fresh. She pelted the fishmonger with his own whitings and mackerels, screaming it was an insult to the working class. There were two or three other harridans as foul-mouthed as she who promptly rose in support of the working class. It was a regular free-for-all. My mother fought with one half of the neighborhood and was ready to quarrel with the other. On Liberation Day she denounced the whole lot of them. Liberation committees were meat and drink to her. Life at home was anything but placid. Every day was spent in an atmosphere of high drama. What did your father do? He smoked his pipe and read his paper with his spectacles slipping off the end of his nose. When I think of all the energy my mother expended just for the sake of putting fifty yards of the ruder boosie in a state of revolt. I left school and studied shorthand typing at Pidgeot Secretarial College. A friend of my father's found me a job with the Mercure Laboratories where I started as a bookkeeper. The head of the personnel made it quite clear from the start, either I went to bed with him or I should find myself in trouble. It was common knowledge in the office that the boss was partial to little beginners. I went and complained to Mr. Albert Pacinia Morrow. That very evening I became his girlfriend. There was no other way out. Are you sure? I could have settled down, of course, home, husband, squalling brats and all the rest of it but I should still have had to go to bed with the head of the personnel. Thanks to Albert, I've already had my photo in the weeklies. To advertise his products. What of it? I've had some small parts in films, one day I might be given a big one. I'm following a course of dramatic art and my teacher says I show promise. I photograph well, my face seems to be expressive. So's the rest of you. Anyway I'm no longer broke, making do with a cup of coffee and a couple of croissants for lunch. I can afford a fine young captain when I feel like it, and in linen sheets too, I've every reason to be hopeful. Prince Charming's aren't to be found in a typist's office, but they all go to the cinema. What does your mother think about it? She says I'm a traitor to the working class but still accepts my money to buy herself a refrigerator. I see her as little as possible. She enjoys the role of the mother whose daughter has gone to the dogs. And since she needs an audience, well, it all takes place in the street. I'm very fond of that street all the same. Over there I'm once again the little merchant girl, Elizabeth Merchant. Whereas here? Whereas here I'm Mina Lacouvry. But that's enough about me. What about you?
For someone who's just back from Indochina, you don't seem to be in much of a hurry to get home. Are you married? No, thank heavens. Well, then? Philippe ran his fingers through Mina's hair. I've got a score to settle with a dirty little bastard. Are you going to break him? It's not quite as simple as that, the little bastard may not be as much of a bastard as he seems. Did he run off with your girl when you were away fighting? No. With her chin in her hand, Mina voiced her thoughts out loud. Worse than that even? He stole your apartment? And everything in it? but I've only myself to blame. Take a leaf out of Mother Merchant's book. Start screaming, it's an insult to the working class and then pitch in. We could bring her along with us if you like. She loves meddling in other people's business. Only a paratroop officer and the working class don't quite go together. Don't worry, though Nathalie Merchant has always put her taste for squabbling above her political convictions. And like her daughter, she's got a weakness for handsome young soldiers. This time Philippe Esclavier laughed out loud, visualizing his arrival at the Rudel Universite flanked by Mother Merchant and her daughter, breaking in on the staid meeting of Weil and his progressivist friends, and shrieking, it's an insult to the working class. And nothing could be closer to the truth, he reflected. You don't often laugh, Philippe. A pity, because it suits you you no longer look like an angry old bear. Here, give me a kiss. Do you know anyone in show business? Not a soul. I'm just a brutal and licentious soldier. It was too much to expect, I suppose. Have you ever been in love with a girl? I mean, really in love? Esclavier hung his head and felt the blood rushing to his face. Yes, I've been in love. I never went to bed with her. I only kissed her once, and then only on the cheek. Calf love. No, it was. Three months ago. Don't cheat, Esclavia, Dyer had told him when they had got drunk together in Marseille. The whole thing's too good to be true. Little soon was all on her own, you had nothing to do with it, you were just a pretext. Lescure probably got closer to her than anyone else, playing his little flute in the dark. And here he was professing his love for Soon, for the benefit of this little bitch. Yet he could not resist it. He was certainly the son of his father, whose two or three extra conjugal adventures had given rise to books or rather literary discussions. Intellectuals didn't know how to love, they were always obsessed by their own problems, they listened in raptures to the beating of their heart, anything served as a pretext for them to probe their souls in order to produce a spate of words. He had not yet been able to eradicate this persistent weed, this observant and monstrous egoism. Like little Mina, he was obsessed by show business, but his show business was exclusively for himself and a few initiates. He suffered but consciously thought of putting his suffering to use, he struggled with himself while pondering on the way in which he could describe his struggle, he loved or pretended to love in the hope of using that love in the form of narrative. This was in his blood this need to serve as an intermediary between what he experienced and felt, and a public. This obsession with the public was inherited from his father, it was like a thistle that had to be rooted out. As he felt in his coat pocket for a packet of cigarettes, Philippe found a notebook in which he had jotted down the addresses and telephone numbers of his comrades on leaving them in Marseille. Glatini, Invalides 08-22 he rang him up while Mina lay down on the thick carpet and did some stretching exercises for the sake of her figure. A very well-bred, overbred, deep-throated voice replied. Countess Glatini speaking. You wish to speak to the captain? Who shall I say? Captain Philippe Esclavia. He'll be delighted, he never stops talking about you. I hope we shall meet soon. Just a moment, here he is. Esclavier gave a little shudder. Biara. I bet Glatini doesn't have much fun. But his comrade's warm voice was already on the other end of the line. So you've got to Paris at last. How long did you stay in Marseille? Four days. Where are you? Come and lunch with us. You know the address, 17 Boulevard des Invalides U Haven T. Got a car. Shall I come and fetch you? 
Philippe had no wish to partake of a family meal, to be interrogated on every count, to have to answer questions which ostensibly had no connection but which would enable the countess to determine his social background and fit his accent and manners to the preconceived idea she would have of him. I suggest we lunch together alone, Glatini. Let's meet at the Brent bar off the Champs Elysees. Eh? It's in a side street next door to the Colisee. I'll see if I can get away. Philippe heard his comrade's voice more faintly. Claude, I shan't be in to lunch. What's that? General de Persenes is coming? Well, you'll have to make some excuse for me. A child shouted in the background, then another, and Glatini's voice sounded closer. Right, Esclavia, see you in your bar at half past twelve. Philippe had the impression that his comrade was relieved and delighted with this opportunity he had just been given to escape from his little family hell. Take my number as well, said Mina. If you ever feel low just give me a ring and if Albert isn't about, come over and see me. Just a couple of good pals doing each other a good turn. I'd like to take you to the Rue de some day, if only to show my mother and her little crowd that I'm not just an old man's mole. Look out. Mina, you're getting sentimental. Very bad for your career. You can be so sweet sometimes, just for a few minutes, and then, suddenly, out you come in your true colors. The real man, selfish and cruel. Who takes his pleasure and promptly puts his trousers on again. Well I never, you're trying to start a row. Mina held her chin in her hand. But it's true, you know. She gave a rather forced little laugh. Leaning back in her armchair, the Comtesse de Glatini scrutinized the stranger who was sitting in her drawing room reading the paper, in a pair of old slippers and a grey pullover. The stranger was her husband, the father of her five children. Jacques. Yes? He looked up, she did not even recognize his face. Was it leanness that exaggerated his features and his square chin, the rather common chin of a boxer or swimming instructor? Why had he thought it necessary to parachute into Dean Bianfu? It was a splendid, dashing gesture, and at the time Jacques had been praised to the skies by everyone she met. Later on there had been a certain reservation. By jumping in he had betrayed his class, for in the army, as in the rest of the country, there were class distinctions which had nothing to do with rank or service. By his action he had publicly repudiated the general staff to which he belonged. Yes, the action of an officer of the line. A breach of manners on his part. And now this habit he affected of pinning a paratrooper's badge on his uniform. Paratroops were nothing but adventurers disguised as soldiers. Rather than lunch with General de Persenes, he preferred to meet this chap Esclavier in a bar. General de Persenes was a dreary old bore, but he still had useful connections in the cavalry and played the dual role of arbiter of elegance and chairman of a sort of honorary jury, he it was who decided what was done and what was not done. He was one of those who had condemned Jacques's gesture. This luncheon might have set everything to rights, but Captain de Glatini, a staff officer who was in the running for the command of a squadron, preferred to meet a big oaf of a paratrooper in a bar. Since his return Jacques had never stopped talking about this fellow Esclavier and all the tricks he got up to, about a sort of tramp called Boyce Führers, about Piniers and Mimaudi, an Arab, and a certain Raspa guy, an illiterate who had become a colonel and who at any other time would have remained a warrant officer for life. The day after he got back, they had both gone out to dine with Colonel Pysange who was said to wield considerable influence behind the scenes in the army. General Millais of the Ministry of National Defense was also there, and in the course of the evening the name of Lieutenant Marindel had cropped up. Lowering his eyelids, which gave him a vaguely sphinx-like appearance, Pysange had observed. I've had a report on that officer. During his four years captivity it seems the communists worked on him pretty thoroughly and he actually became one himself. His parents are well off. We're going to ask him to resign his commission. Claude de Glatini had seen her husband go white in the face and raise his voice all of a sudden. If you did that, Colonel, it would be a pretty dirty trick apart from being a crime against the army. But, Captain, he can be invalided out. 
we can put it down to malaria, that's been done before you know. Lieutenant Marindal was one of the few of us who understood about revolutionary warfare. His conduct in the camps was above all praise, I can vouch for that. He's an exceptional man, Colonel. Colonel Paisan had been warned that anyone who had been in a Vietman camp was never quite the same when he came out. But for a Glatini to have changed to such an extent, this was really astonishing. Yet he could not tolerate such an attitude in one of his subalterns, and at the same time he had to tone down the necessary reprimand and make it sound like a friendly admonition, for the captain belonged to a powerful clan. I don't doubt the soundness of your opinion, Jacques, old boy, but perhaps it was distorted by the atmosphere of the camps and the endless propaganda to which you were subjected. The army's one thing, politics are another and the expression revolutionary warfare is the absolute negation of our traditions. All warfare is bound to become political, Colonel, and an officer with no political training will soon prove ineffective. Frequently the word tradition only serves to conceal our laziness. General Melies had then chipped in. He had a fine military record and prostate trouble, but it was said he would not have this much longer. His snow white moustache was set in motion with every word he gobbled. We know how much you've suffered, my dear fellow. France let you down badly. You were forced to take decisions which were often beyond your capacity. The army has finished with operations of that sort, I think. It must recover its former position, resume its traditions. And for that we shall have to separate the sheep from the goats. Claude had motioned to her husband to let the matter drop. But Jacques had persisted. In that case, General, we're all of us goats, all who were in the Mackie in France, who served in the First Army or the FFL, who took part in the Indochina campaign, in the fighting units, who died of hunger on the tracks of the Oat region, all who believe that the army depends on the people just as a fish depends on water. That's what Mao Tse Tung wrote and it's because we ignored his theories on revolutionary warfare that we deserved our crushing defeat. If you get rid of all of us, what will remain of the army? Colonel Pysange struck the tablecloth with his knife. Glatini was even more contaminated than he had thought, he quoted Mao Tse Tung, a communist, therefore he had read communist books. Oh, if only all those goats weren't needed in order to wage war, how easily this scourge would be wiped out. He came to the rescue of the general. This is just an individual case, the question of Lieutenant Marindal. A simple disciplinary action against him, I feel. I feel any disciplinary action against him would jeopardize the morale of the army and be most unwelcome and unpopular with the friends of Lieutenant Marindal. Of whom you are one. Of whom I am one. Everyone had stopped talking. With difficulty the mistress of the house brought the conversation round to the latest theatrical success. Captain de Glatini had not opened his mouth again. After dinner a lieutenant sitting at the end of the table had come up to him and Claude had realized he was congratulating him. The lieutenant had been out in Indochina. But Paisange had led the young woman into a corner of the drawing room. My dear Claude, you must curb the captain's tongue, if we hadn't been among friends. Among people of the same social standing, the incident might have proved extremely serious and harmful to your husband's career. He must get rid of those ideas of his. You can help the. He seems to have communist sympathies. Jacques a communist. I won't go so far as that. Solid traditions, a sincere faith, and love of his profession would prevent him from sinking to that, my dear. In the car, an old Mercedes they had brought back from Germany, Claude asked her husband with horror in her voice. Is it true you're a communist? Paisange said so, I suppose. I shall never be able to understand how a man with such a noble, forthright appearance can be so low-minded or how, with all those decorations of his, he has never heard a shot fired in anger. Do you know what communism is? No, of course not. And even the communists in France don't know either. Communism is a country in another planet. Now I don't happen to have any inclination for space travel. Will you please ring up Jeanine Marindel tomorrow and ask her to dinner with her husband? Ring up Jeanine after what she has done. 
that's Eve Marindel's business, not ours. But I absolutely insist on having the lieutenant and his wife at our table tomorrow. You'd better ask that windbag Major Gurnier as well. Like that everyone will hear about it, including that old fool Pysange. Now he was referring to his superior officers as fools. This was what communism meant, lowering one's standards, denying the established order of things, and not that cock and bull story about space travel. During the dinner Claude had felt deeply offended, first of all by the presence of Jeanine, the adulterous wife, all sugar and spice, and by her beauty which was more startling than ever, as though sinning was good for the complexion, and, secondly, by the close relationship that existed between her husband and Marindel. The lieutenant addressed Jacques by the familiar to and talked to him as an equal, forgetting the difference of rank, age and, to put it bluntly, social background. After all, Captain de Glatigny had served as an aide-de-camp to several generals. And Jeanine, all smiles and gaiety, that little bitch with the looks of an angel who had given herself to that filthy ginger-headed beast, Pasfuro. Jacques chattered and joked with her. Perhaps he was actually after her himself, now that he knew how easy she was to get. Jacques had changed. Instead of getting up and shaving, there he was lying back in his armchair reading a paper. Since his return he lolled about in bed, spent hours playing with the children or else sat astride a chair in the kitchen, watching Marie peel the vegetables or prepare a stew. Sometimes he even helped her. The children were getting too familiar with their father, and Marie was inclined to be insubordinate. He no longer kept them at a proper distance, and the results of this were deplorable. It was a complete stranger who had shared her bed that first evening. He had behaved disgustingly, and she had felt as though she was committing adultery. He had treated her like any casual pickup, panting and groaning on top of her, while she lay on her back looking up at the crucifix on the wall, at an outraged and reproachful Christ. Then he had thanked her with a clumsy sentimental kiss. In the indignation which this physical contact caused her, she had plucked up her courage and told him everything. Jacques, I think you ought to know. Yes. He wanted to feel his wife's head nestling on his shoulder, to hold her tight in his arms and tell her how much he had thought about her and the children when he was out there, at Marianne too, and had expected to be killed. But she drew away, shrinking from the contact of his body. Jacques. I decided to use the money you sent me for a rather different purpose than we agreed upon. I had the roof of the Chateau de Pressinges redone. It was almost falling in. Glatini half sat up in bed. You're joking, I suppose. No, seriously. It was a little more expensive than I thought, two and a half million. You couldn't have been as stupid as that. What do you mean? What I say, as stupid idiotic and senseless as that. I thought we'd seen the last of that useless, worm-eaten old pile of stones. I was born there, and all my family before me, and two of our sons as well, Xavier and Yvonne. For two months in the year you like to play the lady of the manor, to be solicitous and condescending over the kids of peasants ten times richer than we are, to queen it in your pew in church. You're as vain as a peahen. I never realized you could be so common. That money was for the children and, a bit of it, for us. Seaside holidays, two bicycles for Xavier and John, a little pocket money. A new car. The children will be all right at Pressinges. In that damp, icy old castle. At least it will make them conscious of their position. My dear Claude, all that nonsense is finished and done with. Claude felt like crying as she thought how much she had loved Jacques when he was at Dean Bianfu, and after that, in the POW camp, she had loved him so much she would have died for him, and this imitation Jacques had come back to her. But what had become of the original, the well-mannered, courteous and slightly disdainful Jacques de Glatigny who was proud of his name and made his senior officers feel that he was doing them a favor by obeying them? He used to win horse shows and played bridge perfectly. And now she had to be content with this vulgar, coarse and counterfeit in the armchair. No, it wasn't possible. Jacques peered at his wife over the top of his newspaper. 
She still had those doe eyes which had so beguiled him, eyes that were something between yellow and red, in a shapely, finely chiseled face, and a slender equestrian's figure which childbirth had not thickened. Claude was small and well bred, indestructible and intransigent, she knew how to entertain, direct a conversation, bring up children, speak to servants, she could recite the army list by heart and boasted almost as many generals in her family as there were in his. But she was difficult to get on with and not very intelligent. Their marriage had been celebrated with a great ball in the park of the already tumble-down Chateau de Pressinges. There had been several hundred guests, including a marshal of France, an archbishop, all the local nobility, and all the officers from the neighboring garrisons provided they were sufficiently well born. What remained of the Pressinges fortune had been swallowed up in this final display. The bells which rang for their wedding, eight days later sounded the war alarm. Xavier, the eldest of their children, was now fifteen. Until then Jacques had managed to get along with his wife, he only used to see her long enough to give her a child. After going away in 1939, he was wounded and taken prisoner, then, having escaped, he had spent two years with the Mackey in Savoye. Genevieve had been born in a little town in the Black Forest where Dr. Faust was said to have lived. That year of occupation in Germany, the only year the couple had been together, had been extremely pleasant, hunting, balls, regimental dinners and horse shows. Comtesse de Glatini, the niece of a commander-in-chief and of a high commissioner of France, related to all the nobility, including the German nobility which was rising again from the ruins, rich for once, possessing a car and servants, fancied she had found the rank and position that were her due. She had reigned over that wild year and turned the heads of several lieutenants who had married into her family. Since she often entertained the way Mac General Heinrich von Bullock, a cousin on her mother's side, she was looked upon as a very great lady who could afford to overlook the prejudices of victor and vanquished. But she knew how to get the best out of victory just the same. One day von Bullock had said to the captain. Claude takes pleasure in showing me off, my dear Jacques, I'm her scandal, but a good quality scandal, I plotted against Hitler and I never committed any so-called war crimes. As though it were possible to make war without committing crimes. I come here and sing for my supper by describing my battle in France, I rather enjoy that, and my campaign in Russia, which is somewhat more painful. Sometimes I can't help wondering if your wife isn't a little monster. Give me another glass of that excellent brandy. I know of a wonderful horse that has managed to survive the war, it's stable just round the corner. You could requisition it. If it leaves Germany, at least it won't be leaving the family. According to the latest news, the former Panzer General von Bullock was in the process of building up one of the largest fortunes in Germany from prefabricated houses which he sold throughout the world. He had invited Xavier and Genevieve to spend Christmas with him on his country estate near Cologne. He would come over himself to fetch them and would stay in Paris for a day. Bullock had not had any of his old castles rebuilt, on the contrary. He had had what remained of them blown up with dynamite. Then he had built himself a villa equipped with every modern comfort on the banks of the Bowden Sea. To round everything off, he had just married a Menachin twenty-five years younger than himself. Over the ruined walls of Pressinges, Claude had had a new roof put on. While he was holding the grenade in his hand, when Marianne had been taken, while he was slogging along the tracks, listening to the voice and carrying a sclavier on a stretcher, the little money he had earned by the sweat of his brow had been wasted on this vain and anachronistic impulse. Before his capture Glatini had found his wife's anxiety to restore the castle quite natural. Like all his family, he had a sense of possession which was very different from that of the middle or merchant classes. For him a castle was still a communal building. In the Middle Ages everyone could find refuge there, today everyone could visit it. The owner of the moment was responsible not only to his own dynasty but also to the nation. But his evolution which had begun at Camp 1 now led him to take an aversion to the world in which his wife continued to live and in which the castle stood. Yon came and sat down on his father's knee. Claude's dry voice chided him. Now then, you boys, 
I've forbidden you to come in here. Von, go back to your room. Wait a moment, his father gently said. Claude, look how pale he is. The seaside would have done him a lot of good. Genevieve came in with Indochina Iron too, Muriel and Olivier, the girl and boy they had engendered on each home leave. The children clustered round him, hanging on his neck, pulling his hair, clutching at his pullover, jostling one another, laughing, screaming, fighting. I give up, said Claude. Since you came back all the manners I've taught them have gone by the board. So it's settled, is it, you're going out to meet Esclavia? Let's not go over that again. What's more, I hope to bring him back here to dinner and also see Marindal, if I can. I shan't be here. If this goes on, we'll have your NCOS and privates invading this drawing room. I wouldn't mind at all if they did, but you see, my dear, they're all dead. Jacques de Glatine glanced round the drawing room with its pictures, suits of armor, standards and coats of arms. On the shelves stood rows of miniature cannons, a complete little military museum. That stained and tattered old flag had come from Waterloo, and that large sword, which only a giant could wield, had belonged to the constable. The large crystal chandelier had been looted in Italy, and the sumptuous carpets brought back by General Guard and whom Napoleon had sent into Persia to persuade the Shah to side with him against the British. In a glass case hung the starred cloak of a Grand Master of the Knights of Malta, and on a pillar stood the dented breastplate of an officer of the Pontifical's Waves. Yes, indeed, what would Bachelier and Berman Jew, Mustier and Dupont, Merkilov and Javel, have said if they had found themselves here, among all these remnants of history? and Sir Gono with his WT set which seemed to be devouring his back? But their bodies were now rotting in the Dean Bianfu basin. He plucked the children off him as though they were bunches of grapes, and went off to dress. He was going to be late for his meeting with Esclavia. He felt extremely tired. He would have liked to be living alone in a wooden hut in the country, tramping through the forests in hobnailed boots, feeding on bread, wine, raw onions, sardines and eggs. In solitude. And in prayer. Searching for the mysterious thread which he needed to guide him through this new existence in which he discovered that generals can be imbeciles and one's own wife a stranger. Yet he was the first to arrive at the Brent bar and he almost ordered a whiskey, then changed his mind, that was a habit he would have to get rid of. With a captain's pay, a wife with big ideas, five bouncing children and a flat like a military museum, whiskey was a forbidden luxury. A port, please, barman. You're not going to drink that muck, Esclavia exclaimed, rushing in. Two whiskies, please, barman. Good morning, Captain, said Edouard. The barman gave Philippe Esclavia a conspiratorial smile. This was the first time Philippe had seen his friend in civilian clothes, he was surprised. Although dressed with the utmost care, Glatini looked shrunken, thinner and smaller than he really was, in his rather old-fashioned blue suit which smelt faintly of mothballs. He had put his roll brim hat and gloves down beside him on the bar and sat astride his stool as though it was a saddle. His features were drawn, his smile melancholy. He had a smelly old pipe in his mouth. Esclavia put his hand on his shoulder, as he had done up there in the Mio Highlands. Well, Jacques? Well, Philippe? What was it like getting back? I found my children had grown a lot. I behaved towards them like a doddering old papa, dripping with affection, I tremble for them, for they'll be forced to live in the termite world which we once knew. My wife has got used to being alone. She has acquired self-reliance, a certain sense of independence. The great tragedy is that in the Viet Minh camps we developed on our own, away from our families, our social class, our profession and country. So coming back isn't so easy. With the Viets, the problem was over simple. It boiled down to this, survival. Some of us went a little far there and tried to understand it. I've seen Marindel again. Oh yes. He's happy, he's playing at being happy. But. Yes, he has a gift for theatricals. 
he's being accused of turning communist. Marindal. I've had to stand up for him, consequently I'm now regarded as a fellow traveler. Esclavia reverted to his dry, scornful tone. The army is the biggest collection of dirty dogs and idiots that I've ever come across. Well, why are you in it then? It's also where you meet the most unselfish men and most loyal friends. Have you been home yet? No. I don't know how to put it, but I can't bear the idea. Two more whiskies, please, Edouard, make them doubles. It's true, we've developed away from our homes. And for the first time I feel that we army people are ahead. For the first time in centuries. Only, there we are, it's mere chance that has pushed us ahead, we weren't prepared for it. Let's go and eat, I need your help to get me in the proper frame of mind to go home to the Rudel Universite. By eight o'clock that evening Glatini and Esclavia were drunk. They had run into Orsini wandering about the Champs Elysees in search of a cinema. He never got up until two in the afternoon and spent his time playing poker all night with his fellow Corsicans. Up to now he had been winning. They're handing it to me on a plate, he said. It's the first time I've ever seen them lose. All three of them had gone back to the Brent bar and a fascinated Edouard listened to them forgetting his other clients. As far as I'm concerned, said Glatini, dipping his nose into his glass, love boils down to a purely social function, religion to a number of senseless gestures, warfare to a form of technology more or less suited to the purpose. Do you realize, you too, why I fought at Dean Bianfu, why I slogged through those muddy trenches with my hands tied behind my back, rotting with fever in the monsoon? Do you realize why we waged that war in Indochina? Just so that the Comtiste Glatini could put a new roof on a pile of old ruins. I'm fed up already, said Orsini. One ought to be able to spend one's leave with a few friends. Who, like me, have neither wife nor family. I've never been so thirsty as this evening. All the thirst I felt at Camp One is parching my throat. What do you say to ringing up Marindal? Marindal is living on love, said Esclavia. I think I'm now at last in a fit state to go home. He left, with his beret planted firmly on his head and his lips set in a thin, grim line. Glatini and Orsini went on drinking. With his hands in the pockets of his raincoat, a cigarette drooping from his lip, his face very pale and thin, Philippe Esclavia stood outside the front door. His sister Jacqueline opened it and heaved a deep sigh. It's you, Philippe. We thought you were dead. Thought or hoped. She was shivering, for she felt she was looking at a ghost, the ghost of her father, grimly accoutred. The resemblance was overwhelming. Please, Philippe. I'm so pleased you've come back. She tried to kiss him. He let her do so, keeping his hands in his pockets and his cigarette in his mouth then pushed past her through the door. The muffled sound of a number of voices came from the drawing room. You've got company, I gather. Is while holding forth as usual? Philippe, don't let Severau. Our opinions may differ. It's not just our opinions. Everyone will be delighted to see you, including Michel. After all, you were both deported together. Not for the same reasons. Please. Philippe. I've got out your civilian clothes. Would you like me to go and fetch them? Go and have a wash to freshen yourself up. Then change and. Come and join us. Why change? That uniform you're wearing. I might have known it. When I came back from Math Horson, you wanted me to keep on my deportee's uniform. Now that I'm back from Indochina as an officer. A paratroop officer. Philippe. You want me to disguise myself as a civilian, to slink home in the dark, to cout out to a dirty little crook and his friends who are mucking up my carpets, to ask forgiveness for failing to get myself killed twenty times over, for miraculously coming out alive after being dumped in a Viet Minh hospital. There must be something wrong with you, Jacqueline. Jacqueline burst into tears. You're an utter savage, and you've been drinking, you reek of drink. Our father never used to drink. Philippe stepped into the drawing room with his beret still on his head, 
but he had taken off his raincoat, revealing his parachute badge and decorations. Michel Wireless Clavier was speaking with the scornful detachment, the rather precious insistence on the choice of expression, which enabled him to pose as a sensitive soul and writer of wide culture. He was leaning against the mantelpiece under the big portrait of Eshines Clavier, and one of his hands, which were his best feature, drooped in an attitude of studied negligence. Ensconced in an armchair, Villel seemed to be hanging on his lips, but he wasn't listening to him and his thoughts were elsewhere. Villel hated Weil and his success. He congratulated him on his books, which he signed Michel W. S. Clavier, but said behind his back that they were junk and never read them. He himself would have liked to live in this apartment where generations of professors, men of law, famous doctors and politicians had amassed their tasteful treasures. The phantom later hanging on the opposite wall was a fortune in itself. Since Weil was not looking at him, he turned his head slightly and saw the charming profile of Git, Goldschmidt's daughter. The old professor was asleep in his chair, his mouth wide open. She was lively and attractive the little minx. What would she be like in bed? Prudish? Bold? A mixture of the two? It was something worth considering. Nothing else of interest in this group, a few activists with thick ankles and short hair, two or three society women as silly as that Francois Eispersonian Moreau who was said to be Wiles mistress, some badly dressed, shiny-faced female students barely fit for a role in the hay in an interval between two self-examination periods. The men were not much better, university people with an exaggerated idea of themselves, a painter who turned up at every meeting because he had been given to think that he might meet Picasso there. But what no one knew was that the painter carried in his pocket a syringe filled with black paint with which he intended to spray the mystery monger who had ruined painting. He, Villel did know and was biding his time. One evening he had written a paper, a very good paper, in which he sided with Picasso, of course, but with reservations, extremely subtle reservations. The paper could not appear yet, and perhaps if the incident did occur, the outcome might be entirely different. There was also a stage manager who was noted for his unnatural tastes. And lastly, a Dominican. There is always a Dominican in the offing. Not one of the thirty people assembled the found favor in Villel's eyes, not even the little philosophy mistress from a provincial lycee who was blushing with admiration for the master and delightedly dipping the tip of her tongue into a glass of tepid orangeade. How sordid it all was, while and his orangeade. He caught sight of Philippe Esclavier who had just come in, and recognized him at once. He was the tall captain who at Vietri had given the released prisoners the order to throw away their fiber helmets and canvas boots. Villel had a photographic memory for faces. He assumed a puzzled expression as a wave of jubilation swept over him. The showdown promised to be a good one. Our action in favor of peace, Weil was saying, has met with magnificent results. We raised public opinion against the war in Indochina and the outcome was the armistice and the victory of our friends of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Soon they'll be masters of the South, where the puppet set up by the Americans won't be able to hold out for more than a few days. Still talking away? Philippe's voice chipped in, dry as the crackle of a forest tree on a frosty day. He was leaning against the doorpost as though to block the exit through which his prey might try to escape. I wonder what our country has done to you for you to think of nothing but destroying it, or my family for you to have come and infected them. Michel Weil felt the blood draining from his face, chest and limbs and taking refuge in some mysterious part of his body, a sort of basin into which it always settled as soon as things began to go wrong. He had been expecting this encounter and had prepared for it, but was nevertheless taken by surprise. The Dominican rose to his feet and tried to make for the doorway. Philippe's voice brought him to a standstill like a butterfly on a pin. Back to your seat, vicar, and stay there. Jacqueline tried to come through the door from the other side. She drummed on him with her bare fists but soon gave up. She has gone to her room to have a good cry, while thought to himself. That's all she's good for, crying like her mother. The Dominican has also sat down again. 
and that little sod Villel is secretly laughing his head off. Goldschmidt has woken up at last, he's rubbing his eyes. He's beaming all over his face, he has recognized his little Philippe. This is all very interesting. At the moment I am outside the drama, like a spectator, but I am also at the center of it. This theme would be worth developing, but later, later. I must recover my position on stage, in the center of the stage. Francois Eyes is trying to look shocked. That won't do any good, my little Francois Eyes, this time it's serious, and Philippe hasn't even noticed your facial contortions. I'm his sacrificial beast. Michel suddenly recalled this Persian expression to which he had attached a deep significance, may I be your sacrificial beast. He noticed that a complete silence had fallen and that most of the audience had got up and were waiting for something to happen. He composed his voice. I'm glad to see you again, Philippe. I'm not. I'll repeat my question, what has my country done to you for you to think of nothing but destroying it? It's my country as well. No, it isn't. Because I'm a Jew? No. Goldschmidt's also Jewish, but it's still his country. Because I'm a progressivist? Goldschmidt also claims to be a progressivist, and it's still his country. Then why? Because you're a dirty little shit. You've got an unhealthy liking for misfortune, putrefaction and defeat. You're a born lackey, servile and fawning. I saved your life at Mathhorsen. Not you, your masters. The communists. It was Fournia who had my name taken off the list. Fournia and I don't see eye to eye, but at least we respect each other. Why are you trying to make a row? I was lucky enough to find you surrounded by a particularly choice bunch of asses, bitches and snobs. I couldn't resist such a pleasure. Tomorrow we'll disinfect the place. With DDT. This is outrageous, the philosophy mistress cried out in a shrill voice. This happens to be my house, madam. It's a funny thing, but among all these friends of the people I can't see a single working class person, and among these fighters for peace not a single person capable of handling a rifle. Not a single commie either. The communists aren't like us. They're much more intolerant. They guard against contagion, they keep themselves clean and tip their refuse out onto the heads of others. They've filled my drawing room with it. It's not as bad as all that, Weil said to himself, as long as he sticks to generalizations. Perhaps he won't talk about Math Horson and the reason why I was deported. Perhaps. Because Fournier must certainly have told him all about it. He's a sensitive man, old Philippe. Even though he's a bit of a brute he's frightened of hurting his sister or dishonoring the family name. Deported for black market activities. After all, one had to live, or rather survive. Philippe can't understand that. The Esclaviers have been steeped in honor and fine sentiments for centuries. Now that I have established myself I'm ready to have as many fine sentiments, and even finer, as anyone else. Are you drunk, Philippe? He could not resist provoking his brother-in-law. Perhaps Philippe would now strike him, lay him out as he had done in the camp when he caught him stealing someone else's rations. At the time he had experienced a disturbing sensation of well-being, very odd, that sensation. Philippe's voice sounded distant and remote. I'm not yet drunk enough. Why, go and fetch some alcohol, for we drink alcohol in my house and not milk sop concoctions. We'll both get blind drunk together. No, everyone will get blind drunk with us, even the vicar. Jump to it, Michel my lad, I'm thirsty. Go on, you know what drinks to choose. Don't try and pretend. This time the illusion was pointed. Weil had sold the Germans a store of contraband alcohol, that was why he had been sent to Mathhorsen. Philippe was drunk. Villel was sweating with curiosity. He felt some really juicy secret was about to be revealed. Get a move on, Michel. Weil slowly unhooked himself from the mantelpiece. The captain opened the door for him and shoved him outside. Git, too, had sprung to her feet, as though the spell which held them all rooted to the spot had been broken. She rubbed her head against Philippe's chest, nibbled him, 
kissed him, scratched him, laughed, sobbed and stroked his face. You've come back at last, Philippe. I'm touching you, kissing you. You're as unshaven as ever this evening. Panting and puffing, old Goldschmidt had grasped the captain's hand and was holding it against his fat paunch, he was sniveling, which made him look even uglier than usual. Why didn't you let us know? We should have come and met you at the station, or at Marseille. Villel lit a cigarette and thought. This isn't at all funny, everyone's in tears. It's too trite and yet just now we were very near the moment of truth. Interesting, this captain, very interesting. He's the great love of little Git, you can see. Wiles guests trooped past, one after another, without daring to look at Philippe who was still standing by the door. On his way the Dominican delivered himself in an unctuous tone. May God forgive you, my son. I'd like to see you again, Captain, said Villel. You remember, I was at Vietri at the time of your release? That magnificent gesture, yes, throwing your fiber helmets into the river. I'll ring you up. In the very near future. In his surprise Esclavier allowed him to shake the hand which Goldschmidt was not holding. He suddenly felt tired out, bereft, devoid of anger. Ashamed of himself and of his outburst. Weil came back with a bottle of brandy, put it down on the table and disappeared. He had suddenly assumed the smooth manner of a head waiter. You went too far, Philippe, Goldschmidt gently observed, forcing the captain to sit down beside him. It was you alone who allowed Weil to become the heir to your father and to his thought. Do you know he's got the makings of a great writer? He's an exhibitionist who hates to reveal himself in public though at the same time he can't resist the temptation to do so. A mental strip tease, but he takes good care not to give the reason for his deportation. He will one day. Because he won't be able to stop himself. Exhibitionists are queer people, and we Jews are all exhibitionists. Even the Jews of Israel. Git inquired. No, they seem to have escaped the curse but at the same time they're going to lose their genius, which is a compound of subtlety, restlessness and also fear. In every Jew's subconscious there's a deeply rooted terror of the pogrom. The Israeli doesn't have this. He tills a land which belongs to him and has a rifle slung on his shoulder. For centuries the uprooted Jew has inevitably hated all forms of nationalism. Nations are shadowy families from which he feels himself excluded. So he invented communism, where the notion of class replaced that of nation. But this latest invention to have sprouted from his genius has not solved the problem, at least not for him, for the Jew is essentially outside all social classes just as he happens to be outside every nation. So he lingers on the fringe of communism and becomes what is known as a progressivist. The Israelis took the opposite course, but they immediately suffered from nationalist delirium. You see, I'm as garrulous as ever, Philippe. All this is just to tell you that I'm a Jew and not an Israeli and that Weil is like me. That's one of the reasons I'm so attached to him. I'm an Israeli, said Git. I'm a nationalist and I'm not under the curse. Won't you marry me, Philippe? We'll organize pogroms together and chase Weil and old Goldschmidt with long knives down every passage in the house. All right, said Philippe. I've learnt my lesson. I'm extremely fond of you both. But just leave me in peace with my bottle of brandy. When are you coming to dine with us? Git asked. I'll cook you a nationalist dish, steak and french fried potatoes. I've learnt how to cook in order to seduce you all the more easily. You know what your father used to say, Goldschmidt went on. History will drive us ineluctably towards communism. Instead of fighting it, we ought to humanize it so as to make it tolerable for the West. I know what communism is like and I can tell you now that it isn't tolerable and can never be humanized. Goldschmidt had some difficulty in getting up from his chair. He had asthma and panted at every step he took. One day his heart would give out and that would be the last of the garrulous, inquisitive, indulgent old man. He had always lived in the shadow of others, he had forgotten himself and here was death suddenly reminding him that he existed. Leaning on his daughter's arm, 
He shuffled slowly along the railings of the Luxembourg Gardens. He stopped to recover his breath. What an extraordinary fate for the Tesclavier family, he suddenly said to Git. Eshine dies on his return from the USSR where he has been received in triumph. Paul follows him into the grave a few days later after having had his brother voted out of the Socialist Party, with the result that the Communists and Socialists each bury their great man under their own red flag and insult each other at both funerals. Meanwhile Philippe was at death store in a hospital at Hanoi with a wound in the stomach he had received while attacking a Viet Minh village over which the same red flag was unfurled. The two dying men asked for Philippe. One of them only had while on whom to bestow his political testament. Paul's bedside companion was a former president who had been involved in some shady business. But there was no one with Philippe's mother when she died a month after her great man, no one but old Goldschmidt. She wanted a rosary. The woman in the religious articles shop asked me, is it for someone taking their first communion? Yes, a really astonishing family. Philippe has inherited his father's good looks, eyes as grey as the sea off Brittany. But war and suffering have left their stamp on his face. The raw clay has been fired in the oven. I must ask Philippe one day why he stayed on in the army. I know why, because I'm an Israeli. You're a bit in love with Philippe, aren't you? You can't walk any farther, I'm going to call a taxi. I warn you. The Esclaviers only admit submissive and retiring women into their lives. Alone in the drawing room, with a glass in his hand, Philippe Esclavier paced up and down the shelves of books, old books bound in leather or parchment, paper covered books whose spines had been bleached and whose titles had faded in the light. When his father was still alive, the room was cluttered with books that had just been published. Almost all of them bore the inevitable dedication. To the master, Eshine Esclavia, with all my admiration. The respectful homage of a disciple. To the guiding light of our generation. Base flattery was mixed with sincerity. Eshine Esclavia used to savor the new books like flowers or fruit. He loved the smell of the paper and the fresh ink. He would pick at the stacks at random, glance through a book and put it down again a few minutes later, but sometimes when his interest was roused. He carried it away clasped to his breast like a precious discovery. It was in this room that father and son gave full rein to their exclusive passion. Between them they spoke a language to which they alone held the key. The great men of the Third Republic, the writers and artists who came to the Esclaviers, found themselves dubbed with ridiculous nicknames. Sometimes the professor would pull one of them to pieces for his son's amusement, and soon his absurdities, his vanities and falsehoods would be laid bare on the carpet. Philippe took down a book. Marriage by Leon Bloom. The fuss it had caused on publication now seemed laughable. He remembered Leon Bloom. It was in 1936, he was 13 years old. Eshine Clavia, with his long silver locks nodding at every step, had marched from the nation to the Bastille holding him by the hand to introduce him to this popular front which was partly of his own making. Leon Bloom, who could be gentle when he liked, had stroked little Philippe's hair, and old Juhaux had clasped him so tightly to his breadbasket that he had burst into tears. It was in this room, through this very door, that Eugene Jochim Raths had appeared. Philippe remembered it clearly. As he himself was doing now, he had put his hand on the back of this armchair and, like him, he wore the badges of rank of a captain, but it was very cold in the big drawing room. Defeat had fallen like a black veil over Paris. Came the occupation and times were hard in the Rudel Universite, where one was too well bred after all to indulge in black market activities. Paris was ruled by the Germans, and the people of Paris by the black marketeers, the BOF, the dairymen, the grocers and the butchers. Eshine Esclavia had taken refuge in a magnificent isolation into which he had taken his son with him. It was easy to convince him, by pointing out the morals then in force, that this was not the moment to commit oneself. Every day he had doled him out the sleeping draught which he had baptized detachment. Although suspect in the eyes of the occupying forces, such was his renown that Professor Esclavia attained his chair at the Sorbonne. 
The students flocked to his history lectures as though they hoped these might reveal a secret message which would tell them they must fight and die. But the professor told them nothing and the students tried to find some secret meaning in every word he uttered. The German officer had arrived late in the afternoon. He was tall, slim, wore the iron cross and spoke perfect French. Eshines Clavier, looking very pale, received him standing up, and when Philippe slipped his hand into his father's he felt it trembling like that of an old man. He had no idea his father could age so rapidly and lose his self-control to such an extent. Don't worry, said the German, I haven't come to arrest you. I'm Eugen Jochim Raths, I was a pupil of yours at the Sorbonne. I remember now, the professor replied with an effort. Please sit down, won't you? Please regard this call as absolutely personal, a visit from a pupil to his master, nothing more. You used to tell us, the world is moving towards socialism, nationalism is dying, wars will become impossible, for the people don't want them any longer, puppets like Hitler and Mussolini will collapse in ridicule. Now, the whole German people is behind the Führer, and I mean the people, the working classes. At the head of my squadron I crossed France from Turcoing to Bayonne in a matter of two weeks. The democracies were incapable of fighting and Europe will be rebuilt round the German nation and its legends. You were wrong, Professor. Possibly. I've got my sergeant outside on the landing with some rations. I should be glad to share them with you and continue this discussion at dinner. Philippe had slipped away from his father. No. We don't want you here, he said to the German. His father had protested. Be quiet, Philippe. And had then tried to explain. It's an old pupil of mine I'm receiving here, not an enemy. Please forgive him, Herr Raths. The German had smiled. Young man, some boys of sixteen have already experienced the bitter taste of war and others have died with a rifle in their hands. I believe that if I were your age, if I were a Frenchman, I should not confine my fighting to a mere impoliteness. I came to tell your father that if most of us follow the Führer, I'm not one of them. In spite of their being so cruelly contradicted by the facts I still want to believe in his lessons, but I remain loyal to my country. Goodbye, Professor, goodbye, young man. The German had put on his cap, saluted with a click of his heels and left the room. What came over you, Philippe? I thought he was going to insult you. You might have got us arrested. Then, shortly afterwards, came that evening of the 17th of October 1941. His father was writing, wrapped up in a heavy dressing gown, stopping every so often to blow on his fingers. Philippe, curled up in a blanket, was trying to concentrate on a school book. It was the tumult damn boy eyes. Ong Wander Bourbon and the Prince took and confined themselves to secretly encouraging all the enemies of the guises. The conflict would start in their favor, without their uttering a formal challenge out loud, an equivocal attitude which reduced the opponents of the government to the role of conspirators. Philippe shut the book and threw it down on the floor. They're fighting in Russia, father, thousands of young men are getting themselves killed. Meanwhile I'm reading the tumult damn boy eyes. Bent over his lamp, Professor Esclavier raised his head. All that is no concern of ours, Philippe, but the tumult damn boy eyes is part of your prescribed reading. In the last year you've made hardly any progress in your work. You're listening too much to the echoes of the outside world. The Jews have been given orders to wear the yellow star. If our old friend Goldschmidt was in the occupied zone, he'd be forced to wear it, and little git as well. The Germans are wrong, utterly wrong, but these outrages in the streets are stupid and criminal. You heard what Hauptmann Eugene Jochim Raths told me, if I were a Frenchman, I should not confine my fighting to an impoliteness. Mind will always get the better of brute strength. Uncle Paul. Paul has been up to his usual tricks. Expelled from the Board of Education for refusing to sign something or other in favor of the Marshal. He was quite right. His duty was to carry on with the education of the new generations. Jacqueline thrust her head through the door, she was growing up extremely pretty. 
There are two gentlemen who want to see you, Papa. One of them is a former pupil of yours. They're out of breath, as though they had been running. Show them in. In their old hobnailed boots and army capes dyed brown, Mlia and Budin looked like a couple of tramps. In spite of the cold they were drenched in sweat. Malia was rubbing his nose so hard that it looked as flat as an egros. It's like this, he said, we've just brought down a Gestapo type, a Frenchman, a collaborator, right outside his house, with a revolver shot. Budin spoke up in his turn, but in jerky little phrases on account of his panting. But we only wounded him, it's the first time I've used a revolver. Within three hours we were traced and identified, we can't go back to where we live. Got to make for England and join de Gaulle. Mlia said, Professor S. Clavier's the only man who can get us out of this. We can trust him all right. Eshine S. Clavier had risen to his feet. I'm sorry, but I can't do anything for you. Mlia had given a start. What? I don't know de Gaulle and have no wish to know him. I disapprove of violence and don't want to be mixed up in this murder. Murder. But wasn't it you who said, those of us who prove to be so criminal as to make allies of our enemies should die, each of us has the right to be their judge and at the same time their executioner. Fascism is a crime against the soul. I might have said that. When the war was still on. Since then there has been the armistice. I never asked you to kill men in the streets which is liable to provoke reprisals. Furthermore, I don't know either of you. As I said before, I can't do anything for you. I was one of your most assiduous pupils, Professor. I attended your lectures, I read all your books and articles. Because you belonged to the SFIO, I also joined that party, because you said we should fight against fascism, I volunteered. And now you don't even recognize me. Malia, Eugene Malia. He repeated his name with a sort of absurd despair. Budin chipped in. You wouldn't remember me, of course. I'm from the Cantal, a mechanic in a little village near Orillac. Malia had taken refuge with us. He told me a lot of Buncombe and I believed him and followed him to Paris. That Buncombe was all yours, it seems. He shrugged his shoulders. Come on, Eugene. Can't you see? Your professor has simply got the wind up. We'd better be off before his windiness prompts him to call the police. Philippe had got up, struggling to rid himself of the blanket which enveloped him. He shouted out. That's a lie. Hello, now the kid's butting in, Budin observed simply. Try and understand. The professor told them, put yourselves in my place. I'm a man of letters. I have a book to finish. It's not up to me to meddle in these affairs. I'm too old for this sort of thing. There's a war on, said Mlia. Philippe saw his idol melting like wax. The contempt, or rather the astonishment he discerned in the faces of Mlia and Budin hurt him atrociously. We're off, Professor. All I ask is that you wait a little before summoning the police. I'm coming with you, said Philippe. He put his shoes on with clumsy movements not wishing to look at his father. He had some difficulty in putting on his lumber jacket. The three of them went out together and, as he banged the door behind him, Philippe heard his father's heart-rending cry. They took the metro and got out at a station at random, for they did not know where to go. The station bore the name Gambetta. Malia thought this augured well, he believed in omens. Gambetta had escaped from the siege of Paris in a captive balloon. They went into a cafe with blacked out windows and ordered beef tea. This was one of the non-alcohol days. A year later Professor E. Shines Clavier heard that his son had been captured by the Germans and tortured. Philippe had been tortured for six hours, his father for several months. The professor developed a loathing for anything remotely connected with violence, brutality, armies and police forces. He forgot his cowardice. He ceased to be that rabbit Esclavia, as he had been called by some of his colleagues who knew him well. One day at the Sorbonne, unable to contain himself any longer, he devoted a whole lecture to the subject of torture. It was extremely moving. 
He was once more the great inspired spokesman of the Front Populaire and he wound up with this sentence which seemed incomprehensible to everyone. I can speak about torture, I know what it is like, I suffer torture every night of my life. The pupils rose to their feet and applauded. Next day Professor Esclavier's course of lectures was suspended. Goldschmidt had described this incident to Philippe, but only eight years later, when the captain had just been repatriated from Indochina and his father was already dead. He had added. Towards the end of his life Eshine Esclavier used to fly into a rage whenever anyone mentioned war. He suffered a great deal from the fact that you were out in Indochina. But what on earth came over you? Why did you stay on in the army? Philippe had given an answer which was not quite true, though at the same time not entirely false. I stayed on in the army out of disgust for what I saw on my return from deportation, later on from habit, and now because it's the life that happens to suit me. Disgust he had certainly felt on coming back from Mathhorsen. He was saddled with Michel Weil, who had nowhere to go and was as pathetic and exasperating as a lost dog. The professor had been overwhelmed at seeing his son again. He had sobbed as he hugged him in both arms, stroking his face with his fingers like a blind man. Happy and at ease, they had made all sorts of plans, one of which was to go and have a good rest at Avignon, at Uncle Paul's. Jacqueline and his mother had already gone there. Paul did wonders during the war, the professor had said in an offhand, peevish tone. But you know how stubborn he can be. He won't understand anything and does his utmost to prevent the unity of the socialist and communist parties. De Gaulle's got him in the palm of his hand. He has done him proud and made him a commissaire de la republic. But I still haven't lost all hope of convincing him. In two months time, Philippe, there's going to be a special session of examinations for all those who've come back from the war or from deportation. You will present two theses. The subjects are limited and we'll help you through. A few days later the professor had had a telephone call from the secretary of the resistance and deportees organization which was controlled by the communists and of which he was a member. Philippe was squatting on his haunches playing with a cat. It was marvelous, this warm, living thing. As he let himself be nibbled, as he stroked the black coat, he began to realize at last that he was free, that he could get up, go out, listen to music, smoke as many cigarettes as he liked and ask the cook to make a raspberry tart. Through the open French windows he could hear the cries of children playing in the garden. After hanging up, his father had come back and stroked his head. Did they shave your head? Yes, like everyone else. How thin you are. Not feeling too tired? No, I'm all right. Did you suffer a great deal? I can hardly remember now. I've just been rung up by the Association of the Republican Resistance Workers and Deportees. They're organizing a big meeting at the Salwagram. I have to take the chair. Many of your deportee friends will be there, Revere, Paulian, Judelit, Fournier. It was Fournier who rang me up. They're all the communists of the camp. His father appeared not to hear. They'd be very pleased if you came with me this evening and wore your deportee's uniform. I've burnt my uniform. It smelt of gas chambers and human excrement and also of all the filthy things I had to do in order to survive. Your friends from Mathhorsen asked me to remind you that if you came back alive, you owed this in part to the communists. Weil had then chipped in. There's no problem about the deportee's uniform. The association has new ones for us to wear. I asked for the largest size for you. So you're also in this game, are you? But I thought. Now that the matter's settled, said the professor, I'd like to read you the draft of my speech. The subject is falsehood. We have just finished living for years in a state of falsehood. It isn't settled at all, said Philippe, I'm not going and I have no wish to disguise myself. The falsehood is still continuing. I remember your talks on the wireless in 1939, father, I also remember Mleur and Butin when they came to see you after firing on a Gestapo agent. I didn't want to remember any more. There was some misunderstanding with your friends. 
Philippe had locked himself up in his room. Nevertheless the professor had given his speech in the Salwagram. Why had gone there with him, wearing a deportee's uniform. Many of the audience had therefore thought that Weil was his son. The next day he engaged him as his secretary, and a month later Philippe Esclavier embarked for Indochina. Philippe knew this incident had not dictated his decision, but had rather served him as a pretext. His attempt to resume his studies had not met with much success. Prolonged intellectual effort had always been repugnant to him. Philippe could be brilliant, but he lacked application and he had what Glatini, with a slight touch of irony, called the indolence of the well-bred. Dreams and intellectual activity are incompatible, whereas action is well suited to a large measure of dreams. Philippe had discovered that military life fits in with a certain form of laziness. The existence of an officer is divided very unequally between moments of hardship, fatigue and danger and long periods of inactivity and leisure. In those moments of supreme effort an officer can be driven, despite fear, hunger and weariness, to accomplish extraordinary feats which will turn him, but only for an instant, into someone greater, more disinterested and more dauntless than other men. During the periods of inactivity he moves with the slowness of a drowsy bear in a little enclosed world of his own. All effort is banned from it, or is anyway extremely restricted by regulation, ritual and custom, its jokes are traditional and even its malice has been codified. With a throbbing head, Philippe staggered up to his room. He noticed the sheets had been changed and the bed clumsily remade. He recognized his sister's hand in this, some suitcases had been hidden behind a curtain. All his personal belongings and books had disappeared, the cupboards and drawers were empty. He realized they had not expected to see him again and that someone else had been occupying the room for some time. Glatini got home at two in the morning, dead drunk. He stumbled on the stairs several times. He tried to remember the last time he had been as drunk as this. Yes, it was in 1945, at the time of the liberation of Alsace. The peasants had set up wine stalls in the streets, it was that year's wine, which was still fermenting. Some girls had flung their arms round his neck. He was so drunk that he could no longer drive his jeep and had been obliged to stop in a little pine forest. He had lain down on the moss and the cold had woken him up. Through the branches he could see little patches of sky scattered with stars. He did not know where he had come from, where he was going or who he was, and he had enjoyed that sensation of being no one and yet being alive. A rabbit had scampered past him in the moonlight, followed by its grotesque shadow. Glatini had some difficulty in inserting his key in the lock, annoying hiccups kept rising in his throat. Claude was waiting for him in her dressing gown, her ash blonde hair scraped back from her forehead, which made her look like an old woman. She held a rosary in her hand. Always that urge of hers to repeat the obvious. You're drunk. Drunk and incapable. So drunk you can't even keep on your feet. It would serve you right if I went and woke up the children so that they could see you. The drunken isle of the Spartans. What are you talking about? You make me sick. But what on earth did they do to you in Indochina? Murd. We're going to have this out at once. I absolutely insist. Oh, balls. He barely had time to rush to the lavatory and be sick, and he hoped that, together with all the alcohol he had drunk, he would also get rid of his present life, his financial and domestic worries, the little countess and her roofing mania, so as to recover once more that sensation of being no one. From that night on Claude slept in a separate room and the captain was delighted. He could now read and meditate in peace. 3. The Mules of the Col Lieutenant Colonel Raspegai spent the first month of his 90-day leave in his native village of Les Aldudes, on the Raspegai estate, near the Col d'Urquiga. The first days were among the best in his life. Walking by the banks of the Nive, clambering about the mountains drenched in mist and rain, shooting in the Hera or Irati forest, he was reminded of the little shepherd boy he had once been, mysterious and solitary and of the adolescent who had become an accomplished frontier crosser and whose blood raced through his veins like a torrent. 
It was during the Civil War and the Republicans paid a high price for arms and ammunition. One night Franco's men had seized him and his father. They had beaten him to a jelly all night and had left him for dead out on the mountainside. A guardia civil had dragged the old man to the bottom of a ravine and finished him off with a musket bullet. The Raspeggies would have worked equally well for Franco as for the Republic, they were simply smugglers who seized every opportunity to make a little money. But from that day on Pierre Noel Raspegui had vowed an implacable, absolute hatred against the Gallicing dictator. A few days after his release from the Viet Minh camps the colonel had ordered himself a car. It was waiting for him at Marseille. It was a regent's with claret-colored coachwork outlined in cream, masses of dazzling chromium and white wall tires. It was equipped with a radio and with mirrors on both front fenders. It was in rather bad taste somewhat reminiscent of a grocer who has made his little pile, but Raspegui did not mind that. He knew it was bound to overawe his compatriots. The colonel had carefully calculated the time of his arrival so as to appear in front of the church just as the congregation was leaving. The men were coming down from the oak gallery by the outside staircases, their rosaries round their wrists, while the women in black mantillas emerged from the low vault, making the sign of the cross. In a brand new uniform, his breast adorned with all his decorations, his pipe stuck at a jaunty angle in his mouth, his bamboo swagger stick under his arm, his red beret pulled down on one side, he stood, shoulders squared, chest thrown out, muscles flexed, in the pose which every paper in the country had popularized. The men had hesitated an instant before recognizing him as the great Basque and Dotty ear. Jean, the youngest of the Uruguay boys, was the first to cry out. It's Pierre Aspegai of the Urquago estate, it's the colonel from Indochina, that's him all right with an American car. Then they had rushed towards him. Half the village was related to him on the male or the female side and they had all insisted on kissing him, so as to make it plain to the customs officials and the police that they were his kin. They told him that his mother and brother had come to the first mass but had gone back to the mountains immediately afterwards as one of their animals was sick. The cure appeared, despite his age he still walked with huge strides, like a daddy long legs, and wore his beret pulled forward over his nose. He grasped Raspegui by the shoulders and squeezed his brawny, root hard arms. So the you are, and of course you managed to arrive at the end of mass so as to miss the service. You haven't changed at all. Raspegui heard a small boy saying in his native tongue. It's true, he's just as big and strong as in his pictures, and he's not at all old. Raspegui threw out his chest and flexed his muscles for the boy's benefit. This was the sort of praise which touched him most of all. The men dragged him along to the village inn. While the wine was being poured out, Eskatagai, who had been through the selection board with him, asked. Come on now, Pierre, tell us all about it. What was it like out there? What was it like out there? Explain all that to them, to these people who had scarcely ever left their valley, explain the Chinese and the Viet Minh, the tall elephant grass of the Oat region and the paddy fields of the deltas, the mud and the dust, the fighting, the suffering, the dying, and what he and his kind were striving to find behind all that death. It wasn't exactly a holiday, he replied in his rasping voice, but it got under your skin. He peered at them through half-closed eyes. The cure had sat down opposite him to observe him more closely. This was a rasper guy all right, a member of that clan of shepherds who dabbled in sheep thieving and smuggling but who never jettisoned their goods, preferring to fight and tip the customs men into a ravine, who went further than anyone else in good or in evil who were by way of being sorcerers as well, acquainted with secrets over beasts and over men, and with a deep-rooted, violent passion for women, especially the women of others. And this one was the worst and the best of the lot, the most disconcerting, the most secretive and at the same time most garrulous, prouder and more pagan than anyone has any right to be. But one evening, towards the end of the war, when Pierre Aspegai had come back on a short leave, the cure had found him on his knees in the middle of the choir of the church, motionless and upright, like a knight on the day of his dubbing. 
He had never seen a man so handsome praying with such fervor. Lieutenant Raspegai had just learnt that his men were fighting without him. For the rest of the time he gave every indication that he did not believe in God and feasted with the devil. He would have to bury his roots in Basque soil, marry and settle down here. The cure had spoken to his mother and he was looking out for a wife for him. From Bayonne to saint and grace, rich or poor, countess or scholarly maid, what woman would refuse to mingle her blood with that of the great colonel? Raspegar leant back in his chair and, with his eyes fixed on the ceiling with its smoke blackened wooden beams festooned with clusters of red peppers that had been hung up to dry, he seemed to be searching his memory for something to tell them. Memories he had a plenty, they buzzed through his head like a cloud of flies over his glorious, sordid and generally gory past, that avid quest for medals and promotion, that exalting pursuit of life and of death, and it all ended with a little general fastening yet another decoration onto his breast. He loved medals, he enjoyed military pomp and splendor, but each time he felt frustrated. There was something else he wanted and he didn't know what. What should he tell them? These peasants sitting here with their gnarled hands spread flat out on the knees of their black Sunday best trousers. Stories about girls. They were prudish, the cure was present, and he himself found that sort of thing rather dull nowadays. His withdrawal through the Viet Minh lines for hundreds and hundreds of miles, and then one day the appearance of the Raspegai battalion which had been completely written off. Even then there had been certain rats who reproached him for having abandoned his wounded, the very rats who would have found it absolutely normal for him to surrender or get all his men killed. He knew what they were like, that headquarters rabble, bald, pot-bellied, fat-assed little men, incapable of marching half a dozen miles without melting away in their own dishwater like sweat, with faces like Franco and the fawning manners of Spanish Jesuits. He had thought of all that and had found nothing to tell the men of Leol dudes. He was like a bullfighter being asked by ignorant strangers, who did not number one genuine aficionado among them, to describe his fight just after it is over, when he has not yet got rid of his fear, when he still feels closer to the animal he has killed in the sunshine of the arena than to these people scrutinizing him with a strange gleam in their eyes as though he was a murderer. In any case there is no such thing as an aficionado of war, there are simply those who fight, and all the others. Raspegai drained his glass of wine and rose to his feet. I'll tell you some other time. I've got to go up and see my mother. You know what she's like, I may be a colonel but she'd still beat me over the head with a log if she discovered I was dawdling in the bar instead of climbing up to see her right away. They all laughed as though they didn't know her, a Spanish woman from over the border, irascible, domineering, and rapacious as well, and she had to be the woman she was if she wanted to preserve even a semblance of order in the Raspegai household. The colonel left his car outside the cure's house, went into the grocers who also sold espadrilles and, sitting on a stone bench, donned a bear, surrounded by all the boys and adolescents of the village who drank him in with their eyes like hornets on a stormy day. No, he would not speak to the old men in those of his own age, but to these youngsters who were the only ones who would understand. As he tied the laces round his ankles, he watched them and he already knew which were the three or four among them who, without knowing it, had a sense of war and adventure and who would follow him. He could see Esclavia greeting them with his hands in his pockets. Well, you little bastards! What do you think you're going to get by joining us? Something to overawe your pals and girlfriends, the red berry, the parachute badge, jumping boots? Do you know what you're really in for? Toil, sweat, blood, probably death. Just get that into your heads, you nitwits. You're here to die. So if there's anyone who wants to change his mind, now's the time. Good old Esclavia, he knew how to pile it on. Not one of them had ever stepped out of the ranks and asked to leave. Bowden had once tried the same line, but he didn't have what it takes, out of twelve only four had remained. That bastard Bowden, managing to go sick just at the time of Dean Bianfu. He would make him pay for that. For a start. He had not given him any sign of life and had not answered one of his letters. 
the cure came up. Pierre. It was funny being called by his Christian name, it was a long time since that had happened. It forced him to remember that he had spent his childhood outside the army. Yes, father. You ought to go and see Colonel Mestreville. He keeps talking about you as though you belonged to him. The Q was a little jealous of this. Of course, I'll go and see him. Another thing. Here, take it. Go on, I tell you, take it. With a clumsy gesture, full of affection and brutality, he handed him his old stick, his macula, with its blunted point and leather handle blackened by sweat. It was common knowledge that when he was younger, Abatoy Amberu had gone off with the other Basque cures to fight against Franco and that his stick was the only weapon he had ever carried. You'll hang on to it, won't you, Pierre Aspegai? It will remind you of your homeland, should you ever forget it. The cure was preparing the ground. Raspagai slipped the leather thong round his wrist, took a firm grip on the cane before twirling it round his head, then, with his long, easy stride, started off along the path which led up into the mountains and the Hera forest. Halfway along the road he had come across his brother Fernand with his flock, they had embraced, or rather brushed their cheeks together and slapped each other on the back and shoulders, on the knotted muscles from which a man derives his strength. Thanks to the money you sent, Fernand told him, we now have a hundred sheep, fine ones too. Do you want to come and count them? Mother says you could have done better and saved a little more instead of boozing and running after the girls, that the men who have gone to America send back much more money than you did, that it's not worth being a colonel, and so on and so forth. Don't listen to her, Pierre. She's terribly proud of you. And so am I. Their mother must have heard them. She had a sharp ear and the wind carried far that day. They found her outside the front door, short and swarthy, her scarf wound round her head, both fists on her hips. She only spoke Basque, never Spanish or French. So there you are, you big good for nothing, and you're not even a general after all the schooling and health I've given you. Health she had certainly given him, he was full of life. It seethed through his body and clung to him like those malignant deep-rooted weeds that cut like knives. As for schooling, that was another matter. She had got him a job as a shepherd on another farm the day after he left school. It was lucky the owner happened to be Colonel Mestreville. He bent down to kiss his mother, but she squirmed in his arms as though she found it distasteful, her eyes were brimming with tears. Behind her appeared his three bashful nephews and niece with his sister-in-law, three stocky, thick-set boys who were always ready for a fight, and his niece, much younger, with her big mysterious eyes, she was sucking her thumb and peering at him through her eyelashes. Mate was the one he lifted in his arms and held up towards the sky, a sky that was forever changing, never completely blue, never completely grey, hemmed in by the mountains and which seemed to be cast in his mould with a nature as tormented as his own. After the meal, which they ate in silence, their noses buried in their plates, his mother said. Better change those fine clothes of yours, you'll only get them dirty. She took his uniform and hung it up in a cupboard and he caught her delightedly fingering his decorations, one after another. In the afternoon, in a fine drizzle, he went out with his brother to see the sheep, but to his surprise he found no pleasure in this. He was dreaming of other flocks, the only ones that mattered to him now, men in camouflage uniform, agile and silent, who followed him in the dark. No matter their race or the color of their skin, he would lead them, clean limbed, youthful and upstanding, far from this rottenness, this feebleness, this cowardice, towards the sort of brutal paradise which was only open to fighters and the pure in heart and from which would be banished all cowards, cranks women, guardias civils and anyone who served that bastard Franco. A Spanish shepherd who had caught sight of them came down towards them, he was a friend of Fernand's, they did a little smuggling together. Pointing with his finger, the shepherd inquired. Who's this big fellow? It's my brother, Pierre Noel Raspagai, the colonel from Indochina. Thereupon the shepherd took off his boy Eno and, holding it in his hand, gave a respectful bow. 
this was fine, this warmed the cockles of a man's heart even more than a tot of brandy. In the evening Fernand left the house. He had to prepare a crossing, some mules being brought over from Spain. Pierre would have liked to go with him to see how it would make him feel now. Sitting in his father's armchair, which was his own ever since the old man had died in the ravine, he dozed in front of the fire, with a porron of wine within easy reach. He was alone. The old woman and the children had gone to bed. Tall shadows flickered on the walls as the flames leapt in the hearth. Outside it was raining as heavily as during the last days of Dean Bianfu, but here the rain was fine and icy cold. The solitude grew heavy, unbearable. He poked the fire and sparks flew into the room. He spoke to himself, as he often did when he wanted to reassure himself. I've come a long way, all the same, since I won my first stripe. If there hadn't been this war, what would I have become? I would have gone to America and herded sheep in Montana, where everyone from this valley goes. I had even written to a cousin of ours out there and he had agreed to pay my passage. There were dollars to be earned in Montana, one came home rich, but old, with nothing but a few memories of flocks of sheep caught in a storm or a snow drift. War alone was the great adventure, cruel, poignant and heartwarming with the shadow of death hovering over one each time a comrade fell. Yes, I've had to do some odd things in my time, especially at the beginning, but that was just to make a name for myself. It's hard to achieve recognition when one still stinks of the flocks one has been herding. He remembered the day clearly, the 17th of December 1939, when, in a little village behind the lines, with a full company on parade, a cabinet minister had decorated him with the military medal and his first palm. It was extremely cold and the men's breath formed a faint mist in front of them. Read out the citation. Never had the drums sounded so crisp, they shattered the icy air. Sergeant Pierre Aspegai, of the 152nd Infantry Regiment. A warrant officer whose courage is already legendary. His platoon commander having been killed in the course of a patrol, he assumed command, carried out his mission behind the enemy lines and brought back three prisoners. In the name of the President of the Republic. The drums rolled for Aspegai, the soldiers presented arms for Sergeant Raspegai. It was then he had felt some animal come to life within him, some little animal. His ambition, as yet no bigger than an insect but which started nibbling away at him at once. Yet the thought of that patrol. The most ghastly shambles in his whole career. The men hadn't muffled their equipment properly and there was a hell of a clatter. The lieutenant had lost his way in the dark. He had actually switched on his electric torch to consult his map and compass. It was then they had run into a German patrol, just as bogged down as themselves and commanded by an oberleutnant just as doltish as the French lieutenant. They had fired at each other at random bullets flew in all directions. It may have been the Frenchmen who killed their own lieutenant, and the Germans their oblatnant. Eventually the six Germans that were left had raised their hands a split second before the five Frenchmen did likewise. He, Raspagai, had waited until it was all over, he wanted to see what the hell was going on, he hadn't fired. What was the point?